episode of the Game Informer Show. I'm Ben Hansen, joined by Andrew Reiner. Hello. Benjamin Reeves. The best for last. And Matt Miller. The best. Hi. <laughs> oh my gosh. Miller, what a week this is. It's crazy. How would you describe this week at Game Informer? Uh, there's been so much happening around the Game Informer office. We had an issue meeting yesterday. Yep. For Chaos. Named issue. Just insane stuff. We have a cover reveal next week, so next week's podcast we'll talk about that game, yeah. which is going to be very interesting. There's a lot of people playing games right now. It is. It's a There's busy time. There's so man. many cool games. I mean, uh, not not to spoil end of the year discussions, but there's a lot of good games this year. And we haven't even played Red Dead yet. I know. <laughs> There's a lot of really good games. I I can't I, I can't keep up. Um, struggling. I recommend not playing uh, Dragon Quest Eleven if you're having a tough time keep up with other games because I always, I want to start Shadow of the Tomb Raider. There's so many games I want to start already, but it's like you don't need to. I'm 40 hours in. I got to keep going with Dragon Quest. I got to finish this off before you, do, you can man. think about touching it. And you got to go 100 hours on that thing. I think I can finish it in 65. This is going to be my... Speed run. All right. Yeah. By the Speed time running you're 65, right. not I helping any civilians, just beelining right to the next objective. <laughs> See, uh, we have a good show, Miller. A real good show here. I'm excited. Uh, talking about... Ah, Jesus. This other game I want to play. Forza Horizon 4. Uh, then we're going to talk Life is Strange 2. Uh, and then a very natural segue into talking about the closing of Telltale. Mm. What a crazy week mm. in games. Mm-hmm. It's just unreal. So we should have... Hopefully some insight into that situation. Um, and then Kim is going to talk about her magical trip over to Japan for the Tokyo Game Show. Some exciting games she saw there. So if you like Japan, uh, like this podcast. I think it's the equation has to Breaking go. Japan news. That's right. Uh, and then community emails the back half of the show. Reeves. Oh, boy. It. Spider-Man Game Club. Mm-hmm. Part 3. The grand finale. Oh. The whole kit. You've all finished it now. We have That's right. all Finally. It. It webbed it all, all right. up. And also, everybody stuck with this game club. Yeah. Unless, like, cereal bails before we record this thing. I think it's going to happen. It's crazy. It's exciting stuff. It is super fun. It uh, wasn't feeling so good. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh. Don't say it. Uh, yeah, so we're talking about everything in Spider-Man, the, the final act. Uh, so we've got so many great emails. We'll dive into it. We'll have a lot of fun talking about all that. Because it turns out Reiner was right. There is some stuff to talk about, mm. which is very intriguing. Um, okay, for now, Forza Horizon 4. Yeah. Andrew Reiner, you're reviewing this thing, mm-hmm. and then you roped in two, uh, two Drive Avatar buddies here with Ben Reeves <laughs> and Matt Miller. That's right. all we actually are. And Jeff Cork. He's actually live streaming Assassin's Creed as this is being uh, recorded. That's but, true. Yeah, check uh, out. Uh, yeah, this is, this is my racing team. Uh, real, sh- real short, Forza Horizon is my favorite racing series out there right now. Really? Yeah. It's blend of arcade racing, over the top, chaotic uh, track designs with those tuner options that you find in your stimulations. Uh, and that kind of stock of cars, too, yeah, creates a really compelling uh, mixture for me. And uh, Forza Horizon 4 is the best entry in that series. Yeah. Really? So, yes. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with just how much content is offered. It is, you finish a, it's like the everlasting gobstopper racing <laughs> games. You finish a race, you get three more. You take down a, a billboard, you find out you got another 200 to get. Go on a new track, and it's like, you have 500 more to find. I, I mean, it's just mind-boggling how much content is here in this open world. In the open world itself, set in Britain now, yeah. is stunning. Beautiful, right? Like, very scenic. And at first, it looks like these fields don't look like there's going to be much action on them, right? Like, yeah. It's just a big farm field. But then you realize, like, next thing you know, you go across that field at 180 miles an hour, and then you're launching off a mountain, flying 600 feet in the air. Uh, the track designs are great. And feature all four seasons. So they recreated the open world four times. Right. For more than a season. palette swap. Yeah. yeah. Much like, more than a palette I mean, swap. It's, you know, fall brings the beauty you'd expect with the leaves and all that. Summer, you know, it's like you'd expect there's maybe dry terrain mm-hmm. and the sun shining, but there's a lot of rain, puddles. Spring brings that as well. England. Um, and then winter, it's like Game of Thrones, you know, that ominous saying of winter is coming. It's a lot of White Walkers. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy yeah, how many fantasy insane. zombies but, there are. So you, you, let's say you take on a race, you could go back there in a different season, and it'll have a different identity, and that yeah. the elements from the season will make it more yeah. challenging. And there's cars easy. that you're going to want to yeah. use there. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Like a snowmobile. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, yeah, not quite. I haven't seen those. It was cool because, like, I was on my way to a destination, and it was winter, and I was like, used to driving that way, but then it was winter and I realized, like, oh wait, this lake is frozen over. I can now drive across it. So that was kind of fun. That's so much fun. Did you feel like, as a huge fan of Forza Horizon 3, I love that environment so much. I loved Australia. And I feel like with the announcement of the setting, it was like, England is lovely. 
but doesn't seem as much fun or as cool as Australia, but the weather thing just pushes it over the top. Oh, yeah. You, like Reeve says, you, you discover new things with the different seasons. At least winter brings new elements. Right? Yeah. There's, uh, but there's, like, uh, beaches, castle areas, ooh. small. Uh, there's nothing like a metropolitan area. But there are little kind of quaint towns. There's a lot of really cute to. towns that are yeah. like, oh, if I was on vacation, I would love to visit this there, one. There's a, juxtap- <laughs> there's a really compelling juxtaposition of the idyllic scenery with the intensity of the racing that okay. I, I really like in this game that that was present in, in Forza Horizon 3, but I think they've really doubled down on it here. Um, and and especially in like like some of those showcase races, you're going through just these gorgeous locales, but ridiculous stuff is happening. You've got dirt bikes jumping over you, and I love you know, yeah. I don't want to spoil all of them, yeah. but they're like I, the hover ship. Those are, those yeah. are some of my favorites, actually. Uh, they're really good. You're always like racing something crazy. Well, yeah. speaking of something crazy, tell me if this is a spoiler runner. I'll hint towards it. But you said there's one mission that's very oh, Xbox themed. Yeah, they've they've released footage of it. What is this? Halo. Break it down. There's a Halo track. Uh, where you're in a warthog, you're playing as Master Chief, <laughs> but, it, but they change the terrain. You see the Halo in the background, and there's Halo music and commentary and commentary and vehicles and stuff in the terrain. You know those energy uh-huh. shields, all that stuff. You're oh, seeing cool. all that on the track. But also, it's still England. Yes. <laughs> they, they, they comment. Yeah, Halo is just England. Weren't you paying attention to oh the Oh my gosh! But they, they comment on it like they have come back in time to this period, and they're like, "What is going on here?" So, so. Master Chief is like the new Jeremy Clarkson for this. Yeah, like, what the hell yeah. is going yeah. on? Uh, but the funny thing about just how beautiful this this world is, and they they have like these landmark locations you go to, and they're like, "Oh, this landscape is sacred," you know, like. People travel here to take photos of it. And then the next race, you're just driving over it. Driving through the wall. <laughs> <laughs> or music like, blaring. It's like, look at this old church. It's been here for centuries. And it's like, can you break the billboard on top of it? <laughs> <laughs> this, I, I have, uh, my time with the game has gotten across to me the sense that Forza Horizon 4 is like the, the most popcorn racing game I've ever played. But uh, it's still simmy enough, like Reiner I, was talking about. I think, you know? It can I, be. If you I turn up it, the difficulty, it can be. I sure think yeah. it can be, but I think the experience that most people are going to have is that if you just go in and you let the game carry you along, you're going to have the best time that you can have with it. And, and you can literally do that by just like hitting, was it left on the D-pad, at least in three, oh, yeah. and just give you the next thing you to can do. Uh-huh. You can do that, but you can also just like go to whatever is closest on your map. Like, yeah. oh, that says it's new. I'll go over and do that thing. Um, there's a lot of... There's a lot of meters and progressions and uh, stuff that you could get kind of lost in. Mm -hmm. And in my first couple hours of playing the game, I I was tempted to get too involved with that stuff, and it started getting me frustrated. The Destiny spirit kicked in. Well, I was like, how how should I maximize, how should I speed up my my, uh, progression and all that kind of stuff? And after a couple hours, I realized that that was probably the wrong approach for this game, and Uh that... I was going to have more fun if I just abandoned myself to the insanity of just, I'm just going in and I'm racing and I don't know what I'm doing or when I'm doing it and I don't know what that icon means and I don't know what the all these meters are and, oh, I get to spin a gambling wheel? Sure, let's do it. I, I don't know why that happened. Who knows? So that's how you, like, you feel most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to be fair, yeah. Just to be clear, though, with Miller, when you're talking about a gambling wheel in a racing game, I think of that Need for Speed. Oh. Yeah, 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 no, it's like like transaction. There's it's no like, microtransactions, uh, but it is a, it is a well, wheel. Are. Okay, uh, but, but it's on the wheel. No, not on the wheel. Not so on the wheel. When you level up or complete specific things, you get to spin a wheel for a random prize. Right. Okay. That prize could be a car, currency, or uh, horns for your car. Yes. So they, oh, like they have like, well, they have all the Halo theme. A thieves. Hang on, stop. I need to know. The is the Halo theme? theme? <laughs> <laughs> so you bring a horn, you get okay. the wedding theme. Is the Halo theme, is it like, does it sound like a horn? Yes. Or it, <laughs> yeah. Yes. So <laughs> stupid. I love it. So I have the Killer Instinct one right now. Uh, but then you can also get, they obviously really understood how popular Fortnite was. So they take your driver out of the car. No. Where you get outfits for your driver and dance moves, including floss. Wait a minute. So you can can you run around the world nope. outside the car? It's just when you win a race, he's out of the car. You see them dance. Yeah. Like a little I think any loading moment. stream is you usually like dancing in front of your car. Jeez. Looking like an Christ, idiot. Christ, what's happening? <laughs> I saw or I heard you mention something that I loved about the last one too, 
but it is a jarring the idea that you can like put in your name it's like choosing a custom uh, keychain or something at a gift store so they will constantly refer to you as Ben does yeah. everybody have that? Yeah. Oh, all the time yeah it says Andrew when I turn it's, it on yeah, it hey Ben me. we just did this yeah, all right. Oh, unnatural. Yeah, well, and just given the amount of times they do it, too. And I, don't, I can't it's constant. figure out if it's just because I'm, like, not used to that in a video game or if it's, like, they're... I think they're overusing it a little They're bit. proud of it. They yeah, really they're, are. They're really proud of it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, let's let's be real clear. The the storytelling in this game is not the reason you want to play Forza Horizon. Just going to unlock the festivals? Is that the idea again? Well, here. There are... Hold on to the table so you don't fall. <laughs> There are 26 different campaigns in this game. What the hell? So what, Miller, get one. so what Miller's talking about, about there being so much stuff going on at once, there will be a campaign for drift racing, a campaign for country racing, street racing. You know, you just keep adding on to them. But four of them are story-based. One okay. of the stories, it's a 10-part story, so 10 races, <laughs> is you're a stunt driver in a movie. Mm-hmm. That's been so, some of my favorite ones so yeah, far. I love Stuntman. This yeah. one, you're going to love. It's a top 10 list of the greatest racing games of all time. And it starts at number 10, and it's like, number 10 is OutRun. And they start talking about the game OutRun and why it's great. And then the race you go on simulates what OutRun is right. They have that car. It's not changing the graphics, but it is. And then the next race will be number 9, and they'll be like, number 9 is Daytona USA. Wait, so different licenses? Yeah, but they That's don't. Crazy. They talk about them, but they don't have the actual content. So it's sometimes the same car, right? Like if it's like a and like car. little homage races. This is amazing. So in a Forza Horizon game, they talk about Gran Turismo. They talk about. Well, I don't want to give away the top ten list, but yeah, there's. Uh, of course, they talk there. about one of them Smuggler's Run. Yeah, and you do a Smuggler's Run like run. This is the best <laughs> shit I've ever heard. <laughs> it is so fun. Uh, and and then number there's... one is what Forza Horizon Four. Is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but then there's. Um, but, so those are really cool. Like, I did all ten of those in a row. Whereas yeah. other events, I'm bouncing between them. Um, another one is renting the fastest cars in the world. Uh, so you get to experience just, like, going 200 miles an hour in a car that will cost you. You'll eventually get for, like, three million currency in the game. But yeah. you get to test drive it, right? Yeah. Um, so and these little speeds are really good, too. Like, oh, I used oh, to, like, amazing. hauling across, like, a field. And I'm like, this is too fast. Visually, only, like, 75%. <laughs> racing mechanics. Uh, just the performance of it all is fantastic. Hey, and is this it, the best game ever made? You guys? <laughs> it, it, it all, you know, one of the other things I, I really appreciated about the way they structured it is um, the dynamic difficulty options that they give you. Okay. Um, you have at the beginning of any racing event the option to change out details of how many things the game is doing to help you. And depending on how you do that, boosts how quickly you progress. So you can set... You know, the most obvious thing is obviously you can set uh, how difficult the drivers are, the drive avatars that you're going against. Yeah. Right? You can move that up and down the scale as you see fit. But you can also change things like how much braking assist that it has and, and that kind of stuff. And Which and makes it feel less arcadey. Yes, yeah. exactly. Huh. And so you have this, there's a flexibility to the game, um, dynamics and difficulty that I really appreciate because it, it sort of means that as a player you can twist the game to be the kind of racing game you like. Right. I love it. So, this sounds absolutely fantastic. And you can play it all cooperatively or competitively. So, I can go in, let's say you and I are in the shared world. The shared world contains 72 racers. They're kind of ghost images going around. You could team up with them, get them into your convoy. But let's say you and I, Ben, are on a team and we want to, like, be cooperative. Yeah. Hey, Ben. It'll make the game... Co-op? Yes. It's great that you're racing as a friend. It makes the game more challenging because the rewind yes. functionality is gone. Oh, It just kind of places you back when you hit that now. And that's right. like... You're not gaining anything from that. You're just being placed behind the pack. Uh, but they, get, they reward you better in that. But if you want to be competitive, you and I could go into that race together, be against each other, but both still get progress. So no matter what you do in this game, win or lose, place first or twelfth in a race, it's going to say, hey, good job, you finished that race. Here's the gold medal for completion that you completed this challenge. Go on to the next yeah. one. Well, yeah. not the other ones. And I, I was playing with Reiner and, like, totally biffed it. And it's a very uh, once-in-a-lifetime thing, like, screwed up. And I oh ended up... You've never, you've never yeah, wrecked I in a car racing game before. Yeah. 
Uh, you got some I, lag or something. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, my cat chewed on the controller. Anyway, uh, I got seventh place, but Reiner got first, and so it kind of like evened out, and we still won. Okay. That uh, that match, which is cool. I heard that the co-op it takes a long time to unlock yeah, or something. So the beginning, since there's four seasons, they wanted to kind of give you a taste of all of it out of the gate. Okay. So you're you're shifting from uh, one season to the next, starting with I think it's spring. Uh, and then you eventually uh, get all the way to winter and then kind of roll back around to year two of the competition. Okay. But in that time, stuff is gated off. Like, there's a lot of content in the game. And, like, Team Adventure, that's locked off. Some of the, the multiplayer stuff is locked off. Forzathon, which is a new hourly event that just randomly appears on the map. And that's, like, like I was talking about the shared world, yeah. 72 racers. They can all converge on that to take part in this, like, a scoring challenge, like, uh, speed trap. How fast can you get from point A to point B? Your time, 110 miles an hour, is added to the pool, and you got to right. hit 5,000 total. Okay. Uh, so you're all racing to do those those events. And yeah. so, how long does it take? It's three to five hours, it's, they say. I, 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 it's been long. It was longer for me. I feel like yeah, longer. Uh, at one point in the seasons, you unlock the ability to like have people invited to your game. Uh -huh. And so, like me and Miller were like, oh, cool, we unlocked multiplayer, and so we were able to jump into each other's world. But we weren't able to actually like, do any races together. You could get would, in a convoy together, but yeah. then you can't be on the same team until huh. you unlock certain aspects. I would say this was the one thing of all the things I really like about this game. For me personally, the um, opaque nature of of some of that multiplayer stuff early on right. bothered me because I, I literally w one evening or in the um, when we were first getting started in the game, Ben and I were trying to do this, and we just couldn't figure out what was going on. What are, what are these different? T t uh, Terms mean yeah, teams versus, teams versus convoys, convoys versus, versus yeah, my ad yeah. adventure versus Forza, yeah. Forza Thon, like Forza all these life, different yeah. things that that aren't really uh, clarified for you, and and ultimately it was like I just my buddy and I want to go play in this racing game together. Why yeah. can't we do that? Okay. Um, I think that's the only bummer is like that, yeah. if you are looking to play with your friends, like expect you gotta like invest a couple hours. Yeah. But I mean those hours are fun. They I mean, are. You're absolutely. playing Forza, it's You're a fun a game. Racing but game. if yeah, you wanna yeah, play yeah. with your friends, just yeah. no, you can't do that right Yeah, make sure you, you put like six hours into it before you do that. Right. The other thing that's kind of a bummer is those twenty six campaigns I'm talking about. Some of those are great. Other ones are like dedicated to like Mixer. So they want you to play through Mixer, which will enhance your game you'll get more currency Makes and a streaming followers. service yeah, yeah so they want you to stream online to fill this campaign to level up in this campaign that's kind of gross huh. another one is like tuning cars you know if you don't uh -huh. want to do that they kind of force your hand in that if you're going for the completionist run and then there's you know like vinyls making you know painting cars doing all that stuff okay um so they get pretty thick in the weeds of like trying to force you into everything well yeah. it's called forza <laughs> But uh, those, the ones that are focused on the racing and the stories are very good. Okay. And, and there's a lot of it, right? I mean, you're, you're talking about without ever touching any of those, because a lot of those don't sound great to me either, but I've spent many hours in this game and never touched that stuff yeah, yet. But if you do go on there and you just mess around, you're going to level up. Right? right, so you're like, oh, cool! I don't even know what I'm doing, but I just got a wheel spin. Yeah, and yeah, a new yeah. car. I was still learning the yeah, credits and like experience. Even that one time, I got right. like, seventh place. So. I think I think it's important to stress too, because everybody just sees it as an Xbox game, but like this is also on PC. Everybody, yep. yeah, yeah, like, it, it's in cross-platform play. It yeah. comes up October second. Okay. Um, the last point, the negative point I have is fast travel is still a bit of a pain. Mm. You got to buy these houses. There's in the last game they had the Forza Festival site. Right. Right. There's just one now, a central festival site. Now you're buying houses, and they cost a lot of money in certain areas. But if you have like an event that's four and a half miles away, you got to drive to it. Okay. Uh, until you get a house that's closer in the vicinity. But as you're driving to that, you're going to get so distracted because there's so much to do, like billboards to track down, yeah. you know, hidden garages that hold cars that you got to find in the wilderness. Uh, so it's it's not like the drive's uneventful. Right. But you do have to. Just kind of aimlessly drive for a lot of it. You know, it's really exciting, and it's kind of the undercurrent of this entire conversation. It's talking about how much stuff to do there is, how it nails, in theory, open world activities. Is it's rumored uh, that this is the team working on a new Fable game? Oh yeah, yeah. And thinking about just them nailing the open world like this, and just the density. Good God. Well, it, uh, that that density is exciting, and um, I think one of the things that I have been most excited about in um, in 
some of the games that have come out recently is the idea of some of these dynamic content things that are changing over time. Mm -hmm. The recognition that with a lot of games, um, there are you're going to have people who are playing every day for weeks, right? And that they want to be able to come back a week later and have something be different. And that's what Forza Horizon 4 does. This whole season thing gives you this sense of progression over time and that the game world is changing. And that's a very fable thing. And that would be <laughs> awesome yeah. in, a, in a game like, in a, in a like fantasy RPG to have that kind of dynamic. Even yeah. just based on the tech they have in Forza, it's like one of the best looking games out there and just like it runs super smooth and giant open world. Like yeah. it just looks cool. So even just having that tech underneath the fable game yeah. seems like a win-win to me. Oh, that's exciting. Uh, Reiner, your reviews on the site? Yes. Should be on the site now. We're waiting on one answer on multiplayer. Sure. Uh, okay. Just how it all works, like exactly what you can and can't do at certain times. But yeah, should be on the site soon. Cool. There we go. Uh, love you guys. Do you want to clap out of here? You got it. Hey, we have Kimberly Wallace. Hey, yo. We have Elise Bavis. Hey. Old Giggle Town here. We're talking about Life is Strange 2. Yeah. You guys yeah. both played episode one? Yes. Yeah. yeah. This, is, this is very exciting. I reviewed it. Oh, there we go. Is the review on the site? The review is up. Uh, what'd you think? Uh, I gave it an 8.25. There we go, okay. I liked it quite a bit. Um, so, you know, it's you leave behind the story of Max and Chloe for new characters, new environment. Uh, and we're instead introduced to Sean and Daniel. Uh, Sean's a teenage boy, Daniel's, I think, nine. And they go through something really traumatic at uh, in their home in Seattle. Uh-huh. And they, it's basically like a police altercation, and they have to leave. Uh, without a moment's notice, really, and they're fleeing to Mexico. Okay, so episode one, yeah. I assume you're not getting to Mexico. That's, that's on the horizon, <laughs> right? But it's just like starting that's out, they're their, walking through the woods. That's their plan. Okay. Basically, the first episode is their start of their journey. You know that plan's not going to work, but... I have a feeling they're going to meet some folks along the way. Yeah, right? Uh, <laughs> is it... Okay, first question. Is it connected to awesome adventures of Captain Spirit? Yes. Um, well, we don't see any connections yet. I okay. Mean, there are some. Mm-hmm. But we don't he doesn't I mean I don't want to spoil too much, but Please he don't. is he is supposed there are there are definitely connections there. To the point that you'd recommend people play that before they start like oh, yeah. episode one? I, I think so. Okay, because that was that free episode that was yeah. surprisingly good and cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh so you're digging it so far, but it mm-hmm. does it have some hook like the first Life is Strange had in terms of like the rewind power? Oh yeah, there yeah, there's I think they're gonna get more into the power in the second game because they had like a little tease, but um, there's something that awakens the power in Daniel. Okay. Yeah. And awakens think of it. And it's very confusing at first, I think, for yeah. you know, both the boys. And yeah. They're kinda coming to terms with what happened. Yeah, they're trying to figure yeah. out what the heck's going on with him. <laughs> you know? It's okay. like this little kid gets this mysterious power out of nowhere. Um, you know, there's an emotionally charged scene which triggers it. So they haven't really gone into... So it's not a gameplay mechanic yet? Not anything yet. Anything like that? It's okay. not. Um, and I don't know if it will be. Yeah. But they did hint at the end, like, he was, you know, showing him how to... Do some stuff? Yes. That sounds neat. Hey, Kim, are you as into it as you were hoping for? Yeah, I'm actually pretty surprised. Um, I wasn't sure. It's so hard when you introduce people to a new cast. And, like, oh, I yeah. really loved Max. She was a great protagonist. Um, you know, it's like leaving that behind was a little bittersweet for me, but I get why they did it. And I didn't expect to connect with these characters like as fast as I did. I mean, the dialogue is much better than I feel like the first season was. There's, I hope there's so. some moments, there's some moments, uh-huh. but overall, yeah. better. And I feel like uh, what's interesting here is kind of the brother dynamic of, you know, you have that annoying little brother, but then you want to protect your brother. and mm-hmm. Um, kind of seeing that through the eyes of also, um, they're dealing with some issues of, like, racism and all that going on, too. Really? So it gets really, like, I was surprised how yeah. far they went with some of the political stuff, and I'm happy they did, because there's huh. a line in there, it's like, everything is political. And I, I love that scene. That's a perfect line. And I it, say, it like, is an you amazing You can't line. escape it, but it does get, like, into those, um, to- heavier topics, and I'm really interested to see how they're going to approach it for the rest of the season. Yeah. I-, I liked that writing, also, just because it's almost like they're talking to the games community as a whole. Yeah. In a way, you know, like... Hey, come on. Everything's this is great, too, because they hid how much they do go into it. Um, <laughs> and it, it kind of is a nice surprise to just see them 
not be afraid to touch that issue, which yes. is so polarizing right now. And just, like I said, I'm really interested with how it's going to play out. And this has to do with the police, I'd imagine, in the beginning. Yeah, it has to do with the police. And uh, just in terms of, like, the political climate. Because it, it takes place in October 2016. So they mentioned oh, the election. Yeah, yeah, and just people, like, yeah. racial okay. profiling in general. Like, you, you look know. through the phone and your friend is like, he's not really going to win, is he? So there are... Do they say the words Donald Trump in this game? They don't, but they do reference huh. the wall. They do reference oh, really? the wall. They, yeah. have, they uh, you know, the main character receives scrutiny over whether he's, like, a real American citizen. Yeah, and there's tons of that. Are they going to Mexico to build the wall? <laughs> Were they so empowered at a rally? They yeah, decided to hike down they, they there? Gotta, they gotta escape. Yeah. Okay, all right. It's like, people um, are mad at them, and they didn't... It's not their fault. I, I imagine. Really, I actually cried while I played. Really? <laughs> yeah, I did. This is a whole thing. Okay. And have. the first episode. This is like the lighthearted yeah. beginning. Yeah. Wow. I must have a stone heart. <laughs> I did not. I didn't cry, but like I liked where everything was going. Yeah. I, 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 I was really. I was there really. There are some really emotional scenes with uh, the older brother. Okay. So sad. Is it like the same level? Because I think what's amazing about Life is Strange games compared to Telltale, which we'll talk about in a little bit, is just like the amount of things you can interact with. Like, it doesn't really hold your hand, and I imagine it's the same levels of Life is Strange Season 1, everything there, uh, kept, like, Awesome Adventures, the Captain Spirit, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, I, you can, you know, it starts off in Sean's house, and you can explore the whole house, and it's, it, it has that same feeling of everything feel very, like, lived in, yeah. you know? Um, yeah, the house was the best for the exploration, the and then great. they kind of get on the road, and it gets a little... A little more, like, not as much to do, but there are stuff. But you have to, like, search and go off the beaten path. You have to some explore, of it. Yeah, okay. the forest. There are things to do, like, yeah. Is it, uh, just for this entire season, trying to figure out how they're doing the travel structure, is it going to be a lot of you holding forward and just walking down a road? Like, I mean, there is some of that, but there's okay. also, like, they get to places through cars and other yeah. things. Or, you know, they go to... Pit stops like yeah. gas stations and right. things like that. So there are people that you meet <coughs> along the way. I had a very <coughs> strong, like speaking of Telltale, actually, like very strong Walking Dead vibe every once in a while. Just yes. like Lee and Clementine. Yeah, I was actually that dynamic. thinking that when I was playing. I was like, yeah. oh god, I feel like I'm scavenging for like food and trying yeah. to figure out like should I steal this or no? Like or not? There's stuff like in a car. And it's like, do you want to steal her? Like, this is straight out of the wall. Yeah, I know, right? really? Like, the minute car you, stuff, it's one yeah. of the first scenes that you get when you enter the forest and the car just sitting there like, do you want to steal this candy bar or not that's, like, wedged in? And I'm like, oh, this is so walking dead. And you both yeah. grabbed the candy bar. I did. I, I did. Oh, yeah. and that's oh, what made you cry I, then? Is I, that the difference? I'm the honest, I was honest like, oh, girl. I'm going to get have a little I candy bar. I was worried someone was going to see me, and I was like, I I'm already on the top. I, I think I overanalyze every decision I make in <laughs> these that's games. That's the point of these games, isn't it? That's well, all you like got. You think, yeah, you think there's like going to be some repercussions or something if you mm -hmm. do it, and then you're like, oh, wait, I really wanted to do that, but I didn't because I thought it would screw my character over. Oh, it really didn't, so. Yeah. I don't know why I still play them that way, though. Like, it's like, I still think, oh, what if they get it this way? <laughs> I get yeah. it. What if this comes back to haunt me? It will. 8.25. It Very exciting. Elise, I think it's time we talk about Telltale. We've been dancing around it this entire episode. Yeah. And to do that, I need you to clap very loudly in the microphone. <laughs> All right. Okay. Here we go. Ben Reeves and Andrew Reiner. Hello. And Frey. We're talking Telltale. Kim's still here. Yeah. Hey, everybody. What the hell is going on in the video game industry? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's this somber. It's insane. So Telltale closed. Mm -hmm. Effectively. It's, kind of, it's a weird yeah. middle ground, right? Where it's like, ah, they have a skeleton crew, 25 people, in theory, finishing off Minecraft. But they just, bam, fired 250 people, no severance, kicked them out the door. What a world. I mean, I was in the middle of reviewing the final season of The Walking Dead. Right. I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of weird to think that I won't finish that at all. I mean, there's talks that they might have something well, what, to do. Well, what'd you hear on that front? Uh, that, well, it also caused some controversy because they said other companies were going to help them release the final two episodes, but maybe you should pay your workers before. That's the thing. Yeah. So everyone's like, I'm sure the fan out, there's a fan out cry saying, yes. hey, we want the end of The Walking Dead. People have been invested for a long time, want to see the grand finale. They build this as the final season. And then it's, yep, nope, we're not going to finish up yeah. for everybody. And now they said, maybe we will. And it's like, well. <laughs>
everybody online is certainly blaming leadership, saying like, how could you mismanage that things badly? to this degree? Where it's like, oh, last second. All right, everyone's fired. Bye. It's like you Especially because they had put out. They had put out all the release dates for the final season of The Walking Dead just like a week or two ago. Yeah. It was not that long ago. And they also announced Wolf Among Us season two yeah. coming in the future. Like that morning that they closed, they were like putting stuff up on Twitter and stuff. It was crazy. Well, I mean, I think they were thinking, you know, their lifeline is going to be Walking Dead. Like, will we be able to sustain with this? They just released, yeah. you know, the first, what, two episodes? Mm-hmm. No, um, only the first. Or the first one, and then they have what? The second was so the second was supposed to come out this week. I went to try to go play it. It got pulled from the Steam store, so oh, only wow. a few people have been able to play it if you got it early enough. Oh, interesting. Unfortunately, we were in issue meeting when it went live, and I right. couldn't go into it. So it's like I can't even play that now. I don't know if anything's going to change where you know Steam will let me access it, but I can't. Do we know why they pulled it after putting it up? Because I think they just felt bad thing? selling this game that was mm-hmm. never going to be finished and so we're going to ask people to play, pay full price for something and then it's just going to go off into okay. oblivion. Sure. I guess that's the idea. Is there, and I know focusing on the game is not fair to everyone who was laid off. It's a brutal situation, but at the same time, is there like a universe where maybe this is a best case scenario where everybody gets to have fond, I don't know, more interesting memories of Walking Dead now that it will never be finished? Does it feel a little bit like James Dean dying while he's young or something where it's, oh, like, it's it, like a legacy of like it's, it's, maybe she lived maybe she didn't maybe you know people can have their own theories what happened to Clem sure Star Trek getting cancelled in the third season kind of thing. I don't know maybe a little bit it'll always be like this legend that Walking Dead never finished a Telltale instead of like people love a lot of Telltale games I certainly didn't feel a lot of enthusiasm for that final season even the reviews didn't seem hot out of the gate for episode one and maybe this is a best case scenario for the overall Walking Dead story is that crazy is that dark I think, it, dark, yeah. I think it might be in, even if they get the funding or someone else steps in to do the final episodes, are they going to be true to what that vision was? Yeah, Will exactly. it be the same quality, right? Like, so you, you got to, like, you have that concern right there that the final chapter, you already got to put an asterisk on it. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I kind of agree with you, Hanson, that, yes, it sucks that we've been vested this long in this story arc uh, about this girl. We've watched her grow up in this. The series with, that have, has had great stories, right? Yeah. And great yeah. moments. And now we really won't know how it ends according to their vision, Telltale's vision. Uh, yeah, I think have, leaving it open ended is probably the best scenario you can think of right now. Unless the original dev team comes back, or, you know, the ones that were working on the century, <laughs> Jesus, yeah. gets paid, feels yeah. comfortable enough to deliver the same quality. Because they couldn't games. even, yeah. like, because of licensing issues and stuff, they couldn't even, like, kickstart to finish it either. Like, right. the people who created it, if it's outside of Telltale, they couldn't do that. I'm just trying to think of, like, in a world where there's no way we get it. I, I mean, feel like. I, even, do you think fans would accept if it's, like, some sort of... Uh, you know, the beginning of Mass Effect 2, where it kind of reflected on Mass Effect 1, you had to make those choices. It was just like a series of stills, and you could kind of work your way through it like a comic book panel or something. Maybe there's some oh, middle ground. I think uh, you're totally right. Just You just got to let it go. Yeah. Man, that's brutal. Can you imagine just like, what was it, seven years ago that the first season came out? 2012? Probably yeah. a long time ago. But just like, how high they were riding after the success of that thing, and yeah. everybody was, they were winning Game of the Year awards left and right, and it's just like, everybody was like, this is... This is cool, and they reinvigorated that industry, basically. The whole the adventure genre? Yeah, yeah. yeah. like oh, nobody yeah. was talking about adventure games back then. And if you had said, like, oh, this is going to how they're in, you'd be like, what? Well, they were, they're just going to, like, kind of putter along and then fade into... They were nothing. smart with the properties they got in that... Exper- they, they were experiences you didn't get elsewhere, where you had, like, a really good Walking Dead experience. You had The Wolf Among Us. Yeah. They were taking you to New Worlds, but when they went to, like, uh, Batman... Borderlands and Minecraft I'm like there's really great games of these already and this is just kind of a weird telltale version of them right like they weren't as exciting to me just yeah. because I already had great game experiences well, in, the, in people, those places regardless of what the uh, Borderlands won pretty well mm-hmm. and yeah. the second season of Batman people say that was pretty good people loved it but nobody played it though. that's the thing yeah. it's like I wasn't compelled to play those because I feel like I played that formula so and Reiner if you're not playing the second season of Batman who yeah, no one is oh. honestly that I played is, the first episode know. I didn't like it I was that's like, crazy uh, but I heard it gets a lot better after that one like it's pretty common uh that the first episode, people saying like that one wasn't great, but then it really picks up steam. Right, right. Uh, but yeah, I just didn't feel compelled to go to those games. Yeah. I played so many Telltale games up to that point. 
I latched on to more of the unique experiences where they had a unique voice in the, in the industry opposed to, you know, if Rocksteady makes the best Batman game, you know, sorry, even if you have a great story, like, right. that is the true Batman experience. And it's different enough, yeah. I think it's just a nice reminder of, like, how fragile absolutely everything in the game industry is. Like, Telltale, you just take it for granted. Like, hey, let's make fun of the new episodes that's coming out. Here we go. Telltale Game Engine. Bye, bye, bye. And it's like, oh, they're gone. It's yeah. just like, you take everything for granted. It's just, bam, things can disappear. And I think Stranger Things probably would have done pretty well for them. Yeah? Like, that seemed like one of those properties that's hot. There isn't a lot of stuff in the game space in that capacity, and, and they could do something with it. Yeah? Although Guardians of the Galaxy may be the same story, but, oof, that was a brutal game. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah. was a brutal game. I played two of those episodes. I was like, "Oof, I'm good." I'm so good. you were compelled to play the Guardians of the Galaxy, but not Batman. Huh? Yeah, well, that's the thing. Like, try. Hey, it. what's a Guardians game like? I want to experience mm-hmm. that. All right, Where's yeah. Batman. I know. What uh, What do you wear? Like, some are your favorite Telltale memories, Telltale episodes, Telltale specific uh, chunks of gaming here. That ending of the first Walking Dead the last season. episode. Yes, yeah. I yeah. freaking cried. I haven't had a game make me cry like that. In, I don't think ever. Like, I was sobbing. You were sobbing like Elise playing Life is Strange 2 episode 1. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, I wasn't expecting to even be that emotionally impacted. Like, I knew I'd grown attached to Clementine, and, like, I liked her relationship with Lee, but when everything played out, I was just like, damn. Like, this is not, this is powerful that a game made me feel like this. Yeah? It felt like a good moment for video game storytelling. I think that's what else I liked about that first season of The Walking Dead. It brought back a focus on mm-hmm. narrative in a way that, like, it hasn't been put front and center in a lot of games, because they, like, totally were dialing back on gameplay and just, you know, we are about the narrative, and like I said, that became more and more, more evident throughout the games, and they still, throughout their run, um, even for me in the I've been reviewing The Walking Dead now four seasons. There is still good writing in it throughout. But yeah. It's not that it was awful or anything. It just yeah. it stopped doing things that were surprising and new. Right. So that was the problem. Yeah. I remember playing that first episode of the first season, I think I was reviewing it and trying to convince everybody on staff, like, hey, this game's actually kind of good, guys. You should pay attention to The Walking Dead. Like, what are you talking about? Tell the Back to the Future, Jurassic Park team? Yeah. Yeah, what yeah, are you exactly. talking about? Yeah. Like, it was like crazy, like, oh, you can have a game that's pretty much just story? And I think this was pre-Gone Home, right? So yeah. it was like, just that idea wasn't that solidified in the industry. Sure. It was cool to see. I mean, I'd started up all those conversations that people had had. Is this a game? Da, 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 da. And like, you know, that was uh, interesting to see that it sparked that up, but... It got even more and more, like, um, fuel to the fire <laughs> yeah. as it went on. But it really did show that, like, a game does not have to have all these flashy mechanics to be fun, to be considered a game. Totally. And like that, they kind of set that and, and yeah. started down that road. And even, like, it had a big impact. Like, I know Bruce and Neil from Naughty Dog on The Last of Us, they, they were committed to having realistic graphics for The Last of Us. Because, like, well, to make an emotional punch for a video game, you have to be realistic. And then they said that they played Walking Dead, and we're like, damn it, we were wrong. <laughs> we could have got stylized the whole time. Now, yeah. halfway through The Last of Us Part 2, we're going to see it. <laughs> she puts on her cell suit. Yeah, yeah it's like South cool. Park. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think for me, just their format, the episodic format, I really like. Like, returning to a world, like having that big cliffhanger, and then having those water cooler conversations yep. about it, and then coming back a month or two later. And continuing it, I like that a lot. And it also a lot of people like to have that conversation of, oh, "I'll play it when it's all done." Mm-hmm. Like I, I, I don't know. They had something cool going there. Yeah, for sure. It, Everybody remembers like The Walking Dead on like that once they hit that formula. But like one of my favorite games Telltale ever did was Puzzle Agent. Hell yeah, Puzzle you remember Agent. That game? Yes, it's awesome. That was like I, I think it honestly is their best game. I mean, Walking Dead has the story, but like Puzzle Agent was so unique. And, different. It and it was, has uh, a story. It does have a story. which is actually kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It's about this guy who uh, who's a puzzle agent. He works. Do you remember this? <laughs> you played Hanson, right? Yeah. He's like, he's ah, a puzzle agent for the government. The government has a puzzle agency, and he gets sent out basically to a set from Fargo. Yeah. Uh, to like solve for it's basically it is Professor Layton meets Fargo. Yeah, it's super. So with like fun. a really unique art style, you can play it on every system. Yeah, I'm puzzles totally with are actually it. pretty fun. Yeah, but I love the the goofy atmosphere of that. And so it's like, I kind of miss, I mean, I was happy for Walking Dead and what it did, but I was kind of sad in the sense that 
they just kind of followed that formula after that, and they didn't go back to some of these other right. games that they did. Even, and I, I like their Back to the Future games. Like, yeah. They were weird. Like, yeah. there was, I forget if it's episode three, but at some point in the Back to the Future run, it becomes clear that, like, Doc Brown, like, hooked up with some lady when he was in high school, and it resulted in him just, like, having a crazy amount of confidence, and he basically takes over Hill Valley and yeah. runs it like it's 1984, and he's yeah. this crazy Orwellian figure. Like, they did some fun stuff with Back to the Future lore in that game. Yeah, that was a fun game, too. And Jurassic Park. <laughs> oh, man. They had some great moments. There were so, dinosaurs. So silly. I still feel so bad. I, that oh, game. I played one episode. Now seems like a good time to go through. and just yeah, do for Extra Life or something? That would be like 10 hours of I don't Extra think Life. I don't think 10 hours. Well, that would take five episodes every episode. Yeah. Probably two hours, right? Really? It's probably like eight to ten hours. Uh, it would be fun just to make it a recurring thing throughout Extra Life. Yeah. Like a replay. Yeah. A replay, yeah, or even Game Club. Try to do something. Jurassic Park. It sucks well, though with Telto going down to talk about like one of their worst games and just like bash the hell out of it. But can you even find it? That's the thing too. Yeah, I don't know, man. Uh, Telltale, we'll miss you. Yeah. Thanks miss for the memory. Great stories. Great experiences. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for all the hard work from the developers out there, and I hope they all land on their feet somewhere. I'm sure they will. It's a, it's a Tell down. Down. Yeah. Oh, good good looking resume. If you've Shaman game, Guardians of the Galaxy game, oh, you're yeah. good. I think you're, you're good. good. Okay. I think you're good. Yeah, tough go. Um, Come hey, see me if you're not good. Ben Reeves, Reiner, do you guys want to clap out? Yeah. Here we go. The show goes on. That is the sound of Surreal Vasquez Hello. flying in. Right, Surreal? Yep. My 13 hours just to be on the cast. Okay, Kim, you were at the Tokyo Game Show. You were in Tokyo. Surreal, you were sitting at home thinking about Japan. But you yeah. are the foremost expert on all things Japan and Japanese gaming. So that's why you're here, man. Okay. Kim... Wonderful trip to Tokyo, I'd imagine. It always is. Yeah. What was the highlight this time? Uh, of the trip, not even gaming-wise. No, but. I went to the Near Orchestra concert, and oh. that was amazing to hear live. Um, and I actually, usually when they do, like, rearrangements on, you know, different popular soundtracks that I like in games, I'm not crazy about them. Okay. But this orchestra actually is, like... In, in songs that I never thought that I could like another version of, like Amusement Park from Near Automata, like, that is it. So they had, like, a full like, chorus on stage? They had a full chorus, okay. like, full choir, okay, yeah. and then, a, like, a, a full orchestra, obviously, but, uh, and then they had, like, their voice actresses come out and read parts of the game, like, to, to put a story together, and then the singers for their biggest songs came out, so, like, um... Weight of the World, that singer is okay. the one who did the main one for the first game. So that was really fun. Did they do any of, like, the hacking music, so, like, the weird 8-bit versions of the classic songs from that game? Not the 8-bit version. Okay. There was no, like, cool transition. Really. <laughs> so there's some cool stuff. Um, and then I saw, I went to the Pokemon Cafe. Okay. Is that neat? Um, you know what? I yeah. just wanted to plug it because it's the best food hands down i've had at a themed restaurant before and really? i've been to so many of them by now that actually is like this nintendo really put a lot of effort into this it's great so. and there's like stuff on the site for both those right yes like your, your details right up and all this stuff okay what about the show itself what was the most exciting game that you saw oh boy uh devil may cry 5 yeah of course like that was awesome because dante has a motorcycle weapon now that was like his main weapon that they showed off right like, yeah he, he and um i got addicted to it and so the developers as they were watching me do the demo they're like oh you can switch weapons i'm like nope i don't want to i was doing donuts and then i was like revving up into the enemy's heads like it was just what so is he fun. picking it up what there's is two like? versions of it so he can either slice it in half and uh -huh. use it on both arms and just like or he can <laughs> use a sword ride it and go to people and like it's almost like a chainsaw like lashing their heads if you rev it up at the right time okay sure I liked it. Is Cyril, you into that stuff too? Yeah, I, I think they, I mean, obviously this was a case in four, but like, I like that they were further differentiating Dante and Nero in terms of like, Nero has the arm and he, he can sort of pull enemies towards him and Dante just has the different styles basically. And Nero has a skateboard, so it's very Tony Hawk. Yeah, that seems okay. Also, yeah, yeah Nero, <laughs> did I see this right? That he has the Buster Cannon from Mega Man? It's one of the, yeah. like, the pre-order bonus, or the, like, or the okay. deluxe edition. It's a different arm, basically. But, yeah, he basically now has a bunch of different arms he can use. Uh, and I think on the 8-4 play podcast, they were talking about it, and they are talking about, like, the different arms he can have. And it seems like, I guess, like, one of them is, like, a vibrator or something. 
I it seems a little bit stupid okay. at well, times over there, which I will make cry. But, but that's cool. They also revealed no. V, right? Which is a new yeah. character. Yeah, mm-hmm. V, who just, they're not saying much about, but all those T's is like, that V will fight differently, obviously, than um, Dante or Nero, and he only has um, a cane in a book. So figure out what he's going to do with that. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Has DMC ever done anything like that? I'm not sure, because I, I didn't play the special edition of 4, uh, which I think had, you can play as Lady and Trish, uh, and, and I think uh, Virgil, so I, I'm, I wasn't sure, but like from what I've played, I don't think they've ever done sort of like a sorcerer-like character. Yeah. Uh, so I imagine maybe he summons things, he throws, yeah, you know, fire, he's maybe. like more of a ranged character, which would be interesting cool. for that series. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so is that like the biggest game of the show, or what do you think had like the biggest audience, or like got the <sighs> most buzz? Most buzz, honestly, yeah, it probably was Devil May Cry 5, oh, wow. honestly. Um, Kingdom Hearts had buzz, but uh, that Kingdom Hearts demo was and like Woody. the same one, oh god, was the same one that they had at E3, but they had stage shows, which like obviously they released a longer trailer, obviously there's that footage of you fighting Aqua, which I am, uh, I just can't handle, so. Then, do you think that's too much of a spoiler? Was that, because people were saying like maybe, I don't know if they should have shown this. Uh, I mean, they they must not think it is to show it, or they're. I think they're trying to like make people think one way about what's going to happen, and then it's not going to be what you expect. You're but I'm pretending saying, to be I, a bad guy. I can't raise a hand to her, so this is going to be very very. You're difficult just going to stop the game. Throw it away. Um, yeah, I think, but I don't know. We were talking about it internally, but it just seems like the Kingdom Hearts three campaign. Can you imagine being on that marketing team and like trying to stretch that out? Like, I don't know if they have enough of that game that they haven't shown. Where they can pull off a twist like that of leading people in the direction this late and then mm-hmm. twisting it around. It's like, I feel like they're firing everything they have at this point. I right? don't know. We still have only had like one playable version and seen just certain clips of worlds. The only world we've actually really played was uh, Toy Story. And not even to completion. And we also had um, Olympus. That right. We were, like, the Hercules one. one. Yeah. Okay. But, I don't know. I don't know what to expect. I'm hoping I'm surprised. Uh, the box art obviously got released, and everybody has opinions about that. <laughs> sure. What if the big twist is that there's a Marvel world? Uh, well, there is. Big Hero 6, baby. Well. <laughs> no, but not they Marvel. They would have announced yeah, yeah. that one by now, I would think. Uh, uh, they wouldn't yeah. even save that for a surprise. But the other thing that surprised me was how popular, and I knew this, but going to the show, Persona, because they had Persona Q2 there, Oh, okay. and even on the press days, like, people lined up for two hours for that game in particular, so... Help um, me out, is that like a dungeon crawly thing? It's uh, by the, the team that does Etrian Odyssey, so it's That's in right. that vein. Um, I love the original Persona Q, I think I gave that game like a nine, because the theme's really cool, it's, it's yeah, old school dungeon crawler, but yeah. has the charm of Persona with the characters and, and themes of each dungeon, okay. so I was, I was surprised by that. Um, yeah, I was looking around, this was kind of an interesting year, as I feel like... There wasn't, um, I feel like there are Japanese games in development, there's just not a lot of them that can, are being shown front and center right now, because they're still working through them, like Vanillaware's game was absent, oh, right. yeah, um, but I actually played, I really, I stopped by level five booth, and I really, one of the, some of the most fun I had was Inazuma 11, uh, the soccer game, soccer RPG. on Switch, on yes. Switch, and it is just, it, it's so delightful to play. Is it fun? It's, it's really fun. I, I was, like, totally digging it. Um, and I think it works better being on, like, a platform like Switch than, you know, DS or Vice. And I'm going to say the same thing. I played Yokai Watch 4, which I know we didn't get 3, but 4 is on the Switch. Okay. And that looked amazing. Like, Justin, then at we know, level 5, there's shell shaded. The, yeah. It was actually, like, really fun. And, like, you know, it hasn't done gangbusters over here. The Yokai. No one really paid attention to 2, even, but... If they release four on the Switch, that time to play that. I have a feeling it'll come over, and like I said, I liked what I played of it, so that was one of my surprise stops, because I, I okay. didn't know what they were going to have, and basically just kind of went there. Um, and then, here's the last thing Wait. I'm going to talk about. Uh, the Kill a Kill fighting game is really fun, and that's by Arc System Works that does, like, yeah. the Blaze Blue Guilty Gear series. It's, uh, it's supposedly a different team. It's, like, not, like, the, the one that worked on Dragon Ball, from what I've heard. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I played it at Evo, and it's, like, I'm surprised at how, like, it, it, it looks a little weird because yeah. it's sort of that, 
Guilty Gear sort of very, like, highly detailed 2D art style, but it's on a 3D plane, and they're not, like, 3D models the way you'd expect, so it kind of shifts from, like, basically, like, one sprite to another, uh, if, like, if that makes sense. No. In the way that, like, like, imagine Sonic sort of, uh, I don't know why I went to Sonic, but, like, imagine that, that Sonic 3D game that was sort of canceled, Adventure? where he's oh. sort of moving around on a 3D plane, but he's, like, he's sort of like a 2D sprite. It's sort of like a, a highly detailed version of that. Okay. Uh, and so they, they, when the perspective shifts, you're sort of switching from one sprite to another. And it looks a little weird, but like from what I played of it, it's pretty simple, but I had like I had fun with it. Yeah, it's like, a lot of fun. Okay. And there's this really cool, uh, I don't know if they've showed it off, like, I don't know if they iterated on it, but there's this really cool uh, sort of system where uh, when you clat, like you can sort of throw, up, throw out a super the way sort of Soul Color has, where it has that rock, paper, scissors mechanic. But the, the difference is that you can't tie here. So if you t if you both press the same button, it goes at it again. It kind of raises the stakes of how much damage those attacks will do. Yeah. So you basically go until someone, uh, I, I think either until you, ha you do that three times or until someone wins. And sort of like every time you clash, there's like higher and higher stakes. What's it called again? Kill the Kill. kill I think it's just Kill the Kill, the fighting game or well, something. Well, it's kill. like Kill the Kill. I looked this up because I was like, what's the official name? And it's like Kill the Kill if, IF. IF, okay. Yeah. Interactive fiction. I don't know, but I will say this, Serial, and I, I actually was going to bring this up to you when I got back, but you were out of the office because you hurt your back. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> this is the year, like this year in particular, uh, TGS was all full of fighting games. Yeah. It was It was pretty, like, because I had Soul Calibur, I had Jump Force, I had Kill a Kill, I saw Dead or Alive uh, 6. Uh, and I just, I was like, wow, I didn't realize that so many different ones were kind of, like, yeah, all yeah, coming it's out. It's been, it's been interesting watching sort of the fighting game community grow out of Capcom's shell in a way, just because I think over the years it feels like Street Fighter V is not sort of the centerpiece the way Street Fighter IV was, and I think in the wake of that, I feel like Bandai Namco might be sort of like the one to overtake them, because they have Soul Calibur, they have a Dragon Ball, and, you know, within that, like, Arc System Works, uh, which I don't think is, um, working with Bandai to publish uh, the Kill the Kill game, but there's Jump Force. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like Bandai has sort of taken that mantle, and they also have Tekken. So, like, Crazy, yeah, yeah, you're totally right. So, like, it, it's interesting to see all these sort of, like, contenders come out of the woodwork. Yeah. Street Fighter Five is still probably the most popular one. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like that way in sort of, like, the cultural landscape, so I feel like there's a lot of room for other people to sort of rise up in that way. Oh, they're also making Smash. Yeah. So, <laughs> Bandai Namco is, like, crazy. the fighting game yeah. publisher now. Yeah, I, I didn't even realize it until I was at the show, and I was like, God, there's so many coming out. That's wild. Okay, you, you're missing the biggest thing. Uh, Death Stranding. Death Stranding. I know. I was saving it to the end. Okay, for you, good. Because I knew you were going to want to gush, and I wanted to get all the other I'm stuff. I'm very real quick. Uh, yes. Before TGS, they announced uh, the Yakuza team announced their uh, new project, Project Judge. Yeah, you're totally right. Yeah. It's just sort of like a Yakuza game mixed with Phoenix Wright uh, elements, where you're sort of a detective, but you're also you know doing kickflips on a skateboard, kicking a guy in the face. Like it has that extreme Yakuza vibe, but yeah. also you're you're not like a you're not a criminal. You're investigating a crime, basically. Do you think because it takes place? I don't know which Japanese city, I don't know if you guys remember. I know, I can't. But it looks so Yakuza. I'm wondering no, how does. many it assets they'll like, reuse like, it. I saw it at the show, it plays like a yeah, Yakuza. Okay. It's also it's fine. very similar, it's, and I don't care. <laughs> it's also it's interesting because they hired this, who apparently is like this mega popular actor, sort of someone saying he's like the Brad Pitt of Japan or something, yeah. to, to play the main character, which is kind of cool. Because uh, like last, in Yakuza 6, they had uh, Beat Takeshi, who's like a very famous Japanese actor. So I'm, I'm surprised at the pedigree of actors that they can get for these roles. And that's like super cool. Like I, I like that they're able to sort of make these games feel like they have like a much larger budget than they probably do. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's cool. Project Judge, right? Yeah. That's what it's called. Yeah. Okay, Death Stranding. What was it like? Did it have like a presence on the show floor? Uh, at the Sony booth, like there is a huge um, Norman Reedus statue. So that was about it. Classic. And then, like I said, I was actually on a plane back to Tokyo when they announced all that. I mean, back to Tokyo. Sorry, I wish I was going back to Tokyo. Back home uh -huh. when they announced all that stuff. And when, like, Kojima like, had the panel and yeah, all that stuff? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so I was like, oh, Troy Baker's now in this. So this is, <laughs> yeah, this is the announcer, right? Troy Baker is yeah. going to be in the game. He plays, like, this skull-looking villain. Yeah. Another skull yeah. villain for Kojima. Very novel ground. Some <laughs> big, giant dog with a... Gold mask or something. It's a super cool looking yes. weirdo monster. Like opens its face and it's got like a butthole mouth and yep. stuff. It's everything you want from a but cool yeah. Kojima monster. <laughs> but pretty short trailer overall. It's like yeah. a minute long. Yeah, it's the shortest trailer maybe Kojima's ever made. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. I, 
it was weird because, like, I, I mentioned this to you earlier, Hanson. It just felt like Trey Baker was sort of just implanted into that game. Like, for whatever reason, it just feels like he's out of place. Like, his voice acting is just like, I'm Troy Baker doing my voice. Well, it sounds more than that. It sounds like him just doing his revolver ocelot, which I thought was all over the place in 5. Everybody thinks that I'm insane, yeah. but it just, it sounds like such a similar vibe yeah. to his ocelot. It feels five. like he's not reaching, like, in a way that he might, he... <laughs> Don't, it's a minute long trailer. Don't judge Troy well, Baker. true. But, like, it didn't feel like he was, like, you would think that character would have a raspier voice or something. That's, maybe that's just my sort of thing. But, like, it, it also felt like... They, here's just the uh, the straight audio of him recording. It didn't feel like it was. It didn't feel like he was in the place he was in. Sir, I will not have you besmirch Death Stranding's good name to saying her <laughs> audio quality production uh, is right, too low. We, should we make a bet when we think that game is gonna come out? I think it's gonna be cross gen 2020. Yeah. <laughs> I actually have a copy right here. No. Uh, yeah, I 2020 think seems pretty likely. I still have not I've seen that much, and I'm always just like, what the heck is this? Game. It, 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 very, it, it, very despite, despite the number of trailers they've shown, and one of them even had gameplay, I'm still not 100% <laughs> sure what I'm going to be doing in that game. Besides, like, like, maybe delivering things all Babies. the time. But that seems to clash with the idea of, like, they're summoning demon dogs, and there's all this death going on. Ah, like, all right, guys, we'll see you later. i got another delivery I have you to make. You have to out-deliver this demon dog. <laughs> Every yeah. time I watch it, just, like, my mind, I'm just like, what is going on? That's not what he's going for either, which is a problem. No. Uh, but also, like, a he's weird totally announcement. Serious. Yeah. Uh, at that panel, I guess, Kojima, he announced that there's another character in the game, like, the leader of the company that your main character, Mr. Norman Reedus, works for or whatever. And apparently in Japan, he's going to be voiced by the voice actor that played Solid Snake. Mm. And so now it's this huge setup. Like, if he doesn't cast David Hayter in this role, lights out for Hayter here. And I don't think... That he will? No, Seems like there's I enough ill yeah, will there where it's not going to yeah. happen? I doubt it. Yeah, he'll just put Troy Baker there again. Doing a David Hayter impersonation. Yeah. <laughs> Call it good. Yeah, it's also weird how many of the announcements regarding Dust Training are like, we've gotten this celebrity involved. <laughs> right, well, that's right. So yeah. Well, I guess he also announced that, like, yeah, I'm technically playing the game at this point. Like, all the systems have come together. Not saying it's like alpha or anything close to that, but he had some weird way of phrasing it saying, it's not like disparate parts anymore. I'm technically doing reviews with the controller in my hand now. But then he also mentioned that they're still doing a lot of VO recording for like the main line. So it seems like it's not quite there yet, but maybe a little bit more done than some people would expect. Maybe. It's going to yeah. be 2020 or later. Yep, I think That's you're right. All, I'm saying. all right, hey, TGS, good job, Japan. Doing it. Yep. yep. Still having those shows. Very exciting. Uh, do you guys want to move on to emails? Yeah. Let's do it. And welcome back to the Game Former Show. We have good emails. They great emails that people sent in the podcast at GameFormer.com. They sent in thoughts, questions, words of wisdom, anything under the sun that's good and that makes the show more good. Right, oh, Surreal? Some would say better. Some would say better. Kim's still here. Hello. Surreal Vasquez is still here. Hello. And joining the fray, we have Kyle Hilliard. Thank you for having me. Kyle, why do you like doing emails? Because I like, I like answering people's questions. It's fun. I get to talk about things that aren't necessarily related to video games. Yeah? Okay. Hey, I, um, I went back and listened to that clip from a podcast a while ago where you said you were being sarcastic about Shadow of the Tomb Raider? I did as well, yeah. You were not sarcastic. I did not sound sarcastic yeah. at all. <laughs> <laughs> you realize what you sound like when you speak? Yeah. I, I could have I uh, done better. A better yeah. job at being sarcastic. Yeah, which is something that no one's ever critiqued you with. <laughs> I know. But it was so, I, I went back and listened to that and I was like, oh, yeah, I really do sound sincere. I, it sounds like I really am concerned about Laura's yeah. father. So I do fun. not care about that man at all. <laughs> And there was just a big debate in the office about whether or not people should be enjoying Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Kyle seems like you're in the Nay camp, and Leo says it's the second coming of Christ. Uh, yeah, Leo likes it more than I do. I, I'm enjoying the gameplay, but I just have no clue what's going on ever about in terms of the story and why I'm where I'm supposed to be. And it just seems like, it, yeah, we can get into it. But And Leo says, just pay attention, you idiot. Leo says this. Why do I care about the story? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, the I think you guys both have the same reactions. It's just like it matters differently to you that the story yeah. is bad. I just think it should get more credit for how fun it is. The, the stealth and shooting. Yeah, but still. Moving yeah. through the world is fun, and the shooting is good, and the stealth is cool. and it, there's, it has, I'm going to finish it. Like I'm uh -huh. enjoying the gameplay of it, but yeah. the context for why I'm doing what I'm doing it just has left like the building. Hours right, that's what I'm saying. You guys fundamentally agree about this game. It's just like the, the reactions are very different to yeah. the exact same thing. 
Yeah, yeah pretty pieces. much. Cam, any new reflections on Shadow of the Tomb Raider? No, I feel like I said what needed to be said, and uh, right, somebody actually uh, messaged me and was like, you were right, that ending is bananas, so I was wow. happy that someone remembered right. I'm excited to get to that. That's my main motivation. Yeah, I want to play that. The, um, hey, Cam, no spoilers here. Oh, boy. But uh, Dragon Quest XI, super quick. Is it fair to say that that game is divided into, like, two acts? Because I'm pretty deep in what I would consider the second act, like 40-ish hours in. Is there, like, another big chunk? I think there's, like, four acts, honestly. Shut the fuck up. (laughs) Are you serious? You're, like, halfway through the game, man. Like, you're going to hit maybe around the 60-ish hour mark, that first ending. And then you have to, if you I'm fine with hitting an ending. If I can see yeah, credits roll. Yeah, you've got roll, at least 20 hours. Okay, but it's all like... Okay. Are you enjoying yourself? I am. Oh, I'm making I just, you do this. I know, it's I like it. The same thing said about me in Tomb Raider. I like it, I just want it to be like 50 hours long. That's like good, yeah. good RPG. Well, and this it's is, like double that if you want to do everything. I don't know if I'm going to do it. Anyways, podcastgameformer.com, <laughs> a lot of great emails, uh, including Forrest from Lawrence, Kansas, Hero. Hero of the people. He says, hey, on the last podcast, you talked about making a graph showing the review scores of different sports games. I had a free hour last night, so I did exactly that. I took five of the biggest annual sports games, Madden, NBA 2K, FIFA, The Show, and NHL, and put in review scores for each series. For games that came out for multiple systems, I tried to use the, I tried to use the next-gen review. Now some data. Uh, Ronnie right, says, the average score of each series ranked from lowest to highest. Do we want to take a guess as to which is the highest average score for which series? Okay. NBA 2K. Well, hold on. The highest score, highest. like just the number. Yeah, like right? scored the best, overall, right? Overall best score. Individual? Which series has averaged oh, the highest uh, score? Which series? Yes. Okay, I'm with Sorry. Kim. NBA 2K. Uh, NBA yeah. 2K. Yeah. NBA 2K at an 8.85. Wow. Next up is Madden with an average 8.5. This is since, I looked up his, his math here, uh, since 99. He's oh, cool. Stuff, right? uh, and it'll be the show, 8.38. FIFA, 8.382. NHL 8.175. I would have predicted NHL would have been at the bottom. Isn't that crazy? They're Wait, all is live not on there? NBA it's live. not. No, he's okay. Because that would have been the lowest. We right? we don't talk about okay. NBA live. Don't. How oh, oh, dare you? Yeah, I'm sorry. On this podcast, I'm so sorry. Get it out. Get it out. Get it out. Get it out. Get out of here, live. <laughs> grab, grab that pen and write down the timestamp. I'm freaking out. Uh, the lowest score is uh, 5.5. For I will give somebody everything in my wallet if they can guess what game this is. Lowest score, 5.5. Oh. Okay. Um, it, so we have to guess franchise and year? <laughs> yes. Oh, God. Uh, Madden 06. Uh, the lowest score of those series? Yes. NHL uh, 2004. No. Oh, you can You gotta say it. So I'm the only know. person who would actually have I know, <laughs> and I'm just like, I don't, I never, I don't remember what entry was really bad. Five. Four. I agree to you. Correct answer, NHL 15. NHL 15. Uh, 5.5. Oh, I should know that. I, I know. That. I was waiting for you. <laughs> I know. Oh Highest score is Madden 2001 slash 2002. 9.75. Good guy. Wow. Anyways, it's a fun graph. Uh, That's I, cool. In the video version, you can see it. I'll, I'll pop it on the screen there. Uh, thank you so much for doing the math there, Lawrence. I really appreciate that. Yeah, we're not good at math, so. Yeah. Kim, do you want to read this email? Uh, it's just so I can write down a timestamp, but you're on top of it. Based on your time. Wait, what? (laughs) Here we go. Here we go. Hello, Game Informer crew. Red Dead Redemption 2 is my most anticipated game this year. However, I started to get a little concerned after going through all the hands-on responses recently released by the games media. Everyone is very high on the gameplay, but what has me concerned are the myriad of resources and relationships that you will now have to manage. Based on the coverage, I have seen there are, na- there are new now-, now systems for layering your choices, cleaning your guns, eating regularly, bathing, shaving, and maintaining a good relationship with your horse, among others. You even have to watch your weight now. That's, that's horrible, In by the way. games? Whew, that was insane, right? I know. As someone who will be welcoming a newborn into my family oh. roughly a month after launch, See ya. the idea of a game where I need to spend 20 to 30 minutes on my, maintaining my character before I head off on a mission is off-putting. Based on your time with the game, how intrusive are these mechanics, and how much do you, are you at a detriment if you ignore them for a while in order to get to the next beat in the story? 
Just to cut comments hang off, hang were myriad. <laughs> <laughs> I know you guys are going to comment on that. So oh, mess, I know, we know. Also, right, to cut comments off, it's Jonathan R. from Falls Church, Virginia. Let's get that in there. Uh, I asked Jeff Cork about this real quick. He said it's not a big deal, but it's not bad. Okay. Uh, he said it's like the equivalent of eating in San Andreas. It's like every couple hours you do something super quick. Okay. Uh, if you want to. So, all right, and he said he, he's having a newborn af- a month after it, it releases? That sounds right. Okay. One thing, one thing that no one tells you is that uh, about, you know, people tell you lots of things about having kids, and yeah. they're totally right, but one thing a lot of people don't tell you is that infants are very boring, and they just sit there. So right. it's actually not a bad time to play some mature rated games. <laughs> Wow. Well, really he better cool. hope that he has a good baby. That's it. That's a good point. Yes. Uh, Make sure, oh, t- yes, have a, a good, well-behaved yeah. infant. That's, yeah. a, right. that's a really yeah. good tip. No matter what. And if you don't, you can trade him back for the first two months. Yeah. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. So don't, don't take advantage don't of that. Don't get a screamer. But, right. Yeah. yeah. If your baby screams or cries once, bring that sucker back. <laughs> <laughs> His baby's defective. They're not supposed know. to do that. Yeah. Bring it back to your wife. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, yeah, I don't think I'm really sorry to do this. Could you just... Swap this one out. It's not. It's not. Gotta find out what happens to Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> Are you guys into those sim aspects of Red Dead Two? Like the idea of cleaning your weapons and all that stuff. Like that maintenance level. No, but I am yeah. interested to see how it's integrated in the game. <laughs> like if it, if it is kind of natural and, and maybe it won't maybe it won't be distracting or boring or annoying. But like, yeah. but on paper, like that that doesn't isn't particularly. Exciting. Yeah, that's that's like a to me it feels like a net minus in terms of like yeah. having to do all this maintenance but from what I've heard from Corku who's really the, I think the only one who's played the game here yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it feels like the camp stuff was sort of my big concern of how much you're going to have to sort of micromanage it and he, from what he told me it's more or less like you can ignore it if you want it's just a nice bonus if you okay. have that well maintained and I'm hoping that's the case for a lot of this stuff um, it's just a matter of like if there's all these little aspects you have to maintain and they're all kind of like marginal are they going to add up to something where you know you spend x percent of the game sort of just like with upkeep yeah um but um yeah it seems like it'll it, it looks like it might be fairly relatively minor and dead action jones writes in is talking about like you know the classic question of hey in red dead one how come they never mention this arthur morgan guy odds arthur morgan dies a horrific death at the end of red dead 2 and actually he points out that it's interesting he points out that it, maybe it's going to be structured like Red Dead 1, where then you play as John at the very end of Red Dead 2. Oh. What are the odds? Uh, death, pretty high. We're talking 95? Yeah. yeah. Playing as John, though, I don't think they would repeat that trick for twice. I don't know. They might. Yeah, they've gone back to Liberty City how many times now? I mean, Rockstar loves going repeating some tricks. Yeah, but like story beats, though? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Everybody's looking forward to him in this one, so... <laughs> You know, I th- you did Give make... Give the fans what they want. Yeah, yeah, there's that. But I was trying to think, in GTA 4 and 5, they both of those games ended with the choices about who lives and who dies, right? Of Between characters that you come to know the course of the entire game. Sure. So maybe they do repeat themselves when it comes to narrative little maybe. tricks like that. What are the odds there's a scene at the end of Red Dead 2 where it's like a burial scene? Spoilers for Red Dead 1, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everybody. And then, and then everybody's everybody's fine in the fight. title, dude. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's in there. <laughs> but what are, what are the odds? There's like a burial scene at the end of Red Dead 2, and then they all like look at each other and they're like, we'll never speak of him. <laughs> Arthur Morgan's name will be stripped from the record streamer. Something like that. We'll never relive this undead nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Part 2. Part 2. Uh, Joe from Flemington, Pennsylvania says, hello, crew. Has there ever been a game series that you never particularly liked, but then an entry came out and you loved it? For me, it's infamous. I didn't like the first two. I thought they controlled poorly and the stories were never that interesting. However, I loved Second Son when it came out. I still think it's one of the best action games ever made. Oh, good God. Uh, do you guys know what he's talking about? Is there anything that fits for you guys for a series you never liked and then one just blew you away? Yeah, Monster Hunter World. I could oh, yeah. never get into that series. Um, and everyone was like, no, you'd love it. And I think it was too. I didn't like playing on a handheld and it like, cramped my hands. But uh, playing this one, I've gone over 100 hours in that game. Probably close like now to 150. And um, I did not expect to like it as much as I did. Uh, and it's probably one of my top games that I've played this year. What's your prediction? Where's it going to land? On the personal top ten? Yeah. I don't know, because there's some games that have not come out yet that are a pretty big deal. Red Dead's going to be the first four slots, I think. <laughs> I, th- I think I haven't tallied up my list or really thought about it too much at all, but I feel confident Monster Hunter's going to be number ten. 
No matter what, number 10 is going to be Monster Hunter World. It's borderline. Yeah, mine yeah. will be in the top five. It'll be in there. Okay. Um, Kyle, what do you think? There, oh, like a... Yeah. So, I, I dabbled with a bunch of, like, Castlevanias, like, pre... The pre-Symphony of Mac Castlevania. The freaks. really didn't like them. Yeah. And then I, I tried Harmony of Distance on the Game Boy Advance, and I really it didn't do anything for me. And then I got my uh, wisdom teeth taken out, and I was like, so I had to like, I was like, I'm in bed, like right after surgery, I'm gonna just focus on a game and get through it. I'm gonna and ignore my baby. This was like when I was in college, <laughs> your first baby. <laughs> uh, and I played Symphony of the Night, and that, and like, it took me like a, a long time to really get into it. But once I crossed that line, I like went back and played all those Castlevanias I missed, and I like really fell in love with the series from that point moving forward. Yeah. So Symphony of the Night, kind of in a weird way, like. I I, d I tried a bunch and it didn't do anything for me until I gave Symphony of the Night a real shot and then I fell in love with all those games. Wow, that's weird. Yeah. It's like it's boring, but like God of War, I would say I actively dislike the God of War series. And now there's no universe where it's not my number one game of the year. Yeah, it's impossible. Just impossible. Over Red Dead. <laughs> not having touched it once. Yes, I would oh say it's impossible. Gosh. No, no, Red Dead I'm sure is gonna blow me away, but uh, I'd still be shocked. I think for me it was probably Uncharted. Uh, oh. I think four is probably the one where I was like, this is pretty good, and like the rest of them were fine to good for me. But I think four was like the one where I was like, okay, this is I I, I can understand why people would like Uncharted. And there's still definitely that crowd out there that's like, it's no Uncharted two, but playing those back to back, I mean, Uncharted four is just so much better, right, everybody? Nostalgia. I'm sorry, but this, yeah. is, this is a safe space for you. Okay, thank you, <laughs> thank you. It's just us, right? Um, Dan, friend from Greenwood, Indiana, says, What video games do you regret putting long hours into or beating? Mine would have to be Fantastic Four, Rise of the Silver Surfer, and <laughs> Superman Returns on the 360. Stop playing bad superhero oh, games, Dan. I didn't even consider licensed games. because I put Yeah, a basically lot of... every licensed game, Yeah, right? there's that Thor game on 360 that I played and beat. Yeah. Uh, I was actually, this one might be controversial for this table, but I, I don't look fondly back on my time with Really? I played it through and beat it, and I was like, I don't know if I really got anything from that. I, I, I didn't love it. It was just like, and I, there were moments where I was like, why am I still playing this? That's but I, shocking. I saw it to the end, and I don't think it'll even be in my top ten. We'll see. Speaking of top ten. I would, well, with that kind of attitude, I'd be surprised yeah, if it yeah, wasn't yeah, your yeah, top ten. Yeah. That's, that's shocking, That's, man. Like, that's kind of game. a weird one. But yeah. yeah. And uh, every licensed game, obviously. Every licensed game, including... Except for Spider-Man 2. I mean, this year, I so regret so, so, so regret playing that story mode in Dragon Ball Fighters. <laughs> That's just the <laughs> biggest waste of time. It's worth, like, playing the beginning of it just to see, like, that dynamic, and I think the writing's kind of fun. They make fun of Yantra enough in there and stuff, but, like, doing the last two big campaign chunks of that is so stupid. Yeah, it's it's weird how they ramp up the difficulty in, like, the last two just to say they have a curve, but it's, yeah. it's super arbitrary, and it's, like, the only time I had to start thinking at all about that story mode. Yes, for yeah, sure. So it's kind of a bummer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I feel like Arkham Knight is probably mine. What? I spent. I, I should have just bar like barreled through the, the story mode. Yeah. Like I regret most of the time I spent doing side stuff in that game. All right. Yeah, all side stuff is regrettable. I Do think. you hate Riddler trophies too? Uh, I like them in uh, Asylum. Oh, I feel like they just, they just went overboard in, in City Night. Okay. I love Riddler trophies. <laughs> it's okay, guys. We can have different opinions. <laughs> No, we need to be on the same page! <laughs> Alright, sorry. Boy from Shockley, Minnesota says, Hello, GI crew. A few months back, Nintendo started selling a Switch without a dock in Japan, presumably for families that primarily play undocked. With the release of Nintendo Online, with the addition of online saving, could you see them releasing a cheaper Switch with no screen? That's just always hooked up to a TV. Keep in mind, I'm not asking if you think this is a good idea or even if it's something you or customers would want. The question is Nintendo, and would they ever do it? I don't see how you do that though. Like, no, it's, no way. That's insane. The main, the main selling point of that system is how portable it is. Like that is way over, you know, making it just a home console. I agree, but do you remember the Nintendo's the company that made the 2DS and the 2DS XL? Yeah, but that didn't it's hundred percent unpredictable at all times. So they'd have to call it something else other than the Switch. Indeed, like, they would, like and the they static. would use everybody. Yeah, the you know, I was about to argue with you with the 2DS and say that that doesn't eliminate the main selling point yeah. of that system. Yes, it did. It still has two screens, <laughs> but it. You're right. It did remove the stereo. But that also wasn't a popular thing. People didn't. The stereoscopic element of 3DS ended up being like a, a, right. a secondary thing where this being able to play the Switch remotely, I think is more important than even being able to play it at home. What percentage of people do you think, for total hours of Switch play, what's the breakdown for docked versus undocked, do you think? 70-30. 70, 
70% undocked, 30% docked. I might say 70 docked. Really? I bet more people play it just sitting in front of the couch than you think on their TV. I'd say it's probably split 50-50, honestly. Okay. Wait, are we... Wh- I'm saying that the portable is higher. I know. So that's the same. I'm saying the opposite. <laughs> okay, I was just making sure, because you said sitting on the couch. I thought you meant, like, sitting on the couch playing it. No, docked. sitting on the couch in front of the TV, I think. Playing it docked. Yeah. Okay. Serial, what's your scientific number? Uh, I would say probably 60-40 portable. Wow. Even, right. even though I primarily, I like 95% of my time with the bitches spent doc. Right. See? I think that's... doc, too. Okay, that's what I was going to ask yeah. on the table, because mine is like, mine's 95% not doc. I, right. I play portable more. You have right. a child, though, that plays That's true. You're taking care of your child. Anyway, everything. <laughs> <laughs> to voice question here, the odds, I think, of Nintendo doing that are 35%. <sighs> not about I'd say like 10. Like, I just don't know, like, I guess they could cut the corner of a screen, right? But like... I don't know that they go through the effort of making an R&D, like, like I don't even know how that looks. And, yeah, Look, I, don't I get know. it. It's a bad idea, but it's possible. Uh, Joe from Lakeville, very simple question. Uh, what Pokemon are you? What Pokemon? Kyle, what Pokemon are you? <sighs> Man, I don't know. That's a hard question. There's the, the temptation is to be like, I'm Snorlax. I'm the lazy one. Right? Dude, but I don't. Get between me and my bed. I don't. I walk around at home a lot. I don't, uh-huh. I don't really sit around very much. Uh-huh. <laughs> you don't sleep. So, uh-huh. Who hours Pokemon <laughs> walks a lot? <laughs> and is closest to a normal human. Maybe Mr. Mime? Yeah, <laughs> you actually look a suspicious amount like Mr. Mime now that I think of it. Thank you. This is creepy. <laughs> uh, my middle name's Meryl, so I'll go with I want Meryl. Hear, I want everyone else's answers. Don't single me out. Which Pokemon are you guys? Um, Kim, I'm nervously try- looking no, at her hand. I'm trying not to call myself a chunker here, because that's not what I'm doing, <laughs> but I look like Jigglypuff. You think so? You think so. Jigglypuff. Wigglytuff, I might make, make an exception for, yeah, but you can, you can I don't know, know like, Kim. a beautiful woman with flowing locks like your own, I mean, it's kind of Jinx-esque, I guess, <laughs> like early versions of Jinx. No, no, like recent. You're not problematic, though. No, I fun. think, like, <laughs> out of the gate, Jinx, <laughs> you look spot on. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, can I just be magnetized? Yep, you got it. Uh, <laughs> Mr. H, right there. Anson, says, who are you? Oh, uh, I said Meryl. Oh, that's you my name. Meryl. Uh, Mr. Hardy of Seattle writes, just finished both Resident Evil Revelations games. Strange thing to do in 2018, but <laughs> hey, I, second, those are good. I played two, like, uh, a couple months ago. What the hell is everyone doing? That game is Switch. good. I yeah, that game. those are great. When they announced it, I said, I'm going to play Revelations 2, and Hanson, you said, no, you're not. And uh, I did, just to spite like, you. You proved me wrong. Uh, spite playthrough. Oh, uh, by the way, speaking of games, I regret playing. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, man. No, it was fine. It was fine. It was fine. It's fine. Uh, it's fine. Uh, I enjoyed both, but there was an unfortunate theme in both Revelations games. Towards the end of Resident Evil Revelations, a side character was shot and urgently needed a medical kit. Playing as a lethal refrigerator with limbs, Chris Redfield, I was required to go all the way across the sinking ship to get it. The wicked twist? I passed two or three med kits along the way, which I couldn't pick up since my medical kit inventory was full. So I guess Chris just couldn't stand to part with one of his beloved first aid kits? In Revelations 2, a character is required to move what looked to be a huge crab pot looking thing around to reach upper levels. However, avuncular very bags off because his bad back so it's up to a little girl named Natalia to lug this metal device clearly several times her weight around while Barry happily trots ahead. Trots ahead. I know video games have their own brand of logic uh, but it just seems that many if not all video game protagonists, alleged heroes, engage in a whole lot of behavior which would be which would never fly in real life. Hey son, I've seen you broken your arm. Let me walk over to the house to pick up a splint. Along the way I'll search every room in the house just in case there are any ammunition, ammunition lying around. Uh... Were these two games particularly terrible in this respect? If you think of other examples of heroic protagonists acting well, kind of dickish. I mean, you could probably do it for most of them. Honestly. I think every video game. Yeah. Yeah. Every right. video game protagonist has to break the rules. Even like I was thinking of, you know, the most focused video game story, where it's like I guess it never really shatters it. But even like Shadow of the Colossus. He shouldn't be focusing on those lizards for so long. Yeah. Like, that's a, yeah, even yeah. a dick move. It's going to make me stronger yeah. if I kill First of all, lizard. torturing small animals. Second of all, like, mm-hmm. licking up their tails or whatever. And then third of all, you got stuff to do, man. This is the part where he's killing a bunch of colossi. He's really... Oh, yeah, that him. part, too. Yeah. yeah. He okay. shouldn't have done that at all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this actually, uh, with, um, uh, because I played Tomb Raider and then also Uncharted as well, is that there's so many p- points in all those games where, like, you show up somewhere and they're like, man, there's this mystery that we have not been able to solve for hundreds of years. And I live here and I'm trying to figure it out. There's uh-huh. some treasure here. And then like these 
like Nathan Drake or Laura just show up and they're like they kind of just look around a little bit and they're like all right, I got it. I got it. I figured it out. I'll figure out who killed JFK. That's <laughs> gonna be so frustrating for those people yeah. that have like made their lives trying to figure out. The I would definitely <laughs> want the version of where someone does that and it's like, wait, I don't, I can't understand this. It's like, yeah, dude, we've been trying to figure it out for like a hundred years. You're not gonna be, this, you're not special. You're not gonna suddenly figure this yeah. out. My favorite is when you arrive somewhere and it's like you need like either a screwdriver, or a hammer. Or doorknob whatever yeah, to get yeah. through and it is magically right around if yeah. you just look around video games are bullshit no, no. Yeah, this is all fantasy <laughs> oh, I also um, like when I go off to the side um, on RPGs because I have to pick up every chest and they're like come on let's go and like really like urgent yeah. times and you hear the like music starting to go because you're going to go into a big scene and I'm like nope I got to go over here and get this chest Really quick. Hold on, let's, let's bring the bring the sound, bring the music down. Stop the swelling. I gotta go explore for like. 50. Also, the number of times you basically can just walk around and, and you know run in people's houses uninvited yeah. in games. Oh yeah, like, yeah. Link is such a <laughs> yeah. It's, it's work. Nate in Brandon, Missouri says hello, Penny Crew. Hope this email finds everyone well. Uh, so my wife has a young cousin who's on the spectrum, has had varying highs and lows with it at different times in his life. No matter what, though, he has always looked to video games, and more specifically, videos of video games on YouTube as a sort of comfort. This is how I personally am able to converse with him, discussing our mutual love of games. He always gets obsessed with a game for or two for a while, and then moves on. Except for Undertale. He hasn't moved on since he found it shortly after it came out, and he has watched full playthroughs countless times, and when he isn't doing that, he is endlessly listening to the soundtrack. Good soundtrack. Uh, now that the game is out on Switch, I picked it up and started playing, except I can't really enjoy the game for what it is, because I'm constantly analyzing every word and every screen to try to find out what speaks to my relative. Like, I'm trying to find the common denominator between the two. Has anyone on the panel ever played through a game that a friend or family member loves just to gain insight on that person's personality? Thanks for the great show. Logan from Louisville. P.S. I'm only an hour or two into Undertale. Does this game get any better? Because, oh boy. <laughs> No, that's about it. Uh, the, end, the ending's interesting. Dan but, Tack is yeah. be mad if he hears that. Yeah. Can I just high five his relatives? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's possible. Yeah. You can do it into the mic if you want. Yeah. God, just pretend you're okay. Does it? Did it pick up? Yeah. We high fived yeah. him. Yeah, and you guys just didn't disappear either. <laughs> that's weird. That's weird. What the um, we can do it. Yeah, we can turn it on. Okay, so playing a game to understand someone's personality. I don't have time to do that. <laughs> I just, I just don't feel <laughs> so like selfish. No, yeah. <laughs> just like I'm not gonna play this game yeah, just so I, I can. Understand this person. I don't know. Okay, what about understand anyone? Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Well, I'm not, I'm not gonna do it through the medium of a game. I don't know. Well, uh, when you met your cool game and wife, Kyle, did you like play all of her favorite games to better understand her or anything? Uh, no. <laughs> we had a lot of the same favorite games, like Zelda and stuff. Indigo Prophecy. Indigo Prophecy. Isn't she super into? No, she's never played it. I played Indigo Prophecy. I thought you said she was really into Quantic Dream. She is, starting with Heavy Rain. Uh, oh. Wait, what was, was it Indigo Prophecy, then Heavy Rain? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it was starting with Heavy Rain. Oh, okay. yeah. Uh, I, I will say, it's not a specific person, but I played Dark Souls, not specifically to like try and figure out everyone else's headspace. Right. For why, why is this game such a big hit? Like, what, what is it about this game? Because like, I had tried it a couple times, and it didn't like do anything yeah. for me. But then I think Dark Souls 2, I was like, I'm going to play this all the way to the end. I'm going to beat this just to un to, just to understand it and what it is. Do you get it now? Do you understand everything? Uh, I understand it like 30% more, I think. But I'm still definitely not in full understanding mode. Yeah, I don't think so. Perfect. I played the new Dooms to try and understand Mad Birds just for once in my life. That <laughs> enigma, that mystery wrapped in enigma order. Yeah. I don't get it. <laughs> uh, Kip from Los Angeles says, hey, everyone, big fan of the show. Thank you. And of the magazine. Oh, oh. magazine, everybody. I hear a lot of you guys uh, talk about games that you love on console and PC, but not a lot about your favorite mobile games. Do you guys have any favorites? And if you do, what are they? Uh, I I think I, I don't play too many uh, mobile games now, but I think my two favorites would probably be Cut the Rope, like that whole series. I think is super good, mm. and uh, Groove Coaster before they kind of oh, yeah. went all microtransaction with it, like the original release. Okay, interesting. Yeah, because uh, it, it was a really cool rhythm game. You can play with one hand, and they had a lot of ways to like keep you playing and, and sort of build on the song. It's your second hand. You're just, like pumping your fist in the air. <laughs> to the music. Hell yeah, yeah. Griff Coaster. I turns out I don't really want any more mobile games beyond Tetris and Bejeweled Blitz. That is yeah. just nonstop on any sort of flight. If you have any downtime, it's just Tetris and Bejeweled Blitz. That's all you need. I'm addicted to this game from. Um 
Adult Swim called Monsters Ate My Condo. Oh, and yeah. And it's like match three of the same colors and the, you know, the building. You're stacking them all up and you don't want them to fall over. Um, that was like the most, the one I can think of that I got the most into just because I just constantly load it up because it's easy to play and put down. And Is it free to play? Or? Yeah. But like a nice free to play game? Yeah, no, it's a nice okay. free to play. Like, I haven't dumped any money into it and I've played it a lot. I probably should yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, I will honestly go download that immediately after this because I haven't played that. Yeah, yeah it's fun. Uh, you must build a boat, I think, for me. Oh, yeah, another. And Pokemon Go. I still play so much Pokemon That's Go. shocking. What yeah. is the silly saga that happened? They, like, released a new Pokemon into Pokemon Go, which should seem like a big deal, but it just looks like a turd. Yeah, it looks <laughs> like a Klefki cousin or something. Yeah, but not a fun version of it. Yeah. The Hex Nut Pokemon. Hex Nut Pokemon. What's its name? I, I don't know. Man. Is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah, they, they didn't say what the real name is. Uh, okay. Yeah, because it was released sort of, uh, like, without any fanfare. It was just kind of started showing up, and if you caught it, it turned into a ditto. And then for a whole weekend, people were like, what is this Pokemon? And then they kind of announced this thing. Like, hey, it's this new Pokemon that we promised was going to come out around the time of Let's Go. And then there's, there's a rumor that it was a mistake, that it wasn't supposed to have launched that way. Knowing Niantic, I'll say the odds are very high. Yeah. yeah. This Pokemon was a mistake. But, uh, <laughs> but I like I liked, I liked how they did it, even if it was a mistake. I like the idea of just like... Of a poop? A, of, no, <laughs> like, of, a, of a new Pokemon just suddenly existing in the world and being like, what is that yeah. thing? I've never yeah. seen that before. Like, I like that. I thought right. that was cool. It's kind of weird that it turns into a Ditto because it literally just looks like a silver Ditto with a hex nut on top yeah. of it. <laughs> yeah. But the eyes are in the hex nut part. Well, yeah. the eye. Very cool. Yeah. Always fun. Always fun. You should get back into that. We can trade now. <sighs> I... I've turned so hard on that game. I want to love it, but it bumps me out how I hard I realize the core it. of it is the point of Pokemon is to establish a bond with your Pokemon. And the entire framework of Pokemon Go, it is built on the function, gameplay-wise, of making Pokemon basically irrelevant and interchangeable. It's Collecting just, I'm going to catch another 6,000, whatever. I'm going to grind them for experience, whatever. It's just, I feel no sure. bond for them. And that's the point of the entire series. So all that time I spent in Amsterdam walking around with you, <laughs> freaking Pokemon no. Go. Oh, ironically, and uh, that entire time I only wanted Mr. Mime. That yeah. was the big struggle because I wanted to be closer to Kyle. Because he looks <laughs> shocking. If you get like back Mr. into the Mime. game, I got Mr. Mime that I can give you that I caught right. in London. Wait, yeah. does the M in your middle name stand for Mime? <laughs> <laughs> First name is Mr. Kyle, Mr. Mime Hillier. <laughs> Uh, Sean Pace writes in, uh, Dear Game Informer Podcast, thank you for your in-depth coverage on Nintendo's groundbreaking new character Toadette on last week's podcast. That's what we're here for. It clearly overshadowed all other topics as the new power-up allows to make any to make any character a Peach variant. The internet wasted no time as a Bowsette, a Bowser, now occupies thousands of fan-generated artwork and became a trending topic on Japanese Twitter. The character has rapidly become so popular, fans are hoping to see Nintendo adopt her as canon in addition to the Mushroom Kingdom. No chance. Yeah, they're not doing that. What do you guys make of fan-generated characters, and, and Bowsette in particular here? Uh, people are also drawing lines, by the way, of a Nintendo stock going up. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about that. But but it was like a weird 2% jump in their stock price yeah. around that time. What is... How does this blow it's up just, in such a way? literally just fan art. Do we need to explain it? Because I was... I, I actually met... It's funny. I posted last night in our Slack channel that I was like... Can someone explain Bowsette to me? Because like I don't want to Google this. Like this just seems like a dangerous thing to Google. And yeah. look, Mr. Know Your Meme dot com over okay. here okay. Uh, showed me the original comic that kicked it all off. The M in my middle name stands for meme. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but what is the original comic? It, it's it's a guy that says uh, you know the 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 crown mushroom is some spicy new Mario lore, and it's the ending of Mario Odyssey, which you know spoilers is, uh -huh. is like. Peach sort of rejecting Mario and Bowser. Sure. Uh, and then so Bowser and uh, Mario are sort of like both looking sad, and then Bowser pulls out the, 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 the crown, which was thrown off in, in the Peachette trailer, and then he uses it on himself and turns into Bowsette, which is like a Lady Bowser. And it turns that out like Peach. Lady Bowser, like a Bowser that every weirdo on the internet wants to <laughs> F, like that is a recipe for popularity, apparently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then it like, blows up from But that. I've never, like, I, she's effectively a new character that fans created that I, I feel like. I can't think of the last time a fan created character became this popular. Yeah, like it, it that that original tweet has like eighty thousand retweets or something. What? It's insane. And yeah, the guy, like the guy who, who posted it, was just like, <laughs> I have no idea where this came from. I'm kind of scared of how popular this is. Yeah. And everyone's like, oh, I gotta make the cosplay for. I just yeah. saw this image where they put that <laughs> into Super Mario Thousand Your Door, and the art like looks fantastic. It looks exactly like Thousand Your Door. 
she says, we're talking to Mario, and she says, straight people don't exist, Mario. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that is it's such a weird thing. Also, to, uh, worth pointing out that, I guess, like, people pointed out that, like, because Peachette sort of is Toadette and Peach, it should be Peach Sir, or, like, some sort of <laughs> some sort of combination of... Do you want to correct the internet? Uh, yeah, once right. again, guys. Uh, direct, oh. direct to camera, uh, just uh, really... It's... it's it's pizza. It's pizza. Pizza. <laughs> or or, or bouch. I don't know. Bouch. <laughs> bouch. Uh, uh, I, I like it. It's fun. Yeah. I like as long so as it's like executed in a funny way. I am. I, uh, I am. They have cool. to have discussed it. They're not going to use uh, Bowser in any way. But there has to have been a conversation in Nintendo Japan. Like someone. What the yeah, hell someone is Someone peeked into an executive office. Did that thing where they don't go all the way in. They'd be like, Hey, have you seen this Bowser stuff? I just want to make sure that you watch, see what's going there's, on. And they're like, Yeah, I saw it. There's right, a cool. shattered on the wall. <laughs> <next> <laughs> <to> <laughs> A 15 minute meeting happened right outside Miyamoto's office and it's like, do we show him? Like, do, <laughs> do we show him? And he's just like taking apart a vacuum inside. Or they like, walk or, in and he just has like, he's like, like, oh, I'm, I'm still innocent, guys. And he's like, Mr. Miyamoto, we have something to show you that's going to destroy you. <laughs> this is cute. Eyes well up with Don't break my innocence, but go on. <laughs> <laughs> Miyamoto aged 35 They're years. They're doing that what? Day. <laughs> Uh, okay, Spencer Kordecki says, uh, hey, everybody, well, Amiibo have uses... <laughs> <laughs> well, Amiibo have uses in plenty of games. A lot of people, including myself, bought them for display. Has there ever been anything else that has a purpose you never intended to utilize that you bought only for display? Okay. I bought the, uh, vinyl soundtrack to Sunset Riders. Because it looks cool, and the album itself is like see-through, and there's like fake bullet holes in it and stuff. But I don't even have a record player. <laughs> I just bought it because I really wanted the Sunset Rider soundtrack. Yeah, I did uh, the same thing with the Undertale soundtrack, uh, which is funny because it comes with it's like this big, uh, you know, vinyl record, but it also comes with like this tiny, tinier record that's just like the I think it's just the dog song from from Undertale, oh, okay. and it's like a picture of the dog, which is kind of cute. But like, yeah, I have no intention of ever actually using that record right. uh, as a record. Right, right, right. I mean, pretty much every special edition of a game that I bought that it comes with some kind of statue or figure. Like, I finally have stopped doing that Good. for a long time. I haven't bought But I remember Arkham Asylum came with, like, a Batarang on a stand. I want like, to put that on a shelf. People yeah. think I'm cool. People <laughs> think I'm cool. And, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've gotten over that now. I don't really feel the need to have to buy that. And game. you chucked your Batarang out a window. I think I sold it on you. And it never came back to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it didn't fly very well because I had a stand on the bottom. Yeah, that's yeah. your first mistake. Yeah. <laughs> Kim, do you actually wear all that diva clothing you buy, or yeah, you just I have do. like a creepy display in your house, or it's oh, just a bunch a of mannequins? Too, but, okay. Um, yeah, I wear it all. Cool. Hey, yeah, clothing's different. Clothing's yeah. not like yeah. well, all, all clothing is just putting on display, I guess yeah. technically, right? Well, well I I bought yeah. a kimono from Japan just because, and I know I'm never gonna wear it. <laughs> <laughs> it's cute. Halloween's coming up. I know that's what everyone tells, but that, that's kind of disrespectful to wear that for Halloween. Yeah, well, Halloween uh, costume. Kimono. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, I. Th- well, well, what if it's like Bowsette wearing a kimono? <laughs> well, I bought it just for, I guess, just to look at. I, I don't know. Clothes are cool. There's a in that movie, the house with a clock in its wall. Yeah. There's a, he's wearing a kimono, and everyone's like, "Why are you wearing a robe?" And he goes, "It's a kimono. It's a running gag. It's very funny." At Jack Black, laugh right. Uh, <laughs> Josh Rogers from Athens, Georgia says, "Hey, Ben and crew, I thought this would be a fun game." Thank you, Josh. He says, I was searching through my email and found all these old GI newsletters y'all sent out. I scrolled back to the oldest one I have and found a list of the week's top ten must-read stories for Game Informer. As a fun challenge, I was wondering if based on this list, you could guess the week or month of this oh, newsletter. Fine. We'll see. I, I actually, uh, behind the scenes, I put this together every week. Oh, interesting. All right. Oh, I don't know, you're if gonna know I don't know. Like, that, that might give me a leg up or not. You didn't know. take the job over from someone else. This was like your... Uh, Jeff, I'm headed first. And then he didn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> no, I do it. <laughs> okay, how do you feel about it? <laughs> Fine. Uh, they, the, the web people have made it very easy for me. Okay. okay. Nice. Thank you, web people. Also, okay, these are the main news stories at the top of this newsletter. Okay. Dissecting Survival Horror, colon, What Makes the Genre Special by Kimberly Wallace. And Crafting the Story of Army of Two, colon, The Devil's Cartel by Ben Hansen. Wow. This is a video. This week's okay. top ten must-read stories... Debating the bros and cons of the Army of Two series. That's a good headline. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for your time. Glad you appreciate that one. Blog hurting. Uh, eight games that changed mid-development. Reeves play, the official trailer. 
Transformers yeah. Fall of Cybertron review, top 43 video game redheads. That's I wrote that. Kyle yeah, totally that's a joke. That. Are you one of them? It's very funny. Okay. A lot what of good was, Jeff Cork jokes in there. What's the funniest thing in there? Do you have any, like, this is a Jeff Cork joke. He said that I should put Majora's Mask Moon on there, <laughs> and then just imply that if you were able to look at the back of its head, it would have a little red ponytail. <laughs> it's perfect. Oh, and Master Chief was on that list, too, which people get very upset about. <laughs> that's a funny feature. I Over like my dead body. Yeah. All right, what, what month? What year? Uh, okay. I'm going to guess October 2013. Interesting guess. Mm. October 2014. Interesting guess. I'm going to say uh, I'm going to say. September 2012. August 25th, 2012. Oh, oh, there we go. Thank you. Give me for my history. Okay, last one, real quick. Ready? Alec from Situate, Massachusetts says, Hello, everybody. I have a game for you. Come to a consensus on which of the games released in the same year was more influential. Not the better game, just which had a better effect on future games. Mm, so every top 50 and or uh, 100 list we ever do. Mm hmm. Okay, bigger effect on future games. games. Okay. Which is more influential? There we go. Be tough, but we have to fly. Uncharted 2 versus Arkham Asylum. Arkham Asylum. You think of like two later? I think it's Uncharted 2. I think it might be Uncharted 2. That was such a gap from that first game. And just in terms of like that piece design, term like yeah, that 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 didn't that that did not did not create any new. Gameplay mechanics. It was still a third-person cover shooter. Arkham Just Asylum needed, created like a whole new genre. I think in terms of like studios saying we want a set piece moment, let's make an Uncharted style moment. I think that has a bigger impact. I think there's like more than people that saying like full-on ripped off Arkham Asylum. Like yeah, Shadow like of five. Mordor. No, you guys are wrong. Five games are ripped wrong. off. Kim, I'm with you. Yeah. Let's yeah. go to the grave. Let's I drive the oh, yeah. If you want to set pieces, Call of Duty established that sort of mold of like not yeah. third person. Well, not the way Uncharted did. Yeah, it's different. All right. And uh, let's not back that up anymore. <laughs> <laughs> 2011, Skyrim versus Dark Souls. Dark Souls. Ooh. Skyrim. Skyrim. Dark Souls. Why are we agreeing on everything? I know. This is weird. Skyrim's great, but I, I just don't think it 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 did it did stuff really well that had already been done before. But where Dark you Souls mean like was, Demon Souls? And Dark oh, Souls? that's a good point. But Dark Souls was the one that kind of like that's the true starting line for that sort of yeah. Dark, Dark Souls. Okay. Okay. away those, that that series would not have. Okay. Like sure. That. All right. Same for the night. Thomas so Seven. Get out of here with that, Alec. Yeah. Resident Evil 4 or San Andreas? Resident Evil 4. 4. San Andreas. Resident Evil 4. 4. Bioshock, GTA 4. Bioshock. 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 Oh, sorry, I haven't been saying the years, but... Okay, 1997, Goldeneye versus Mario Kart 64. Ooh. Goldeneye. Oh, Goldeneye. That started the console Goldeneye. first. Yeah. Sure. But do you think that would have happened anyway? Much later. Well, maybe. of course it would have. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 1994, Super Metroid or Mega Man X? Super Metroid. Super Metroid. Yeah, Super Metroid. Sorry, Kyle. 2001, Metal Gear Solid 2, or Devil May Cry? Devil May Cry. Well, who's really Metal Gear Solid? Devil May Cry. He's really influenced by Metal Gear. Wait, Metal Gear Solid 2 specifically? Which Devil May Cry? One. Devil oh. May Cry 1. Okay. Like, yeah, Metal Gear Solid 2. I think I like the Metal Gear Really, like, too. God of War and Ninja Gaiden basically, like, Oh, came out of... Damn it, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, I might go Devil May Cry. In terms of character yeah. action games, that, that yeah. spawned an entire new genre, effectively. Damn it, I'm changing my answer. Yeah, but everybody, when they talk about like a twist in the game, will say, we can do a Metal Gear Solid 2 style <laughs> moment. <laughs> and look, look at all the games that have done that since. Uh, <laughs> Assassin's Creed, Chris, Assassin's Creed 3, kind of? Yeah. Um, 2007, Bioshock versus Modern Warfare. Bioshock. Modern Warfare. Ooh. Modern Warfare Modern versus Modern online Warfare. gameplay. Yeah, of course, Modern yeah. Warfare. RPG system. I like that. Those shooters. Good. There we go. Awesome. What do you guys like? You know the I week? like that last one. Yeah, that Perfect. last one was cool. Do you? Alex? Yeah, I like that. I like that one. I, it's always I always try not to go to the one we just did. But, yeah, but that one was good. That it's was my fun. fault for always putting the fun game ones at the end. Uh, personally, this person that made the sports graph. That that is pretty thorough. Though. Look, it didn't yeah. lead to the most interesting discussion, but that is effing cool. Effort. I mean, yeah. that is a lot of effort. At least an that's hour, also something that you specifically requested in the last episode that you're right. made for you. You're right, you're right. <laughs> that was just a very... <laughs> okay, okay. Here's I'll go with the room. Let's go with Alec, and this is from... But I love that graph. Sorry, yeah, 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 the graph the graph was very cool, and I appreciate it. I like it. Alec from Situate, Massachusetts. And I don't think we've ever shown this on air or talked about it, but, you know, Massachusetts, we'll put it up on the big board. But just to make it easier, we also have, like, a smaller version of the big, big board. Hang on a second. Oh, been maintaining since yeah so this, this is the close-up if you're watching the video version so you can actually see more detail we something. don't have anybody in the middle <laughs> yeah this is flyover <laughs> country so people can really right. work on it uh in massachusetts all right congratulations we'll put you on the big board that'll be fun give you the whole pinup 
Uh, as for now, holy cow, Spider-Man, Game Club, the grand yeah. finale for Go Basket. We have a lot to talk about, man. What? Ready for it? What? Here it is. Spoilers for the very end of Spider-Man coming up after this. Hello and welcome to the grand finale of the GI Game Club for Insomniac Spider-Man! Oh, it isn't over! Oh, oh man, oh. maybe it isn't. There's DLC on the way. Wait, what? Oh. We're going to talk about all that. So if you haven't finished Insomniac Spider-Man, I wouldn't recommend watching or listening to this part. Because I'm here, Leo Vader is here, Burp into the mic, Leo, grand, congratulations. Uh, Sergio Vasquez. Hello. And Ben Reeves. <laughs> We did it! We Same did it! crew! Entire oh game club! Gosh. This is mission accomplished. Rarely does this happen. Ooh. Rarely! When you get trustworthy people, it yeah. happens 100% Why of the time. Why would we get anybody else? You think I'm going to let Joe Juba back into this room? Wow. Joe Juba? The joke himself? The human joke? You guys, <laughs> Spider-Man is done. We finished it. Yeah. Ben Reeves, we did it! I saw credits. I saw post-credits. Did you? So okay. Credits? Here's the problem with the credits. <laughs> Let's start right at the credits. Oh, okay. Wonderful. First of all, pros and cons of credits. Pros acknowledges the work of the people who worked on the game. It's not really pros. <laughs> it's just a list of names. Oh, I yeah. see. But in alphabetical joke. order, mind oh. you. And I was going to double check it to see if this is the first Insomniac game, like how long Insomniac's been doing that. But that's a good, classy, Valvian touch. Yeah. You know, it's a good, good move. Cons of credits, saying, hey, you can hold X to skip credits. And then you're left in the state of, does that mean that we'll jump directly to the post credits video? Oh, right. Or what does that mean exactly? So I sat through those suckers. I was scared of missing this Did you use the right analog stick to scroll through it faster? I did a little bit. Yeah. I, I also it. think that's a pro, because it's nice to be able to, all right, let's get this moving. So, okay. But I appreciate, like, all right, let's give everybody their due. They spent some time working on the game, so yeah. And they look they cool. They flash on my... <laughs> screen for like two seconds. That's cool. Yeah, and you just repeatedly give the tip of the cap. That's like, right. Good that's job, right, everybody. Right. Good job. Well Write done. them all down separately yeah. so that I can put them on my wall. Can gotcha. Write them letters. <laughs> uh, okay. What did you guys think jumping back into that world after the end of Act 2? What were you guys doing? Because it is chaos in the streets, if you didn't notice. Yeah. It was a little bit weird just because I had done like basically every side mission up to that like every side mission. Oh, wow, okay. Uh, in the game. Like even the sort of the smaller activities or just like the side, like the blue... The blue yeah, everything. The side activities, all the crimes and all okay. that stuff. And so... There wasn't that much to do other than the main story, so there were moments where I was like, the next side mission, or the next main mission has to happen, but he's like, well, I guess I should go on patrol for a minute and just... Uh, and there wasn't anything to do. <laughs> he just literally walked around a building <laughs> just giving high fives. Yeah. Like, and stables, right. people trying to shoot you down. But, to answer your question, I thought it was cool how the the whole city changed, and it was definitely in a state of disarray. Uh, there were more, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know if there's more crimes going on, but there was, like, people up in every, like, the roof of every building trying to shoot Spider-Man down. Right. Yeah. Uh, Alex from Barnstable, England, says, My favorite part are the pockets of bad guys that now litter what was previously a reasonably safe space to swing around in. It's really ramped up the tension, having your spidey sense constantly going off while you swing around, and I love the feeling of cleaning up the streets. When I see those clusters of red dots on the minimap, I can't resist taking two minutes to take them down and restore safety to another street corner. They don't respond if you defeated them, which is a nice touch. It helps you huh. feel like you're oh, taking really? back the city one oh, inch at a time. Oh, cool. I wish I'd known that. It was interesting because, like, at that point I was kind of mulling over whether or not I was going to do more side stuff because I hadn't, I was the opposite of you where I hadn't done too much of it yet. And at that point I figured, okay, well, maybe it'll return to normal once the, I've beaten the game. So I kind of, uh, at that point, I more or less mainlined it because I was just like, okay, if this... If I, if I sort of, like, start, you know, uh, doing all the side stuff, I'm just going to get, like, it, it's going to be annoying to, to run around the city with all these people shooting me, so I may as well fi uh, finish it. So I feel like, on the one hand, that's kind of a bummer, but I think it ups the sense of urgency yeah. in terms of, like, okay, th things are happening, uh, I need to get stuff done now, which I think kind of conflicts with the, the few moments where they're like, oh, I guess I can just do whatever. But it's like, no, like, people are, in, it's chaos in the city. Like, like I don't know why said people are dying. Yeah, yeah, so it's like, why would you go and chase pigeons when they're, like, you know, when everyone in base, like, every, someone on every block has a gun at this point, right? <laughs> like, I always stop pigeon. what I'm doing when a pigeon pops up. <laughs> Even the pigeons have guns. It's crazy. Oh, God. Tyler from Rhode Island says, the size of the city is excellent, the character depth is great, but the amount of critical disaster taking place is staggering. 
apocalyptic bioweapons, constant gunfire and crime, six plus active deranged uber deadly villains at once. I constantly felt sorry for Spider-Man and his inability to handle it all, and it left me feeling helpless. Is this what we want out of a Spider-Man game? It didn't feel like a very friendly neighborhood. <sighs> also, uh, just on the crimes front, uh, David made this comparison, and then also Juan Benitez. He goes further with this. He says, hey guys, so we need to talk about that third act. I was really loving the first two acts and kind of laughing at some of the similarities to Arkham, but then New York turned into Gotham? Uh, humor me for a bit, but Scarecrow releases fear toxins on the city, Doc Ock releases Devil's Breath, I have to fight the Sinister Six and very reminiscent fights to any Arkham game. Fighting Rhino was like fighting Bane. Vulture equals Man Bat. Scorpion has a Scarecrow vibe. Mr. Negative equals Ra's al Ghul. Even the Doc Ock fight was very Joker in the first Arkham. We have to punch him around and then do the quick time event to punch him with the gel. What happened? I thought they had a great flow, but then to cherry pick Arkham bosses and scenarios for the big climax? I felt like it was a missed opportunity for Insomniac to make their own mark. I feel like the the key difference, which is, I think it's interesting that he like makes parallels, because I feel like while the sort of the plot elements I think match up, I felt like it was totally different from from Arkham in that those I, I think my favorite fight in the game was the one against uh, Electro and the Vulture because I feel like oh, taking them both on at the same time I think like I never hit the ground during that fight and it was because of like all right I have to constantly manage sort of this guy and this guy and it was a really cool fight that you honestly don't get all that often in games in terms of like the dual boss fight where sort of both entities feel distinct I think doesn't happen that often I th- and that was a really cool fight and like that one and the Scorpion and uh, Rhino one even yeah. like just the fact that they're sort of mixing the bosses in that way I think was actually like one of the best things they've done in the game I completely it, agree yeah those are my favorite scenes yeah. in the game probably yeah, yeah it was one of those things where like it was halfway through the fight you realize like, oh we're just staying in the air the whole time this is something interesting and I feel like maybe I just am terrible playing and people watching gameplay footage can probably uh, attest to that but at the same time, I felt like, in theory, this is one of those fights that's cool on paper, but I felt like it wasn't quite achieving it. And apparently, listening to interviews with Brian Intahar, he said that originally that was supposed to be two fights. Oh, and really? Somebody said, you know, they're both aerial. Like, if we have to combine fights, we can combine them. Whereas the Rhino-Scorpion one, they said that was always planned together. Which, oh. that one almost felt more... Uh, I feel like I had more of yeah. a, like I didn't like that one as much, because yeah. it felt like... It felt a little more video gamey, and that like, okay, here are sort of the critical points where you have to lure Rhino in, and then you know deal damage so you can actually hit him. Uh, and then like, Scorpion wasn't that interesting to fight. And I no. also was kind of like, Scorpion in that game overall kind of left a bad taste in my mouth because like that that trippy sequence, I wasn't really oh, into. We have, we have so much to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. We felt yeah. Can to, we get to that in a little bit? To jump onto his point though, yeah. like comparing it to Arkham is a little bit of. I don't know. He's the one making the comparisons, and maybe there are some comparisons you can make, but I wouldn't say it's. It was one to one or anything like right. that. I think, yeah, like the Raja Ghoul versus Mister Negative. Like, I don't know if there were that many comparisons other than no. they had a sword. I thought of it more in the beginning, almost because when Kingpin goes down, and it's like, well, he's keeping all the other supervillains at bay, and then they kind of rise up in his absence of power. That was kind of the setup for Arkham Knight. Like, Joker's gone now; everybody else is rising up. Right. And the other part of it is like, there's only so many different like archetypes of boss fights. In Video games. So right, that's yeah. part of it is like the fact there's two big broken, uh, hulking bruisers that run yeah. after you. Like, I think those fights are different enough, even on their own. Bane versus like, yeah. the Rhino. That oh. I wouldn't cons- compare them exactly one to one the way he is. Uh, you played a lot of Spider-Man games. What percentage of Rhino boss fights throughout Spider-Man's history are like the video game staple one on one? He charges into a wall, you dodge, and then he gets stuck. Oh, probably 100%. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's like, what else are you going to do? He's it's the rhino. rhino, yeah. yeah. Uh, Hazel Muhammad writes in about these fights. He says, the tandem boss battles were enjoyable, if a bit simplistic. Uh, you basically had to focus on one big bad guy while dodging the other. It felt somewhat repetitive when you make your way to Rhino and Scorpion, but I do thank the developers for teaching the player how to handle Scorpion in the hallucination sequence, since it makes the fight a bit less hectic than the Electro Vulture fight. Barbara Dro, uh, Game Club Champion, says, Wow, the Electro Vulture fight was great. I can't recall the last time I fought a double boss battle in a game, but I do sort of wish we'd been able to go against Scorpion one-on-one. There seems to be quite a bit of history between him and the Spider-Man. It would have been good to see how that would have concluded, but I did love how he and Rhino kept bickering during the fight. That was fun, and like it culminates with them being locked in the yeah. cargo container at the end yeah. there, which you'd think Rhino you'd be, could yeah, get out Yeah, you'd think of. Rhino would break out of that. Yeah, they're, they're like surrounding him with guns. It's like, what if, if he breaks out? You're going to shoot him? That's going to stop him? <laughs> I mean, that looks like a big cargo container. Yeah. I, I did love, uh, first of all, okay, a couple questions for you, Reese. When you first start fighting Rhino, Peter Parker has some line, or Spider-Man has some line, where he says, you're my second favorite Russian. 
Am I missing something very obvious for what he's talking about there? Like Fable, the other one? Vladimir Putin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Vlad! I get yeah. it, okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that was like an allusion to something, or or what, but uh, I don't know if canonically in the comics he has like a favorite Russian. I can't think of anything. Is it big? Alcoholic, a white Russian, maybe? Do you want me to oh, go yeah, Spider-Man's yeah, favorite yeah. Russian? I think it was just a joke. Like, oh, a white Russian, really? a random like thing a favorite, to say. Yeah. We should make sure to talk about it long enough that people can finish typing their comments about <laughs> it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah he has other Russian Myriad. Ones, okay. <laughs> also, I like I liked the moment that fo- in that... Uh, damn it, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're so mean. I like the moment in that fight, too, where uh, Spider-Man just will not stop f***ing making jokes. And at a certain point, he goes, Okay, watch out, Rhino Poachers! And Rhino charges him, and he goes like, "You are not funny." I the thing. hero of the piece. On the point of the, <laughs> of the say what we're all thinking. <laughs> on the point of the quips, though, I do appreciate that they know when to tone that down towards the end yeah. of, the, of the game, where like the him and the Doc Ock fight, like there's like he doesn't really quip at all because yeah. like it's You're right. it's a very stern acknowledgement of like this guy he cares about. Like it's, it's, there's a, there's a difference between. The, the fights he's had before and the fight and like this particular fight. although it was weird yeah. he was quipping at Aunt May's deathbed that was really yeah. <laughs> I guess she won't be in the sequel <laughs> well honestly we don't want to jump the gun too much here but I did think Aunt about May, that I help you out of bed <laughs> <laughs> but in the like you know after that entire sequence when they're back in the restaurant at the far end right they get yeah. their big makeup session on the table or whatever wipe the ketchup off the table and actually make up. No, but he, uh, he's joking. They're joking around about, like, oh, I guess I accidentally made Doc Ock. There's some line about, like, oh, remember last time when I made Doc Ock and the devil's breath? He yeah. makes some joke about it. He's like, hey, you're not just dying as a result of you doing this work. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, wasn't that, like, a month or two later? I guess you're right. Was, he should be joking about yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, you're totally over it. I'm in a dark humor now. No, it's <laughs> a valid point, but at some point, it's like, all right, move on. Yeah, I don't do it while it's topical. <laughs> Were you guys surprised by them shoving the boss battles together? Because I feel like I started Act Three of this is gonna be a lot of boss fights. If we have to take out six of these dudes, yeah, I was. I thought it was just gonna be like Act Three was just gonna be one boss fight after the other, right. and it kind of is in a way. But like, I appreciated that they that they went this dual round instead of like the very sort of like okay, now I have to take on this guy because I think my immediate complaint was like why don't they just team up and like kick his ass again? Like it doesn't. I I, I think Mister. I mean, the last two, obviously, are kind of split, but I think I, I very much like that they've changed it up with the dual boss fights, for sure. Definitely. Yeah, the, um, I liked the sequence where you're in Otto's secret uh, you know, research lab, and you kind of learn the backstory of what everybody's getting out of the deal, but do you feel like their motivation was clear enough where everybody's like, yeah, sure, we hate Osborne enough, and... He can actually help us out with right. very specific things, like Rhino. He can just get him out of the suit. Which is, like, that that raised so many questions <laughs> for me as I was okay. Look, fine, but I feel like that suit is so stuck that couldn't he just like I don't know stop exercising and lose muscle weight and eventually swim <laughs> out of it? Go on a and, diet. Uh, how does he pee? Yeah. Like, uh, like that right. was like I spent like a good amount of time thinking like, does that make sense? Does that actually make sense or is that is that bull crap? Like. Is that a comic book thing, or I don't he know? He could be lying. There's a lot. There's a lot of comic book stuff in here. Oh, I can't get out of this suit. <laughs> I'm sorry. I did think it was cool, conceptually. Again, when you're playing as Miles, like trying to dodge the rhino, that style sequence eventually got annoying. I was a little bit frustrated by it. But the idea of being, you know, uh, somebody without powers in this world, like trying to dodge that, it was cool at first. But then it got to the point of, why does rhino? care so much about this random idiot like yeah like, all he did you always right yeah like, i didn't know he was doing anything <laughs> no not at all you smell like someone who might be a spider-man someday <laughs> <laughs> you're ripe to get bitten <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh leo what was your favorite sequence of everything here uh my favorite sequence probably uh the rhino uh scorpion fight really really that yeah. fight in particular yeah i i don't know how much it rips off bane Really? Like, I didn't get that far in Arkham City or Arkham Knight or whatever? Oh, it doesn't. Oh, great. Yeah, so you're good. <laughs> Just from the start of fighting Rhino, it's like, oh, he's, you're not making him run into stuff. You're dropping the things on him. And when you're still making you him that, come over to that area, you're so like you can you're doing the, the thing full, basically the bait and switch, basically. Like, oh, I'm over here, and then you, like, dodge out of the way. and like It's yeah, slightly more exciting because yeah, you're right in front sure. of him. And plus, once you, like, think, oh, maybe I need to do this, and then you start doing it, and then it goes into slow motion, and you know you're doing the right thing. Yeah. yeah. That moment was pretty cool. That was cool. I did the mistake of, like, I released all of my Electrobots on him at the very beginning, and that's, that does enough damage to him where you get past that first part. Oh. And then Scorpion shows up, and so then with Scorpion jumping around all over the place, I didn't understand what I was supposed to do to the Rhino. 
And so, like, in the confusion, I was like, this is a mess. So I had to, like, take Scorpion out of the picture and then figure out what I was supposed to do to Rhino in the first place. Weird. So, oh. kind of I went, I, the, well, I went, I went the opposite route. I took out Rhino first and then Scorpion. Yeah. Because you yeah. didn't understand what to do with Scorpion. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely liked those two double boss fights were definitely, like, they're yeah. tied pretty yeah, much for my favorite part because... The other earlier boss fights and everything, you feel more confined and it's more specific. It feels mechanic. more PC. Yeah, yeah, but this is more like use what you've learned, use how good you've gotten at swinging yeah. Yeah. and attacking and also, dodging in midair to do this. First of all, I was a little bit bummed out when I think it was the first objective for Act Three. It was, uh, hey, it's uh, Rhino and Scorpion. Yeah, they're out there. Go up against who you want to go up against. And then I went to both locations and you just take out their thugs, which yeah. is kind of a, a lame yeah. attack. Like I thought this was gonna be like choose your boss fight, which was really. I thought about it would have been cool if they had had like, all right, here's. Four objectives, you can take out all the bosses in any order you want. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But then uh, also it was like getting to that point, I loved seeing Electro like flying around. Anytime I see a boss or anything in the open world itself, that's always so cool. So like swinging up on that boss fight and just seeing him zipping around, that's yeah. so cool. Just it's, it's probably some antiquated notion, but just the, that we have the tech to actually put the boss in the world that I've been swinging around in. Yeah. It's the same thing. No, cool. I thought that was cool. Yeah, I like that they do set up Electro li a little bit. I mean, they, I know they kind of used it, the mechanic, but like the one where you have to take out all the electric towers, basically, and there's one on the helicopter, basically teaching you like, you know, hit the generator first if you want to like stop yeah. Electro, and then in the boss fight they don't explain it, so because you're, you know, like that, that that's a good sort of way to make the boss fight more exciting. What about that very basic concept which you do a fair amount in this game that we haven't talked about yet of just shooting your webs after following like electric cables to the electricity boxes? Oh, it's the best thing in the game. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what is this? You know, where it's like, hey, use your Spidey Sense to track the electricity boxes, and you have to shoot your webs at it to and shut them out. Oh, okay. it's, like, it's just yeah. like this small little gameplay thing that they have recurring throughout the game that's one of those classic video game details that I guess we did a lot, but there's nothing remarkable, and I don't know if it's really necessary. Yeah, but sure. Fine. Yeah. It yeah. added time it to the clock. Time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, on the combat front, real quick, we have a couple thoughts here. Cheese2B says, One of my favorite things in this game has been throwing random objects at enemies. The best object by far had to be hurling manhole covers at people like a frisbee. Those things would have taken their freaking heads off! But all they do is knock them back a bit. Yeah. It's funny how many boss fights even come down to like the L1, R1, chuck things at him. Even yeah. Doc Ock, which we'll talk about in a bit here. I like it. There's a moment where he's like, I have no weakness! Yeah, it turns out it's L1 and R1 that they got me doing the yeah. entire game. I, like I also like that. At one point, I was doing it so much that I accidentally did it after a, a crime had, like, resolved, and someone said, hey, he's throwing stuff around! He is a, he is a danger, like Jameson said! <laughs> <laughs> oh, no! I accidentally pressed those two buttons! <laughs> I really liked doing that, too, and I really liked, like, ripping the turrets off of the top of the sable truck as well and throwing them at enemies. Oh, I'm really yeah, doing that. That's really? Fun. No. I don't That's, think like, I the only way thing. you can take out the... Yeah. Sable, the groups of Sable guys is if you get the turrets first. For yeah. me, anyway. Otherwise, they just hold you down the whole fight. Okay. Um, let's see. This is Michael from Idaho. He says, What is your favorite small thing in the game? Mine is when I see a thug near a wall and spamming R1 to see them splat up against it. Uh, he says this game is his first ever platinum. Oh. Favorite small thing? Actually, platinum didn't make it. It just didn't sound like <laughs> That's a very funny. Screw you, buddy. <laughs> it is always satisfying to see someone pinned up against a wall. Yeah. Especially because it's always on the fence of, like, is this actually going to pin the person with this impact web? Or are they going to be invincible to it right. for some weird reason? So whenever it works, yeah. it feels well, awesome. Well, I... Even if, if they stick right to the wall immediately, that's great. If they get all webbed up, and then you punch them a couple times, and punch them into a wall, and then they get stuck, that's yeah, also really good. Stuff. For sure. Yeah, or swing kicking them into a street oh, yeah. light, and yeah. get them stuck there. That's really good. Good stuff. Ready for this crap? Leo, oh, James no. Hicks writes in, oh, your old he, rival. Here we go. <laughs> hicks a <-doo! laughs> says, hey, did you know that if you double tap L1, you can cycle between your current and most recently used gadgets? What? <laughs> 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 we haven't left the building, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, where were you? Act 1. <laughs> yeah, no, this Hicks. game club's been going on for three weeks, James Hicks. This is exactly the kind of thing Hicks would do. Hello. Let's go, Hicks. <laughs> That's really great advice. Thank you. <laughs> He says he didn't know about it until the new game plus either, so oh, he's not missing out that much. Um, oh, real quick from uh, Connor in Laramie, Wyoming. He says, hey, I want to mention that uh, J. Jonah Jameson in the last act is actually a pretty good news person when he's not focused on Spider-Man. He's telling people to stay safe, and, it, and his takedowns of Sable, I think, speak to the potential of the character if only he wasn't obsessed with Spider-Man. This is actually one of my favorite things about some of the comics, where eventually in the Ultimate con Continuity, and more recently in the main one, but J. Jonah Jameson actually becomes a staunch ally of Spider-Man, he can still be a gruff, unlikable, but he's actually a better guy. Yeah, he was—he was saying some some truthful things towards the end there. 
Um, but I don't know if I just didn't play enough Endgame, but I never got the thing that we thought was being foreshadowed. Yeah, I was going to ask you guys. Yeah, I didn't hear that either. Of him, he never said, like, Spider-Man's all right. Like, there was never the 180. Oh, interesting. That Spider-Man's like, by the end of the day, I'm going to get to say something nice to me. Yeah. Uh, kind of. <laughs> I mean, in the end, I've been, I've been doing this yeah. Yeah. end game stuff, and he, he kind of shifts in that direction, but he never, like, does that, like, because he acknowledges that Spider-Man saved the city. Of like, he, Oh, he does? Okay. He 100% says that, but he, he attributes it to him. Of like, well, obviously, I, like, I have it from a source that Spider-Man listens to this show. So it's uh-huh. clear that he listened to me and has become a better person. Oh, that's cool. I was, um, yeah. during Act 3, I finally realized, I don't really know why J. Jonah Jameson hates Spider-Man. <laughs> Leo, if I put a gun to your head right now and ask you why that is. <laughs> why does he hate him? Does anybody know? No, I have no idea. Are you scared of spiders? Can you help us? In the comics, there's like a pretty famous issue where he like has this monologue of like oh the reason I hate Spider-Man is because he's better than me and it's like I'm jealous basically it's uh J. Jonah Jameson jealous? yeah that's this was middle name is <laughs> J. Jealous Jameson huh that's it? that that was the reason in the comics yeah okay I mean it, yeah you can read it for what it is I kind of like the idea of he's just like you know kind of a grumpier old dude and he's sort of set in his ways and I'm like I mean Spider-Man is connected to a lot of like destruction in the city so it's just, just kind of like yeah if this guy wasn't around he wouldn't be like causing a mess you know yeah it's the way people talk about like Fortnite you know they're like oh all the kids are playing Fortnite everybody thinks Fortnite's so great you know exactly in this world he's kind of just the Fortnite. like Spider-Man <laughs> yeah his <laughs> wife is always talking about man I love Spider-Man he's like why don't you love me the way you love Spider-Man these are That's all my theory. <laughs> 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 Such a dick move just to leave people hanging on a podcast. <laughs> okay, guys. Uh, uh, what was that? <laughs> Daniel writes this, in... This podcast. <laughs> Three-second pause. Anyway, Daniel says, Hey, I ended up rolling through all of Acts 2 and 3 and everything else to get 100% over the weekend. Loved it. I very rarely do this, and the feelings in my index finger the following night when I tried to pull the right trigger playing Tomb Raider attest to that. I guess the swinging was just too good. I'll make a note to hold R2 sometimes rather than pulling and releasing for each and every swing when he plays the sequel. So his finger was sore because he would just oh. swing manually. Uh, did you guys do that often? Only zip. I don't think I've ever had that problem. Only zip. Only zip everywhere. Really? No, that's what you do if your finger's Oh, okay. Bad. That's true. That is helpful. Uh, Matt Clark says getting 100% took too much time. There were too many side missions. It's kind of annoying. I did not get to that point. Did anybody here get to that point? I did 100%, yeah. It was, at one point, I think we talked about this last time, but there were too many crime missions. Like, having mm. five of each type of crime to do in each section of the city is just a little overkill, in my opinion. Yeah, I feel like they're supposed to be spontaneous events, but I think when you have to itemize them and say, like, well, I have to wait around and, you know, for this crime to spawn, it's kind of annoying. And also, yeah, it's like, here's another fight, here's another fight. Uh, like, I don't know that I don't know that those are the best events, but, like, I feel like most of the other side stuff ends up being pretty cool. Like, the backpacks have you know, like, a nice story behind them. The pigeons are kind of cool, sort of swinging missions. Like, the Taskmaster stuff is, is can be kind of difficult, but I enjoy the challenge. Um, so, like, I think the, the crime stuff was the only thing that I got, that I haven't 100 percent of the game yet, but, like, those are the things that I think if I get tired of the game, it'll, that'll be why. Yeah. Uh, real quick, Daniel Heidbrink, Heidbrink, I should say, from Western Missouri, uh, he says, first off, the game's freaking great! Said in my best Jeff Cork impression, he said, can anybody do a no. better Jeff Cork saying freaking great? Yeah. Yeah. It's freaking great. <laughs> uh, secondly, to the point below is a somewhat odd experience of uncomfortable playing. While swinging around, and specifically when dropping down at higher speeds, heights, uh, there have been a handful of times when I've literally felt my stomach drop as if I'm riding a roller coaster. Has anybody else experienced this? A roller coaster? Yeah, a couple <laughs> times. Uh, I, not in this game. I get that in strange games. I think like Monster Hunter. Strange games. Like, Monster Hunter World, okay. it did it for me if I was falling for a long ways, yeah, or even, sure. like, a lot of old school games. I think if I'm just dropping randomly, sure. then my stomach will, will drop I thought as well. the Infamous series was particularly good at that, I don't know if really? you that, but mm-hmm. they did a really good sense of, like, I don't know, movement or momentum when yeah. falling. The only time that ever happened to me was it, actually in Half-Life 2, when you're on that bridge and you're kind of, like, going through all the railings and stuff, and I looked down, and that was, like, the only time where, like... I was like, oh, I don't want. I definitely do not want to fall right now. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I really do enjoy the momentum of, of falling and swinging. Into the yeah. Okay, real quick, gameplay stuff a little bit more. Um, oh, uh, James Burkett says it's amazing they allowed Spider-Man to change his suit at any time. 
In the Arkham games, you have to wait around until New Game Plus to go into other suits, so then you wouldn't break immersion. Uh, yeah, and a couple of people love the uh, cartoon suit. They were super... Yeah, here we go. So this is... I, I love the cartoon suit. Yeah, yeah I, I do too. Like, I but, played a good part of it with the cartoon suit, yeah. Yeah, so Andrew Palomo and Carl Nielsen both absolutely love the, the vintage, old-school look for the comic book suit. It's awesome, and they even say that they want like the whole city to be cel-shaded like that, yeah. which is a fun idea, Very but cool. technically might be difficult. Go um, play Ultimate Spider-Man. Yeah, I guess that's what you need to do. But at the same time, I kept going back to just the standards of I would go to the Stark suit or I'd go to just the Insomniac suit because I didn't want to break that immersion. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't want it to be maybe a new game plus. I would get freaky yeah. with it, but like I didn't want some dopey looking Spider-Man in my cutscene. I, I was with you. I, I definitely switched to the cartoon Spider-Man after I, I finished the game and started doing side stuff, but until then I it was all like white suit. Until, yeah. Basically. There was a, a couple of times where I would like throw on the, like, the 2099 suit, which I thought was really cool looking and I didn't realize I had nostalgia for it, but I was like, oh, I'm Spider-Man 2099, alright. Is that from the comics or from that old game? It's from the comics, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, well, I know, but and, your nostalgia. And in the game. Oh, my nostalgia? Probably from the comics. I didn't love that game that much. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Um, Ryan Clausen has a very good point from uh, San Diego here. He says, well, playing Spider-Man, I noticed that during certain sections, like the party scene, people are dressed like supervillains, like Rhino or Mysterio. Along with this, it is established that the Twitter section and the menu, along with other world-building areas, that many people have died from attacks by these villain villains. Wouldn't that be like dressing up as terrorists at a Halloween party? It's yeah. a weird move, right? Oh, that's yeah. a good point. I didn't even think about that. Hey, some of Bin Laden party again, everybody. <laughs> Here we go. And everyone's woo, getting drunk. <laughs> Jesus, Jerry. I wish it was just one person and they were being like lambasted for their yeah. offensive costume. Oh, it's like, dude, what the hell? My aunt died from me. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's aunt died. <laughs> um, aunt, aunt say, aren't safe. The aunt massacre. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if you don't know aunt. Nathan from Roanoke, Virginia says, Hey, you keep asking for granular details? Here you go. One of the coolest details I noticed in the game. Inside of the Feast Center, the main floor is a big gymnasium. If you look at the floor, the detail level is awesome. Areas near the edge of the gym are far less worn and still have a nice reflective finish that looks so realistic. In the center of the gym, where the basketball nets would be, it's far more worn, with individual pieces of wood that make up the floor being partially reflective, with edges that look very worn. It's an insane amount of attention to detail, even thinking about which sections of the floor would be more worn than others. Huh. There you go. Granular detail. Thank you, Nathan. That's Too cool. granular. Yeah, yeah so come on. Just broaden out a little bit. <laughs> Did you like the game or not? Is the Feast Center supposed to be like an old high school that got converted into a homeless shelter? What is it? I think they forced the homeless to play basketball games against each other oh, to figure out who oh, gets oh, hell the yeah. resources I each week. Now, yeah. uh, Nathan also says, as far as the story goes, I loved it overall, but anyone else thinks Silver Sable changed her tune way too quickly. I thought she'd be pissed Spider-Man failed and was beaten by Octavius. Her line of, you can repay me by not dying, was particularly strange, as minutes before she was ready to shoot him in an instant. Yeah, yeah that turn was super weird. Uh, like, her character becoming like, oh, I guess Spider-Man's alright after trying to kill him like seconds before. Seemed like they were like, we gotta get her off the board. Yeah. <laughs> so I think uh, in interviews with Brian Hitzar, he talked about how originally she had a much bigger, bigger role, obviously, and then of all the people to whittle down, she was one that got eh, short shrift. I, I was also more. frustrated because, like, they have a conversation after that whole mission of, like, all right, Spider-Man, I guess you're cool now. My guys are still going to try to kill you anyway. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. They're not going to listen to me. Right. And, and then, like, they don't remove the Sable people at all, even though, like, there's no reason for them to continue shooting you. Like, I <laughs> just, thought that was just a weird, yeah. like, handout. Well, we're not going to do that. So it's I, like, I almost, they could have just not addressed it at all. Honestly. Yeah. It would have been fine. It's like, yeah, it's a video game. This stuff's going to keep happening if I want to keep Yeah, it's a weird thing. Like, well, now that you bring it up, it's a total, like, it's totally clashing with the game, but, like, I yeah. hadn't mentioned it. That yeah, is weird. Ten points, Silver yeah. Sable. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I did, like, before that moment, though, you know, when Spider-Man's trying to take out, I think it's demons outside the tower? I forget. And there's still demons around. I they think, never I go think away. demons, yeah. Um, but then the Sable police come jetpacking around. He's like, what is this, 1984 or something? But I like the push and pull of, like, whose side are you on now? Like, all these conflicting armies kind of getting together and just trying to square the alliances in my mind is kind of fun. Yeah. And I think Spider-Man even does my favorite thing where he keeps emphasizing with them, like, we are on the same team. Like, just stop shooting at me for a little bit and we can take care of this whole situation. Yeah, it's fun to try and figure out. But Damon's also pissed here, writing in, saying, did I seriously not get to fight Sable after getting dumped on by her goons throughout the entire game? I was also disappointed by that. I was like, come on, no fight? Yeah. Come on! Some idiot, actually, on this table thought that Sable was going to be the, the final boss. Why? Instead of DLC, yeah. like she'd been announced to be. Yeah. I, I, I texted these guys before we started playing. I'm like, I haven't played anymore, but just trying to guess the final boss and how people say it's a surprise. What if it's Sable? 
I didn't ask it as a question. I said it is 100% going to be stable, and I'll cut my pinky off if it's not. People said the last box was a surprise. No, but I think people phrased, and I saw some conversation about people talking about the final act being surprising. And also, I don't really see it that much, but I heard some people talking about, like, oh, you know, it kind of walks into a more political discussion, talking about the militarization of police. So I was expecting more on that front, but I was like, what? Yeah. I mean, except the fact that, that, like, at some point the police more or less becomes sable, and it's like... That's it. Military checkpoints and stuff, but I don't think it ever... Like, it kind of does that implicitly, but I don't think it ever explicitly says, like, Spider-Man never walks on and says, military police are bad, guys. Yeah. Well, there's no good. Yeah. group, though, too. It's not, I don't know. Yeah, I think, I, just, I think the idea, the imagery of, like, checkpoints and things like that can sort of, like, Maybe. sure. Wait, those, those what is this, 1984? Yeah. yeah, what is this, a video game? All these checkpoints? Hey. Uh, Doug from Burlington, Vermont, says, just finished. <laughs> that was Wicked! Is it just me, or is that the best Spider-Man movie I've ever seen? Who created the story? Marvel Insomniac? Who, who's responsible for this? That's a great question. John Paquette. <laughs> Lead writer, John Paquette. Did you oh. meet him on the cover story trip? No, he was on vacation, but he, he called in. So he did, like, a phone call uh-huh. interview and while we were there. And he's an Insomniac employee? Yeah. Okay. So he's been there for a while? Do you know he's not, like, a Marvel hire or anything crazy like that? I don't know for sure. Okay. I presumably they had some, like, input from Marvel, right? I think so, yeah. Listening to... I, I devoured every spoiler cast I could with Brian and Tahar, which were very fun. I think kind of funny. I had the best one, if you're interested in, in checking those out. Um, but uh, I was shocked listening to interviews just how how much of a collaboration this was. He pitches it very much. as like, it's this crazy three-way collaboration between Sony, Marvel, and Somniac. But I definitely assumed that Sony was kind of leading the show. But in his mind, it definitely seemed like Insomniac and Marvel got together. Oh, really? And then Sony helped like push over the finish line to make it happen in a big way probably with a bigger budget and all this stuff um but yeah i was shocked even the way he was framing it talking about you know this game we see it in our minds as the iron man of marvel gaming like we want to get out in a big way hmm. and kind of set the standard and oh i didn't really see it as separate from sony in that way but i think it's more so than you think in your mind that's interesting good well, i don't know so is he thinking that insomniac would do other non-spider-man related i don't know if i go projects? that far but it definitely listen to those interviews it made me think I don't know if it's 1,000% ruled out that Marvel isn't building some bigger universe. The idea that the Avengers wouldn't acknowledge Spider-Man in some way. cool. I mean, presumably if Marvel has all the rights to that, because it's a completely different development team, different publisher. Right, but if Marvel's still the main licensee, like maybe they would be able to tie those together in a subtle way. Sorry, no, it's Square. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I could totally see them sort of, maybe after the Square thing, just sort of, contracting with studios that they think are good like here hey we're gonna make one with you know microsoft and ninja theory or something like and like try try i think the sort of their attempts to build a universe is more about like we just want to have like a consistent world where you know marvel characters are in good games yeah. right right and that'd be great kale from colchester says are there any games or any marvel characters you would like to see wrapped into this universe if it is one shared thing i mean i think iron man would be pretty cool <laughs> yeah do yeah. iron man right finally he hasn't really had any good video games but he'll be the in the adventures game you know, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, does that doesn't mean you don't want to see him solo, right? I like, I'd love to I see like, want a good it war game, but who would you who, who would you pick then? Oh, me? Yeah. You're asking me. <laughs> I I am asking you right now. Hmm. I like Doctor Strange. I'd like to see some freaky powers, and I, I don't mean, think it's he's a gonna be in the Avengers game. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, that hurts when you talk about that. <laughs> hey, come on, man. Uh, but just on the story front overall, in terms of like, hey, who the hell wrote this thing? Uh, that is the biggest surprise. I think even on this podcast before, I was talking about, I was a little bit skeptical about the writing in this game. I thought it was going to be video game superhero level, mm-hmm. which isn't a high mo- like high bar in my mind, but throughout the writing has been so much better than I thought. It's just the quips, dialogue, the emotional moments, like they hit it out of the park. Not quite, I don't think, to like a God of War level of writing, which I think might be the high water mark this year for me, but still sure. super, super solid. Yeah, it was really, really, I would say it's a, definitely above average uh, did a really good bar, and, like, I, I I had fun with it. And there were some cool, like, twists. I don't know if you want to get into the... For me, we like, there so was a moment to into it. where Mary Jane, that stealth sequence in Osborne's mansion... Yes, yes. Which I still wasn't a fan of the gameplay, but, like, that, story-wise, I was like, oh, this is kind of cool with Harry, and, like, it turns out there is more going on here than we thought with yeah. him not being in Europe. Yes, absolutely. Um, that is huge. A lot of people wrote in about that uh, walled... Chikawa writes in saying, I really enjoyed navigating Norman's apartment. Um, Don from Albuquerque, New Mexico says, Gah! 
Finding that damn key in Norman Osborne's apartment drove me nuts. I had to laser focus on finding a calendar or a code when I flipped the photo of Harry's mom around the first two times. I didn't even see the key at all. My spidey sense wasn't cutting it. Uh, and Kale says, the MJ stealth bits made me groan uh, in general. And Kale says, I think the next game, an L.A. Noir-style investigative dialogue mechanic would be so much better for MJ. Oh, yeah. yeah. But I agree that, you know, when she gets, like, the taser and, like, working her way out of the apartment or even in, I'm still not crazy about those sequences, but... It turns out when you're just walking around unraveling a story that's interesting, like that entire sequence was, figuring out what's going on with Harry, that's all you need. And that was, I think, the strongest part for MJ throughout yeah. the entire game. It's me. funny because I, 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 I also took a little time to find the key, but I, I spent so much time just looking at random stuff in the apartment that yeah. I think the game eventually just tells you where that stuff is. Because like, mm. I, I spent so much time there, it's like, hey, go to this, like an objective marker popped up that, hey, it's in this room. And when I looked at the picture for the first time, it says, hey, I think I, something might be on the back. And I immediately flipped it around there was the key it was hmm. so I, I guess i'm surprised that like he had trouble finding the key when for me it was just like immediate of like hey there's a key in the back of this thing with the first time i ever held it so. yeah uh connor from wyoming also writes in just saying mj sequence through the end in norma's apartment floored me uh the more for the series of story revelations that she encountered harry oh my god and then evan filarica says well i can't wait for peter to continue to mentor miles through the use of his arachnid abilities Nothing made me freak out more than having the game reveal that Harry was never in Europe in the first place, but rather in a preserved status in Norman's penthouse throughout the entirety of the game with a symbiote-like substance wrapped around him in order to keep him alive. That, plus the massive foreshadowing of Norman turning into Green Goblin with hints of go- Goblin glider, Goblin mask, helmet, which I love that Mary Jane put that on. Like, that's such a cool <laughs> idea. Um, pumpkin bombs scattered throughout the game and the green water casting a very sinister shadow over Norman's face leads him to believe that we're in for a very exciting follow-up to this already breathtaking game. Thank you for everything, it was, Squad. I mean, I always find it a little bit corny when they're like, oh, here, I'm really into this purple and green color scheme. Like, that <laughs> always seems like the most obvious sort of hinting. But I do appreciate that, like, yeah, they're going maybe a slightly different direction with Harry specifically. Uh, I will say that, though, when the spider broke out of the, of the containment, there was, like, a split second in my mind. It's like, wait, is Mary Jane going to get bitten by a spider in this? And yes. that was, like, my happiest moment of, like, that would be such a huge yeah. shift oh, for this. Right. And then, like, you know, 10 seconds, I was like, oh, wait, no, it's going to fight. Like, she's going to take yeah. it over to Miles. Dylan, I mean, that was the biggest, like, yeah, you could see that coming from a mile away. Yeah. yeah, Dylan from North Carolina says, part of me is really disappointed that MJ was not the one bitten by the spider. Exactly. I know Miles has a history of being spidey, but by the end of the game, I love MJ and thought she was a total badass. Um, Especially since I think it would have played into the arc of, like, the reason they broke up is because, like, I'm tired of you protecting me. So, like, the idea of, like, okay, now I'm also a spider person, I think, would have been... <laughs> And if that was her line of dialogue, then yeah, yeah, I am yeah. also a she spider person. She kicks down Harry, uh, uh, Peter's door and says, now I am a spider person. <laughs> okay, we have a lot to unpack here. I loved that idea of sneaking around that place so much as MJ and then having it revealed post-credits that, like, she was so close to Harry. That is such a cool, unnerving oh, yeah. idea. Oh, yeah, I she was less that, than a yeah. foot away from Harry during that entire sequence. I That's knew so there was somebody in that really? container. Why? Why? Yeah, you could, like, barely hear something, but it was like, Shut up. what? I, I, you could didn't like hear someone talking or anything, but it was like it just a little gurgling or whatever. I was like, oh, there's someone in there. Oh, Did you oh Mark Hamill? Like, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, he, am I the only one? Am I the only? <laughs> that was so stupid <laughs> that during that post credits thing, when like he puts his little um, hand on the tank, you know, in a very uh, Star Trek Two situation or whatever, and then like the symbiote hand or whatever comes up and touches it. Did you guys all understand that was a symbiote? I, I That was, like, my first instinct of, like, wait, is there some other, like, did Harry at some point encounter some sort of other symbiote thing? But it, that's what it has to be. Yeah. Right. Leo, you're not that glued into lore either. Am I nuts? I thought it was just like, oh, it's a weird hand. And then it wasn't until listening to the spoiler cast, like, oh, that was supposed to be a Venom tease. I see. I didn't get that at all. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't get that either. It makes okay. sense, but it's not, like, explicitly laid out if you're not familiar with Spider-Man, I don't think. It was just like, yeah. oh, yeah, something is really weird is going on with Harry. Yeah. Even if you don't get it, you're like, oh, this is kind of messed up. Like, yeah. Yeah. So what should we have taken away from that, Reese? Spider-Man fan number one? I was a little turned off by it just because I, I don't know, it's, like, so messy with the traditional lore. Isn't that the maybe? fun, though? Like, I love that Yes, I don't know. I, there's certain things that just turn me off, and the idea of like the Venom suit coming from—they had to do something other than what it was because Spider-Man got the Venom suit out of a vending machine <laughs> in space. So uh, they weren't going to probably go that route. But you sure? The fact that I don't know—they this they, is safer than doing what they did. <laughs> I feel like a, a recurring theme of this 
series might be sort of conflicts within the villains themselves instead of them all sort of being against Spider-Man. So I'd be interested to see if maybe they set up the next game as Harry resenting Norman and sort of that being the conflict of like the symbiote versus Green Goblin uh, in the next game. Yeah. I think oh, that'd be that's cool. interesting. I guess I uh, I was a little turned off because I was like, oh, but Eddie Brock's supposed to be the Venom. Like, I kind of wanted that. Maybe I'll still go that way in the sequel, but... Maybe you'll fight... And so it's just guaranteed that he's Venom? Does it have to be Venom, or can it just be another symbiote that has, like, a new name Carnage. or something? Like, yeah, it doesn't have to be the, Venom, the no. Hob Venom or something. Hob Venom, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's probably the anti-Venom. Oh, I can't believe I didn't think of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but it is cool that Green Goblin and Venom weren't really in this game, right? Yeah. So two of his biggest villains are still up for grabs in the sequel, which is kind of a cool setup. You know, it's like, oh, plus Mysterio or, like, Kraven. Like, there's a bunch of, like cool villains we haven't seen yet, even for though sure. there were so many in this game. Yeah, they have more than enough to work with, for sure. Also, just that idea, I think it's people on the street who said something along the lines of uh, Osborne screwed! Uh, like, you know, the fact that Devil's Breath got released, like, he's never going to win the next election, or he'll be kicked out of office or something. So I like that idea of him getting stripped of his mayorship and kind of down on his luck and then yeah. blaming Spider-Man. Oh, yeah. Whatever it works. Um, Jack White, your fan from Utah, thank you, Jack White, so did you guys notice the clues that hint at Norman Osborn knowing who Spider-Man's true identity is? Like Aunt May and Dr. Octavius, I think Norman knows who Spider-Man is. Their primary clue is how involved Norman is in the life of Peter. In the franchise, Norman sees himself as a father figure to Peter and acts like one. If Aunt May and Doc Ock can figure out who Spider-Man really is, a billionaire mayor from New York City with multiple files on the masked menace who is overly involved in the life of his son's orphan friend would have figured it out too. Other clues like personal stand-down orders to Silver Sable to prevent her from killing a spider or scenes where they cut off Mayor Osborne confronting the web-slinger, leaving to believe that Insomniac Games has a more mature, complex story to tell about the Goblin. Sure. That's how Gwen Stacy died in the comics, is Green Goblin found out, or sorry, Norman found out who Peter really was, Spider-Man, and they went after his girlfriend. Is out of this? Yeah, okay. So. Also, I don't know, I think, I would imagine a push and pull is for the sequel, Doc Ock kind of I don't know about reuniting, but, like, talking again to Osborne, because their interactions are so good, and the idea of that final shot of Otto, he knows, and now he's pissed, right? Like, he knows who Spider-Man really is, and so he has this juicy secret. For dramatic purposes, he has to tell somebody who more interesting than his greatest rival, right? right? Well, that was a scene I really liked in Homecoming, to compare it to that. Yeah. Like, the vulture found out who he was, but... Peter also saved his family, and so he kind of like feels like he owes him one. It's like, no, oh, I don't know who he is. But he has that secret, which could come up at any time. Like, he has that trick card, you know, he could play. Yeah, I guess it's that same thing. Yeah. And with this, I don't know that, that Doc Ock has the same, like, motivation to keep it a secret. So yeah, it yeah. could kind of go any direction for a sequel. I'm kind of curious to see, like, will he keep it a secret? Yeah, but that scene in particular, I think, was really well done of him, like, sort of bouncing between sort of pleading and sort of, like, blackmailing him, and then, like, Spider-Man immediately saying, like, well, you can do whatever you want, man. I'm not gonna, like, I'm not gonna let you do that to me. Yes. Like, if you want to tell people, like, go for it. Right. It's a really good scene. Mm. Yeah, for sure. I think that, yeah, the entire sequence was incredible. And I think it speaks volumes. The amount of uh, email we got specifically about Doc Ock, like, people love that Doc Ock storyline and his voice acting and implications throughout the game. I thought it was a cool portrayal of that character. Oh, good. And you know everything. That's right. Um, Period. Real quick, maybe before we get to all that Doc Ock stuff, or we can reverse a little bit, um, what do you guys think about Lee and Mr. Negative's final boss fight and stuff? We haven't really addressed that yet. Uh, I'm happy they brought him back. I thought, like, like, you know, last episode I said, like, I, I was kind of disappointed that they sort of silent him for the, the for Doc Ock, but I like that he comes back and, you know, has a pretty interesting last uh, boss fight. Yeah. Like, the, bo- the fight isn't, like, my favorite, but... I, I think they're just waiting for Triangle to pop up. Yeah, yeah but it's I the think, most forgettable of the third act. Yeah, well, really, but I think I actually like that fight. It's an interesting yeah. send off for the character. Like, I, this is the boss fight. Like that, you know, even if it's not the best one, I feel like this is the boss fight he he deserved in terms of like giving him a big finale versus you know the, the one before that. Yeah. Um, okay, Joseph De Maria has a couple thoughts. He took a back up just a little bit more. He says, "Hey, when you're playing as MJ infiltrating Norman's penthouse, a couple things caught my eye. First is how the spiders, at least the ones that crawled in MJ, were numbered." I immediately pictured Norman getting a bunch of scientists together and trying to label all these spiders, and how eventually the spiders would molt off their skin and no longer be numbered. Uh, more importantly, however, there is no there are tattoos. <laughs> well, the one that bites Miles, he has like it has like a U on it, right? Did I see that correctly? Is that like an ultimate reference? It used to be a ten, and it just molted. Off oh, I see. Um, uh, actually, I don't know because I think they were numbered in the Ultimate Comics. Okay. Too. So, but I don't know why it's a U. I, I think it was a number. Did it, we all see a U? 
I saw a number. You. Well, I you use a number in some ways. Oh, oh. sure. It's like a Roman thing. Um, anyways, uh, this person says, more importantly, however, there is no toilet in Norman's bathroom. Now, what? Admittedly, there is a toilet in Harry's bathroom in the apartment, but why would there not be one in Norman's? Who builds a bathroom without a toilet? Well, if you examine the environment, you can find poop all over the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no, I'm going to wake you up. i got to use your bathroom again. It's like a Murphy bed. you got to pull it out. Oh, oh I see. Little oh. goblin pellet. <laughs> <laughs> Murphy toilet. Um, okay, Joseph really gets to it, though, saying... This, uh, overall, this is really the best story in any Marvel video game. Probably true. Uh, when I heard that Martin Lee escaped after attacking Oscorp, sorry, Oscorp, uh, I thought there'd be a big moment during the final fight that Martin would show up and help Peter beat Doc Ock. I know he's a villain, but Insomniac said they took some liberties, and I was hoping that would be one of them. Did you guys think about that, or is it just like, ah, Mr. Negative's defeated, goodbye? No, nah, I thought he was done. Yeah. yeah. Um, there was a lot of confusion, which is surprising to me. Uh, that mirrored James from Dublin here is saying, hey, so when the City Hall bombing takes place, we're going back to Act 1 for this, okay. I'm sorry, and uh, Peter's Spidey Sense trademark goes off, he turns around to see what's setting it off, he spots a guy getting out of a car while turning into a demon, then, still in Peter's point of view, the camera pans to the left to reveal Martin Lee turning negative. The camera just whip pans right again to focus on a third guy on the City Hall steps. There's no reaction shot from Peter, no audio line, no change of music, the camera doesn't even focus on Lee for literally more than two seconds. It happened so fast that I genuinely wasn't even certain it was him, because surely the game wouldn't skip over such a significant reveal. Then after all the cutscenes are said and done, there's a phone call between Peter and MJ, and they're discussing the plan of action for taking Lee down. Is there a missing scene? What's happening here? Other people wrote in about that, yeah. about like, when did they reveal that Lee was negative? What's happening? Right. Yeah. I thought that was weird, too. I, like, I don't know, comic fans obviously knew he was Mr. Negative. But the characters, I was like, how did they find out it was him? Like, you would think they would have had a conversation, like, holy crap. He's Mr. Negative, you know. Like <laughs> yeah. a rec- recognition of that. Right, and I wonder if it's connected maybe. You know, he talks about, was there a cut scene? I'm sure it was reworked Ten Ways to Sunday and stuff. But I wonder if it is connected to the fact that in the E3 demo, remember, the reveal is through that helicopter window. Mm-hmm. Remember? And that might be a more momentous thing that they then tweaked in some way, but there's some remnant in there of mm-hmm. the change of the reveal. Um, but Dan Dinkler, Mr. Dinkler, mm-hmm. says, you'll never believe this. Try me. Or will I? But I watched Sinister 2 the same don't believe night. It. Nope. I don't know. I watched Sinister 2 the same night as playing the Mary Jane segment where she watches that disturbing video of Lee getting his powers. Needless to say, it freaked me out. Anybody else think that was scary? I don't know what Sinister 2 was. I don't know I what know. that is either. Neither do I. Yeah, I don't believe it. Is that them. from the producers of Insidious? I'll say yes. That sounds about right. Um, I don't know anything about that. But did you guys find that scene scary? When Lee's getting his powers and killing his parents and all that stuff? That I found a little... It was shocking when his parents, like, blew up into goop. Yeah. Right. I found that more shocking than, like, the yeah. bombing earlier or anything. Yeah. Like, I found it shocking what? that, yeah, that Osborne 2 would have that VHS just sitting there ready to hit play. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta watch this one again. Yeah. Hey, Freeze framing through an emulator. <laughs> uh, Sinister 2 is a kind of weirdo horror movie. Oh. So. From the producers of Insidious. Right. Isn't it weird, though, that I think it was in the last episode, I think I made a joke talking about Mary Jane's Sinister 2 being broken bottles and cardboard. And I said the word sinister too as a joke. Oh, oh really? Oh. I think so. Oh. Well, freak geez. out, you guys. Oh. <laughs> um, Azal Muhammad, friend of the show, says, Hey, I'm still unsure about the Otto Lee connection established in Act 2, since Otto's in the room with Norman when Lee accidentally kills his parents with his powers. There's a part in Otto's hideout where Lee thanks Otto for working on a cure for Lee's condition. So maybe that's enough severance for causing Lee to kill his parents? It still feels tenuous. Like, why does he blame Osborne so much, but Otto's like, Yeah, you're cool, man. I'll work kind of alongside you. Hmm. I hadn't thought of that. That's interesting. Yeah, maybe there's more details there that, that we didn't I assume Otto could have been on the side of, well, I hate Norman too. Come on. I didn't yeah. know what he could do. Or like, uh, I feel human. bad for you. Yeah. Was Otto there at the time? Yeah, that's what he's saying. Oh, okay. I don't yeah. remember that. Apparently so he's that. in the background or something. Yeah. I, I didn't see it either. Hmm. But, um, and then Hazal also says, Otto having a hideout not known to Peter also feels tenuous because that means Otto's always been a bad egg since he'd been planning this event before the neural trip causes neural chip causes him to go mad, which makes the hallucination sequence between Potter, Peter and Otto ring hollow, since we as the player are being told that Otto's never been the good man that Peter's currently attempting to rectify while under, while under Scorpion's venom. Mm. But maybe that's just me. I wish that was the story. I Like, I wish the neural chip was not even a part of it. Same here. Yeah, I wish he, he was just... secretly bad the whole time. Yeah, or, you know, like, he had these motivations that turned him bad, and well, the neural chip yeah. just, like, weakens that. Do you think that the hideout proves that or helps that the yeah. theory first certainly yeah okay because it was because i was still confused about like he pulled the chip out at the end but it wasn't like the night and day cartoon 
light switch. Oh yeah, it's not like he was immediately. Yeah, exactly. So there is still some evil in his heart. Yeah, no matter I mean, what. do you think that he used the chip as an excuse to, like, because it feels like they do imply, but I wonder if like maybe Osborne was just sort of blaming that on the idea, like if he was just sort of saying, oh, it's the chip that's making me do it. But I yeah, know. I, I already know that I'm bad. I would be into that, but yeah, like the dramatically taking the chip out makes it certainly yeah. feel like the story is not trying to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then he also says the final battle between Peter and Otto was okay, but I did dig the reveal that Otto knew that Peter was Spider-Man, since you can hear him confirm the fact while Peter is hallucinating while under Scorpion's venom. It's uttered twice. It was a neat touch for those paying attention during that sequence. So when it comes up during the final battle, it's not as big of a surprise as it could be, but actually a hidden fear of Peter. I like that idea too. That like even though Peter acts shocked, he's like, "You know, you know," and he was so mad that the hallucination tips a little bit or hints that in Peter's mind he suspects that he actually knows. Yeah, yeah that's a fun idea. I, I like that, I will say that like gameplay wise that I don't know, it was kinda hard to me for me to reconcile that like here's someone who's been a scientist most of his life. He's not doesn't look like he like you know like is is just like a bodybuilder or anything. For the number of punches that guy took was just kind of <laughs> a little high than no, uh, yeah. the robot arms must change high. your skin uh, uh make it up or something. But on that uh on the hallucination thing, I did like, in theory, even though it feels, and a lot of people wrote in about this, obviously, that it feels very Scarecrow. Um, I did like the idea of it revealing a little bit more. Like, I like, Otto has a couple good lines where he's screaming, he goes, you are the poison, Peter. Everything you touch suffers. And then there's that moment where he's like, he's like, I bet your Uncle Ben jumped in front of the bullet. He's like, I would have jumped in front of the bullet if I was Uncle Ben. And then Spider-Man oh, has I some... That. That's, yeah. Wow. That's it's cool. Neat. And Spider-Man has some line where he's like, he's like, oh, he said, I'd rather fi- oh, I'm sorry, there's Scorpion that says that. Because then Spider-Man says, I think I'd rather fight the real Scorpion than my subconscious. Oh, <laughs> oh that's yeah. a good line. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I don't know. If I didn't like that hallucination scene that much, because it did feel... I know we talked about this earlier, and I said it wasn't that much like uh, Arkham, but yes. this scene in particular did feel a bit like Arkham to me. And, and I inc- like, yeah, including like the Lee fight, because that also has like the trippy thing. Yeah. This is a lot of weird abstract environments which normally I'm down for, but it's surprising in Act 3 to come swinging in with all these... Yeah, maybe just they needed one of them. Although, the giant arms coming through the background was really sweet. That was cool. That looked really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, somebody had a very good point, um, and it went a little something like this. This is Nathan saying, If Spider-Man is still able to navigate the city lab during this hallucination, how is he fighting a boss fight and not destroying the lab? Like, where was he physically when he well, was fighting a boss? It would have been cool if he came to and, like, the lab was just destroyed. Half of New York was destroyed. But this is beating the crap out of some homeless dude. <laughs> this is Nathan's best point, though. He says, why would anyone at Insomniac create a hallucination level with Spider-Man and use Scorpion instead of Mysterio? Yeah. I they have the budget weird. to do both, man. Or <laughs> they, they just didn't have him in the game, I guess. I don't know. But they hinted that he already fought Mysterio. I would yeah. bet. I mean, Brandon Tari has said, like, hey, we had to cut a lot out of this game. A lot of bosses had to go. I bet that at least maybe like this tech or some of the environment concept yeah. art was originally tied to Mysterio. It has to be. It that would make a lot of sense. It yeah. would make a lot of sense. Yeah, because just the idea of, like, oh, it's some poison. Because now everything's that, weird. Yeah, Scorpion's never, he has a poison sting, but it's never like made hallucinations, you know. Right. Uh, Thomas Wilson said it reminded him a lot of Infinity War and some of the trippy stuff of Infinity War, seeing like it's in, inside Thanos' mind and stuff. And James Hicks, okay. this. Oh. <gasps> Relax, Leo, relax! James, you're safe. You're safe. You can't come through your earbuds, I promise. No, no! Uh, James Hicks writes in. The nerve of this guy. Let's hear it. He says, The part where Scorpion poisons Spider-Man and he hallucinates the green flood around New York City surely has to be a PS1 reference, right? That's that's what I was reminded of, for sure. Oh, really? Was that yeah. original game, yeah. What's it, because it's all like foggy down there and you can't go down? Or what's the... Yeah, yeah, it's just covered in fog. Okay, that's cool. Um, Grim Feather says, The Streets of Poison mission... Um, stand it's not out green though. Yeah, I looked at it too. It wasn't green. Uh, stand out as a highlight of Act Three for me. I usually don't enjoy dream sequences in games, but the active role the player takes in the sequence and the platforming s gameplay kept me engaged in the exposition. Exposition and made Spidey's quest to stop Otto feel even more personal. It was kind of like right before the finale, a nice reminder of kind of walking through their relationship. Just in case, I'd imagine you had done a bunch of side quests of, hey, here's who Otto was. Just to remind yeah, you, you remember a bit. you liked him. <laughs> <laughs> here's how you parkour, by the way. You hold R two and it helps you run across platforms <laughs> that can, was weird that's a video game problem but i was, I was like man i wish i wasn't saying this right now right like, this is just taking me out of it although oh, i give me a few seconds to try it on my own before you tell yeah me good. although i was trying to swing i think i might be that idiot that needed that help because i forgot about the part where you have to like hold l2 to like aim specifically oh sure. i just did that so few times that i died several times in that sequence not knowing oh that really I had to change oh, it up. Right. 
Because it's never popped on the screen, friend, but I can ignore it, I guess. Um, here's a great question. Cade Marks from Chandler, Arizona says, Hey, in the conversation immediately following the end of Act 2, Spider-Man and Yuri talk about the phone, talk on the phone about how Spider-Man left the hospital before he had finished healing. This struck me as strange, because how could he be treated in the hospital without his suit being removed? Yeah. And does that mean Yuri knows his identity? They never reference this in conversation or later in the game. Then later in Act 3, when Peter is brought back to Feast to have his injuries treated, they never remove his suit. This detail really bothered me. I like the idea of someone at a hospital, like, writing patient names. Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> they had the outfit where he's, like, in his underwear with yeah. his mask on. They could have used that at the very least. Yeah, just put that, put yeah. that model in there. I don't know. It would have been kind of fun to lay a cap, even if you don't want to, like, model the hospital and all that, to have, like, a shot of him in, like, in a gown or something with his mask still on. Just to be, like, acknowledged, like, all right, we respected his identity. Yeah. Yeah, that would have been good. Because yeah. I feel like when they were bringing him into Feast, there, I felt like that scene was coming of, like, do we remove his mask? Or, like, yep. I thought that was coming. And they just completely sort of, like, silently like, yeah. that conversation. It would have been a cool moment to see them, like, they like, all ca- kind of quietly agreeing of, like, nah, let's not do it. Right, yeah. right. Let's just try and shove, like, respirators, like, up right. little nose in the suit. <laughs> yeah. I love that scene right before it, though. I thought that animation was incredible of just, like, Doc Ock beating the crap out of Spider-Man. That was like, some of the most impactful animation of the game, of even though it was a cutscene. Just, holy God, is he getting the crap beat out of him. There's, like, a pool of blood underneath him afterwards. It was wild yeah. looking. It was cool looking. It w- that was close to when Miles got bit, right? No. That's no, a, it wasn't? That's towards the end. Okay. Yeah, for some reason, I was thinking, like, oh, my gosh, I wonder if he's going to be out of commission for a while, and then Miles is going to jump in. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, may, maybe you'd seen the spider at that point, so maybe I think that's you why had. you thought You're of like, it. Yeah. Oh, the spider bites come in, blah, blah, blah. One of the most impactful moments for me emotionally, which was immediately undercut by them not taking the suit off and just, like, doing a quick fade to black, and then he was back up and running around. But I love that scene when MJ ran into Feast and saw him, like, on the table, like, yeah. covered in blood, and she has the best delivery where she just goes, like, oh, my God. That's all she says, and it's such an amazing performance. Just this little line, that's all she had to say. And I was like, oh, this is the scene where I'm going to be destroyed. And then, nope, fade to black, everything's fine. Yeah, okay, they could have milked you a little bit more. Yeah. Come on, guys. Milk me! Milk me! <laughs> hey, video <laughs> game! Mother Spider! <laughs> <laughs> there was another scene with, uh, right after Miles goes and gets to the water, and he comes back, and they're having a hard time, and then Spider-Man leaves, and he's like, Wait, are you are you Spider Man's girlfriend? And he's like, oh, yeah, that's cool. I was like, oh, that's a f- kind of a fun little exchange. It's right. also weird that Miles doesn't recognize Peter's voice. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That is a right. big right. recurring theme. Is what the hell's wrong with Miles? Surely everybody knows because it certainly seems like everybody does. Yeah. A series of back to back scenes of Spider Man. You knew? How is it possible? You knew what? too? Huh? I thought I was being pretty hidden and clever. <laughs> um, do you guys want to talk about Miles? Too bad. Uh, uh, Rag <laughs> from no. Uh, Rag from Braintree, England. Okay. What? England. Braintree. Is that a real place? Mm. I don't know. Is that a reference to Isaac Newton? Because that apple fell on him and then he, oh, yeah, he uses brain under the right. tree. Um, he says, hey, GI crew, just a really quick observation. I'm sure you noticed anyways. Back in part one of the game club, Reeves mentioned that Miles' power include camouflaging himself and paralyzing people temporarily. Well, when MJ is going through Norman's secret lab, if you interact with the spider cages, she mentions how the labels on them say optical camouflage and bioelectrokinesis. Hmm. Now, this is obviously a usual dose of fake scientific mumbo-jumbo, but definitely sounds like Miles' power. And sure enough, he was bitten by one of those spiders. That's a good detail. Yeah, Alex from Salt Lake City says, Mary sneaks into O's Corp, finds a hidden room, bumps into a glass of container... Gla- bumps into a glass container of spiders. They crawl all over her, so she stands to brush them off. One remains without her knowing... The spider then survives and hangs on as MJ jumps off a building, gets saved by Peter, <laughs> and makes it all the way to Feast, where it lands on a conveniently placed box that's picked up by Miles. And the moment he picks up the box, spider bite. <laughs> <laughs> I also thought it was a little weird. I thought maybe the spider should have like crawled into a case or something she had, and then it was trapped in the case. Her like, mouth. Yeah, or yeah. her mouth. Not her nose. Oh, a spider shoving in my mouth. Oh, hold on, let me pick it out of my teeth. <laughs> That's what's so weird about that sequence is it's like such a like specific series of hoops it's jumping through to get to Miles yeah. being bitten, which is the obvious thing that we know is going to happen. Yeah. Right. I mean, couldn't they have worked some other way for the story for Miles to have just been there or something? I don't know. Miles did that stealth yeah. sequence? Yeah, maybe. Well, well, no, it would have to be MJ because of the Harry connection, because she's like, oh my god, Harry, where's yeah. Miles? Be like, well, Harry maybe have them both there, I don't know. But you can't troll both at once. Uh, that's a good point. And even on a practical level, there's no way Mary Jane would have not noticed there was a spider on her for that long. A giant spider. And tried to well, has she ever been bit? 
Uh, not the new one, like the main continuity of the series. Really, did wow. get spider powers once when like everybody in New York got spider powers. <laughs> but you know, that's that's all. That like a weird thing <laughs> that happened. That's all. But like, you could have had like Miles and Mary Jane there, and then Miles could have got bitten and then maybe fainted or something. And then Mary Jane was like, "Oh, I got to deal with this and this," and like yeah. there's a bunch of like sable guys. Throw him off the me. building too. Yeah, you want me to just cut this part of the podcast and send it to Insomnia because her job yeah, application? Come on, Brian. <laughs> yeah, don't you understand? I'm, I'm saying these guy. sentences. Why weren't they doing <laughs> Why it? Why aren't they in the game? I do like when people do that online. I'm like, "Come on, guys, you didn't you didn't make the game." Right? Do you want to have a comment for yourself then? <laughs> come on, dude. <laughs> <laughs> come on, this curly hair dude is annoying. I <laughs> thought I thought that was a bold Whoa. move. And I didn't really understand where MJ was going when she's like, where are you, Peter? I need you. There's people with guns on me on the roof. I'm going to jump for it. And spider is very clearly like, no, don't do it. I'm not quite there yeah. yet. She's like, see ya. And she goes for it. You're and he, up. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And he catches her, which is very sweet and all that stuff because they have that cute little line. Which I like, would have liked crazy. to have You're amazing. the pavement. Yeah. <laughs> and then Peter was like, no. But he clearly said he wasn't ready and she went for that's it. That's true. Like, that actually got me just on the tension level. Like, he said it. He said it, and you weren't listening. It's going to be a nightmare. It reminds me of Back to the Future 2. I think that was the first time I ever saw that. Like, a dude up against a wall, and like, oh, i got to jump off this building now. Yes, yes. And then the DeLorean picked MJ up, which I thought was a That's what I was hoping for, yeah. What's better than that? Is that that's the just DeLorean? the best thing you can do in fiction, is have somebody jump off a building and then slowly rise up. And they yeah. come back. It's really oh. good. It's really good. In fact, at my funeral, <laughs> just... Insist on bringing like a DVD player uh-huh. and a huge projector screen, and then it's just that five second clip from Back to the Future 2 <laughs> when Marty rises up. Oh, up. I thought you were going to tell us to throw your coffin off a building <laughs> and then raise it back up. And no, better yet, then also just for fun, fill my coffin full of spiders and then turn it into an open casket halfway through. <laughs> I had uh, this You're is a lot of arms spring out doing this thing. <laughs> I had a friend prop. that was like he wanted to rig up his coffin so that like when people leaned in to like look at the body, if there was like a lever they would press on and the body would start to sit up <laughs> and then it would spit puke out of yeah, his mouth. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm alive. I'm alive. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let them bury me. I like the idea of him recording his VO line for post death saying I'm alive and he can't get the performance right, so it just sounds like this hollow I'm alive. Like, oh, this is the one time you're going through all this effort. Just nail this one line. Alright, that's fun. Um, Paul from Dublin, Ireland here, uh, he says, Hey, I love the game despite some serious flaws. Example, the last wave of a stable base and there's one bad guy left I can't find. Turns out he's stuck in a container. Luckily, I had skill points in the bank because I upgraded my ground pound and just spammed that until he was knocked out. Otherwise, I would have been so frustrated. <laughs> uh, that's a recurring theme. A lot of people wrote in with bugs. Like, I had a fair amount going through. Weird stuff where the rhino would get stuck and, like, walk in place. Hmm. But a lot of people wrote in and said they had a lot of problems with bugs, uh, which was surprising. But that's not where he's going with this. He says, I want to be careful here, which is important to stress, because I'm all for powerful women being portrayed in the world. Uh-oh. But Peter's one... <laughs> 100,000 per correct, one, okay, 100,000 percent correct, trying to keep MJ out of danger, uh, this is, I'm blowing it, he is 1,000, <laughs> <laughs> Peter's right trying to save MJ, um, because the men she's sneaking around are terrorists with guns that blew up City Hall in New York, and because she has Moxie, she gets annoyed at Peter at the point of breaking up with him because he doesn't want her to get hurt? By terrorists! When she gets caught and cowers in fear, rightly so, these men are going to mercilessly kill her. The next center of her ability to react is her just saying, No, please! Like in the Game Over screen. Mm-hmm. He's like, this isn't a men versus women issue. This is a man with spider powers going up against bad guys, trying to stop his insane girlfriend from taking on terrorists with absolutely no training whatsoever. I, I mean, I can totally see that. It's just, like, I think that it is less about, like, that then I think it is sort of if it's part of a running theme of like you always sort of like I mean it's implied that it's been a co- running theme with them of like mm-hmm. Peter t- telling her not to do stuff in less extreme situations right, right. and then right. like her saying like no like I do I want to do this despite the fact that you've been telling me this forever so I can see her making that leap but like logically yes of course he's the right to like not want her to go near you know people with guns all the time like a a, mil- a paramilitary group and it's this big concession at the end of like okay you can go invade Osborne's tower and he even he seems to be understanding of like go for it but I wish there was even more of him really having to wrestle with that because he's like he's uh, just sending his girlfriend to die at yeah, that yeah. point like come on man also why wasn't he ready she he knew she was coming he could have been there perched ready to go. As soon as she was in the building, yeah, right? you to start that mission, you swing up to two blocks away, 
and I guess he's just sitting there the whole time. He's trying to finish a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> come on, be cool. What'd you guys? Oh, think? it's so greasy. Oh. No one wrote in about it, but what about that like um, uh, burning apartment scene? Or I guess it's feast. Burning apartment scene. Oh, like the other feast when that gets burned down, and then it gets to that point where like Miles and MJ save Peter, and Spider-Man seems surprisingly shook by all that. Like I would have died. What? If I didn't sleep shot that web. <laughs> I was just confused because don't you go back to the East after that and it's not burned down? That it's the it's the feast in Harlem. I think they said it's like this weird northern feast. Oh, weird! The northern yeah. feast. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I was surprised by I, I like the beat narratively. I like Peter getting freaked out. Um, but at the same time, it's like man, you've gone up against some pretty crazy things so far in the game. Like a burning building, that seems doable. Yeah. I know you have to like hold the platform up so they don't die and stuff. But you've done. I, I read it more as him being sort of impacted by the fact that it's happening sort of close, like, basically, literally hitting close to home, of like, yeah. man, like, I, people could, people I care about could have died, and also yeah. me, but, yeah, I guess uh, you're right. that's sort of more, I, I read it less about his own personal thing, but more about, like, it hitting him that this is starting to impact people around him. Yeah, I can dig it. Um, oh, real quick, here's, a, here's an interesting thought from Charles Hudman saying, after I beat the game, I realized I got tricked, I was tricked into buying a Superman game. Uh, it makes sense. Mary Jane becoming an investigative reporter like Lois Lane. Peter ignoring his home life due to feeling obligated to become Spider-Man. The I can't save everyone line that Peter says. Peter is such a positive force in New York. Everyone loves him and sees him as a symbol of hope. It seems as if Insomniac borrowed heavily from Spider-Man. Or, er, sorry, from Superman. They definitely uh, borrowed heavily from Spider-Man as well. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that. Did you think about the Superman thing at all? No. Not, not really. No, not, yeah, not really. Okay. Uh, sure, I can see some parallels. I can see the par- yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that's... Yeah, you can make parallels to Batman. You can make... He's a superhero. They're both superheroes. So, like, those Just themes are there. What, what, what are they talking about? He also kind of seemed like a spider to me in some of the ways that he was Yeah, I don't know if I got that. World. I was thinking of things that spiders can do and then comparing it to him, <laughs> and, like, they matched up really it well. It seems like he can this do kind whatever. This guy's wrote into podcast.gameofforward.com, and you're ridiculing them for their interesting thought. What about, like, MJ being a reporter? That's that's interesting. Yeah. I yeah. D- well, I will make the concession that it does seem like Mary Jane is uh, quite a bit like Lois Lane. Okay. Right, so shut the hell up, curly haired. Yeah. Great email. Come on, dude. <laughs> Tyler from Greenwood, Indiana uh, says, Hey, in the first part of the game club, I emailed about how much I enjoyed the little mini game puzzles in Dr. Octavius' lab. Boy, was I rewarded. <laughs> Knowing that Peter essentially helped create Doc Ock by completing his research is what makes this game so damn good. Insomniac took something like throwaway little puzzles and interwove them into a story to actually give you a player, to give you, the player, a grander sense of accomplishment and meaning. This attention to detail is rarity, and Insomniac really knocked it out of the park. Um, I guess that is a cool idea. Yeah, you're totally right. Um, Angie and Neji from Richmond, Virginia says, The way they portrayed Doc Ock was genius. I almost thought he was going to team up with Spidey to take on Norman in the end. Mm. Huh. When, you, uh, when Doc Ock was like holding Norman Osborn over the edge and he let him go, I feel like Doc Ock would have regretted that the next morning. Like, ah, I could have tortured him more. Really. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, why he, yeah that's why he was. Turning wouldn't. away... Yeah. After dropping, you don't even want to see this guy die. This is your entire mission. You've gone through so much effort just to take down this dude. Yeah. And then that's it. You don't take uh, any joint. I mean, dude. well, I'm done now. <laughs> I don't remember what he said. I'm he bored. Was, he was kind of like digging into him a little bit, right? Uh, Osborn was. And so, like, it made sense that he dropped him. Right. Yeah, I think, yeah, he totally was insulting him. Like, you've never been that smart. I think he said right. something along so those lines. Well, screw you, dude. But... Screw you, dude. Basically having the McGruber F you, dude, moment at the end, but like without the sweet act of vengeance, he's got through so much work. I Whoa, isn't that revenge? Like killing the guy? Like, that's kind of messed it up. It like you wanted to torture him or something. Um, <laughs> I, All right. I felt disconnected. And maybe it's, I didn't walk around on the street level enough in Act 3 or something, but the idea of Devil's Breath and the entire city being infected with this disease, I guess it didn't really hit me that hard, mm-hmm. or didn't really think about it too much. It was like, okay, Aunt May cop blood. There are a couple sequences of her, like, helping people in Feast, but did you guys really connect with, like, the Devil's Breath infecting the entire city storyline? They built it up so much, and then you, like, barely see any consequences from it, I feel like. Outside of the yeah. big one. With yeah. Aunt May, but yeah. Right. I feel like when May started getting sick, I was like, wait, what is going on? Oh, right, yeah. they did that whole thing. Well, yeah. what, I'm so what else would you have liked to see? I don't know. Like Everybody parodies. in the city turning into mutants yeah. that I fight. <laughs> yeah, like good video game. Yeah, I don't know. I guess I just didn't really feel it. I feel like I'm with Serial. I was reminded every once in a while. Like, oh yeah, I guess there's a disease. And somehow that helps get back at Osborn and Doc Ock, even though he only wants to kill this one person, really? He's that just was like, the weird thing. It seemed like it was a political move to like, all right, I'm releasing Devil's Breath, and then 
people will blame Osborne for this, but I didn't quite ha- understand the connection there. Yeah. I've thrown up a thing on WikiLeaks that you can read about how I've totally exposed Norman. <laughs> there it is. Uh, Pat from Ireland. A lot of Ireland here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's green, like the Green Goblin. It's, like it's a country. Yeah. Classic song from Sorrel. It's a country. All right, I just wanted to reference one of the revelations in Act 3 that addresses some of your misgivings about Doc Ock and the Sinister Six supplanting Mr. Negative as the big bad. While the exposition dump in Doc Ock's lair might seem a bit too convenient and reinforces your fears that the character turn was shoehorned in, I argue that the game offers up the idea that the good doctor was this way long before he donned the arms. This is similar to an email from before. But uh, every time I was in his office throughout the game, I wondered what that blueprint on the largest board on the back of the room was. It just looked like an innocuous tech design, but the revelation that this was the blueprint for the raft... Coupled with his involvement in the experiment that created Mr. Negative, lends credence to the idea that Otto's morals were sketchy in general, and that his warm exterior was just a facade. Hmm. So he helped people break out of the raft because he knew it from that early on? Hmm. Is that the idea? I found myself reflecting on this a lot in Act 3, as the game took the time to challenge the idea that his turn could be explained away by the arms causing a change in personality. Sure, the choice was tele- telegraphed plenty of times, but the strength of the performances in the game made me love the doc and desperately want to explain away his villainy via some gamma rays as science. The fact that I couldn't cling to the notion it was forced to wrestle with the idea that the doc had a darker side that manipulated Peter is a triumph of the game's characteriz- characterization in my opinion. So he didn't buy into the chip theory? I guess not. Hmm. Yeah, he's anti-chip theory. Well, I know like sometimes I pop a box of Pringles and eat them and I just like gorge myself on those right. chips and so chips sometimes make me do bad things too. So Bad jokes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Steven Olulu Nike says, hey, I found Dr. Octavius' arc of his extremely interesting because watching the last game club I could see that you were just as confused as I was trying to understand why exactly Otto became Doc Ock it was at the end when Doc Ock is caught and he tries to manipulate Peter in that instance to let him go and work with him again that's when I realized his true villainy was in manipulating Peter to help him knowing that he could barely do his work without Peter I then remembered the voice note that you pick up in the lab towards the beginning where Doc Ock is enamored by how natural Peter is in his understanding of complex science now Doc Ock did not see Peter as an assistant but a partner I also thought the part where he sees Peter fixing the suit, and I realized that he must have known then that Peter is Spider-Man. The heartbreaking Peter's reaction when he realizes that Doc Ock has tried to fully kill him multiple times was devastating, because he genuinely thought Doc Ock didn't know he was Spider-Man. But yeah, just the manipulation level throughout the entire game, I think, is an interesting layer of villainy. Yeah, like In my that. mind, I guess I didn't quite feel it, although I thought the performance was awesome when Spider-Man was screaming, like, you know, you knew, and he was so pissed. Because in my mind, it's like, isn't he slightly better? Because he knew all these connections to Peter, and he wasn't going out and like ripping MJ limb for limb or yeah. like, torturing anybody around him. Point. So yeah. it's for him to be so pissed about it, it's like it's almost a positive, isn't it? I mean, <sighs> what he tried to blow him up that one time, I guess, right? Right. <laughs> and I guess he beat him up, but he didn't kill him that one time. He like did really beat him up really bad. Right. Yeah. So I don't know. Like it seemed there there was yeah possibly some restraint there. Yeah, could have been worse. Doc Ock, not that bad. I think it's a good Yeah, I mean, here. come yeah. on. What's the big deal? I dress up as him for Halloween. Absolutely. Yeah, he's not a terrorist in my oh, book. Oh, dude, that's not cool. <laughs> not cool, dude. Mark V writes in and says, Hey, Game Club. Ready? Hello. Hey. Hey. Happy birthday. It seems silly, but the part I can't get out of my mind is when Peter decides to make the anti-Doc Ock suit and does so in what appears to be mere minutes. Uh, initially, I was completely pulled out of the game when this happened. What? No suit building montage? No believable passage of time? Unless it's been an arduous <laughs> process? But then I realized something. I've been making new suits throughout the entire game, each one taking literal seconds. I mean, yeah. like, that's one thing, like, because, I mean, video games play with time really strangely, but, like, in that cutscene, it felt like, A, I wasn't sure why he did it or what that suit was supposed to do. Like, yeah. what specifically about that suit made yes. it anti-Doc Ock? Besides that's the fact right, that it sort yeah. of looked like the, it had the color scheme of his claws. He'd be confused, whatever. he would think he's fighting one of Wait, his own claws. is that me? Oh, <laughs> as he got beat up and those pieces fell off, he had this his other suit on underneath it. Which I thought it was, was cold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm really cold. I need to yeah. make another layer for my And then suit. he had Spider-Punk underneath that suit. You can yeah. see his wrist teeth. Oh, and his underwear. Skin. He has uh, Spider-Man underwear. Yeah. <laughs> that oh, montage yeah. was funny when he was making the suit because it was like panning over the drawings and then fading the drawings and then it did it again and then he had the suit and it was like exactly my who's winning E3 montage <laughs> of me doing calculations <laughs> that I did in five minutes. Wait and a minute. <laughs> then he did and then he tried to jump on a skateboard and fell. Yeah, also, right. I didn't think that suit was that cool looking for like, oh, I being, it was like cool. the final. I mean, it's it was fine, fine but it's, <laughs> look, you have like one of the most iconic looking characters of all time. Where, like, who? It's hard to like beat Spider-Man's classic suit, right? Right. So, so he like, just should have put on the classic suit. I don't know. Like, I just, 
I'm going to oh, make a cool. new suit to be like, all right, look how cool this is now. Right, and especially like its its ultimate power was what to, like refill your gadget. So, like, eh, it didn't okay. even seem as good as like some of the other stuff I used. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No. Um, what did uh. you guys think about the two sequences of the fight, like the two stages of the fight for Doc Ock? I had a little trouble with the first one, but that's just because I was being dumb and didn't notice it. There were like points outside the rim of the arena that you can climb on, but after that, right. it seemed yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, felt pretty in line with the rest of those boss fights in yeah. terms of like you're kind of just waiting for the moment where you can press triangle. Yeah. Um, but that second fight I thought was like interesting. I thought it was cool the idea that he couldn't use his webs anymore. Yeah. Just yeah. go in and punch him in the face. Like any yeah. game that just ends with brawling and beating the crap out of a bad dude with your fist. Yeah. And on the side of the building was cool. Yeah, the perspective angle for sure. I thought it looked just incredible. The music was great. I'd be curious well to see if he can even fail that because I think like that would be one of those things where it's like it's a really cool set piece but I think if you fail it once it kind of like saps all the power out of it. I'm like ragged all off the building. Yeah. I wanted to see I thought it was cool conceptually really cool looking. I wanted to see a little bit more variety to the combat because it was kind of like the same combo over and over again. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to see him maybe rip off another arm or like some sense of progression going on throughout that. Yeah. Even when you're fighting him on top of the building the first time you do that combo and take him out like that looks cool, but then you do it like three or four more times and just kind of loses some of its emphasis when it's the same exact animation every time. Right, right. And by the way, I'm just noticing in my notes that apparently there's a line that I forgot about where Doc Ock says, I will cure the city after I bring down Osborne. But that's like after he thought see? that he threw him off He's the... He's not a bad guy. Yeah, it's just a little confusing. Yeah. Hmm. Um, let's see. Steve Barfoot from Nugatuck, Connecticut says, Hey, J.I. Crew, the last cutscene really cemented my love for Peter and Octavius as voice acting. Hear the cracks in Peter's voice against... Going while going against Doc Ock was gut wrenching because of how much he looked up to Otto. I loved how they gave Otto an almost Walter White esque background with his relationship to Norman and Oshkor. It made their feud believable. Also, yeah, the Rocky like, joke between Electro and Spidey was probably the best joke in the game. We didn't mention Adrian that. Adrian one, yeah. Right, and then he's like, "No one gets my jokes." And Electro is like, "I will crush you." And then he's like, "Hey, you got it. All right, yeah, that's, that's good." I guess uh, uh, Brian into Harley, creative director along with Bill Roseman, the Marvel representative. Uh, they both share Rocky as one of their favorite films. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Thank you for telling us that secret. Yeah. It's yeah, uh, a very good movie. Little pro tip. Um, it stays between us. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, I agree. The voice acting towards the end I thought was incredible. Just having, like, basically, it was almost like episode three, you are the chosen one! But I love just hearing <laughs> Peter scream, like, you are my hero! And then it's such a simple line, but I love it so much, uh, where Doc Ock is just almost trying to explain things to him. He's like, this means so much to me! And Spider-Man's like, not as much as it means to me! Just having, like, very clear, just expressing you could not be more simple at a storytelling level, but it's still fun to hear those two just, no, I'm very confident that I need to do this because it means a lot to me. I, 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 I in general, agree, but, like, for me, it was the moment where I write, oh, right, this is the same guy who does Yosuke in Persona 4 when he was started <laughs> he started yelling. I was like, oh, it's, I recognize that voice actor now. This is Spider-Man's uh, voice actor? Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. I didn't recognize him until the last No, time. like, it, I felt like he was doing a pretty good job of sort of not... Uh, yeah, like, of using his nor- like, like a normal voice, but not sort of you know being the Yuri Lowenthal voice. But like when he started yelling, it definitely felt like thi- this is sort of like the intonations of his voice started like coming in the like coming into place for me. I'm like, oh, this is that character that does other voices. Right, right, sure. Um, Tom from Redmond, Washington says, "Hey, GI folks, hello. Let's talk about the end of the Doc Ock fight. That look on Peter's face when Otto was begging for another chance just crushed me. You realize that Spider-Man has to choose between dooming his mentor to live all his days out as a vegetable." Uh, or letting him use technology that will eat his brain to save his body. Either way, Otto will never be whole again, and Peter can't provide a positive outcome for him no matter what he does. F! Says Tom. <laughs> F! <laughs> to pay respect. Yeah, yeah, the final yeah. line. Um, hey, what the... Dustin W. writes in from Clanton, Alabama, and he says, They killed Aunt May! <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah! Uh, Didn't think they would do it, but I felt it coming towards the end. Is this the first time May has died in the Superman story? Sorry, Spider-Man? <laughs> yes, in the Superman story, yes. All right, all right. All right, right everybody, all right. Uh, she's died a couple times. Oh, yeah. she has? Yeah. She died once, and then it was revealed at the end that she knew exactly that he was Spider-Man the whole time, so it was kind of like echoes of that. Oh, okay. But then it turned out that was just a plant from Norman Osborn that he had hired a, an actor to play on May, and he'd kidnapped the real Aunt May. That's probably what happened Held her theory. hostage for years, I think yeah. she also, Didn't she also die in that like, One More Day storyline where... Like, it was like right after Civil War, the, and that's why he wished for like. Yeah, was, she was about to die, and the only way to save her was to make a deal with the, the devil. devil. Yeah. yeah, people are not happy about that. That seems odd. Um, Vanna Winland says, "Hey there, writing in to talk about how incredible, though extremely sad, the scene with Spider-Man and Peter Parker waiting by Aunt May's hospital bed is. The fact that Peter tried to stay strong and act heroic, saying things like it's going to be okay, ma'am, while we know he's struggling to not let his emotions get the best of him in this moment was so powerful." 
I agree. When he's like leaving the suit on, oh, that's so good. Uh, even, when he is, even when he has the chance to save May with the antidote, he resists his want to act on it because it would mean killing hundreds of others. The scene meant so much to Peter, Spider-Man's character, because it proved that he's selfless and willing to do the right thing, even if it hurts him. Um, also, when Peter took his mask off and broke down by Aunt May's bedside, it really showed how human he is. It made me think how much I've done as Spider-Man up until that point, realizing, whoa, at his core, Peter's just a regular guy uh, who happened to get some powers, yet he's beaten up some of the scummiest of scum villains. Uh... Yeah, what did you guys think of that sequence in particular? I was like, I didn't think she was going to die, even until like the moment where that she flatlined. I was like, well, she's not going to die. And then <laughs> you heard the sound. I was like, whoa, whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I think my mouth dropped open at that point. It's it's effective. It really worked for me. Uh, even I think it speaks a lot that it even has the most dumb comic book setup for that moment of like. We only have enough in this container to either cure this person or the entire city. Or everybody. But you just quickly let it go because I think the performances are so good. Like when Peter gets down, he's just like, I don't know what to do. And he's like crying. So good. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, you do. Yeah. And yeah. I, like that was the sort of crystallization of like what I think is like the theme of Act 3, which is sort of you start the game sort of eight years into Peter's uh, sort of career as Spider-Man. He's like super confident. He knows what he's doing. And then like Act 3 is sort of that slowly falling apart because like early on it's the idea of like all these things are happening and I don't know which one to tackle first and it's sort of he's starting to stretch himself thin and then over the course of the act it feels like sort of uh, the Spider-Man becomes not enough and then he sort of starts like having to deal with the repercussions of like when one here like when his heroism alone isn't enough to like you know solve every problem right right and what's the yeah, solution? it's almost like super another like Spider-Man Superman story I mean maybe yeah he's like yeah. sweet now I can take the load off <laughs> Uh, now your relatives can die. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see to it. Uh, Chris, oh, he's the villain in the next game. Who's your uncle? <laughs> <laughs> who's your uncle? Bob. Chris from Portland, Tennessee says, Well, it's official. I've teared up at the ending of two video games now. Halo 4 and Spider-Man. Of course. So, Halo 4? Yeah, Halo 4. Is that mm-hmm. Wait, how does that one end? Oh, I know. He said he got some bad news. They screwed up the Halo 4. <laughs> <laughs> oh. no, um, I'm sorry Henry, your dog's dead. <laughs> Henry from Gettysburg says, Hey, dudes, <laughs> honest show of hands, who teared up at the end? And what was it that got you? For me, it was when May said, I'm proud of you, and Ben would have been too. Oh. Did you guys tear up? I did not tear up. Okay. I don't have a soul. Yeah. Closest I came was MJ saying, Oh, my God, but I still didn't tear I feel up. like the, the, yeah, the, the, and Ben would have been too, I think that was probably the closest, like, that, that was the most I came down. And what does it sure. look like when the game is close to making you cry? Oh, shit. It got me. <laughs> cool. Hang on. Let me write that down. This is making me cry. Okay. Yeah. Um, you're going to quote me on that one. Uh-huh. <laughs> William A. has other thoughts. He says, hey, guys, so I finished the game last night, and first off, I really enjoyed the experience, but maybe uh, maybe felt I overhyped the game in my head going into it. I felt as though they rushed the Sinister Six battles too quickly in an effort to progress further, and I didn't like how they made Martin Lee's character feel more like background noise the farther it went. Uh, while the final cutscene with Octavius was an amazing scene, the ending was just so abrupt. May dies. Ten seconds later, a funeral funeral clip. Ten seconds later, he's kissing MJ in a diner. Credits. Then Miles faking, flashing Peter. It just seemed to me such a weird way to wrap up an overall fantastic game, and I haven't heard many people bring this up online. Also, Peter's face looks so weird compared to the other faces. It seems as though they really aged his skin. Specifically, cutting from the kiss with Mary Jane, it's like such a quiet scene, and then it, like the credits are softly brought up. It just didn't feel like... How superhero movies end. Yeah. I feel like it did. It could have like slammed to credits on something interesting. Him swinging towards the camera. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think that's the way to do it. Oh, yeah. on the flagpole. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's also weird because like it, I feel like it has the same problem as Marvel movies do, where it's like they kind of don't end sort of like well because you're always expecting. Okay, what's the next scene? Is there going to be a, a post credit scene or like? What's, what's going to happen next, thing. even as the credits are rolling? It's kind of like a weird thing, but... I mean, uh, I think overall, though, I thought that ending was great. Yeah. It was good. Yeah, and I, and I, I, I think, like, even before then, I feel like the... I understand it does feel a little compressed in terms of, like, this thing is happening so fast, but I feel like that speaks to the sort of, like, the momentum with which all of this stuff is sort of falling around Peter, like, as he's going on. I feel like it yeah. fits, even if, even, even if it, like, is sort of cramped up in terms of pacing. Yeah. I resonate with a few of his... Um, Issues, let's say, just like the Sinister Six did feel a little rushed in my mind. Right. And it was like all the back third of the game, so like, felt like we could have spaced that out a little bit more. The same thing with like Martin Lee. They set him up to be this big figure, and then he kind of like dwindled near the end of the game. So I get some of that. Yeah. Um, Alec also writes in and says they really should have gotten Naughty Dog's lip technology for that last kiss. I guess I didn't notice it looking <laughs> janky at all. Oh, uh, I didn't know. It was a little weird. A little weird. Kiss yeah. expert. It looks how most of my kisses look. <laughs> 
Um, I let's film. see. This is interesting. Jay Purrington writes in and just says, Hey, do you, have, do you think this game has a chance to reach a wider audience than Spider-Man Homecoming? Mm, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> Spider-Man Homecoming is pretty big. Yeah. yeah. And also, uh, Matt Cohn from Cashin, Wisconsin, just says, like, the greatest achievement of this game is that it has such a wide net of availability. Like, it's a basic Spider-Man story, but also yeah. services fans. It's really crazy that yeah. you walk that line successfully. Unless you'd like Xbox, you can... Yeah, oh, the four hundred dollar console barrier. That whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. That whole thing. Um, let's see. People are excited about DLC. We are too. Maybe we'll talk about it on the podcast in the future. Uh, simple question here. Mitch Z says, with the conclusion of this game, looking towards a sequel, that for sure is going to happen. Would you be satisfied if the second game also took place in New York City? Yeah, I don't know why not. I think yeah. they could add like Queens and stuff. Yeah, they could add one of the boroughs totally. or something. Yeah. And it probably will dive into like. Peter's backstory a little bit more with his parents, and that'd be a reason to go to Queens. Yeah, Does that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, I think if they sort of do, if they change up the side objectives enough, I feel like they and also use a different district. I think they could do enough to sort of freshen that city up if you're sort of involved in different things. Because if it's more backpacks, more sort of like sort of those more trivial objectives, I feel like it will feel very samey, but I think they can do enough with it, that city to right. make it feel new again. Also, like, yeah. New York's a cool city. Like, I'd never complain when they watch, like, two movies in a row that are both set in New York. Like, it's a cool background for things. Like, you just have to have, like, interesting missions. Well, look at Yakuza, for example. And stuff, right? yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. How many games have been set in those cities over and over again? Um, here's a weird one. Uh, not weird. Nice. Uh, Steve <laughs> Winters from York, Pennsylvania says, hey, this game has been amazing and the podcast is a way to get a slight Spider-Man fix while I'm at work and listen on Fridays. Thank you. Uh, this game has also been a nice way to get my brother's mind off uh, his cancer. Uh, it'd be nice to have some of Osborne's GR27 cure. Interesting. I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer or Pity Parker for that matter, but my brother's diagnosed with uh, E-Wing sarcoma recently, and video games have been a good way for us to connect. Even though this game is a multiplayer, it's been an incredible experience for the both of us. We talk about it a lot, and listening to the game club pretty much echoes our opinions for the most part. He says Reeves's are just off the mark. Uh, what? Uh, anyway, could you send some well wishes his way? I think he'd really get, a, really get a kick out of it. It would make his day. His name is Kev, but everybody calls him Kevy. 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 Thank you. It would be like the game, Kevy. Podcast.com. Let us know what you think. Uh, and then they say, hopefully Red Dead 2 will be next. Kevy. Yeah. Red Dead 2. Yeah. Kevy. Red Dead 2. Tell us if you want us to do Red Dead 2. I feel it's almost like the freight train that we can't dodge is doing Red Dead 2 as the next game club. But there's yeah. a part of me that wants to dodge it and just do Balloon Fight or something weird. Yeah. Uh, mm, game club uh, for Balloon Fight. That'd be kind of cool. Do one small, like, weirdo game. Yeah. Red Dead's going to be so huge. That's going to be such a large one. I, I have to imagine Red Dead's going to be way longer than Spider-Man, though. It's going to be three seasons of Game Club. <laughs> <laughs> we hope you like it. Yeah. And we're only going to Game Club the PS4 version of Red Dead. That's so right. Exactly. Xbox, Xbox players, <laughs> don't talk to us. <laughs> Sorry, you can't even play it. Uh, I'm very sorry to all the Xbox fans that listen to the podcast. Uh, but hey, maybe you don't have to buy a PS4 or a nice Spider-Man because you listen to this, you get the full experience. You yeah. know, so we're saving yeah. you money in a weird way. <laughs> That's right. So Perhaps. you owe us money. <laughs> Give us $60. Google Wallet it. Uh, we'll make it work. Uh, what do you guys think about Spider-Man overall? Any big takeaways we haven't hit yet? I feel like we kind of missed the overall assessment. But Leo, final thoughts on the game. It's a, it's a fun game. I don't beat many games that I play. And I don't know if I would have beaten this one really? if we didn't do the game club. I, I would have left it on good terms, but like 10 hours in, I would have been like, okay, I get Really? It. That's shocking. Just because the story never quite clicked with me, and I never oh. really wanted to. Wait, well, story never clicked. That's you crazy. You don't seem like a guy who's like crazy about story, though, all the time. Oh, no. Yeah, I mean, I, I liked the gameplay, and I got to play a lot of it, and sure. then I was happy. Okay. But it was like, I, I will keep doing this so that we can talk about it on the game club. And then by the third act, I came around because I liked those boss battles so much. Sure. Wow, that's really surprising. Yeah. Okay. But you were pretty excited about this going in, too. Yeah, definitely. Just but the it, gameplay. I just, I really beat 10% of the games I start. Hmm, honestly. Yeah. What's the last one you beat? Spider-Man. <laughs> cool. Uh, cool. Serial, what I don't you know. I, I, I leave every game at the last level. It's a problem. Uh, uh, I, I think I was pretty impressed with the story overall. Yeah. I, I don't know that it's like, I think Homecoming is still like far and away my favorite Spider-Man like story so far that I've, I mean, I haven't, I'm not a big comics guy, but like, yeah. Uh, I, but I think this does a pretty good job of sort of planting the, the, the Spider-Man story in a video game in a way that doesn't feel like cheesy or forced. Yeah, uh, it's probably better than like the the Eric the Garland. Is that his name? Those Spider-Man movies. Andrew Garfield. Amazing Spider-Man. Yeah. Eric I, think it's, I, think, I don't know, man. Uh, uh, I watch Gar that. people are all the same. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I think it's better than those two movies. But yeah, maybe the I haven't watched the Tobey Maguire ones, but 
or in, really? in a long time. Oh, okay. I haven't, so I wouldn't know, but like I feel like this is a pretty solid story told in a video game uh, yeah. that happens to have Spider-Man, and like uh, Spider-Man being my favorite superhero, I think this does pretty well. But like I think it does right by him. Yeah, I know on the podcast when Kyle and Reiner were talking about the game, I I stumped him by just saying, "What's the story about?" And I found myself kind of coming back to that theme at the end of Act Three, and it's like I guess. It's about letting go of the past and letting go of vengeance. Is that, is well, that the conclusion I mean, here? Just kind of looking at it from their perspective, it's like, how would you have like encapsulated the story without spoiling anything? Right. Too, it's like it would yeah. have been kind of hard to like talk. I guess about it's about vengeance. Yeah. 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 I, I, yeah. Yeah. I feel Possibly. like this game is it is a lot more about plot than it is sort of like themes necess- on like more or less. It okay. feels like, but yeah, I, uh, I like the game overall. I don't know that I would. I think you know. Uh, you know, people were talking about it, like, oh, I don't know if it's, you know, God of War might have some competition, but I don't, I don't think it's in that realm at all. But this is like pretty solid game. I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. I know Elise, and I think JV said it was her favorite game of the year right now. Yeah, which oh. is surprising over God yeah. of War. It's uh, mine too. Yeah. But oh really? I, God of War, I liked. It's not at the top of my list of the year. Uh, it just didn't click for me the way it clicked for everybody else. But Reeves, I you're really Spider-Man. Like this is your favorite character of all time. I need to know your read on this game in general. Other than I liked it a lot. Here. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's definitely the best Spider-Man game ever. Yeah. It's like for me, there were highs that matched the Arkham games. Yeah. Uh, it just was filled with a lot of more like clutter that wasn't up to the same bar, and so some of my my excitement was diminished a little bit by like, oh, I'm grinding through and doing all these crimes, or I'm finding this. Well, dumb, that's like, your little fault cat. for doing hundred percent. It is, frankly. I guess, but it's like, yeah. So it's maybe my fault for loving the character so much that I wanted to do it all, but. Uh, but, but compared yeah. to other like Spider-Man stories, I mean, is this upper echelon it's, or it's up there? Yeah, it's upper echelon. I would say. Okay. I, I really like their portrayal of Doc Ock specifically. I liked their relationship with Mary Jane. Like Mary Jane's character that as uh, like kind of a party girl in the comics for a long time and never really. It feels like, especially recently, she's had trouble sort of like, clicking and like finding her place. Huh. And so it was kind of really cool to see their portrayal of her in this as well. Did she surprise you? Oh yeah. <laughs> I don't know about surprise, but no. yeah, I, I like that when she jumped off that roof. I think yeah, that was maybe that was a surprise. <laughs> that's what Brian was talking about. Yes, when you got the stealth takedown, that was a little surprising. I was like, okay, that's cool. Yeah. She was surprisingly into that too. She's like, good boy, and crap. Like she's like, <laughs> yeah, he's <laughs> like, all right, MJ, all right. And so I uh, kept having flashbacks to American Animals. If anybody's seen that, no, the no. idea that tasing someone will knock them out in one stun is explored in American Animals. What is American Animals? Is it true? It's about uh, some college kids stealing paintings. I don't want to spoil any of it. It's really, really good. Also, the number of pe- the number of times someone is able to punch someone out in one hit, yeah, kind of high. Like more, uh, Miles does it, feels a little weird. <laughs> oh right, right, right. How fragile humans are that, in that universe. <laughs> had he been bitten by that point? No, I don't think okay, so. yeah, yeah. At the time it happened, I was like, maybe he got bitten off screen and he's got powers now. <laughs> yeah, that's weird. Yeah. Also, oh, Spider-Man oh, told him one line about like, if, you, if the punch can X-ray, you can get knocked. Prove it. I, I like. I thought that sequence was funny because he was like stealthing around, and because I was stuck there for so long, I was stealthing around for a long time around Rhino, and then he like walks twenty feet, sees sees two criminals, and I was like, "Hey, you leave her alone!" <laughs> and he's like yelling at these criminals, like the Rhino is still right <laughs> over there, dude. Are you out of your mind? Oh, uh, that's crazy. Anyways, it's a good story. Oh, you? Oh, you like, uh, yeah. You really liked it? Uh, yeah, I in my mind, and I know I've never played one before, but this is about as good as a Spider-Man game could be. And that is a crazy feat. And it's nice. I, I brought it up in Act 1, but it's fun to have these types of experiences that remind you why you like something that's just generally in pop culture. It's like, okay, yeah, yeah. Spider-Man. We've spent our whole lives with Spider-Man. But to create something that stands out, that reminds people, oh, Spider-Man is really cool. That's a monumental task. And so, yeah, overall, I was much more impressed by the story and specifically the writing than right. I thought. They did justice to the character, which I appreciated. And, like, the combat was more fun than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely got came around to the combat like yeah. pretty well. Like even yeah. though it's, it's, it can be a little repetitive because I feel like I found my combo and it doesn't seem like like the game really gives you options like reasons to vary sure. up your combos. Yeah, but, I mean it's uh, not Devil May Cry, but like honestly, like it because it's a little bit simpler than that. It like it, it appeals yeah. to a wider audience. I also feel that it does a good job of making you feel like the character of like I'm zipping yeah. around between different bad guys and sort of mm-hmm. like throwing them around and you know using a lot of webs. Like it, it's it's a, it's a pretty good combat that that feels like a Spider-Man specific combo system. Right. And right. very freeform. They yeah. described him in the cover trip videos as the acrobatic improviser and I feel like they completely nailed that. Mm, yeah. yeah, that's true. So I thought the Insomniac, congrats, good job. And I'm Are you really, shaking their hand? That's right. I'm shaking their invisible miles <laughs> Thank per you, hour Insomniac. Hand, their forearms. Wait a minute, whose hands are we shaking? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Oh, oh, Get his neural chip. <laughs> That's but, dumb. Uh, I'm really looking forward to see what they do next. Yeah. And it's, I don't know, probably three or four years away, which is kind of sad. But. Yeah. It's going to be a yeah. long haul. Exciting times. Hey, Spider-Man, thank you for absolutely everybody that played along with us. I'm amazed at the number of emails we got. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. Podcast at GameFormer.com uh, for all feedback. And for the next Game Club, let's do it again, guys. Let's do it again. This is super fun. I look forward to it every week. Do you really? Yeah. That's great. Oh, Talk about video games. I, yeah, I like it. I, oh, I, I like it. Wait a minute. I like the Game Club. It freaks me out when I have dozens and dozens of pieces of paper, but it's always nice to, like, I feel like give the game the discussion it deserves. And even in general, just an episodic exploration of something, like, with, you know, all TV shows coming to Netflix a full season at a time, you know? Right. That kind of uh, theory pitching, like, it never really happens anymore, I feel like. Yeah, yeah more theory pitching. Have too. people written in on what they want us to do next? Right then. Mm-hmm. And, and stop playing PlayStation games, you cowards. Forza <laughs> 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 Horizon 4, Game Club, coming up. <laughs> Guys, this episode is so long. Uh, so, uh, on behalf of everybody, thank you so much for watching and listening to this episode of the Game Informer Show. Uh, be sure to tune in next Thursday. We'll have a new exciting episode with a cover reveal in it, everybody. This will be fun. Yeah. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs> did you even play Spider-Man, Spider-Man Clubs? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you did. I did. Show. I'm Ben Hansen, joined by Dantac. Hello, sir. And J.V. Gwaltney. Hey. You know what this is, Dantac? Is this a real big show? This is a really big show. One of the biggest of the year, I would argue. Very exciting sure. show overall. I agree. Why is it so big? Because we can talk about something that happened surprisingly recently for us, because this is a quick turnaround for Dantac right in this story. Whoa. Yeah, but this is Black Ops 4, our new cover story. Uh, yes. This is what we were teasing last week. And more specifically, yes. forget Black Ops 4, it's Blackout in Black Ops 4. Blackout, which right. is the battle royale mode within Black Ops 4, which is right. kind of the whole kit and caboodle for the cover story you wrote. Dan, Absolutely, right? like you know, when we were, when we went to, we went to Treyarch and we got to see the sights. Yeah, and you know, in wrapping my head around what we saw, I was like, all right, if I'm going to do this, this story has to be just about Blackout. There's, there's a the, lot to there's digest. so much. Yes, uh, yeah. So that story is 100 percent Blackout. Perfect. And we're going to talk about playing it in a little bit here. I'd imagine some people are like Call of Duty, meh. Battle Royale, man, that audience might be out there. I have read the comments on the internet, yes. Exactly. I just want to emphasize, like, one of the biggest series in the world tackling the biggest genre in the world. Like, there is a lot of meat to dive into here, so I'm sorry if we get very specific, but I think some people might be watching or listening to this for the first time. We should get specific. I agree. But, later on in the show, just to make up for that, we're going to have some fun. Some good old-fashioned fun. Wait, wait, this is going to be fun. This is oh, yeah, great. we're going to have fun, no matter what. It's all going to be great. Uh, but Kyle and Reiner are going to be joining us to talk about the Spider-Man. Oh. Uh, Reiner is gaga over this game, believe it or not. We'll talk all about it. Also about uh, Reiner's interview with Sir Todd Howard, Mr. Ooh. God Howard, as the Ooh. internet knows him. Talking about Fallout 76, hopefully some new details there. Then, Dan, you're going to come back kicking and screaming. Coming back. Talk about PAX. Yeah. Well, Dan Tech's PAX. One of my favorite shows. Perfect. This one. This one was cool. You'll find out later. Uh, but Dan wants to talk about Artifact a lot. Uh, also, some other stuff there. A uh, little bit about Destiny 2 Forsaken with Surreal Vasquez. We're going to have Matt Miller on wow. hopefully next week to really dive in deep. But this is a big Wait, you show, kidding. man. This is actually like hours of content. It really Are is. Are we really doing this? All yeah, right. Leo might chime in with a couple things about a certain grim sky. Uh, then community emails. Then back half of the show, not only did we go to L.A. for Treyarch uh, this month, but Ben Reeves and I traveled to Rochester, New York. That's right. Uh, for another... A little more intellectual, more sophisticated trip. Not that Call of Duty isn't intellectual, but we went to the Strong Museum, the Museum of Play over there, which is an amazing museum that's dedicated to fun 
and play and everything good under the sun, but they have like video game archives and pinball archives, overall game archives that are incredible. And we got like a behind the scenes tour, reason I dove in deep. And so back after the show, we're going to be showing an interview with Jeremy Sassier, who's the assistant vice president for interpretation and electronic games, talking about how you make a museum dedicated to the concept of play. And like they have certain objects in their toy hall of fame, which are very funny. Okay. That you would not expect. I'm but it's like, well, yeah, guess that is one of the greatest toys of all time. Mm. You would never guess what the it is. Slinky? Antic. Is it a, it's a mace? A flail? A slinky? Okay, we're getting closer. We're getting closer. Think of other things you like to play with. <laughs> okay. Uh, Call of Duty Black Ops 4, yes. specifically Black Ops. Yes. We went out to Treyarch. We played it for over two hours. It was over two hours. Yeah. They, they let us go longer than... than they originally said, which is great. Yeah, it's fantastic. And so uh, all month long, we're rolling out features at GameFormer.com slash Black Ops 4, uh, the number four, uh, talking about everything you could really want to know about this thing, because the beta is coming soon. It's September 10th. Yes. Uh, but every day up until September 10th, we're rolling out features, diving into the vehicles, how zombies work on the map. There is a ton of specifics, because it's a fascinating of topic. Broad overview, J.V. Gwaltney. Walking in and playing it, set the set the mood. What was the stage like where we played this, and what was the vibe? Uh, at Treyarch, they yes. have this room that looks like the War Room from Doctor Strange, if you've ever seen that motion picture. Yeah, you uh, can kind of see it in the Rapid Fire interview that we posted on Tuesday. Yeah, so it's a big conference kind of room, and there were, uh, I think it was, what, six computers on each side? Five, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, and so uh, we just, it was the three of us and uh, the developers there, like, David Vaughn, what is it, Von Har? Von Der Har? Yeah. Uh, the studio design director was playing with us. Dan Bunting was playing with us. Some of the community guys were playing with us. Uh, and we loaded into the map. Uh, Hang on, just, just zooming out a little bit more. Uh, we were playing with a total of 80 people. Yeah, oh yeah, which absolutely. Is one of those crazy things. In the game. They weren't all in house at Treyarch. Like, specifically, they were in testing facilities, strangely enough, back in Minneapolis, where we're based. Really? Uh, yeah, yes. that's what they said. They yeah, because they've been they Activision headquarters. So why did we go out that? there? I know we could have just played right there. It. It's so hard to think people are playing Blackout in Minneapolis. But yeah, we had a full, full map of eighty players, which is where the beta is going to launch. Where the, the number might be flexible later on. They said they tested it with over one hundred, even internally. You know, given what they were saying, assuming the beta goes well, I'm pretty sure we're going to see that number jump up. That's yeah. basically the implication that yes. we received. Okay, but JV impressions. Uh, Odd impressions first. Yeah, I liked it. I think we got off to a strong start when uh, David and Dan Tack here, when we were falling in, because immediately you open up and you're not jumping out of a bus or a plane, you're jumping out of a helicopter. A, a squad of helicopters, helicopters. Yeah. yeah. of choppers. And so uh, David and Dan died immediately. Like, they slapped the earth, and I had to go what? revive them. No, I mean, we can talk about that for a second. But first, before we get into this, yeah. I mean, the, the cover story, you know, the cover story has tons more details than this. Yes. I, so uh, hi, if, you, if you get interested in this at all... I suggest you check it out before the beta hits. Okay, and yep. again, zooming out even further, I feel like we need to set the baseline. I was surprised. I think building up to this, we're like, well, it's Black Ops doing Blackout, Battle Royale. I think we're all feeling pretty optimistic about this thing. We think it can possibly be huge. I was kind of surprised it didn't make more of a splash on Tuesday with the cover reveal, where it's like, I don't think people are excited, as excited as they should be about this game. Why, why do you think that is? I think, think it's because it's just it's Call of Duty again, and people have are, are have franchise. There's definitely fatigue. franchise fatigue. It's franchise fatigue combined with there's a certain trend on the internet which I don't understand fully of like F Battle Royale. I'm already sick of Battle Royale. There's already two popular games in this genre. I don't want to hear about it anymore. Mm. I don't understand that, but I think that's out there, and I think it combines with Call of Duty where people are like, okay, maybe if it's good, I'll check it out. But I left very optimistic about that thing. Yeah, and I would, I would say that I was certainly, I was curious. I don't know if I was optimistic actually going in. I didn't know what it was right. going to look like. Certainly, upon leaving, I was, ext- I'm, I'm very hyped for it. I'm absolutely going to be playing it. Like, there's no doubt about it. It's yep. going to be, it's going to be my new Battle Royale game. Really? Yes. Yeah. Based on, based on our play session, absolutely. Uh, it is, and again, just zooming out even further, I mean, it is super duper PUBG. A lot of people might think like, oh, okay, trying to catch on to the if, Fortnite bandwagon. Like, no, no, they were trying to catch on to the PUBG bandwagon. Yeah, last if I was, was going to attach it to being more similar to one of those products, then yes, obviously. I mean, it's not a stretch though. It feels very PUBG. It feels I mean, like a good first. A lot of like, some PUBG. many of the core components uh, do have analogs, but there's I, there's plenty different about it. Oh, absolutely. Like, like we'll dive into it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I feel like there's this whole like. You still can't deny that there's this whole sort of audience for PUBG that just wants something that doesn't play like a rickety prototype. And, like, yeah. that is what Blackout is. Like, that is... I know Blackout's different, and we're going to get into that, why it's a bit different, but... Eventually, we'll talk about this game. Yeah. My <laughs> takeaway is, uh, like, it... 
It's stable PUBG. It's the stable PUBG I've wanted. Well, specifically on consoles. Oh, yeah. Like, I have a great time playing PUBG I don't on have any PC. Pr- I, I feel like the, the, the whole, like, PUBG doesn't work is totally. amazingly overblown if yes. we're talking about the PC. If you're on Xbox, I don't play that. I don't know anything about it. But on PC, I haven't had problems since 1.0. But I think that that console crowd that wants, like, a great playing Battle Royale that isn't Fortnite, like, this is going to eat that crowd yep. up. That this seems like the there, perfect there's a lot, There's a lot to offer here, and if people can get, you know, can say, hey... Just because it's Call of Duty doesn't mean it's this thing. This is a new thing. I know. Yeah. I know the whole, like, yada yada, Call of Duty is the same every year. And it's literally not. And I know people are upset about the campaign going. Yep. This is a big deal. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say it's a big deal. Yeah. I mean, just because we saw the response of, like, oh, people are having franchise fatigue or whatever. Like, you guys see the numbers, like, at the end of the year for Call of Duty. Like, it has a huge built-in audience. Like, it always oh, does well. It's always and, at the top. And we'll see, you know, how that correlates with the lack of a campaign yeah. and, and all that. But I, I truly think that once people get their hands on this and yes. play it, yeah, it's, gonna, it's, yeah. I think if the beta gets out of the gate well, I think it's going to turn a lot of people around. And again, sure. like what we played, they said, was largely the same experience that they're planning for the, for beta, the beta, but still not one-to-one. And technically, we don't know how the beta is going to perform. There's still some time from the build right. that we played versus that, so take everything with a grain of salt. We fair. don't know how it's yeah. going to get out of the gate and all that stuff. But I was just amazed, you know, you Are wonder, we going to talk about the game? Oh, yeah, just, yeah, just setting the table a little bit more before we're, we dive We're really in here. getting this table it's set. It's a full Thanksgiving meal we All have right. to get that to, is, Dan. That's fair. That's fair. guest, okay. Dan. But I'm just amazed by the excitement within the halls of Treyarch for this mode specifically. You know, it's kind of a PRE thing, but every once in a while they would say, like, we haven't felt this much excitement. Actually, it's like creating zombies mode. That's something I want to I address real quick. Yeah. In, in a PRE thing. You know, right. oftentimes you go to a demo, it's a very choreographed experience designed to show you what they want to show you about the game. You can't yeah. do that in Battle Royale. Yeah. You don't know what the hell's going to happen. Yes. <laughs> Nobody there was pulling any punches, I assure you. People, like, like letting me live through any kind of situation, it was a full-on, as chaotic and enjoyable as a Battle Royale game It's a be. sandbox, and it felt like a sandbox, and it was just crazy to feel that level of like playful fun, experimentation, tension mm-hmm. in a studio oh, with yeah. the Call of Duty's multiplayer. It was wild. It was so much fun. Yeah, no, it was fun seeing like the beefs come out between some of those uh, developers where it was like, I'm going to get you this time. Yeah, Yeah, it was real good. And it was super fun, like, playing, because I was in a squad with, like, Dan Bunting and uh, Matt Sconce, who's a designer over there. But we were on one side of the room. You guys were with, yeah, Matt, uh, or sorry, David Von Der Haar and whatnot. Lord Von. Lord Von Der Haar on the one side of the room. And it was so much fun just being in a battle royale. We were squatted up. You can play solo. You can play duos. You can do quads. Quads. There we go. Um, So we were playing quads. And so, just playing this game, and then just realizing, like, wait a minute, our banter is lining up with that team's banter, where we're like, who the hell is in that diner over there? Take them out, they're on the left! And then I hear you guys, like, and it was who's us. on the hill up there? Yep. And then realizing, like, oh my god, we're going up against each other on this relatively big map, this is wild. That was the real thrill, is finding out when we were actually dueling each other Which there. actually happened pretty frequently, yep. but because that's because your guys were listening to where we were dropping, and then jumping. How up. dare you, sir! That did not happen. It's totally, it's totally dead. But yeah. there was a great Several moment, times. too, I think... It, one of the early games, uh, Miles, a designer, and Matt Sconce, a designer, mm-hmm. they were the last two alive. That was an epic game. Yeah, it we, was should, we should talk about that game once we talk about the actual basics of gameplay and other things first, don't you? Or do you want to just dive right in? Let's dive in, because I think you can demonstrate it through what oh, happened okay. here. So it came okay. down to 1v1, tiny circle, obviously. As a, as a battery often does. On yeah, a hill. Yeah. On a hill. On a hill. Everybody hiding in the grass. We've seen this situation before. And Matt Sconce did the diabolical move of whipping out the RC car. Right, so the... the blackout RC car, or the Black yeah. Ops RC car. The, recon, the, rec- the reconnaissance bot. Yes. So this allows you to... I don't think this is in any other battle royale, any form, really. Several different ways to scout, but nothing nothing like this, nothing as specific. Yeah. Uh, you get to drive the little recon car, and it gives you vision. So obviously you're vulnerable while you're doing this, uh, because you're taking vision of the car, but you can just sort of drive it around in third person and check out the scenery. You and can't then, blow it up, but... Right, it's not, it's not a weapon in yeah. itself, but when you're in that final circle, you're just trying to find out where the other guy's hiding so you can pop him. It's very, very powerful, as we found. Right. Uh, so what he did was locate the other individual and sort of just stop the car and quietly flashbang that area and then, you know, mop him up. That's what happened. And then and our it, team won because it was, was very intense. It was very intense. It was an intense moment. It was a battle royale moment. All right, if I want to call it one of those. <laughs> um, and then you start, like, the car itself is really interesting because you can uh, combine it with many other tools on the map. Like, you yeah. can stick a, uh, a sensor dart into it to create, like, a mobile, you know, uh, ping network for your radar. Oh, yeah. yeah. Or put it on a... Yeah, I don't know what you could do with it if you put it on a chopper, but you could put it on a chopper. Yeah, that's true. Or they <laughs> even mentioned, like, putting it on uh, a boat going down the river yeah. and then driving it off onto the shore and mentioned, like, 
Rivertown, which is kind of the center of the map. Right, Rivertown is completely isolated. The only spot on the map that is completely surrounded by water. Right. Yes. And so, like, the, uh, I forget if it was Miles, some designer over at Treyarch was talking about, like, scouting out one side of the island with the RC car, with the sensor thing, while then they were flushing from the other side. Just, yeah. like, those little tactical maneuvers you can do with this thing, it, and that, it's going to be really fun to that, watch. That's that's one of the coolest things. The, but we're, well, we're, we're deep in the weeds now. Hell yeah. We haven't even talked about the game at all, but... Uh, stuff you can do, the applications I, I found very fascinating of objects that are in multiplayer as they portray a battle royale, like the yeah. sensor dart. Obviously, in, in multiplayer, you just throw that thing out, you're like, okay, we got UAV pings, all right, cool, I know that guy's around the corner, I'm going to shoot him. Here, you can, like, attach that to a chopper, you can attach it to a car, you can prepare a final house to, like, you'll know exactly when they enter the bottom floor and then just, you know, throw a grenade down there or something. Lots of interesting applications for old tools. Yes. Or, or more common tools. Yeah, that's things we know how to use already. Yeah, that's that's what I wasn't expecting to work so well, but did work really well, was that they have a huge emphasis on, okay, we're taking the stuff from Call of Duty multiplayer and adapting it to Blackout in ways that seem really cool like that, and also the perks. You know, that's another big sure. difference is uh, you get the sort of power-ups, but you have to pop them, and they're limited time. They're not things that stay on you the entire time. Right, because that would be crazy, right? Yeah. You just get but it's stuff like, if you haven't played Call of Duty, it's stuff like you can silence your footsteps, you can... Uh, you know, aim faster, like move the gun faster, stuff like that. And so some of those carry over directly from multiplayer, and it's some kind of do. fun seeing, like, Although oh, yeah, it turns they, out they have been changed a little bit yeah. to, right. to for the for the format, but yes. But there's other stuff like uh, Looter, which lets you see through walls, apparently, and there's a perk, I forget the name of it, where you can, like, survive outside the circle for longer. Looter lets you see Outlander. loot through walls, yes. And yeah. Outlander lets you do survive, around the, survive outside the circle, so you can kind of hunt people okay. from out yeah. there. And the circle is, is very PUBG. They have, as they call it, a Black Ops twist where they do. as a circle gets smaller and smaller, in theory it gets more intense, and, and they have like this interesting it, filter going over it. does it. have some more interesting character. I mean, some other characteristics that are not found in, in all Battle Royales, where, where we destroy things outside of the circle. Right. So you can't sort of, you know, try to like hoard items and stuff outside of the circle and come in with it, or, or try to use vehicles. Vehicles will malfunction outside of the circle if you're trying to skirt the edge and sort of abuse that. So keeping a helicopter in a tiny circle towards the end will be very tricky. You'll be and a sitting duck, basically. And I think they said it was impossible, yeah. like in the build. They said you could, you could try, yeah. but it's a big risk. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and again, it's very very Black Opsy, very Treyarchy in the fact that the, the closer the heart of the circle comes in, the more aberrations that you will see if you stay outside the circle. You will not get clear information on what's actually in the circle. You'll see hallucinations. You'll have auditory and visual hallucinations. Your characters are kind of like dusty and floaty and trippy looking. The characters yeah. inside the circle. Right. Yeah. It's, right. it's a, the whole mind bendy kind of thing. So they, they got that yeah. in there. A little flavor. Yeah, they yeah. got that flavor in there. But we kind of danced around a little bit, but vehicles in Call of Duty Multiplayer. Huge. Coming back. Right. Since it's been a while. I am, of all of the aspects of this, I, had, I enjoyed many of them, but mm -hmm. the vehicles were great. All right. Mm -hmm. Flying around that chopper, it's intuitive, it's awesome, mm -hmm. it's a cool risk reward balance they have with every vehicle. I absolutely can't wait to get on more vehicles. Like, that's my priority. Yeah, and there's fun stuff you can do. We didn't track because we're not that good or smart, but they described later on, like, you can do some wild stuff. Like, if you're flying solo with the chopper, yeah. uh, even, like, to scout people out uh, for the rest of your squad and whatnot, you can do stuff like hot swap between seats. You can, you can jump yep. into the side, snipe folks, and then jump back to pilot the helicopter again and before it crashes. That's all very theoretical, yes. Because yeah. uh, it's going to end badly, right? You're going to you're gonna hit a tree or something while you try to, to get that snipe perfect snipe from there. Right, right. Yes. But the helicopter overall, I found it surprisingly easy to fly. It was very easy, like, first time in there. I didn't kill yeah. anybody, so that's a, that's a huge plus. I landed it safely. That's amazing. I did some pretty sweet stuff where I flew it over to the dam area and then jumped out use my wingsuit, which yep. we can talk about later, we need but then like wingsuited away as the helicopter was crashing into the dam and exploding. It's like, this is a cool thing yes. in a Call of Duty yep. multiplayer match here. Yeah, and we didn't have any, but I would have loved to have had like a multi-helicopter engagement. Oh, a battle. That would have yeah. just been insane. Yeah, Matt Scott's a uh, designer over there, again, coming up a lot, but when we asked him about like the craziest moment he's had so far in testing the game, because they're playing it all day, every day, yep. uh, he talked about like a three-way helicopter fight right. towards the end of the match was just absurdly fun. And I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. So, so along with the vehicles, like uh, the wingsuiting is, is a big shift Huge. from other BRs, because you, you basically have intense mobility everywhere, especially from a vertical position uh, on, a, on the map. Mm -hmm. As, as uh, Vaughn put it, uh, it's very Batman. Yeah. You just like, yeah. be on the top of the skyscraper, which is like under construction on the, on the map, and then just jump off, float away at any point. Like any tall place, if you just hold jump, right. uh, then you'll whip out your wingsuit, which is how you will get down to the ground after you parachute in right. for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you wingsuit immediately, and then you parachute at the very end. 
Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's yes. flipped. Yeah, you're totally right. Uh, did you guys use the wingsuit much outside yep. of just landing? I, I tried, but you know, it can. Uh, I wasn't quite up on it. I didn't want to risk it again after after I had a couple of uh, fail entries. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it's really cool. It's a very yeah. cool mechanic that you could tell is going to be a big skill base factor in, in that game where people are wingsuit assaulting each other from high vantage points. Totally. Absolutely Just happen. the mobility overall, I didn't expect. And even adding on to that then, you can get Ruin's uh, grapple gun. Oh, of course. That's, yeah. that's, that's fantastic. That's an item that you have to find. You can only use it five times. But the combination of like all these vehicles, wingsuit, the grappling gun. So, like, so it's not just ruins. Everybody's ability, like a lot right. of different abilities are in there, including ruins grapple gun. Yeah, yeah. which is the most exciting one I saw. Yeah, no, that's it was a fun one. It was super cool. I remember getting that early and then shooting through the forest, uh, attaching to trees to avoid enemy fire. It was super cool. Like it, the, just the tactical ways you can use these items and also have them look really cool at the same time. Yeah, for good. sure. The uh, other vehicles, ATV, yeah, uh, cargo truck, yeah. Which is Everybody's interesting. Great. Which Very sounds great. boring, but it's actually really no, cool. No, it's super, it's super interesting. So yeah. non-traditional seating, so you can crouch and prone on the back of that puppy. Yep. Right? That's a, that's a big deal. Uh, and, of course, more importantly, if you're especially when you're playing with a squad, you can load that bad boy up with stuff for every situation. So you got two weapon slots. You don't want to have an RPG in your main weapon slot if you're going house to house with, you know, in a shotgun situation right. where you're going to blow yourself up. There is friendly fire. There is self-damage. So those are things you got to take, take in mind. So, but you're like, well, if I run into a chopper? Oh, well, good thing I took up an RPG on the back of the truck. That chopper's going down right now, right? So in go. theory, your squad's going to be rolling around with a cargo truck just filled with goodies exactly. that the other team can steal this if is, they want to. This is a, you know, a, a best-case scenario situation where you guys have a truck and it's loaded up with goods. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's not going to happen every time. Sometimes you're just going to use it to run people over. But it's also a very put-all-your-eggs-in-one-basket sort of thing. Like right. another thing Vaughn said was we don't make it hard for uh, vehicles to blow up and black that's out. That's true. Yeah, it feels like one rocket launcher or grenade, like, your whole stash is gone. Now, I didn't have this problem, but I heard that a cargo truck really did some damage on you. It's I mean, it ran us day. over. No, it didn't kill Dan. It killed us. It, it did not kill me. I was killed by the, by the, by the cleanup It crew. was astonishing to watch, though, because I was <laughs> we were spectating because we were dead. Because I, I, I had died. I, got, I walked into yeah. a bullet. And so... Uh, I got to see Miles get run over right in front of me. And then uh, I was yeah, killed. no, it was horrific. His body got dragged by the truck. <laughs> oh, my God. So, yeah, I'm excited for we that. But it, it was a battering ram. They used yeah. the cargo truck as a battering ram to kill Miles. We were really close to the final circle at that point. But yeah. I believe you. Uh, also, real quick note on the vehicles. I was a little bit thrown at first because it's not uh, like hold R2 or whatever. We were playing on PS4s, by the way. Yeah. Uh, but it's PS4 not, Pros. There we go, specifically. Okay. But it's not hold R2 to accelerate on these vehicles. Like, for the driving ve vehicles in particular, it's feels a little bit more warthoggy. Mm -hmm. Where, like, you're holding yeah. up because they want to mirror the movement controls for your character with the vehicle. So there's that moment of like, wait, how am I steering and driving this thing? But it's, okay, all analog-based. They were very intuitive. Yeah. The yeah. vehicle's very intuitive, and they're very fun. Very fun. Yeah? I can't, like, I want to go back in the chopper right now. Okay, the, um, overall, the map. It was yeah. hillier than I thought. It was there are a lot more lo flowers than There I are lots of elevated points, so you're going to get lots of battle royale situations, long-range snipe, uh, snipe opportunities, really depending on your play style, because... You know, uh, even though we did have plenty of hills and, and vantage points that you could shoot and snipe people from, there were lots of interior conflicts as well. Yeah. Where shotguns and other close range weapons would be more appropriate. A lot of warehouses, like, you know, like the big warehouses in PUBG, these have, like, giant doors on the front that you can slowly open up and whatnot if you want, but there's a lot of fights in those. It's, it's real interesting to think, the more I think about Blackout's map, because at first I was like, oh, this is kind of fan servicey because it's presented as, like, a weird theme park sort of history, you know, nod to the legacy of Black Ops, but the yeah. more I thought about it, it's like, well, PUBG's interiors all suck. You know, they all look kind of bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fortnite's interiors are all, like, rehashed sort of assets. These feel sure. like unique places that you are going to, like, it feels like the most diverse sort of, like, uh, battle royale it experience. Yeah, it doesn't feel as like Disneyland as you would think, because things yeah. are so spaced out. Yeah, it doesn't. Know? It. I mean, it has the concept of, like, oh, you're going to all these locations that are remixed, like, multiplayer maps and, ma and like, maps from zombies. But, you know, they, they've uh, they've been built on this. It's not just like, oh, I'm playing this map from, like, five years ago. Right. Like, it just takes that concept of that map and turns it into a structure. At some point when we first got on the map, we're going for a quick tour, and we're in a cargo truck, and Dan Bunting, the co-studio head at Treyarch, he was, like, giving me the tour, and it was very funny. He's like, on the left, you'll see the map Raid, uh, yeah. and as we keep going along this path, it's like, yeah, let's go for a tour of Black Ops history yeah, That's here. excellent, yeah. yeah. And one thing, I, you know, now that I've had a chance to, like, digest it and think about it a lot more, I do feel like the maps, uh, the map locations are very distinct in terms of 
I have a particular play style. This is a place that I'm probably going to want to hang out if I want to get kills. Mm -hmm. Like, if I'm a sniper, I probably don't want to go, you know, to the to the hedge maze. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Outside the asylum. It's probably not a really great place for me. Because uh -huh. uh, not only are zombies likely to be there, but it's just really tight and constrained. So if I'm a shotgun player, I probably want to be there. Yeah. Uh, there's fun stuff, like Nuketown is an island. Yes, now, it is. Which has, like, a whole system underneath that's, like, flooded. It, it's very bizarre. The nuke has gone off. And there, right. are, there are bunkers below with the with the mannequins who have survived again, of course. And there's a <laughs> sign that lets you know how many players are in the surrounding yep. vicinity, this which is, is so thing. cool. There is literally like a population sign on the island, and so if you look at it, it'll change based on how many players are currently on the island. Like no BS, there'll be like if it says five, it's like okay, we're not alone here, boys. Right. Like it's I very, love very that handy, idea. Very it's super fun and interesting in that location because there was a lot of loot. I was able to loot the entire bunker myself one game, and man, yeah. I came out of there packed. Yeah, I feel like my favorite moments that came from this uh, particular version of Battle Royale were sort of like reminiscent of those horror movie moments when you realize, oh, you're not alone. Like in the skyscraper, for example, I popped what is it, Skulker, the one that lets you the perk that lets you move silently, and okay. I could hear below me two players moving around, and it took me a minute to realize, oh, those aren't my teammates. And it's just moments like that where everything that follows is super tense, and I feel like Blackout does that a better job does a better job of that than, like, PUBG for me. Uh, I don't know about that. Yeah, I think it does it for me. It hits the tension of PUBG, which is what I want for Battle Royale games, and I don't really get that from Fortnite necessarily, but... Oh, God, no. I've never had that before. Well, I think some people... Play Not, no, I'm just saying I haven't. Like, totally. Yeah. The um, other things to mention, maybe the most fun, outside of shooting each other, uh, there is a basketball court. There is. Oh, there uh, is. There, in the there, Estates there. area is a reference to an old Black Ops 2 map. Yeah, so you can actually pick up the basketball you can, you and can shoot. shoot hoops. And yeah. there are other areas where there are uh, items you can interact with, too, although we didn't get to see any explicitly. There's a pool yeah. table in the stronghold area, they said, but I don't think you can sink the ball. I saw a pool table yet. in the bunker in uh, Nuketown. Yeah, well, they, they kept teasing, like, But I didn't. I, did, I tried to interact with them, and it didn't work. Okay. But I, there are other things. They told us there are. There is, like, an array area, a reference to that map, where there's, like, loudspeakers you can turn on and off with different switches if you want to mess with that stuff. Yeah. Overall, though, uh, the map, uh, it's big. It is. Like, it's 100 no, Nuketown. Whatever that means. Uh, my impression, though, like, especially in the helicopter when you're coming in with the choppers in the beginning, it was, like, it's a little bit smaller than I was expecting. Yeah. It's much more, and even they said this, it's not one-to-one, -one, but it feels more like a 4x4 PUBG map compared to an 8x8. So expect that type of feel. Right, but not a one-to-one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I don't know. I liked it more. I feel like I don't want to be traversing, like, just long terrains for so... Like, I feel like the, uh, it, Blackout has a good sort of, like, balance between, like, okay, here's some spaces that you traverse for a bit, and here's enemy engagement. Yeah, I think Vaughn even at some point said, like, you know, in terms of, like, how many vehicles we give it to you and how much you'll be running across the map on foot, he said, uh, it's not Miramar. So, <laughs> for yeah, a puppy reference... Thing, that, it was the thing that was said, yes. Yeah. And uh, Miramar, as anyone who's played it knows... You don't have a car on that map. Sometimes you just you're gonna be running for a long, a long time. <laughs> and I think they said from like states up top to uh, whatever is. They, did. they gave us a figure. Map. It's in the story. I don't know what point to point it was, but it's five minutes basically. Five minute run, roughly. Five minute yeah. sprint. Sprint. Right. So that's a, that's important to note. Not a walk. Yeah. But you have to be sprinting the whole Which time. Which doesn't make it sound that big, but the map I think is big enough. It I don't is. Think you'll it be is. disappointed. I think I, I think I did see some concerns on the on the internet that it was gonna be too small. I, I'd like to allay those. It's it's perfectly sized for yeah. the for the yeah it's good the size is good yeah. and it was interesting talking to them I, hopefully we'll pull up some quotes later on in the month um but talking to them just about designing the map and how they rebooted it three times because yes. they kept over designing it and they just had to like let go of a lot of call of duty design instincts for multiplayer maps and just say like we need some downtime we need some down area where it's just right. hills where you guys can have your own fun but they were too meticulous and it's realized like okay we'll put some hot spots in here but the key to a good Battle Royale map is, like, sometimes there's just hills for a while. It's and fine. we're talking mad changes, mad iteration. Like, they had you used to have craftables. You used to have, used to, have to build those abilities, which is, I'm so glad that's not yeah, a thing. No, yeah, no, that would be awful. Finding pieces and putting them together, it's like, ugh. Yeah, even, like, the when they got out of the gate and announced Blackout, and eventually, in that video, remember, the camera pulls out, and it shows, like, the, the yellow dots all over the map and stuff. Yes. That's not the layout of the map anymore. It's even changed since that, yeah. which is fun to look back at, because that wasn't that long ago, I don't think. No, it really, I mean, in the, in the time span for, like, game development, that was like a yeah. blip, right? Right. right. So, yeah, which uh, kind of ties into a larger theme of, they even emphasize, like, we're still very much designing Blackout. Yeah. This is and you can tell they're designing it hard, though. This is where the <laughs> this is where the big guns are, right? This is yeah. where the, this game is happening at this point. Right. At this point in the process, yeah. they are still trying to lock down a lot of these details for Blackout. And I feel like that's kind of going to be the case after release, too. Like, the nature oh, like, of that conversation was like, this game is a living thing that we are going
going to negotiate with our community yeah. of how it changes in the year or years to come. And let's right. talk about let's talk about something that I thought was pretty pretty interesting and, and pretty different for a battle royale, and that's the inclusion of AI. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's to the map. We haven't talked about the zombies yet. That's true. I was like, all right, you're adding zombies to this. Can I get the kid me? Come on, that's 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 not about it. You know. Because their pitch is like, why are there zombies? It's black ops. Okay, well, I, well, I, mean, I guess it makes <laughs> sense in that t- in those terms, right? I guess. Yeah. But I also like how they're in- how they're implemented as sort of a risk reward, tension building tool, just like a supply drop or yeah. or something else to fight over. They fill the same role, mm-hmm. only even more fun because they're annoying and they interfere with the combat at the same time as being that uh, proposition of loot. And so yeah. it's like you know a loot crate or something loot drop in PUBG where you'll see like a beacon of light, yep. and so you know okay in this area there's going to be zombies. There's going to be a zombie supply stash, the mystery, right? Mystery which is box equivalent. A great treasure chest, but at the same time you'll have to take out five to eight zombies, and they'll make a lot of noise. Not all yet. There. So comparing it to zombies mode, no, like these zombies are not going to be a real threat unless. You're also engaged and occupied with enemies at the same yeah, time. Yeah, right. like five to eight, right? Yeah, it's like five to eight. I think yeah. is what they said. And it's yeah. a very if you're alone, it's a very small number. They don't actually they're not vicious zombies like in the other mode. They're just like hello. They're big dangers that they're a dinner bell. Uh, if yeah, you exactly. engage with them, exactly. Yeah, I, I think it is a fun dynamic. As they put it, like anything that brings players together for conflict, Correct. like this type of thing, it's good. And uh, Vaughn at some point even said like, you know, now we have zombies, and he said. There's opportunities for other types of AI in the future. Right. Yeah. Like, but what we didn't. Does that mean? Unfortunately, we can Yeah, we couldn't get anything more. I just want a megalodon to like burst up through that lake. Is it too much to ask? Yeah. And just do the opening of Fallen Kingdom where it bites the helicopter. Just please. Yes. But zombies, it's interesting. It's also yeah. weird that like the map is only in the daytime right now. It's just fun seeing like those zombies locations. But like in broad daylight, yeah, I thought it was still, wacky still and weird, creepy. but it's still creepy. It's creepy to see like the light break through the cracks and like the roof and stuff. Yeah, like it's and walking around with like corpses around you. It's still unnerving. Yeah, yeah, I think those areas are still creepy. Those yeah. areas are still creepy. Yeah, for sure. Uh, what else shout out to you guys? Oh gosh, items in forever. general. They said we're constantly going to be trying to fill your inventory. You yes. use a. There, item is, there is a backpack. There is a backpack. That's all you get. There's one size right. fits all. Yes, and yeah. you're using the D-pad to navigate this, to, to loot corpses, everything like that. And so it's a pretty quick... It's extremely quick. Yeah. yeah. So when you kill another player, um, you don't have to, like, pick up each item individually. You get to loot through their sack, and everything is organized. So once you kill a few people, you'll understand all the healing items are going to be at the end. The weapons are going to be up front. You know exactly where to scroll through and grab everything you want. We should probably talk about the progression system a little bit. Oh, Lord. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's yeah. basically... It seems to hinge on the idea of that you will want to unlock character skins and models throughout Black Ops and the zombie series. That's and to correct. do that, like you have to you have to get a quest. And the way you get a quest is you find an item out in the world that's tied to a character somehow. So for example, a zombie character like Rick Toffin, right? Well he doesn't he have multiple isn't he one yeah, of well, advanced unlocks? Yeah, yeah, but just like for example, you have a character like that, so you have to go to a zombie's location for to Rick find Toffin, yeah, yeah uh, an item tied to him and then you get the item and usually it has a quest tied to it that you have to do, like, maybe for him it's, this This isn't official, maybe for him it's, like, kill a certain amount of zombies or kill zombies in a certain I, way. I bet for him it's actually going to be ridiculous. He's yeah. probably one of the harder unlocks. Right. No, I just so mean, for the, like... For the base, let's talk about the base tier unlocks, because we don't know what the multi, the multi-mission yeah. uh, icons, yeah. so called, like like Mason and Rip Defend and, yeah. and Woods and some other the guys, icons. they have multi-chain quests that are much more complex. And you say quests, I mean, it's just... Let's just, call quest. just yeah. go do the okay, thing. Okay, let's do the. We'll, we'll call it Call of Duty. What missions? All right. Yeah. But basically, we'll get the it's Intel it. and go do the mission. Characters like Battery, yes, right? Battery all player. Battery was the, is the most easiest example here. Yes, that's if what I, they If I find War Machine, which is a pretty rare item in a map under normal conditions, right? Gun. That's a very powerful weapon in health, limited ammo. Find the gun, kill a few people with it, and then place in the top fifteen. Yeah. Simple. Right. Easy peasy. You get Battery. Bad, and I like and Battery. The is, it's like, hey, uh, you pick up the item, you act like the character would act, and then you get to unlock that yeah. character, which is. Interesting in a battle royale. I think it think it's pretty novel. But it's going to be variable for a lot of them. Like especially, like I said, the more desirable, like like defense is probably going to be really hard. Yeah, I really don't like the idea. I need to see it in action. But just that whole concept of like, oh, I went and did all this bullshit. Like I found the item in the first place, and then yeah. I did the thing. But like I got, you know, I was seventeenth instead of fifteenth, so I don't get. That's fine with me. The character unlock that you, you seems gotta, like you nonsense. Chase, you but chase, to you be fair, to be fair, yeah. they did say, you know, if that's what we hear from the community, we'll dial it back. Which I feel like is a good I, compromise. I, th- I think yeah. on on the p- characters like Battery and Specialist and whatever, the standard zombie cast, that's fine. But I think as a player, you want to have something to chase, right? 
Yeah. It doesn't require monetization or purchase. You know, some cool skin you can unlock. If you're in a battle with, like, you know, you're in the you're in the chop, you're like, oh, Rick Defend just dropped next to me. I'm going to drop it next to that guy. He's really good. Because he's probably done some crazy stuff with, like, a ray gun. Get the final kill with a ray gun. I, I bet that's some, some, some lunatic like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but... Yeah, yeah, I think there can be so, there should be something to aspire to so that you do have a progression thing that isn't that doesn't offer any play rewards, right? It's just, just cosmetic. cosmetic, right? Yeah, yeah and, I, yeah, and I'm curious and maybe more worried about just that race. If somebody sees the item, how much they're going to stab their teammates in the back to go grab it. You can also trade those items if you want to, but it's going to lead to some weird social dynamics where is everyone's it? like, I, I, think I want this quite out of. If I'm playing with my team, they're not going to. We're going to go for the win, well over anything like stupid like that. Don't play with JV. Yeah, see that I. I don't What's play with that JV? supposed to mean? That's JV, why I don't play with JV. JV's what? not a great team player. It's what did I do? Player. I survived longer than any of you. Well, one time we were playing oh, with God. JV in the last round here, game. and we're what playing with, with old Matt Sconce again, the designer of Treyarch, the best player in the room, the one who won the Battle Royale earlier, having a great time. Dan and I were out. It was JV and Sconce left in that squad. Here we go. Meanwhile, JV, <laughs> as Sconce is just firing away, it's killing guys left story. and right, JV's in this little house. And he's talking about, oh, this looks like Breaking Bad. <laughs> they did as, as Matt Scott dies then, and I say, hey, JV, go revive Scott. Are you crazy? Go take care of it. Right. So, so he, was, say, he was in the middle of, like, no. Zombie. He was, no. he was literally alone. He had killed yes. the opponent. It was like a double kill situation. 100%. He was down. So, yes, you can pick up your teammates with a down, similar to many other mm-hmm. games. He bled out for, like, what? It had to have been, like, five minutes where JV was just It was a there long time. This is the longest bleed I've ever seen. Just and G- JV's being able to go around looking at rocks and being like, oh, I don't, maybe I'll get to him. Well, I guess yeah. I couldn't get to him in time. Yeah, it was pretty funny. It was <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> it was. In fact, I went back and checked the tape, JV Goldney, uh, from the time that I said, go say Matt, are you crazy? To you actually just slowly meandering over oh, to revive the most valuable player on our team. It was 34 seconds for you to make that decision. Oh, my God. 34 seconds. And if you want to hear it for yourself, we'll post it uh, after the credits <laughs> on this episode of the Game Informer Show. Oh, you're okay with can that, Can we not Jamie. do that? Nope, we're going to do gotta it. got to be done. All right, yep, cool. Let the world know what kind of teammate <laughs> Jamie Galtney is when playing with a great I'm player. I'm the one who lives. God, God, oh, gosh. So if you didn't live, th- were you going to win? It doesn't I matter. I longer than you. <laughs> well, look, that might be true, but that's not I went out. Fi- I went out with a warm gun in my hand. All right, uh, I my... Are you sure about that? Yeah, I, I think you just got shot in the face. No, I, I mean I did, but I also killed somebody. Like it was, I was in the that was I know the drop. We landed at Asylum. We were inside. There were zombies already active on the location. It was kind of a a very frisky drop location. Frisky. Let me tell you. I know, and I got out of there like a smart person. What Dan was your finest moment playing? Finest you got moment. hit by the truck. <laughs> well, no, no, that was would like it to be that. Uh, I was involved in a very early skirmish. You know, the sort of the like you've hit the ground. Mm-hmm. There's another person right there. You kind of look at each other and wonder what the hell is going to happen. So uh, I was near a garage, right? And he was hitting me in the back with fists, and I could have turned and fought him. This was like a brutal beginning. We landed at a very... It was not a, uh, a named area. This was off the beaten path. But you guys dropped there anyway. Perfect. So because Yeah, because you weren't totally watching. We weren't dropped. eavesdropping! Maybe uh, somebody recommended it. Maybe they were. I don't know. Because we all decided to go off location because we wanted a quieter drop, right? Uh-huh. So there was not a whole lot of stuff around. People were... People were this was at least eight people in the in the vicinity, and everybody was basically naked, punching each other. Yeah. So I opened up a garage door, and uh, there was nothing in there but a thing of ammo and the the old tomahawk, the throwing tomahawk. That's like a one shot kill. So like he had me down to about half health, and I just turned around and just point blank that thing right into his head, and it was uh, it was great. But did you throw it? Or that was one of the, one of your better players. Um, I think it was your best player. On your oh team. really? I, or one of them? One of them. Okay. Did you throw it? Oh, it's a throw. Okay. Yeah, you have to throw it. Um, that's sweet. Yeah, yeah, it was actually really great. It was one of those great like. Oh god! Oh god! Super pressure! Super pressure! What am I gonna do? I hope there's a gun in here. I hope he doesn't get the gun. Yeah. And I'm just like, okay, I got a tomahawk. I got one shot at this. I feel like I found a gun every time we dropped. I do want. I do want to talk about that briefly. Yes. Yeah. I think that the you don't have as much trouble finding something to shoot. Their quote was, "The game is about finding items, not searching for items." Yeah. You might, you're not gonna have as much trouble finding something to shoot, but finding what you want to shoot with the right attachments that can still be. You're still gonna be hunting. You're still gonna be always hunting for better stuff, but you're not gonna be like. Oh god, I don't have anything to shoot unless you drop with twelve people at an off base location and uh, there's you know. But it's fine. Then you there, find there a was, hatchet. There was like a rocket launcher. Yeah, there was like a rocket launcher and a hatchet in that house. That was it. Everybody else is running <laughs> around with fists. That's perfect. Hey guys, turns out battle rails are fun. Yeah, yeah, real fun. I know. <laughs> and I, I'm constantly puzzled by people who are like, "Yo, we have enough battle rail. We just we just got started." To be frank, um, this yeah. I mean, realistically, especially on PS4. I mean, this is going to be, if you don't like Fortnite, your best bet. Yep. And in theory, 
for a while. I think you could find a huge audience. Dan, you, I, you I have, I have said to something to the effect of, I think PUBG's in trouble. Wow. Well, yeah, okay, that, that's on the table. Yeah, I agree. This, if, if, if there's an analogous game, if, and I was, you know, if there's a one-to-one game that's closer, yeah. it's definitely that. 100%. And this this has a lot of the great things that I like from PUBG. And I love PUBG, for the record, everybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, 95 says Dantec. That's correct. That is why I scored it. I also scored Fortnite in 95. Must, I must like Battle Royales. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, I had a ton of fun playing this. I want to play more, and I think I think you're right. I think I think I'm right in you quoting me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I really made a great point when I quoted you there. Isn't that was pretty good? I think good. Dr- definitely in the console audience. I mean, I think it's a tough sell for the millions of people that have already purchased PUBG on PC, especially to say, right. "Hey, pay sixty bucks, double the price, more than double at this point." And you can play another battle royale that also comes with Call of Duty multiplayer. And that, that really de- that really depends since we're on the PUBG topic now. Like PUBG has gone through cycles of like being great to being not you know not as great. And you know, with their current initiative to try to I don't know they have some like fix PUBG initiative going on right now, right? Like as yeah. a, a big thing. And I mean, and we don't we have not confirmed this because we haven't done it yet. But you know we will they you know dedicated servers, uncapped frame rate. This thing could be a monster on PC as well. Could be. And, and of course Battle.net. As a social platform, I mean, having a battle royale and battle—that's that's a recipe. Yeah. That's, yeah. A, that's a very good recipe. Let me tell you. Assuming it all shakes out as they as they say it is. Yeah, I mean, that's the that's the big thing in my mind. Is like, what is launch going to be like? John, well, you know, because server stuff anything. are like <laughs> launch week. You know, okay, that's be- that's a better estimate. Yeah, like what day? Is, uh, yeah, it's <laughs> always launch day is always iffy, but like launch week. You know, if they can nail that, I, I'm I'm in the same camp of like, man, PUBG's in trouble. I'm, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to use this term where, where it's in trouble. I'd rather use the term where they're gonna have to step their game up. How about that? Yes. Eh. Yeah. It'll be interesting to Healthy see. Healthy competition raises all all the ships. Something like that, right? I don't know. I think on console, this mode, yeah, if done right at launch, could have a huge impact. Well, from what we saw, what do you think? I, mean, I think so. I mean, I don't like think it's to the point where PUBG should really be worried. I think they're definitely like I said. There is that crowd, especially on PS4, that will want a battle royale that's not Fortnite that plays well on console. If this thing comes out and it plays well, which it seems like it probably yep. will, uh, I think it's going to be a great, great battle yep. royale option. I think it's yeah. a heavy hitter. Yeah, and I'm not, not yeah, I'm not shying away from that. It's it's got all the bells and whistles and the tools to be a great battle royale for sure. And as uh, Vaughn said repeatedly, like releasing a game, if it's a football game, you're at the 50 yard line, and they right. plan on supporting this. They said you'll be sick of the updates. are going to support yep. this thing. Right, so and it's, it's a as with all battle royales, right? These are living entities that change massively. Like look at Realm Rail, like that goes from from public favor to the hated a uh, super hated game within like two days based on changes. Yeah, and Call of Duty's community is already like lively to begin with, even outside of like the battle royale stuff. They're gonna have community. opinions on this mode. For yeah, sure. they they will be vocal about. I it. think they're gonna love it. I think yeah. they will too. I think they are. Yeah. I'm curious, like how how you know if there's how this mode is going to evolve, like in the in the long run, like if there's going to be a blackout too, like how does this fit into mm. Activision? That's, that's a huge the, question. You know, like is this just a service, like straight up? Yeah, in the like rapid fire, not. we asked him a couple things along those lines about whether it be sold standalone. As he just said, I just make the shoes. Yeah, I just make the shoes, man. He's just what a game he said. designer. It's not a business guy. Uh, I could see it being sold standalone conceptually. We didn't get a hint of it's, that um, at the at the studio, but. Also, he wouldn't rule out the idea of other Call of Duty studios making their own battle royale, which, which is where is, it gets insane. Now that just gets that gets rough. Yeah, You're doing. I don't. I, mean, I don't know that that's the thing that can happen. Not really. I mean, World War Two battle royale or whatever you know, Sledgehammer does next. <laughs> hey, Battlefield Five's coming out too. But then you just like you're fighting with your own product. Like, because you got one that these are living games, right? Yeah. Last years, you're gonna have to pick which battle royale in the Call of Duty franchise you want to play at, at, at any given time. That's right. That's insane to me. But yeah. The other thing that is a big unknown at this point is microtransactions. Right. We don't know anything. They're we not don't. talking about it yet. It could that, that's, It could have a huge impact. We won't know anything about that until very close to release, I'm sure. That's just it how it seems like post-beta type of thing. Yeah. yeah, so we don't know about that. Uh, zombies. Yes. Oh, yeah. Zombies are Why part of Black Ops mode. <laughs> zombies are part of Black Ops 4, aren't they? Yes. Uh, there's three different campaigns going four, at launch. Four if you've got the... The season pass. Yeah. Right? Okay, there we go. Uh, Dan, you got to play a little bit of like the Blood of the Dead. The I kind did. Of reimagining I did. of Mob of the Dead. Right, the sequel, so if you so, will. Yeah, it's more of a sequel. Let's, yeah. let's make that really clear. We did get to play it for like three seconds. Yeah. And so it's not the same thing, but it's the same place mm-hmm. and revamped. It's a so, one-to-one of Alcatraz now yes. compared to like the abbreviated version of Alcatraz, which it was before. Correct. And yeah, I mean, it's really hard to say anything about that experience because one player zombies is not a thing for me. 
and that's what I was doing. Right. And I'm not going to like be figuring out any of the puzzles or anything like that. They um, said it was going to add new story details. It'll answer mm-hmm. some questions from Mob of the Dead, which I guess a lot of the community has had. <laughs> answer some questions. Suck. Oh, my <laughs> God. This was, I think, the most mind-blowing <laughs> section. We're going to talk about zombies a lot uh, next week on GameInformer.com. So definitely check it out there. Yeah. But just talking to uh, to Jason uh, yeah, Jason Blundell, Jason Blundell. Absolutely. Blundell. the director of the Zombies book, he goes back a long ways with zombies and figuring out how deep this rabbit hole goes and that storyline. The fact that he said there are three fully formed languages within the right. zombies universe. Not, not spoken, though. Right, but, but still written languages. Like, what has everybody been doing? And that community, the way he describes it, <laughs> it's like it feels like a QAnon level of intensity of trying to figure out what that. is happening with zombie I mean, storylines. QAnon is just sh- posting, and, sure. and this is actually figuring out ciphers. Like, yeah, yeah like there it, are it, answers here. Yeah, like Jason gleefully told us when we were like talking to him that he likes to play with people too. Like when he was talking about his interview with uh, what was it, Gamespot? He was like, "Oh yeah, I was leaving clues and, and notes and stuff during that interview, right. meeting at the community, and like the first thing." Well, more like the third thing you see when you walk into Treyarch is like this huge like zombie board that is somehow like a st- like telling the story of the zombies universe. Right. It has so there's two storylines. It's story so convoluted. Right? You know, it's, it's the ether and chaos. Ether is the one that's wrapping the up now. One. Yes, yeah. and then chaos, chaos is, is the new. new one. It's basically a new starting point, a new fifty-two in DC terms oh of like, God. hey, this is yeah. nine Voyage of Despair. It's a new storyline. In theory, you can leave everything else behind. In theory. Well, he said he seemed adamant that they are separate this yeah, is they completely are. new and, and, and you know if you haven't played zombies outside of like oh i've played a few waves you know and killed some stuff with some buddies like there is there is some like ridiculous level easter eggs in those yeah. modes like the that's last good. it's yeah but see that's the thing i like about zombies modes they can be enjoyed on multiple levels yep. if you just want to sit there and shoot some zombies and get some other grades you can and then if you want to go down that insane rabbit hole you can do that too. Yeah, no, I think yeah. that's what's most interesting to me about it. Isn't necessarily like I want to do the thing where I unlock the Easter eggs. Like I'm more like interested in like the amount of work that goes into that and like just creating that sort of impressive yeah. puzzle piece, which we'll be talking about at GameFormer.com next week. Like the history yes. of zombies, yeah, all that stuff, we'll a little bit that. of their creation. But like nine, which is that crazy yes. Roman gladiatorial combat thing yes. that was teased. We, we saw. Some oh, bits of details, like a highlight it, video of different areas, and yes. they were key on emphasizing, and it's true from what we saw. Like, it's not just like an arena thing. You get we're, out we're of that not gladiatorium. Just gladiatorium. It was like a, there's a dungeon, there's some catacombs, yeah, there's catacombs, like a, a well lit, very eerily lit green cave. It seems connected to the elixir or whatever they're drinking, and so yeah, yeah. So I think the elixirs are going to take the take the spot of like the chewing gum and the other sort of zombie uh, pack a punch kind of stuff. Sure, it seemed like a lot of elixirs are being drank and. A good time to being had. The vapors, yeah. Yes. The vapors, yeah. I think it looked really cool, to be honest with you. Uh, and there was plenty of, like, shooting up. All, yeah, it looked good. It looked good. Yeah, yeah. it looked like a fun time. Yeah, we didn't see anything from Voyage of Despair, I don't no, think. No, we did but not. But 9 certainly looks interesting. And the fact that there's so many campaigns out of the gate, they're really wondering, like, that's is so it going to split the community? So like, how can they focus on all these at once? I'd imagine that zombies community will tackle it, though. Oh, they'll, they'll, if anybody yeah. can, it's them. Um, Other <laughs> quick facts about zombies, if you want to get these down. Um, zombies now has a realistic mode just one hit kill they said the <laughs> test group within Treyarch they can normally get to like round 200 normally playing sure. zombies on realistic they all died on 15 yeah uh, there's an easy mode easter eggs are yes. on easy mode uh, but no the easter ciphers, eggs are oh they aren't they are the not ciphers are okay so you can get that's the ciphers but you can't get the easter eggs that's I'll right make sure we're clear on that because yes that's important and yes. that's okay none of the hardcore zombies guys are going to play it on easy anyway that's actually for the people who just want to come in and, and do zombies without the yeah. the mind bending insanity that is the... It is one of the deepest rabbit holes I've ever witnessed in the gaming industry. It's, it's, what it's are crazy. you guys doing It's crazy. Uh, we have interviews going up next week. A lot of fun facts. Um, Gameinformer.com slash Black Ops 4 for everything. Yeah. Everything. Everything you can imagine. And the beta's mm-hmm. coming soon. Prove us wrong. We, I think everybody will have a good time with yeah. this. If it launches, I okay. Think so too. Yeah. yeah. And there's lots more stuff if you go to that. Like, tons more. We, right. we barely scratched the surface of this, what we could have talked about. It's crazy. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. But I'm sorry for anybody not interested in Call of Duty Black Ops. Uh, and for those people, let's talk about Spider-Man. You guys want to clap out of here and come back later? Hey, we got Andrew Reiner. Whew, that was a lot of Call of Duty talk. Yeah, you were just sitting off camera saying, we're going to talk about Spider-Man. It's going like this. We also <laughs> have Kyle Hilliard. Hi. Okay, let's have some fun here, folks. I'm sorry if you didn't care about Black Ops, but we're excited about it, damn it. Insomniac Spider-Man. Yeah. Insomniac's Marvel Spider-Man's Marvel. Just Spider-Man. Out tomorrow for everyone. That's true. Okay, so it's time to Spider-Man. You gave what score? 9.5 out of 10. 
There it is. If we didn't hint too strongly last week that Reiner was pretty hot on it. Uh, Kyle, how much have you played of this thing? I have... I believe I won't know until Friday, until it, like the servers go live. I believe I have a platinum trophy in the game. Really? Yeah. Wait, how do you? You can't believe that. You, well, because I played on three different consoles, and it only it wasn't. You, they don't upload the trophies to the server. All right, so. people don't. Anyway, care. To, I played it a lot. What I do you think? One hundred percent completed. I love it. It's great. Everything you wanted it to be. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I don't. There's like there. I. It's you know, it's not a perfect game. There's like we won't go into spoilers, obviously, but like. Oh, maybe, I am. Maybe there's a couple little like sure. story shortcomings here and there, and not all the side quests are like amazing. But like overall, like I think easily, easily the best Spider-Man game ever. Crushes Period. Spider-Man Two, crushes NeverSoft. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah, I mean the Spider-Man Two template is kind of there, you know, but expanded on in a huge way. Yeah, for sure. Ryan, did anything surprise you? Like you knew a lot going into this thing, and then you start playing it, and it's like, oh, it's more this than I thought. Yeah, it's more, uh, boy, him and his prime than I thought it would be. Like, it, to put that into context, I mean, you'd really have to spoil a lot of the story stuff, but they go places in that narrative that I didn't expect them to. Uh, you know, opening new chapters, closing old ones. Like, uh, it does feel like you've read maybe, there's maybe a hundred comics that you didn't read before this, you know? like And that's not off-putting? No. Okay. No, I think they do a really good job of kind of setting the stage for all these things, and they knock them out of the park. They, they take some real risks with that story. Uh, both with, you know, the established universe that you know and love and tone as well. Like, uh, there's moments in that game that get surprisingly dark or you touching. Com- or you compared something to the no Russian level from, yeah. from Call of Duty, which seems yeah, you- insane. Yeah. Uh, Kyle and I had a big yeah. talk about this. I was like, you might not want to, if your daughter's around, you might not want her to see the sequence. Yeah, because one of the reasons I was excited to play the game is because I played with my kids. It's a T-ready game. But I think Reiner was right. Like, I'm glad that I had that heads up and didn't play it around my kid. We're not, we're not I am ta- so flabbergasted about yeah. what this could be for Spider-Man. Yeah. I, yeah, we don't yeah. want to spoil it. I mean, I we're, not, we're not talking about gore. Like, there's yeah. no gore. It's just, it's just a disturbing. very intense... It's a very disturbing sequence. Yeah. Weird. And it, without spoiling anything, can you talk about, like, what the larger theme of the game is? Is it... Mm. That's a good question. Like, I mean, it's... Well, it's like pure Spider-Man. And I, I guess that's kind of a lame answer. Well, but the like, lamest so, thing I've ever heard about. I know. It's, but well, it's, it's not his origin story. It's it's like right smack in the middle of, yeah. like, I'm the... I'm, I am the titular Spider-Man is one of his famous lines that he says. I know this isn't going to sound like the the most exciting thing in the world, but the game begins with him defeating Kingpin, big victory, his biggest victory yet, Uh after eight years of being Spidey. But at the same time, you find out that he's really starting to fall apart as Peter. So he's getting evicted from his apartment. Uh, He can't, you know, hit his appointments he needs to with Aunt May or or work, you know, at his lab. Him and Mary Jane are broken up. Because like of this, you yeah. know, a, okay. a big part of it is, you know, just the devotion he's given to being the city's hero, right? Yeah. Uh, so everything else is starting to fall apart. And so peak Spider-Man, lowest Peter Parker, and that's where the X starts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Got yeah. it. Okay, that's And that's right. where it kind of starts rolling, and you really get invested in both of those stories, and there's key players in both that rise in different ways. Uh, again, I don't want to give away too no, much. I hate don't. being so cryptic, but, yeah, some might go against Peter, others may support him in ways you wouldn't expect. It, yeah. it's, it's very cool how they weave that web. Okay, what can you talk about? What is, what you, what is uh, red well, hot in your mind? Yeah, I, I, in my review, you know, I wrote one line just immediately. I wrote, it's a triumph of superheroes and storytelling, and I felt wow. like that's all I really needed to write for this review. Usually I'm just blabbing on uh, and have to be heavily edited, but this game, I felt like that line really summarized everything about it in You get this great Spider-Man experience, you know, like exactly what you want from Spidey, web-swinging, he's super athletic, powerful in combat, witty, I I think they did a pretty good job with his humor. Yeah. There's some of it that goes on and on a little bit, but... Little ventrancy. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh, But he's he's pretty funny. Uh, Like, I think it's... Even the cheesy stuff is executed well, you know? Okay. Yeah, and then you get the depth of, you know, his different costumes through the years, you know, that's something that you're... They dangle like a carrot in front of you, Insomniac does, that keeps you going maybe doing more side missions than maybe you would if you're just a critical path player. You might want to get that, those other costumes. And then on the other side, you have this really fascinating story about uh, not just Peter, but Mary Jane and other characters in the Spider-Man universe that they actually take a lot of time to slow down. Nice. And you get to know them, and it isn't just all a beat em up you know, it's uh, they, they really do a nice job of making you care about each character in this game, whether sometimes the villains or 
the heroes. It, it gets messy. Yeah. Okay. Do you I, think there is going to be that crowd? I remember we talked about it before in the podcast about are there going to be people that might be a little bit disappointed or bummed up by how much time you spend in kind of low key Peter Parker settings? Boy, if you're not, if you don't get vested in that narrative, you might just be out. Like, oh really? Uh, I mean, yeah, you might like this or just click through the cutscenes or whatever. But I mean, I don't know who that would be. Like, yeah. Because I think. Part of that is building up these other characters. Yeah, their moments are just as interesting as Spider Man's sometimes, and and just as exciting too. There's yeah. there's moments uh, with certain characters that you're playing as that it's like, holy crap, this the S is hitting the fan in a big way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I want to see what happens next, and then Control goes back to Spidey, and you're like, I want to go back to Mary Jane. I want to see where this is going. I mean, it, it is paced well. I, there, I there will be those people I think who get annoyed. It's like, ah, okay, I got to do this stealthy part with Mary Jane. Like, you'll see it coming. It's like, oh, this is a Mary Jane mission. Yeah. Um, but they're they're quick, and the story is interesting. There was maybe, like, one or two occasions where I, I was I put it off to go do more side quests as Spider-Man. But, I mean, there's there's one in particular that I really liked, but to explain why would be a spoiler. All right. <laughs> so I will not say. Uh, but there, I think I think that crowd will exist that is annoyed by those, but they're they're quick, and they control well, and, and they're interesting. Yeah. So, so you say Triumph of superhero storytelling. I mean, are we talking about on the level of tightness with the Arkham series? Is there any oh, yeah. comparison yeah. you can make I, there? I think it's, you, you put it right there with the first Arkham Asylum. Uh, I know There's a lot of people like their favorite. I liked Arkham City the best. Yeah. Like, I thought that was a better realization of Batman in his world. Uh, and the story was awesome. But, uh, yeah, it is that kind of first step from Insomniac Games as Spider-Man that they knew the, the character. They did everything they could to bring what you've seen on both the silver screen and in the, the funny pages to life in their game. And and I think, uh, you know, there's every time I saw him move, I was like, that looks awesome. That looks like a comic book cover, you know, yeah. like a different, a different animation he'd have. Uh, and they frame it that way, too. They, they frame it like comic panels sometimes, the story sequences. Including, like, with photo mode, you can turn it, it into a comic could. panel. Yeah, you could. Yeah, you could. Yeah, it's awesome. So, yeah, I... I, I I can't think of anything that Arkham did better than this, like in that first kind of throw. They're both like kind of established in the middle of their universes. They're not origin story. Combat. Combat's very similar. You know, I guess you could say maybe uh, Spider-Man apes too much of it at times, but uh, especially in some of the side activities where there's different villains. And they're just kind of there. Batman is very very much like a defensive fighter, you know, because you're countering a lot more, where Spider-Man's a more active sort of fighter like you're doing counters similarly but you're doing a lot more like active punching as spider-man i would say tying him up and stuff yeah. and then just like the navigation do you guys ever get sick of swinging around Isn't no as sweet i as never think? never once use that's fast just, travel that's like the highlight of the game right yeah they make yeah. you use it once for story purposes to show you it's there but after that i was like i gotta go three miles that way i don't care like i'm, I'm just gonna haul ass yeah. uh with you my get, the line you get so fast that like it really often i mean you you're right. Like you see fast travel. If it's like you'll go faster just by swinging than you would if it would. You'd watch the cutscene of him in the train. You know, uh, but it feels great. Yeah. It's um, initially he's a little he's a little sticky, and it does take some getting used to. Like he he like maybe you want to just land on top of this one you know building on top of a building, the shed or something, and maybe he just keeps jumping over it. So I there was like maybe like a little bit of time that I had to get used to controlling him. Uh, but it feels so good, and that that point jump where you dash into like one specific spot and leap off, which is yeah. the fastest way to travel, even faster than web swimming. It like when you get the timing down on it, it just it, it feels great. It's so cool. Awesome. Yeah. Reiner, everything you wanted from a, a new Spidey experience, absolutely. Uh, you know the the city activities get uh, a little repetitive. I don't know how many times I stopped a car by jamming on. The square button. Oh, really? It's that uh, sequence? Yeah. Okay. Like, it, you just got to close your eyes and be like, is it over? And it's like, oh, thank God it's over. Um, so that's something they could really use, you, you know, when they come to the sequel, which, man, they outline a hell of a follow-up act. Uh, in really? In the post-credit sequence. Yeah, there's two clips. I know people like going into the uh, uh, Marvel Cinematic movies knowing how many clips there are. Okay. Uh, stick around all the way through the credits. And imagining they're long. Okay. It's yeah, very, very, long. very long. Every company in the world worked on this game. Is by that the way. right? Lots yeah. of Sony support for Insomniac. Yeah. They're interesting, uh, and so it has you more excited about Insomniac's perpetual future as a oh, yeah. caliber. Yeah, yeah. They they tease some big things, and I mean, I've there's Spider-Man people like other critics that have finished the game and have DM'd me, and they're just like, uh-huh. "Is this what I think it is?" And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I think so." That's something we're gonna have to talk about in 
a spoiled cast or something like that. There's yeah. there's a lot to discuss. It's almost like it's ripe for a game club, <laughs> which is coming up next week. Was it September thirteenth? I think the episode yeah. airs, so it'll be a good one. For yeah. Club. Oh, good. So we're gonna break it up into three sections. So Act One, Act Two, and Act Three. And you will know you're at the end of Act One, which is after how long? Three, four hours? Four, something like that. Okay, somewhere around there. So yeah. write in an email to podcastgameformer.com with your thoughts on that section of the game. Whatever stands out, be specific, be in-depth, focus on one thing. If you want your email read, if it's a scattershot of everything, it's very tough to sort through. Yeah. But one standout, favorite moment, anything like that, favorite little detail. But stop at the end of Act One where there's a trophy that'll tell you it's the end of Act One. Yeah. And a certain character gives a political speech. Well, yes. It's Norman Osborn. He's the mayor of New York City. Right, that's that's, right. that's yeah. no. That's no. Okay. All right. Yeah. So after he gives a speech, that is the stopping point for the game club, yeah. which is next week. So play along with the community. It should be a good time. Anything else you want to get off your chest about Spider-Man? Do we talk? Web swinging is good. Combat's Fighting is good. good. Story's great. Story's good. Uh-huh. I think we got it all. Yeah. Insomniac did it. Congratulations. And you know those, yeah. those moments where you're playing as Mary Jane and, and others, it, it's, they're fun. They're done very okay. well. Yeah, okay. the, the stealth works well, and the puzzles are cool, and the context of what's going on. Yeah. yeah. I want more backpacks. I like collecting the backpacks. Yeah. Oh. A tip for people out there, don't gather everything right away like I did. Like, just immediately, like, oh, I got a backpack. I'd be I'm not going to do another backpack. mission. I'm just going to get all 50. Yeah. Oh, no. Because having those scattered, littered throughout the game as you're going through it is a nice diversion. Okay. So you don't just have city crimes left at the end. <laughs> Interesting, because those get pretty dry. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. But the main game's awesome. Cool. 9.5. Review on the site. Yeah. It's up there, there we right go. Now. Fallout 76. Whoa. Yeah. Uh, we More talked about it. Yeah, <laughs> a couple weeks ago. Oh, nope, wait, no, you're no, not no, clapping out yet, buddy. Fallout 76. Uh, <laughs> so you talked to Mr. Todd Howard himself. Uh, yeah. There was one ray of light cast down upon <laughs> his shiny head. Uh, and what did he tell you about Fallout 76? So every time I've seen that game, whether it was at E3 or at QuakeCon, they kept talking about the multiplayer and what's new to the Fallout universe. Yeah. And they never really outlined how it's Fallout, right? So okay. it's like they're like, you're, it's a survival game. You're playing with other players. Every player's, you know, every human is a player, and you're just like, or every character is a human. That's what they said, right? And I'm just like, yeah, how no is this human work? NPCs. In yeah, the world. that's an easy way to put it. Yeah. Yes. So I was like, uh, how is this Fallout? Like, is it just, is it more like Ark or Rust or something like that? So I sat down with him and I and I asked him those questions about uh, him and and other people on the team about. Uh, why is it follow? Tell me, what do I do when I get to the vault? And he's like, oh, you're on a quest for the Overseer. And that goes all the way across the world. That takes you to different regions, and that is your main critical path. The Overseer. Yeah. What is that? So it's someone who left the vault before you, okay. and they have you fetching something or going after something, uh, and that's where it kicks off. So I was like, okay, so I have a quest line. That's cool. Yeah. Am I getting other ones as you go along? And they're like, absolutely. There's other characters in the world. And I was like, well, wait. You said characters were only humans, but it's that's not true. There's uh, other NPCs like robots. Right. And they don't like calling them NPCs. This is something that I got into the weeds with them a little bit about. But I was like, so they're AI-driven, and they communicate with you and give you quests. They're NPCs. It's an NPC. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what do they say? They're just like, that's not the true classification. Uh, of what they're interactable. What are NPCs all? are? <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I was like, oh, okay, whatever. Um but they will give you quests. You'll find, like, hollow uh, tapes, so maybe holograms of people giving you quests. You'll find uh, documents like you have in other Fallout games. You know those environmental stories that have always been so compelling about those games? Yeah. That stuff's still there. Okay. And they also do something uh, a little different this time where you, if you're in the vicinity of something, you know, it might give you a kind of a landmark location, but also cue you to a, uh, clue you into a quest that could be there. And then on top of that, something that's new, because they said, you know, it's only 24 players per server. So it's four times larger than any Fallout before it. Think Mm -hmm. about that in terms of your little speck of you in the world, how tiny you are. Mm -hmm. The odds of you seeing someone else, if you're in a dungeon or something like that, or another vault, pretty minuscule. Uh, And they want that to be that way, where, you know, maybe you hear gunshots on the horizon, you're like, what is that? Yeah, uh, I'm going to go investigate. It could be NBCs battling super mutants against ghouls or something, or it could be another player that you stumble across. And what happens at that point? Um, but they have things called events, and those are going to show up on your map that will have people gather. It could be a big boss battle. It could be some kind of escort mission. They told me about one uh, with robots where you're escorting robots. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but that's where they want people to meet up to be able to do these, um, you know, kind of communal uh, missions. All right, okay. So, so you will be mostly on your own. Right? Yep. Or but, you can. But these events will be the, the areas where occasionally you'll gather with other people and do things. Yeah. So you could play it solo. You know, you're always online. Yeah. There's always that chance of someone else coming up and messing with you or whatever. But you could play the game, you know, by yourself. Never team up with anyone else. Pete Hines talked to me about how he went through that. Uh, how he was playing the game that way, and he was really enjoying it. Uh, or you can, right out of the outset, let's say the three of us wanted to play together, we can team up and go into the world together and play it cooperatively, build, you know, camps together, stuff like that. Cool. So you left much more optimistic about I it? I did, yeah. I, I totally get now why it's followed. Like, they said you're going to have a huge, you know, like, the huge uh, list of missions that you haven't done yet, and you're just going to pick one and kind of go off and, yeah. and do that. So, yeah, I'm a little worried about how much... You know, they kept saying you got to take care of your thirst and hunger uh, okay. and your camps and stuff like that. I worry about that being maybe a little too front and center, but they kept saying, like, you conquer that eventually and then you move on to something else, like mm-hmm. another challenge, like radiation or something like that. Okay. And uh, Vats is just out, right? Like Vats is down. in the game, but oh, it slowing down isn't. So targeting, okay. you could target. Okay, okay, okay. That's going to be so bizarre. Yeah, I can't wait to see how they do that. Yeah, it's weird they haven't shown that yet. I bet people are going to freak out when they see that for the first time. Like, real-time vats, no! Yeah, I guess it would be, like, just high-speed aiming. Or, like, like, like this is a weird one to call, but Crackdown would let you, like, aim. You could lock onto a car, but then, like, use the right control stick to aim yeah, for the maybe. gas tank or aim for the tires. Oh, wow, okay. Like, so maybe it's going to be something like that? I don't know. It's Main point of inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, hired, they hired the Crackdown <laughs> one targeting yeah, guy. Yeah, what are those guys doing? Yeah, indeed. What is that crackdown <laughs> team doing? I think a lot of people are wondering. But. Yeah, it sounds cool. Like, I was worried about it. And a lot of people online are, are seriously, like, freaking out about this not being Fallout anymore. Yeah, for sure. But it still fo- sounds like it is. By the way, uh, I, I understand those people being concerned, but it is funny. Like, the second round of, it's not Fallout anymore. We already went through that with Fallout 3, where everyone got their panties yeah. in a bunch, yeah. and everyone's getting it again for it's different It's not layers. top down! Yeah, all right, okay. <laughs> but uh, Fallout's evolving, folks. Here we go. Yeah, we'll see. And I mean, I thought they were pretty smart in naming it 76 and not 5. Right, for you sure. Know, so they leave that door open for, okay, you didn't like this one, or, you know, you wanted just a strictly single-player traditional Bethesda Game Studios game. Well, here it is. Yeah, for sure. Uh, your feature's in the magazine right now. It's on the site, too. Oh, it is? Yeah, the full thing. What's it called if people want to find it? Uh, what did I call that? I don't remember. Four Fantastic Hours with no, Fallout. That was oh, my Spider-Man page. Just look at GameFormer.com. <laughs> yeah, You'll find it. it. It's on there. Cool, there we go. And do you know when the beta starts for that? It's in October. Wow, right? coming up real soon. Crazy. Um, also, just in case we seem like complete idiots, I want to mention that the Nintendo Direct that happened Thursday morning, we haven't seen yet. Uh, we're recording this uh, not quite there yet, if that sentence made sense. So if there's some crazy news or something that we're not covering, we're sorry. We don't know what is in the Nintendo Direct, but maybe I, next week. I or promise something. we can see crazy news, though. No, I don't want to do that. I hate being a listener uh, and knowing things. Don't what about do predictions? I, predictions? I don't know. Smash Brothers character. No matter what we say, we're wrong. Let's move on. Uh, okay, we have a lot to talk about. Um, Ryan, are you coming back for emails? Sure. Okay, cool. You guys want to clap out, though? Oh, what's this? Kyle, you're confused, but you Kyle's still here. To <laughs> Shut up. We have Sergio Vasquez. Hello. And then we have Daniel Tack. Couldn't keep me away. One more thing about Blackout. It's great. It's great. Um, seems promising is probably a better way to phrase it. Well, Anyways, yeah, since you put those words in my mouth earlier this show, I had to, I'm just, I gotta roll with it now. I did not. <laughs> you said those words repeatedly. I did. But yeah. Don't. The other people in the office were misquoting you, saying that it's going to kill PUBG. Like, I don't think Dan said that. I don't Man, think Dan said that. can we co- kill hyperbole a little bit here? Yeah, no kidding. This kill podcast anything? seems to be nice and vanilla, which is why we're talking about early impressions of Destiny 2 Forsaken <laughs> uh, with Serial Vasquez. Again, Matt Miller, lord of all that is Destiny, will hopefully be gracing us with He's his presence entered next the Destiny week. Chamber. Yes. But as for now, like, early impressions of the campaign, that's what you've been playing, Serial? Yeah, I've, I've, I want to say I've... Uh, made my way through most of the campaign. Okay. Because uh, it's structured a little differently. So you start it's off... It's like Mega Man bosses. Yeah. So okay. basically... Um, it's weird because, like, that specific thing, I think, is something that they kind of messed up because even though... So at one point, you make your way through the early missions, uh, and eventually you sort of get to a point where here's the Tangled Shore, sort of their new location yeah. um, that's in the reef, and they give basically say, okay, here's sort of... 
they, they do a, a very nice cutscene where they're like, okay, it's the hangman. He's like this guy who really likes to torture people. It's the marksman. Do he's they like, put the, the name on the screen? It's literally like a set of like cards of like poker cards of like, here's oh, fun. Okay. This is the hangman. It's like, and they're all sort of like working under Aldrin, who's the guy who, spoiler warning for people who don't, who haven't watched the trailers, basically, is he kills Kate, is, is sort of the whole <laughs> thing they rest how, this how expansion How can you kill a robot? On. Well, I mean, first of all, you have to end. kill, you have to snipe the little ghost that brings him back to life, <laughs> and then you beat the crap out of him for yeah. about five minutes. Right, um, right. And, and then you shoot him in, take and a hard him in the face. Or something? You can't Baymax him? <laughs> no, Kyle. Okay. He's way stronger than that. He's too cool to die that way. <laughs> okay, excuse So me? you kill all these guys. So basically, but the idea is that you're supposed to be able to tackle them in any order. Yeah. But they have, they have like literal different light uh, power recommendations, so it's there, there's, okay. there's, there's sort well. of like a surreptitious order of like, you should probably tackle the 390 guy before you take on the 400 guy. Right. Uh, but if you want, like, a, uh, I actually didn't notice that at first and took on the, the hangman when I was 20 light below him, and he was, like, the hardest fight by far. But it was, it was kind of, like, a, interesting to have a cool challenge that was, like, sort of focused on really reading the boss versus just, like, all right, he's in the damage phase. Kill it, like, you know, yeah. deal a bunch of damage to him. Okay. Overall impressions? Uh, I'm pretty think? positive on it. Uh, pretty positive. So, in the middle of it, there's, well, maybe not in the middle, but in the early segment, there's this really weird sort of introduction to the bounty system, which they introduced in the last patch. Yeah. Which is just, like, go to the vendor, get a bounty, and complete it. So, basically, in order for the guy to, uh, the spider, who is sort of the vendor of the Tangled Shore, yeah. uh, in order to get you to trust him, for him to trust you, you have to complete bounties for him. Okay. And it's kind of like oh, this weird sort of, like, it kills the momentum a little bit because it, it's just like, all right, you're, you're doing this thing, like, Kate dies, you're trying to avenge these guys, you, there's a mission beforehand that introduces you to all of the all of the barons. Yeah. Uh, and so you're like, all right, let's go kill these barons. And then there's this guy's like, wait, you might want to do some bounties for me. Like, basically, mm. and these involve basically going out to different parts of the, of the world, uh, like, all of the other Destiny locations. And like, okay, go find this lost sector, oh, which no. you remember the name of, right? Because it says, like, go to, you know... Uh, this particular location, and Something it won't be on the map. Something knows very well, but it's like, I don't remember anything. Right, so it all, like, this place called the pit, yeah, start your hunt at the pit. I don't know where the pit is, like, it's uh-huh. a lost sector, and I don't know, I don't remember the name of it, so I basically spent, like, an hour looking up locations online, it's like, where's the pit? The pit is in the er- in the EDZ, and it's in this area, so it was, like, uh-huh. this weird, like, it killed the momentum a lot for me, but after that, um, uh, it's... Like, all of these bosses are, like, their own set piece in a, in a lot of really cool And so cool those ways. seem cool. Yeah. Th- those are, like, my only problem with them is that they, they're they kind of a little bit, bit too brief. Like, I, I, I wish that they had built up these bosses a little bit more. But when you're in the moment, it feels really cool. Like, cool. There's one on a motorbike. There's one that's, like, a sniper <laughs> bike. Well, there's one that's, like, a, on a, a pike, which are the oh, sort of... Oh, sure. And so you're fighting them on that. And, like, all these bosses have, have so far... I've only killed seven of the eight. Uh-huh. Uh, but they've all been really good so far. Hang on a second. How are you doing over there? Just, get, just getting ready for my turn. I swear to God, if you were checking your phone, no, oh, help me. You really want to know what I was doing? Yeah. I was looking up a, a quote for Anthem when I talk about it. <laughs> okay, good. I love it. Uh, <laughs> good. Okay, you're my best friend. God, you're doing a really good job. Okay, so next week again, <laughs> yeah. we'll dive in deep. Matt Miller, get ready. You thought that blackout talk was something? Matt Miller is going to blow you away. But, Serial, you're here to provide color commentary for mm-hmm. uh, Dan Tack and Kyle Hilliard. Uh, and their Ooh. wonderful trip to PAX West. Ooh. I'm going to uh, commentate yeah, their entire time that they're talking. I'm going to talk over them talking. Yeah, talk about those, those yeah, parents some that. more. Uh, how was PAX, boys? Uh, it was fantastic. Fantastic. Nobody cool. And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, fantastic as You love always. the show. I do. It's one of my favorite shows. It's just such a community-oriented thing. It's really like, get, great to get the pulse on how other people feel about games. Like Sometimes I think you're so isolated, you know. You get the game, you play the game, you like it, you don't like it. We're in Minnesota. <laughs> it's, cra- it's crazy to just get out there and, and talk to people about what the coolest thing they saw was. Yeah. And, and everything happening together. And, of course, the, the rare occasion that Valve was out there showing a game. Holy uh, God. How often does that happen, right? Had, I, okay, we're going to get to that, because you're red hot on Artifact. Yeah. The card game, the Dota card game. Yes. Uh, and that's why Serial's secretly here. But just for some other quick hits along the way. Sure. Uh, Kyle, most exciting thing you saw at PAX. What do you think? Um... So, uh, my favorite thing I played was uh, just, I, I, I say just, to, like it, to, it sounds like I'm diminishing it, but it was like a, an indie game that I wasn't following that I ended up getting hands-on there called, it's, it's G-R-I-S, which is oh, Spanish yeah. for gray, so I believe it's pronounced Greece. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just a really beautiful sort of artsy-fartsy platformer, which is like my jam. Like yeah. that, That's the kind of stuff I love, and you, you kind of play as this 
this uh, woman who's like moving through an environment and uh, solving puzzles, and it's hand drawn 2D animation. It's just really beautiful, and it, it I really enjoyed my time with it's it. Coming out on Switch, Switch and PC, which is like a a weird takeaway from PAX is like everything was Switch and PC, like as far as just like Perfect. which is yeah, it's just <laughs> super smart. Uh, but yeah, like every indie thing that I touched, I felt like was Switch yeah. and PC. You also played Anthem. I did not play Anthem, but I talked oh. to the devs of Anthem. Oh, I was hoping you'd play it, because I wanted to have you compare it to Spider-Man in any way. Oh. Just for, like, movement. Because both those games, movement is big, and I think they're interesting yeah. in both. But. No, they, but they were there. They had a panel, and they were there to talk about kind of... Almost explain in more detail exactly how story is delivered in the game, like going okay. to Port Tarsus and then between the missions and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Um, but the thing that... My favorite thing that I talked to them about, which is super nerdy, which is what I was looking up on my phone, which you got so mad at me about, uh-huh. uh, was... That I asked them, like, a very nerdy question of, like, if you could get in the Normandy in Mass Effect, could you fly, like, a billion light years and get to the planet on which Anthem takes place? Like, <laughs> do they exist in and the And I same bet universe? their answer is no. Um, <laughs> not, not a flat no. They had a weird term for it. Um, where the, the uh, there's, like, the Anthem of Creation, the, the, the storms. Do you remember what the storms yep. are called? Uh, the Shaper Storms. Yes. So this is uh, Gamble, the producer, yes. says, It is actually, theoretically, in the IP, possible to have the entire Mass Effect universe within a Shaper Storm. So it's not a uh, flat no, it's more like a round. It's like a round no. Wait, what the hell are you talking about? What I does guess that mean? A shaper Storms, I guess, are like weird dimensional rifts or something like that? No. I, really? That's, that, the, I just read you his quote, is what he said. Maybe he's talking about, like, the scale and the size because the Shaper Storms are going to be so big. Or are they, maybe they're, like, portals to other places or something? I don't think so. My read, just to spoil Anthem because I don't know anything, yeah. my read, and I'm going to spoil Xenoblade 1 for people if you're not ready for this, I think what's going on with Anthem is that it's, like, Earth, but it's been, like, terraformed and transformed in some crazy way. Even though they've said flat that it's not Earth. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's not Earth, but it's like we are the like shapers. Like an alternate dimension. Not an alternate Earth. dimension, but the type yeah. of thing where like something went wrong with Earth. It's been terraformed. It's been nuked and then revolutionized. And it's like the new world that we essentially caused. Yeah, that is my theory. I think it's gonna be like the ending of Battlestar. Maybe because mm-hmm. yeah. they are cagey about whether or not it's Earth. They're not saying no, no, no. It's like yeah. well, no. Yeah, it's always, it's always yeah. Weird. yeah. But there's a full interview on the site if you want to see everything. Sure. Um, some other quick hits. I uh, played Super Mario Party, which sure. was we played like a co-op focused version, yeah. where like even the in between mini games is a co-op, like you're riding down a raft together, uh, and then the, the the games that you play are specifically co-op. Yeah. Uh, which I enjoyed that. That was fun. I had a good time with that. Uh, hang on. What are the odds Super Mario Party is going to be like the best selling Mario Party in years and years and years? And years? Oh, pretty high. Yeah, super high. 100%. 150%. Hundred percent. Hundred on Switch. Percent. It is on yeah. Switch. Okay. Well, that, I, I thought, for game whatever game. reason, I thought Switch that game was PC, coming out. Actually. Yeah, oh, oh, weird. Uh, I thought it was on three S switches, right? You can do like weird stuff. Yeah, like, yeah. We didn't do anything like that. We just had four Joy Cons. Okay, but, and it was all motion control, but it was fun. We Is there any five. mini game where you can you have to stack these switches on top of each other? Rub know, them man. up against there each other? Be. Yeah. I played it. I hump some switches. What are you talking about, Serial? You got to use them as uh, fuel. You got to start a fire with your switches. There you go. I think you're right, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I played a game called Sort of Fun, where you sorted things. That's good, right? All right. I have fewer details here. Um. The, uh, <laughs> this is genuinely I'm interested in this, the Halo Fireteam Raven arcade game. Oh, yeah. You played this? I forgot that I told you that I could talk about it. Yeah. yeah, I played it briefly at a Dave and Buster's. Okay. Uh, how was the Halo arcade game? How was the event there at the Dave Wait, and Buster's? Wait, uh, had all the games Buster, you could play. There's a Dave and Buster's, like, like, ten miles from here. Um, so it was, I mean, it, it was underwhelming. It, it doesn't look great. It looks like the Halo 3 engine, maybe. And it's like a light gun game? It's like a light gun game. There's two screens, four seats, uh... I didn't really get a good sense of the soundtrack because uh, maybe it was just the nature of the arcade scene where it's just super loud. And there's also like a lot of like sup- for an arcade game, like a lot of story and cutscenes and like character. Oh, no. Like the four characters have like bios on the machine, so you're like, oh, I'm playing as this guy who puts on a helmet, and I forget what they look like. Um, and I guess it takes place during Halo One, which is about the most interesting thing. Okay. Like you're supporting Master Chief while he's trying to blow up the Halo. By being on rails and shooting things. Okay. So and the guns vibrated, so that was fun. Well, I'm glad you talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, Streets of Rage Four was also announced. Did you play it? I played it. Yeah, it was very early. They even had placeholder music and sound effects. Okay. But the uh, the two D character animation was fantastic. Like, it's it, dot it's e- really you. Good. It's like the team that made that Wonder Boy remake, which is visually incredible. Yeah, and it, it the like I'm not a big Streets of Rage guy, but like I was I 
really admired the the animation of just the characters moving around and punching. Yeah. Like, they look really great. It's like 2D hand drawn animation. Okay. Which is also was the same for Windjammers 2, which I got right, to play. Right. Which isn't dramatically different from Windjammers. Like you have some new abilities. Like well, you can need. you can like throw smoke up to like uh, obfuscate your goal. Yeah. Does that, does that work? You got and it. And the uh, and the, the again the animation is like hand drawn and it looks really great. And Windjammers is just the best. Yeah. Um, Great. And Trover, real quick, Kyle. Yeah, Trover. So I played Trover, and I got to talk to Justin Royal, the co-creator of Rick and Morty. This is a PlayStation VR game? It is. It can be played either way. Okay. You can either play it flat, which was their weird term for it, or you can play it in VR. Right. Um, and it's and it was and it's funny. Like, even just the, like, opening tutorial was making me laugh. Because, like, Justin Roiland is a funny television comedy writer. Yep. And he plays a ton of video games, so he's, like, playing with tropes about like tutorials and stuff like that and that was it was really funny like it had that sort of like weirdly um improvisational style like that he has it's very distinctly right. him and it's just fun to see in a game because you rarely yeah. feel that kind of light-hearted and improv style in and it, even at the end of that demo like it's it, it had like uh hey thanks for playing our packs demo and a bunch of jokes about packs and stuff like oh, that like, oh. like he had clearly gone into the recording booth and recorded a bunch of stuff specifically for the demo yeah and and he's a very funny person as it turns out and he fun to talk to so. perfect okay kyle's smorgasbord all right i'll, has I'll close clapping out nope no clapping okay. in you're gonna stay here and crack wise because okay. antag hey king oh. of the jungle and stuff oh yeah sorry i asked them i asked <laughs> Diab- i played i played diablo switch yeah and i asked them about the majora's wings yes and they said they were wings inspired by majora's mask that is less of an answer than you could possibly hope I know, for. but we were Based talking... Based on a real game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just wanted to... We were talking about that last week, so... Yeah. Okay. Based on the fact that we winged it because we needed another <laughs> item yeah. that loosely related to Zelda. Uh, All right, Dan, I'm done. Dantac. Hey. Artifact. Oh, it's a game. You tweeted about this more than you've tweeted about anything, not including <laughs> some dog memes or something in the I don't last know, week. I think Aeolian. Probably, probably more, probably <laughs> more Aeolian Lobster dog memes. Yeah. Okay, and then you went in our Slack channel and you said, Artifact is the real... Deal. I did. It's going to kill PUBG. <laughs> no. so, to be clear, I never said it was going to kill anything, I and I didn't say it was a real deal either. I just said it was awesome. It's allegedly awesome. awesome. murdered. So this is <laughs> Valve's Dota 2 card game that Serial Vest, because you went out to Valve to also yep. play. I also watched the stream for like an ungodly amount of time. Perfect. It, it must have been so much fun to have Valve showing this game at PAX. It was fascinating, especially since I had really no idea what to expect. I didn't have like a, a preconceived notion of this game going in. I actually thought it was going to be kind of wonky. Okay. And almost unplayable based on the concept. What? Three you di- you're playing three different games at the same time. Three games? Three lanes, basically. It's three lanes, but to, to break it down to essential terms, yeah, you're playing three different games. So it's yeah. like walking between different chessboards playing. And over. you've got to win two out of those three games in well, most conditions to win, or, or double yeah. win on one board yeah. to win. I mean, you have one hand split across them, so it's not like you're picking up one okay. hand of cards and like, you're, bas- you're trying to sort of you know, wrangle them all together to, to play basically one match. But, Dan, you play so many of these collectible card I games. I mean, you've played some where there's multiple lanes before, right? It's not, not in this Elder fashion. Elder do that or Elder Scrolls does do that. Okay. There's two lanes, but it's not the same... Co- it's not like this. And that's why I try to state that you're playing three different games, because that's the easiest way to explain it. You are essentially playing three different games, and you have to win two of those games, or double win on one game to win. So, big impressions, it's complicated? It, it certainly yeah. was complicated for the first... The first time I played. Second time I played, I started getting the hang of it. By the third and fourth game, I was ready to go and starting to do strategy. Because you kept coming back for more I did. Valve. To I did. I play. actually did. I kept every <laughs> every day I would send Doug an email. And I'd be like, hey, I'm coming. Can I come back today? <laughs> Can I come back today? And I did that two days in a row. I'll wear the blazer you like, Doug, please. Yeah, yeah. Doug Lombardi. Um, and it was, uh, and thankfully they did let me play again. Yeah. And it was um, incredible. Uh, once I got the hang of it. That's, that's the key. It's not that complicated, but it can be very bewildering in your first If you're first game. saying that, you are a systems dude that loves card games. I just worry, I, I guess, about, like, is this going to hit a mass audience if, like, you're turned off for a little while by the complexity? This, this is a card gamer's game. I'm going to straight okay. with you. Like, this is a game for card for people who like card games. Yeah. This isn't going to have, like, uh, an overshoot of, like, oh, yeah, I like Dota, so I'm going to love this. You, you might like the characters and lore. But unless you like card games, I can't see it happening. It's not going to have, like, a Hearthstone-esque, like, sort of mass appeal. Ah, it's, it's simple to pick up, and I can uh, just play around in, like, two minutes you know, on my phone. It is... The thing is, it's very complex, but it's also very simple once you understand there's, like, all these juggling resources. Yeah. You can have a good time with, like, a dumb deck and be like, I'm just going to make a thing, and I'm going to put things down. Mm-hmm. But there is... There are definitely, like, because of the way that the turns pass and the overarching strategies, there's a lot of room for complexity there, and it, it is there. Yeah. Uh, so what? I'm still missing the ingredient of what blew you away. Oh, like um, 
So once you get into it, you realize you're all playing three games. So here's how it works, in a, in a nutshell, because I can't... I'm t Believe me, it's very it's difficult to explain, it's difficult to play the first time, but once you have that, you understand it. But you've got color-coded heroes, right? They go into the lanes. So you got you got to figure out where you want to put them. Yeah. Like, I want to go put this one, this red guy here, this blue guy here, this black guy here. Okay? And then you'll be able to cast the corresponding color-coded spells and effects in the lanes that the hero is in. Okay. Right? Sure. So you can only cast a blue spell in a lane that you've got a blue character. Uh, and you can rule break with some of these because, let's say, I can cast a blue spell with the mana in that lane, with the card in that lane, but I can put it in another lane. But so, that's only for some spells. Okay, help me out. Yeah. So d it's just a twist on typical structure that resulted in more fun, or I don't understand why that I, makes it. I'm going to get there, please. First, okay. I have to yeah. tell you how it works. <laughs> okay. Um, so here, so I go first. Let's say I've got a blue character in the lane. He's at three health. I go first. So the, the smart thing I would do is if I had a potion in my hand, I'd heal my hero up, because otherwise, during his first turn, he could kill the blue hero, and then I couldn't play any blue cards for the rest of the round. So there's a very limiting factor there where you want to deny your opponent the ability to cast spells and effects in each lane by terminating the hero there. But that's very, again, this is very surface-level stuff. Like, some heroes don't even, like, you know, do anything. Others have special abilities to click, so activated abilities. That's all part of it. And then between each round, between each board, you have an ability to go to the shop which is like a Dota concept, right? Yeah. This is basically to let you pull away from a game that you are destroying the opponent um, by killing all of those creeps, which are randomly thrown into lanes and have random attack patterns. Same with your heroes, right? You don't get to pick directly with the attack unless you use cards. This sounds very complicated, I know. It does. It, it's it's mind-boggling, but it, once you... there, The UI and everything, very intuitive. It, it helps you grasp difficult concepts over the course of a 30 minutes. And it feels fresh. Absolutely. Yeah. You have to tinker with it. Like I said, I... First game, I was like, man, this is kind of weird. I don't know if I like it by game five and six. Yeah. It was like, now I get it. This is really cool. I'm going to start establishing lane presence in this lane with the blue character so that I can cast spells down on the other side of the board early on in the turn so I can clear out his hero before his hero will have a chance to play any cards in that lane. So his, his black character here will not, be able to play, will not be able to play any black cards in the lane or any cards in the lane. Okay. Because he's only got that black hero. If I kill it from using stuff down here in lane one... By the time that turn, that when we get to the third board, that hero will be dead because of stuff I've done here. And then he won't be able to play any cards, and that's a huge advantage for me. Yeah. And, and I think, sort of for me, what I really, what I think it comes down to is just the number of considerations for playing any particular card are way higher than I think in most card games. So, like, in, in, a, lot of, in a lot of card games, it feels like, okay, this is, the, this is how I use this card. But because of the three lanes, you have, like, okay, do I want to save... Even on a basic level of just, like, here's a, uh, a card that heals my guy. Do I want to use it on this hero, or do I want to use it on a hero that is in another lane? And sometimes you want heroes to die because th uh, it's the easiest, like, sometimes it can be the easiest way to move them from one lane to another because they come back, basically. And so there are things about, like, which enemy are you targeting in this lane? Like, and, and so those options feel so much higher and it feels easier to miss something, which is sort of like the thing that I kind of dislike about a lot of card games on a high level. It's just like, oh, these games are just kind of playing out sort of automatically. Yeah. Uh, versus, like, it's very easy for even, like, good players, because, like, I was watching the stream, and even they had, like, here are people who have played a lot of the game uh, up against people who, you know, basically just started playing today but have, you know, been reading up on it. And it was very easy even for, like, their sort of champions, which is what they call them, to, to miss something. Of like, oh, he, he was... Focusing on the strategy in this way, but he's totally forgot about this one lane, and this guy's making a run for this single lane, and he can totally win that way. Ha! Huh. So, so a lot of it comes down to the to the turn structure. It's not just like I do all my stuff, you do all your stuff. It's I do one thing, you do one thing, I do one thing, you do one right. thing, and then eventually you just pass you know, when you're out of stuff to do. Right. Or you could pass, and then let them play something, then do something. That, but that's let's not even go there. Uh -huh. Like that's uh, that's more wild. Yeah. And then you gotta beat these lanes, and then choose how to allocate your resources once you perhaps you don't want to overcommit to a lane uh, and then lose two lanes, right? So you kind of have to like move your assets around after you it's a big a pass and play like, like okay, I'm going to take this lane now so I'm going to stop putting stuff there is he going to stop putting stuff there? I don't know you know, you have to make all these considerations about which lanes you want to take when and how. It's fun Kyle, as a Valve fan, isn't it kind of fun to hear the idea that like the designers at Valve are inventing a new card game isn't there like a party that's kind of into it <laughs> Just the idea of like it's if, a card game. Yeah, it's a well-worn genre. If you take out the word card, it's exciting. The fact that Valve is working on a game. Just on a game design basis, though. Like yeah. it's like, hey, Valve is instead of making Dota oh, two, they're okay, making Cribbage two. Like they're, and they're it's, it's a good design. They're looking at like a known 
like genre. It's not yeah. really a genre, I guess you could say, but like, and they're and they're taking and they're putting their valve like touch on it. Is what right. you're saying. As opposed to what they've done, which okay. is like take someone else's project and sort of like create it. Like Dota was basically that. Counter Strike is basically that to some yeah. degree. Yeah. Left 4 Dead and Portal. This feels like the first sort of. I don't want to say original, but like this is feels like the most design work they've done on a, on a basic high level. Like obviously, there's yeah, a lot of that's nuance. true. You guys, are, that is exciting that they're yeah. that they're thinking about game design again. Also, Brad Muir, former Double Fine guy, is there. Did you talk to him at PAX? I, I saw him there, but I didn't oh. get a chance to talk to him. I oh was, my gosh, the legend! It was crazy. Who like, he was the people that were playing right near me? We had uh, the previous uh, previously the Hearthstone director, Brad Brode, was playing. Oh my like, god! Down for me, yeah. What, what was his facial expression? I, I was trying to play my own game. Started crying. <laughs> I mean, he's not there. We're all a business, boy. Those sons of bitches. Well, he's not. He's not. I wish I had. He's not not with Hearthstone. Tears of joy. I know. (laughs) They perfected it. But that is fascinating because, in theory, the Hearthstone creator he started a new studio. I forget the name of it. But like, you think they're going to make a new card game? Like, I I have no idea. But I I do know that this game is awesome, and I want to be clear about that. Yeah. Like, since we're doing a lot of pre-evaluation on games today, like we already (laughs) did with Blackout, this thing's great. This thing is really, really good, and it's poised for uh, a great launch. (laughs) <laughs> I think they're going to take over the world? It has the backing no. of Steam, which I think is going to give it like a set no. amount of like... I don't think it's going to fail. I'm not sure if it's going to like so, blow away. I have some questions and considerations that you know we're not talked about still, and that's very important for this game's success or failure, and that's the monetization model, yeah. tournaments, uh, drafts... Oh, real quick. Free to play? No, no. no. $20, okay. and you get like you a... You buy card packs. Yeah, you get okay. two... You, there are $2, which I think is more expensive than most it's, card it's, games. It's 20 bucks gets you in the door with 10 packs, and then every pre- additional pack is $2. 40 bucks gets you on the floor. That's right. It's going to be, yeah, this is not going to be, it's not a free play. Yeah. So okay. that's, that's already a big thing against it in terms of mass appeal, yeah. right? Um, and you can also buy, like, individual cards on the marketplace, so you can see, like, if right. there's a particular card you're missing. It could get hairy. Yeah, uh, of course so it could get hairy. I mean, it's, it'll be hard to see, it'll be interesting to see, like, how much the total set costs. I'm sure someone's going to do that math at some point. Yeah. Like, here's how much all the cards and artifact cost. Right. And it will change as sets yeah. go rotate in and out of uh, standard play. Yeah. You know, and again, uh, that's, a, that's a big factor, I think. That, but what I can say is that the gameplay is very compelling and very that's cool. Great. Especially if you do like, if you like Dota and you're a, a hardcore CCG player, it's a bonus. Dan, this yeah. is made for you. I think it really is. But I'm, I'm happy to hear that you're excited about it. Real I, quick, I actually yeah. am. Is it visually compelling? Because that's the nice thing about Hearthstone is how, like, Some of nice it is. It well, from a UI and gameplay perspective, I think it really does a great job of conveying mm-hmm. what's happening on the board. But the At Hearthstone levels? Not that presentation. Hearthstone, Hearthstone is just like, Hearthstone is amazing. Right? Yeah. You're throwing colored rocks at each other. Yeah, yeah. It, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's like, that is why I like Hearthstone. Hearthstone. <laughs> this <laughs> is the best description of Hearthstone. You're throwing colored rocks at each other. <laughs> this is much more like they're try- they, they do a great job at conveying the ridiculous amount of required information as opposed to Hearthstone, where it's one board. Yeah, and doing 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 things the opponent cannot respond to. Mm-hmm. There are no there are no interactions. Yeah, there are some interesting things like. Uh, Certain cards will trigger cutscenes. Like there's one like what? if you use yeah. uh, Zeus's Thunder God's Wrath, basically it cuts to like an overhead sort of like three fourths view of like lightning striking all of the heroes. All most so of the some hero, of those some of those yeah. cool. All right, spells. the hero right. signature spell. So here's a cool con- like, The hero comes with spells. Yeah, comes with spells. That cards in your hand, basically. If you put that hero in your deck, you get their associated spell. Uh huh. So with Zeus, you get the Thunder God's Wrath, which you know blows up everybody. Yeah. Um, heroes, just heroes. That's important. Yeah, cool. So Okay, Artifact. You wrote about it on the site, too. I did. Mm-hmm. Gameformer.com. Yes. Feeling good. Uh, I want to play it right now. I get so it. So do I. Like, I, I can't live without playing that game. I'm telling <laughs> He's you. going to play with or without it. You have to get a copy of no, this game. I did not expect for it to be this good, and yeah. I have never waited in a line at PAX before until this moment. That's exactly how I felt going into right. Artifact. From yeah. this moment. <laughs> I, it's... Stupid good. I love affair. I okay. must have more. Now imagine right. you played it in April. Or yeah. whenever the hell I played it. <laughs> I'd like to imagine that. Like to go, uh, that's another good That's how long I've had to wait. Uh, When's it coming out? Uh, uh, October, November 28th. October, October is closed beta. Yeah. This year? This year. Oh my god. I know. That's coming soon. I know. Very exciting. Um, Leo Vader in the booth. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Top of uh, the Leo's course. Real quick. Uh, the Rainbow Six Siege update. I feel like we would miss out if we didn't get your just ocean of knowledge about Rainbow Six Siege on the Grim Sky update here. Sure. Two uh, new characters. Yes. First off, I always feel weird when I'm talking for a long time on video off camera, so if Kyle yeah. could just, like, move his lips yeah. while yep, yep, I talk, it. that'd be but really But imagine, helpful. like, a really handsome, articulate Kyle. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So, two new ops and a new map. I was hoping they would suck so I wouldn't play Rainbow Six Siege for two months and then I could play all the games that are coming out this fall, uh-huh. but both the operators and the new map are amazing. I love them. 
There's a uh, the shield operator Clash. She's the first shield defender. It's a real son of a bitch. It's like an electrified shield. It's the two things that you don't want to deal with in this game. And the electricity slows you way, way yeah. down. How are you supposed to beat that? You need to get up close and you need to hit her. Hit the shield and it knocks it away and then you can hit fire her legs. That's what you're supposed okay. to do. Oh, Plus, okay. you can play Capitao and burn her up with your flame arrows. Oh, that's cute. But she's really cool. Like, I was able to totally, like, cancel a plant because they tried to sneak in the side and plant the diffuser, and then I was able to just block the hole with my big body. It was great. Block the hole, baby. Uh, Maverick, what do you think? Maverick's super fun. He's not as overpowered as I was worried he would be. He can silently create holes and reinforce walls, which no one's been ever able to do before. That's a weird one. Yeah, they're like tiny little murder holes, but I was able to like <laughs> kill people back through them. Like, they didn't feel like they just ended the match when they yeah. came in on the point, you know? For sure. Uh, Leo has been a great Sherpa for Rainbow Six Siege. Like, my friends have gotten into it recently. Seems like everyone in the world that I know is getting into Rainbow Six Siege, and uh, Leo is great for guiding us through it. We've definitely hit that curve, though, Leo, where it's gone from, like, grab-ass hour every time we played <laughs> to now it's just a lot of, like, Damn it! Like, the genuine frustrations. Like, why aren't we better? We should be better at this by now. Like, there's always that learning curve when you step into a game like this of, this is fun, whatever, and now the fun's, ta like, tapering down a little bit because we're getting frustrated that we could be better killers. You sure. know, just enough to hate yourself. Right, but I think the game is incredible. It is so much fun. You need to start obsessively watching Tips videos every day at work. Is that the secret? That's the secret. Okay, I'll put it on the other screen. Um, also, the other thing that's frustrating, team kills in that game, in casual matches are absurd. It's a problem. It is an epidemic. And you can't get out of it until you're level 20 to play a ranked game. Right. What are you supposed to do with that? Get a full stack of five people. It's the only thing. The only thing you can do. Because it's just a slaughter. Oh it's yeah, insane. it's horrible. Yeah, it's, it's a nightmare for and, sure. And what have they conveyed? Ubisoft conveyed about this problem? Well, they definitely want to keep, you know, friendly fire on. That's not an option to right. just remove that. But I don't know. They've done minor things to hamper the toxicity. With this update, you can now mute text chat on a person-to-person -person basis on PC. Okay. If you haven't had before, that's really yeah. nice. Great. But I don't know what they're going to do about team killing. It seems like a hard problem to solve. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Leo, are you excited to play more Spider-Man for Game Club next week? I'm excited to s stop playing Spider-Man where I have until Game Club next week. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Look forward to it. End of Act 1, everybody. Right into podcastgameinformer.com. Do you want can I do a couple, two real quicks? Okay. Uh, Leo should check out uh, Due Process. It's a cool-looking game that's Inspired by Rainbow Six, that's a yeah. shooter that's coming out. Uh, then or, it kind of okay. looks like a PS One game. It's it's weird. You saw me hard on this one. Okay. Yeah, he said excited. It's cool. <laughs> I promise it's cool. Uh, and then uh, Dan and I played Fortnite mini golf, but we don't remember who won. Which is we do remember who won. No, I don't think it's anywhere. Okay, that seems fun. Uh, oh, you guys were all blackout drunk. Is, is I mean, the, 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 no. the scorecards on the shelf there, but I mean, I can't really see it from it here. Off? Yeah, I can't see it from here. I, I understand. Okay, one of us video, won. Oh, is video on those, those are definitely two numbers, but I can't tell what. Oh are. my god, this episode's long. We've got to move on to emails. You guys ready? Yes. Yeah. Welcome back to the Informer Show. I'm still here. Dan Tag, returning champions I'm here. I'm still here. King of the jungle. <laughs> a jungle is a dog, <laughs> apparently. Wait, what is the king of the jungle if not one dog? Big dogs gotta eat. Oh, Dan Tag, please. It's a family-friendly podcast. Uh, Andrew Rainer's back as well. Hey, what's up? And the spider nut himself, Benjamin Reeves. Meow. <laughs> Okay, what we're doing here, we're reading emails that people sent into podcast at GameInformer.com. They sent in questions, thoughts, words of wisdom, dares, games, trivia, anything that makes the podcast better. Podcast at GameInformer.com. We're going to choose our absolute favorite email of the week and then put that person's uh, city or country or state up on the big board. We have a pin going up there. It's lovely. And how many people have lied about where they live? Uh, probably zero. Really? But we would love more international uh, people writing in. Because right now it's just Paris on the big board. And then it's a lot in the U.S. And they should yeah, be what's up, Australia? Yeah, come, come on, Australia. For the last time, David, David Milner. Right? Come in on. Podcast, again, I don't want to hear from that guy. Yeah. I thought we used to get a lot of emails from Australia. We do. They just never win. Okay. I'm not saying anything about the quality of Australian emails. Right. But I'm just saying. Let's just say those emails are down under. Mm, Whoa. The table. Um... Anyways, Tyler from Nashville writes in. He says, hey, in celebration of the upcoming Spider-Man game. Have you guys heard this? Seen what this? What, what game is this? Uh, Spider-Man. Uh, I thought I'd give you all some fun rapid-fire questions relating to the webhead, since rapid-fire questions seem to be one of Game Informer's favorite things to do. That's true. You guys ready? This is quick. Okay. Dan, you ready? I haven't even played this game. Can Peter's radioactive, spi uh, radioactive spider bite ever be cured? Yes. Okay. Yes, but why didn't you want to? Actually, okay. fun fact, he... Uh, in one version of the story, he kills Mary Jane. What? Because she gets cancer. 
and he, has, he like snuffs around with a he pillow or something? He gets cancer because of the you know, the intercourse they were having. Is that true? Yeah. Jesus Christ, <laughs> Spider-Man! <laughs> yeah, how dare you, Spider-Man? Uh, 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 yeah. Starting out on a high note. Okay, number two. If there's a Spider-Gwen, where's Uncle Spider-Ben? Oh, that, that'd be fun. I'd All read right. that story. If Spider-Man comics keep going till 2099, what will happen to Spider-Man 2099? He'll be old Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the best Spider-Man villain? Uh, Green Goblin. Who's the worst? Wait, am I the only one answering you? Well, <laughs> you're figuring Vulture. out. Hey, you kind of just took off with it. All right. The worst is Vulture? Yeah, sure. You're out of it. Uh, uh, even after, did you watch the new movie, Homecoming? No. Oh, oh crap. So, well, uh, Vulture's very bad. fun. He's very fun. All right. That. What do his webs feel like? <laughs> like going home. Silly string? Yeah, silly string, I think is right. Um, would web shooters help make your life easier? Yes. Oh, yes. Of course. Do spiders have a spider sense in the Spider-Man universe? How do you think they run away? All right. Gwen Stacy or Mary Jane? Gwen Stacy. Toby, Andrew, or Tom? Tom. 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 Peter Parker. Peter Parker. Or Miles Morales? <laughs> Peter Parker. All right. Miles. Is the Venom movie going to be any good? No. Yes. I think it's going to be a solid... I'm, I'm hoping it'll be bad good. 52% of Rotten Tomatoes would be my guess. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Is Stan Lee going to appear in the new game? I don't know. No comment. Just uh, play the game. <laughs> play the game? If he can do whatever a spider can, can he suck blood? No. <laughs> All right. Uh, what do you? Who do you want as the villain for Spider-Man: Far From Home? Well, they've already announced it. Haven't they? Yeah. Yes, Mysterio. Mysterio. The yeah. Best. That's the best choice. That's my favorite. Yeah, that's a really good choice. So much fun. Carnage. Uh, let's see. Uh, when is Insomniac remaking Ratchet and Clank: Going Commando? Never. It'd In nice. my dreams. There we go. Last question. How excited should I be for Insomniac Spider-Man? Nine point five. I'd argue that nine point five. Yeah, nine point five out of ten. <laughs> what do you think the review means? Uh, let's see, Mike from Walnut Key Creek, California says, Hey, G.I. Crew, I'm super excited to play Spider-Man on the PlayStation 4. I haven't played a Spider-Man game this generation and can't wait to see how the web swinging and diving into crowded streets flow on current technology. But with this being yet another game set in New York, this caused me to ask the question, what is the best New York ever in all of video games? It's been featured everywhere from driving games, open world games, etc., including Insomniac Zone Resistance 3. Given your extensive game knowledge, what... Which one do you think is the best representation of the city? Grand Theft Auto 4. It's hard to argue against Grand Theft Auto, honestly. That's true. Although, at the GameStop Expo, somebody that went through our line, it was very nice, said wonderful things about Game Informer. I'm sorry, I don't remember their name. They were talking about uh, New York and video games, and they said only one game feels like it's gotten it exactly right, and I didn't see it coming. The Division. They said The Division is, like, scary spot on for, like, recreating everything in New York. I can see that. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, the No Man's Land is a lot like New York? Is that what they're saying? Mm-hmm. Like, every district is laid out and has a... Yeah, actually, I see I that. So. Wow. Yeah, they, they're closer to the actual, like, blueprint of what New York is, the city streets. Yeah. Whereas liberties are usually taken to make the games more fun. Like, yeah. you know, elevating roads or, you know, putting diff- districts in different spots. That's why like it's called that. Liberty City. Yeah. I'm fond of the... Even though it's not actually like New York, I'm fond of the uh, pulpy dark version of New York in Max Payne. Oh, yeah, okay. a fun kind of feel to it. It's like the New York you want to feel like in a dark movie. Does that make sense? Nope. Anyway, Scott from New Cumberland, Pennsylvania says, hello everyone. I generally think JV has terrible taste in video games. Uh, however, I'm in love with Crossing Souls, a game we don't really talk about much. Uh-huh. It's a game he gave a 9. I picked it up on Switch and I can't stop playing it. Um, that was like the... Um, yeah, I remember that. Was the 80s inspired... Yeah. Is that like a realization where you wake up and just start screaming because you realize you have like the same taste as Jamie? Hi, Jamie! <laughs> Come on, Jamie! My hair, it's growing! <laughs> so you're gonna bit by a radioactive Jamie? Oh. Hey, if you wake up one morning and your hair is growing, you should be worried. <laughs> I'd like Anyways, to be that worried. Question is, what is your favorite JV ass JV game? Uh, JV? JV likes XCOM. Does that count? Ah, that is true. Uh, I mean, is Undertale a JV game? I don't know. If- I don't Undertale think it is. is really How about Edith Finch? Is Edith Finch a JV game? Yes, it is. That, so that's cool. that's a good one, yeah. Uh, okay. Wolfenstein. Of course. Oh, there yeah. Of Great course. Choice. An actual, he does like some good games. Wait a <laughs> minute. He's a yeah. real gamer ass gamer. <laughs> uh, Jordan Schaefer from Fairfax, Virginia says Hello, I just read JV's latest virtual life post and was reminded that I meant to send this email a while ago. I just finished Final Fantasy XV for the first time over the summer and absolutely loved it. The characters, the world, the lore, the monsters, the combat, the music, overall aesthetic, all of it was brilliant. At this point, I'm hard-pressed to think of any party members in any game, save for maybe Mass Effect 2, that I've enjoyed more than the Choco Bros and their banter. And I suppose I can see why JV couldn't get into it. Uh, You read that article recently. But can someone back me up when I say this game is incredible? It is. You loved it too? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's, it's a really good game. Did you write the review? What did you give it again? Uh, Eight 
five. I think it was an A5. Right. Yeah. Like that. Dan, yeah, you're it's a good game. game. I did not finish it. I started it. I, I didn't care for it. So I understand that. They, um, there was that weirdo mobile version of Final Fantasy oh, 15 yeah. with like, the chibi sprites. And I guess like there was a leak. I don't know if it's true or not, or it's just a rumor that it was popping up like on the PlayStation yeah, 4 store. It would be but coming. like the weird chibi version. Get that version on Switch. That'd be really cool. I will absolutely give the yeah, game another chance. Cool. Uh, well, how far into chibi? You get? Maybe like four or five hours. Um, and I was not feeling it. Other than the music, I love the music. But I played it to completion, and I don't think I ever felt it. So I mean, really? wow. Yeah. But have you tried the chibi mobile? Oh, version? I would play it again. <laughs> All right, that, yeah. on a Switch. It's nice. That's and right. I understand. Uh, Nick from Dover, New Hampshire, has a very good question. I love this question, and I want us to take it very seriously. Okay. okay. My challenge to each of you is to name a game from this generation, Switch and Wii U, both count, that you have played to completion, that you are confident none of your podcast colleagues have ever even touched. Do I have to like it? Or is it going to be any game that they haven't touched? Well, you have to have completed it. Right. Yeah. So you but like you guys it. review uh, games, which almost feels like cheating, right? Uh, so should it be a game that we haven't reviewed then? I would love that, if you can do it. Wow. Every Artifacts right, Monday game that's on Xbox. What, what? is it? Artifix Mundi, it's yeah. a developer. They make these like he's gonna win puzzle adventure games. Name one. I can't name them, but I played like mm-hmm. ten one, of them. There's one coming out. My brother Rabbit. I played it at PAX. Okay, what about Ryan Rabbit specifically? Like the Ghostbusters game. I remember you played that, right? Did you beat it? What, the real Ghostbusters game? No, the I'm sorry, Goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> Completely yeah. different thing. Yeah, I yeah. Did. Okay, I that, and that's what made me want to play these games. Yeah, I'm like I want a good old school like. Puzzle findy game, like yeah, adventure okay. game, and Artifix Monday. Seriously, just search them on the Xbox Store. There's like ten of those games there. I played through all of them. Wow, I can't name one of them right now, but I played <laughs> through all of them. It's a good. And time. there's like trilogies I played through. I can't even remember the right, 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 right. That's They're good. fun. All right. Dan Tack was. I mean, mine's kind of easy with the PC specialty. Uh, let's go with uh, Slay the Spire. I bet no one's here even has even played it. Much Never even heard of that. I might have downloaded it, there, but I haven't booted yeah. it up. It's right. coming to Switch, right? Uh, I think it is. Is it, I don't know if it's been. I, I think it's out What did you say? Let's Inspire? Slay the Spire. Oh. It's an awesome game that no one here has played. I believe you, man. Reeves, what do you got? I was going to say Uncharted 4. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody here has touched it, right? Everyone's Nobody's still here. very confused about that. <laughs> uh, Box Box Boy, has anybody here played that? No. I love that series. That's pretty mainstream. Wow. Though. Yeah, everybody's <laughs> playing that. No, that's no, true, though. It's, it's a really fun, like, uh, puzzle platformer, if you're into yeah? it. Yeah? All right. Um, I was thinking, I look back through my notes because I keep track of every game I played. There's a game called The Three Force Home. came out in 2015 on Steam. Uh, it's a little narrative game. It was actually made by somebody in Minnesota here, which I didn't know until I beat it. Um, but it's like you're just driving a car on the way home, and you're like on the phone with your mom. And I think the rest of the Wait, family... what's it called? Three Force Home. I played that. Damn it! Yeah. Damn it, my deepest cut! Yeah, I mean, it's just like constantly moving. Yeah, and a tornado is like coming yeah. towards your parents' house. Yeah. Damn it. That okay, wait. What about... Out of hit- all the guys who could pull out a deep cut hand. I, I know! You. That was a pretty good deep cut. Hidden Agenda? Uh, I started it Damn it With some friends But we did not finish it Has anybody Started Donut County yet? I have uh, not That just go. came out that I know count. but I just beat it It doesn't count. count It counts It counts, <laughs> it counts. <laughs> It's good um, Okay I'm sorry Hansen you lose That's fair It's true My name is Mason Parker From Grand Prairie Texas Hello And I have a question Regarding the magazine The Game Informer magazine I think oh. oh As far as I can tell No credit is given To the reader response section Even though it's absolutely great The wry humor and sarcasm Is and always has been Hilarious to me so who the heck writes them? Whoever it is, bravo, my good man or lady, you've given me many laughs. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. Oh, do you yeah. guys prefer to keep it a mystery? He yeah. said that we could say who it is. Yeah. Let's keep it a mystery. Really? really? Yeah. Right. Well, you just revealed it to I me. I can say I used to write them for about a decade. Oh. But they're very funny now. Well, they are <laughs> funny. Yeah. I love it. It's my favorite part of the magazine. But this mystery person who's been on the show a fair amount, he insisted... Good oh. God, we need more emails. Yeah. So, in, in addition to podcastinginformer.com, send in your thoughts on the magazine to feedback at gameinformer.com. And we can confirm it's a person on staff who writes this. That's right. Oh, okay. Under six feet. Anyways, uh, Natalie from Felix Toe UK says, Hello, GI crew. If you were an NPC and you were killed, what loot would you drop? My loot would more than likely be a piece of Lego, uh, giving a minus one damage per second debuff. We have all stood on Legos. That's true. All right, for Natalie, what is going to be left behind if you were killed as an NPC? A bazooka. A weird thing. Just one bazooka. Just drops out of my pants. Does that mean you always have one in your pants? 
Are you hammering? Oh, wow. It'll be six ounces of Mountain Dew. Just like a little fist puddle? <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't even be in a can. It's fizzing. <laughs> How are people supposed to loot that? Straws. <laughs> Dan, what do you got? Uh, some, some vape and a cheer wine. <laughs> Boy, really cheer says wine. it all. Cool. <laughs> a vape? What are you talking Nothing. about? Nothing's cooler than vaping. And then, <laughs> is the cheer wine inside the vape? No, they're separate products. Get, it's double the loot. So you get a, 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 a Final, Final Fantasy wine. character. It's Final yeah, Fantasy 15. Yeah. There he is. <laughs> what? Vape and cheer wine. He's been right in. These are good things. They're pretty good. Earbuds and regret for me. Anyways, Matt Patron says, Hello, Matt. Howdy, Ben and crew. Uh, so I know everyone wants to discuss the game that is kicking off the blockbuster fall video game season this week. You know the one. Uh, it begins with S and it ends with Brigade. That's right, mm. folks. Strange, Strange Brigade. Brigade. Yeah. Forget Spider-Man. Where the hell did this game come from? I sunk 20 hours in over the weekend and I have kids. <laughs> They're starving. Uh, <laughs> uppercutting mummies and shotgun blasting Mola Ram's children is fantastic. My two favorite things in life right now are Strange Brigade and RoboCop, and I hadn't even heard of Strange Brigade until last Thursday night. I assume he's talking about the Game Boy RoboCop theme. Um, anyways, has a game ever jumped from the shadows to surprise you like Strange Brigade, Brigade did for me? Well, for me, it was Undertale. Oh, just completely out of nowhere? When I got tasked, when I was like... No one was talking about it. Yeah. Well, Tack discovered it. <laughs> I didn't say that, but I, I certainly had no idea what, like, what it was when I was going in at all, and I just played the whole thing through. Yeah. Like, God, you gave it what, 975? No, no. It wasn't that high. It was 9 something, though. Mm-hmm. I think we came in one Monday and we were like, hey, some people started talking about this Undertale game, and you That's were like, I oh, I beat it this yeah. weekend. You're yeah. like, what? Because I picked it up and I, and I just started playing it. I'm going to find out what I gave it. Yeah, please it's do. Okay. Uh, Strange Brigade, that's a little bit like a Left 4 Dead style thing. I don't think anybody in the office has checked it out at this point, maybe, but we'll just yeah, keep our eye on it. sounds cool. Well, it's yeah. kind of Indiana Jones style, right? I don't know. That's what I've heard. Oh, so. really? Okay. That sounds fun. Uh, for me, I guess this year would be Subnautica. I, I had no oh. expectations going in. I was just like, I guess I'll try out this little underwater cute thing, and then so good. sunk so much time into it. Yeah. Turing test for me. Oh, like, okay. That was awesome. Cool. Yeah, was that, that a couple years first-person puzzle game, kind of like uh, Portal? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's well, right. Well, the original Portal, I was going to say was pretty good. Out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. As we talk I mean, about I the game club. Bundled with games you've never even heard of. Yeah, no, that's but that's crazy. true. It was. Like, it was the, <laughs> that, it was the dark horse. Well, the, it was the, the one that you probably carried the least amount in that package. Right, yeah, that's right. true. Uh, it's also older. I was going to say the original Prince of Persia, Sands of Time. I went in to, like, rent it somewhere, and back when you could rent games from places, and then, like, the next day returned it to go and buy it. Wow. And I liked it so Bold. much. Okay, so, yeah, if we're... If we're Putting the caveat in there, like you know, nobody was talking about it. Then, then I guess I'm gonna have to go. I'll go with Divinity: Original Sin then. The oh, okay. Before, before it became like you know the best franchise ever for <laughs> right. RPGs. Yeah. Did you talk to them at PAX? Uh, yes, I did. Did you thank them? I absolutely did. Okay. Yeah. Anything stand out from the interactions with Larry in there? I mean, they were they were just showing stuff that was already like that was already out. Okay. It's on consoles now, right? Correct. Yep. Oh, very just cool. Just came out. Couch co-op. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's Turn-based huge. RPG. Yeah. Awesome. The game's awesome. Also, Matt says, side note, keep making us laugh. On the way home from a Taylor Swift concert, my daughter and I listened to the entire Jurassic World Amazon game podcast, <laughs> and they laughed let's so hard. Let's do it again! Yeah, let's do it again. Wow. I would love to. Let's I reached out again. to those guys and, like, hey, what would you recommend we check out next? And they said that the closest to Jurassic World was, like, a Mr. Robot audio oh, game. What? I don't know anything about Mr. Robot. I don't know how that, that would go. That would be the worst. <laughs> oh, man. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Let's do it. Let's okay. Do it. Right At some now. point. There we go. Like, uh, right now. Okay. All right. Uh, Trondheim? from Norway. Hello, Tron Time. Says, hello, as I was playing Forza Horizon 3, a thought hit me. Would it not be awesome to have a Mario Kart Horizon? I have for a long time wondered where Mario Kart should go next, as I think 8 is the best Mario Kart game ever. Imagine, though, driving around Mushroom Kingdom open world style and find challenges, drifting, green shell shooting challenges, and of course, normal circuit racing. And while doing so, listening to radio stations like Dry Tones, good. With old and new Mario tunes and talking stations like Peach Speech. These are very good. Uh, with Peach talking about her royal life in the castle. Open world Mario Kart? Wouldn't that be fun? I, I think those. that's a really good idea. Something different with Mario Kart. We can get the rabbits Whoa. in there too. You know? Why not? Let's, wow. let's do it. But I agree. Like Mario Kart 8, how do you top that? You oh, I, think it's, I think it's a cool you, idea. You move to open world. That's yeah. a good idea. Open it's, world combined with get all the Smash Brothers characters in there. That's a game over. I think, wow. I've been thinking they should do that for a long time. That's bold. It yeah. seems like they're inching in that direction. They're moving the that deal. way. I bet the new one launches with people outside of the normal Mario franchise. Like, like out of the Link. game. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, out of for the game. sure. I would like a Link. One thing, the problem with that is like I don't think Nintendo would just like blatantly copy some other formula. Like, right. they'd have to put their own spin on it like hey we came up with this on our own it's a weird wacky new thing plus open world with cardboard and there you go 
There we go. You could use the vehicle as a new yep. modular thing. That's fun. Uh, Chris Craven from Lafayette, Indiana. Lafayette. Says, Ben and Podcast crew, love the show, but every time the Metal Gear Solid series gets mentioned on the show, the entire crew collectively agrees that Metal Gear Solid 4 is the worst in the series. <laughs> I don't know. I believe that way, but I don't know if everyone else does. Um, but he says, it's gone on for far too long. It ends here. I'm here to tell you why Metal Gear Solid 4 is obviously the best in the series. That's outrageous, but here's his argument. Okay, let's put an asterisk on it. Yep. The gameplay. Fan and pain aside, Metal Gear Solid 4 has the best gameplay in the series by far. Well, you can't, you can't put one aside. aside a game. Look, that's fine. Keep going, Chris. Yeah. Uh, in the first three games, it is so hard to sneak around and take out enemies silently because of the isometric camera and the lack of a crouch. Uh, you can run, crawl past enemies unnoticed, but the games didn't don't feel stealthy. 90% of the time, I'm discovered by an enemy I can't see because of the isometric camera. You should play uh, the subsistence version of Metal Gear Solid 3, because I yeah, can't remember so that good. camera. Anyways, the shooting mechanics in Metal Gear Solid 4 are also leagues ahead of the very first of the first three games. That's true. Navigating a firefight used to be a nightmare because you had to stand still, switch to first-person view, and aim at your enemy. Over-the-shoulder shooting Metal Gear Solid 4 was a godsend. Yes, the shooting is better. But again, subsistence. Anyways, uh, the story. Metal Gear Solid 4's story is amazing. It wraps up just about every loose end in the series, and it's filled with such emotion and excitement. I teared up during the end of the game, and I don't think... And I don't cry during video games or movies very often. Oh. Hmm. Um, I also teared up at the end of 4. Really? It is, it is a monumental task to like wrap everything up in some cohesive package, especially coming out of 2. I'd argue it's impossible. I think the story did as good of a job as it could, but you're forgetting about the presentation of the story, which I think is the, the big beat that still kills me, is the cliché thing of the length of the cutscenes. And it's not even like they're packed full of information. It's an hour and a half long cutscene that you could convey all that information you convey emotionally in 10 minutes if you just just edit it, that script a little bit there right? is one chapter i think it's chapter three where if like you skip all the cutscenes, you finish it in like 15 minutes or something chapter it's, three is my favorite in that game the one in Prague where you're like yeah. sneaking around and there's oh i'm not saying the chapter's bad i'm I just know. saying it's super short game right wise yeah but do you remember in chapter three when the guy in the trench coat's following you and yeah. they're all whistling and stuff it's really and good. then it goes in the building and it turns out it's three of those hand robots stacked on top of each other like a muppet man yep. wait a minute it seems like you like Metal i Metal like Metal Gear Solid 4 i just think it's my least favorite of the main line yeah anyway but the, the monkey that drinks coke is pretty cool. What's better game than that? that? No. Uh, although, hey, he says uh, the locations are also great. Middle East, South America, Eastern Europe, and Shadow Freaking Moses. The change in location between every act is very refreshing and keeps the game interesting throughout. Metal Gear Solid 2's Big Shell and Metal Gear Solid 3's Jungle Environments got a little bit boring after a while. You can't tell me that sneaking around an active war zone in the first act isn't hella cool. It is cool. There's no doubt Metal Gear Solid 4 is cool. Right. Yeah. It's just Metal Gear Solid 4. Maybe someday we'll talk about it in the game club or something. I'd do that. Cool. Uh, I would, to, to his point, I think I'd rather go back to 4 than 3. No. Oh, really? Yeah, personally. I I mean, three's not a bad game or anything. Of course I just, not. I don't know. Something about it, I, I'm more fond of 4. I, I like bet you played mind. 3 more, though. Uh, yes. Okay, there we go. Uh, Forrest from Lawrence, Kansas says, Hey, GI crew. In the last episode... Oh, Leo, uh, look alive in, in Slack over there. I sent you some stuff. Um, hey, GI Crew, in the last episode, you played music from the driving level of Parappa the Rapper. An interesting fact about that song is that it's based off, and it's sampling, the German experimental rock band, uh, Can, and their song, Turtles Have Short Legs, from 1971. Huh. This is a deep cut here. Yeah, we're out of the break. You yeah, think the break. Cool song, huh. yeah. That's neat. Do you think that they were really inspired by this? Or it's just, eh, it's piano. How many things can you do? Well, let's hear Parappas. <laughs> Turtles have short legs, not for walking, wild. Is, is the core of it. It's close. It's different enough, though. Um, okay. Hello. That's pretty damn close. It is. Oh, it's gotta be right here. Yeah, I wonder if someone's ever remixed it and rapped over the Turtles Have Short Legs song. It's really good. I would like to hear it. Anyways, we have uh, Carl from Newcastle, Australia. Whoa, we got a winner. He says, hey, Ben and crew, thanks for the great show. Thank you. After listening to the show last week about Game Over music, it got me thinking about Shadow of the Beast and the Game Over song there. I used to play this game on the Amiga back in the day, and my sister used to watch me play games as we chatted. Even now in our early 40s, we talk about this end song as it reminds us so much of our youth. Uh, you want to play this thing, Leo? The Shadow of the Beast Game Over song? Start about 10 seconds in if you could. It's a weird one. On the Amiga. 
Reiner, did you ever play the Amiga? I did, yeah. What memories do you have of that thing? Uh, Need for Speed, Test Drive, no, Test Drive, uh, Ultima. Yeah. Really? On the Ultima. Amiga? Yeah, Ultima. yeah. Oh, weird. It's good memories. Nice, sexy Game Over song. Console's this game? Amiga. Really? It sounds pretty good. Yeah. Wait a minute. It's a powerful machine. Weird. It's a powerful <laughs> tune. Anyways, Cody Espinoza from Leighton, Utah says, Utah, you're welcome. We'll see. Uh, it says, hey guys, love the show. Look forward to it. Thank you. Um, last week's segment where you played the Total Distortion game over song hit me with the giggles more than I'd like to admit. Thank you. Anyway, I should ask a question, so here goes. Do you think it was a bad move for Square Enix to release Dragon Quest XI in the same week as Insomniac Spider-Man? No, I don't know. Or is it like a bad move for Insomniac to release <laughs> Spider-Man in the same Clearly, week? Clearly, yeah. Open Critic has Dragon Quest review average at a 90. Spider-Man's at an 88. Whoa! Really? Wow. Yeah. Plus, Dragon Quest Eleven's oh. on Steam. That's yeah, a whole is. different crowd. It is a whole different crowd. I'm just, I'm just saying, like, I'm, I'm sure there's some overlap just because Spider-Man has insane mass appeal, right? Yeah. But, like, eh, like the, you know, the hardcore JRPG enthusiast. Right. It's going to be racing to go play Spidey over. over On some G-Q level, 11. you're just saying, like, yeah. is this a bad idea to release this thing the same week as another thing? You've got to come out some week. Yeah, it might yeah. as well be this one. Plus, right. the Tuesday-Friday split, maybe that'll help them a little bit. Right. I, uh, over Liberty Weekend, I sunk another, well, I had 25 hours in the Dragon Quest alert. You're hooked. Wow. Yeah, you're I'm committed to beating it at this really? point. I really well, am, Dave. All right, that's it, I'm in. I was, I was actually on the fence about whether I was going to play it, but if really? you're playing it, liking oh. it, I'll give it a shot, yeah. yeah. I am you liking it. It is salted and play a game that you have... <laughs> <laughs> not no, playing games. That's not the reason. It's just that he, he finds it very. Usually, he does. He finds it very difficult to get into games that I'm into. He likes versa. baby games. Yeah, this, it is very no, it's simple. <laughs> it's very old school, Dan. Like, That's don't good. go in. You didn't I, finish Persona Five, so I, I can't imagine. But I got a hundred. I mean, eighty to hundred hours into it. I didn't All right, Travis Eleven is a monster. I do love, you know, whenever we have this conversation about, like, you know, old school Final Fantasy. That's that's what I like. I like that. Okay. okay? So, like, I want turn based combat with where I just hit things. And they die. And that I is lose. Dragon Quest in a nutshell. Right. Well, also, the enemy designs are so cool looking. Like the art is all fantastic for the enemies in particular. Uh, it's also it's just does a lot of very smart things for JRPGs. Of just it's like Nino Kuni, where it's just very clear about where you need to go next. And it could be seeing as babifying it, but it's just so nice to have that clarity of like talk to this person and tell you exactly where you need to go. It'll always give you a hint when you open up the map, stuff like that. Dan, so it's a straight line. I mean, uh, no, it's not a straight line. Like there are definitely areas okay. where it's like. Feel free to explore, but if you're ever panicking and you're a little bit confused, you can be pointed in the right direction, okay. which is very nice. So why did you feel like, okay, I can devote my life to this game, but like Persona 5, you weren't able to make it through? That's a good question. Probably because I have some nostalgia for Dragon Quest. Oh, interesting. Um, whereas Persona, I don't. Even though Persona, I believe, objectively, is probably a better game. Uh, I don't know. There's something charming about both the Toriyama art and I really like Dragon Quest V, so I get the thrill out of it. I'm enjoying it. Um, anyways, we have Pat, a boy... <laughs> From Massachusetts. There we go. Okay. Uh, saying, say that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it says, yeah. I'm a boy from Massachusetts. <laughs> yeah, wanting to be a big boy. Was that a Bob Dylan song? I think so. Hello, Game Informer staff. How many backlog games are too many? And at what point should I admit that I have a problem? Mm. I currently have 60 games on my games to beat list. That's a problem. This list includes uh, the games on my consoles, uh, blah, blah, blah. Luckily, most of these were free gifts uh, or purchased through Humble Bundle, so it didn't cost too much. But I'm nervous I may actually never finish any of them. I bet Dan Tech has a lot of thoughts on this. I'm, I'm glad you I'm glad you brought it up. I'd say, uh, what is it? How many is too many? I'd say two. Two. Yeah. Wait. So a backlog of two games? You believe in that? I don't believe. You're asking how many is too many, right? And and last time we had this conversation, which seems like every uh-huh. freaking time I'm on the show, right? It comes because up. It came up like maybe you know you're playing through one and you have something else that you have to play on the burner. I'll, I'll allow the one. I'll okay. remind you, you're under oath, Dan. That's correct. <laughs> I would say a dozen. Uh, that's where it really starts to feel like, oh my god. This is overwhelming because you have multiples of, of certain genres in there then. Yes. Uh, but that begs the question, like, how many games do people buy that they never, ever touch? Yeah. 20%? Uh, I mean, seriously, like, game devs sell games, but nobody ever experiences their work. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. If that's Steve, Steam is involved, I'm sure the number is yeah. astronomical. Oh, yeah. oh, gosh. And it's so tempting with their sales and stuff. Right. But that's what bothers me is when I start to buy a lot of games and I'm not playing through them. Yeah. I, yeah. So if he has bought 60 games and he hasn't played all those, like, I, I don't know, that would kind of bother me. Think about all that money you've spent and not 
Right, even it though feels it's like it's kind of going to waste. End. Okay, how about this for a solution? He listed his 60 games. Really? You need to choose what he no, genuinely needs to cross off You're this really going to read all those? Yes. This wow. Is, here we go. Ready? So remember this, everybody. Okay. Choose the one that he absolutely needs so, to get through. So we all pick... We pick yes. We we'll pick all one pick one, one of his through. Games. Yes. Okay. Ready? Play. Okay. Horizon Zero Dawn. That's it. No Man's Sky. Infamous Second Son. Fury. Dark Cloud 2. Grim Fandango. XCOM 2. Resident Evil Remake. Resident Evil Code Veronica. Alien Isolation. Valkyria Chronicles. Dead Rising 1. Dead Rising 2. This War of Mine. Everyone's Gone to the Rapture. Tearaways. Stories. The Path of Destinies. Abzu. Rayman Legends. Bloodborne. Metal Gear Solid 5. The Witness. Deus Ex. Mankind Divided. Beyond Two Souls. Telltale's Game of Thrones. Telltale's Batman. Ratchet and Clank. The movie. The game. Psycho Pass. Mandatory Happiness. Never heard of it. Bound, Knack, Amnesia, Tales of Hysteria, Tales from the Borderlands, Just Cause 3, Transformers Devastation, The Walking Dead Season 2, Borderlands 2, The Handsome Collection, Assassin's Creed Origin, Assassin's Creed Freedom Cry, The Division, Dishonored 2, Darksiders, Darksiders 2, Battle Word, Kronos, never heard of it, Destroy All Humans 1, 2, The Legend of K, Red Faction 1, Super Dungeon Brothers, Book of Unwritten Tales 2, Near Automata, Xenoblade Chronicles 2, Octopath Traveler, FTL, Static Mania, Pikmin 3, Earthbound, Super Metroid, Advance Wars. Why well, wouldn't you read them all? That's out. a heck of a yeah, list. That sounds pretty manageable. Well, yeah. There was one on there twice, never heard of it. You said multiple times. Oh, so yeah. I think you should play that he one. You should really get through that. on the top of your brain. I'm going with Rayman Legends. I'm going with Bloodborne, obviously. All right. I would say X-Men, X-Men 2. Yeah, that's right. X-Men, X-Men 2. 2. Uh, I'm going Horizon Zero Dawn. It's modern. Play it. Become part of the conversation. Yes. Part of it's tough, though, because we don't know his taste. Like, if but, he by the way, Bloodborne, Bloodborne is also modern and part of the conversation. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good one, too. Maybe that's more true. relevant with Sekiro coming out. Could be a while before that we see that uh, Horizon Zero Dawn 2. Also, if he hasn't played Super Metroid... Yeah, it was that on there? Yeah, that was like near, it was the, near end. the end. It was near oh, the man, end. He snuck it in there. Yeah. Uh, what do you guys like? Email of the week. I like the person who said, name a game that nobody else at the table's played. That's that was true. Fun. That was an interesting idea, wasn't yeah, it? it's a good one. I kind of like the backlog one. It that, is fun. I've never heard of anybody say, go through stuff. 60 games. For, yeah. It's intense. I like the game you've, nobody's ever played. I agree. I yeah. agree. Even though I sure. lost at it, that is Nick from Dover. <gasps> New Hampshire, New Hampshire on the big board. Congratulations. Seriously, Sweet. people play Artifix Monday games and write in next week. Let us know what you think of them. Some old-ass adventure games. Yep. They're not, I mean, they're, they're making new ones. Oh, like they have dozens one. of them. I saw yeah, one of yeah. them. Yeah. Cool. Uh, for now, an interview with Jeremy Saussier oh, uh, yeah. over at the Strong Museum. Reeves, we went to Rochester, New York, and checked out the Strong Museum yeah. a while ago. Well, yeah, almost a month ago. Yeah, it was a while ago. Uh, what, what stood out to you walking those halls? Uh, it was just cool to see, like, their just massive collection of games, obviously. And we have yeah. a vault here, so you think we'd be a little bit desensitized to it, but it was yeah. still cool to go, and their their facility, obviously, is just like a dwarf star compared to ours, but if that's a good comparison... Nope, nope, what is not that at mean? all! It's oh, huge, and it also has this, like... It has, like, warehouses where there's stuff still sealed away, and it's just, like, random toys, too, when you're walking the back halls, which... Isn't on the show floor, show floor, museum floor, which is also amazing. You should definitely check it out. But just in the back halls, they just have like obscure toys, just random dolls from 1973 sitting on this shelf right. over here next to a first edition of Dungeons and Dragons over here. It's like Indiana Jones, the warehouse scene. They kind of pan back. It's yeah. just like, oh, what kind of like crazy treasures are hidden here? Right, including just like old ass pinball tables where they just look bizarre and you can tell they're from the 50s or something like that, and everyone there that was giving us our tour was so smart. So they just oh, would yeah. pause and be like, oh, that's the first time a Flipper was ever on a pinball table. It's like, what? Like, yeah. on this table you right here? You just pass by something random and be like, hey, this is kind of a crazy thing, and they're like, well, this thing was the yeah. first time ever they used a bumper and blah, blah, blah. Here's why like, you should appreciate this and this and this. And yeah. so what we did is you wrote a magazine feature. Mm-hmm. What it's is in it the new issue. Okay. It's in the uh, Call of Duty issue, which we just uh, re- revealed the cover on, so yeah. it'll be in newsstands pretty soon. Uh, it's it's a uh, several pages that kind of highlight some of the weird oddities they have in their collection. We're just scratching the surface too. I, I can't include them all, but like stuff like Will Wright's notebooks, stuff like uh, the original pitch boards that Atari used to pitch the idea for a Star Wars arcade game. They were awesome, and in that, by the way, like in the original pitch, they yeah. said you pilot Luke Skywalker's Millennium Falcon to take out the Death Star. Yeah. like, well, not quite, but pretty okay. good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of the weird ones, the oldest things we covered is an old arcade game from the 1940s. Where you, 1946. Yeah, where you well, are the, the bomber and uh, uh, you're dropping atomic bombs on cities. In 1946, in 1946 they made this arcade so like, game. Like, one year. After, yeah, in production, year. less than a year. And it's so, crazy. in addition to the magazine feature, we'll have, uh, coming up, I think next week we're going to start launching them, but we have five videos diving into some of these oddities, like a deep dive on things like the history of Atomic Bomber. Right. Will Wright's notebooks. There's like an over 10-minute video if you're into like 
just leafing through his notebooks from the 90s. It's super nerdy, deep right. dive stuff. But Does he have pictures? Did he draw stuff? Yes, he did. Oh, also, no. he's crazy really into dead, horoscopes because he's designing The Sims. I thought so, you were going to say crazy into horses, and I was like... <laughs> He is crazy in the bathrooms, and that really uh-huh. comes through in the notebook. It is fun because you'll see like a chart of like here's the like the personality traits, like a whole chart for the Sims. You're like, I know it, it looks exactly like it was in the game. And then the next page will be like, hey, remember to call Margaret, and like a list of like here's what to buy at the store. And you're like, yeah. oh, okay. What are you doing, Will Red? But it turns yeah. out to clump with the Sims, you have to doodle a lot and sketch a lot. And yeah. when you're making a game about life, there's a lot to wrap your mind around. So a lot of fun stuff like that. So we have, yeah, five videos that will be rolling out, and your feature is in the yeah. magazine. And uh, we intentionally kind of, we have some crossover there, but there's, like, stuff I cover that you don't, and vice versa. So yeah. it's kind of cool to, if you're into this stuff, I would recommend reading If you're into gaming history, videos. yeah, there's yeah. a lot to dive into, and to dive into it right now. Uh, with no further ado, here's Jeremy. Dwarf Star. Here. Welcome to the Game Informer Show, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Great to be here. Honored to have you. Where are we right now? We are in the Strong Museum in Rochester, New York. You're in our iCheg lab, which okay. iCheg stands for the International Center for the History of Electronic Games. Okay, and off camera, people can't see it, there's a cage with old Mario statues, a bunch <laughs> of old Apple IIs, everything interesting if you're a video game dork. Yes, we have a collection, uh, just the, the video game side of the museum, we have a collection of more than 60,000 games and related uh, objects, and we also have hundreds of thousands of archival materials, so documentation related to the games and the video game industry. Have That's you ever had this priced out? Like, how much is it worth? <laughs> <laughs> you can rob the place for What's going on here? Oh, uh, exactly. Right when are you guys not around? Uh, <laughs> So when a, when a, when a uh, collection item actually comes into the museum, part of the cataloging process is for us to, um, to, to add an appraisal and maybe the purchase price if it's something that we've acquired through purchase, uh, or it may be that we have to appraise yeah. the item as it comes in. But no, we haven't, um, we haven't appraised the entire collection um, you know, for, for what it's worth. But Sure. Yeah. What does that involve, though? You just look up eBay prices, or like, how do you decide, like, what's this going rate on this thing? Yeah, so, I mean, appraisal is done in a variety of ways, but it's, a lot of it is, right, it's establishing what fair market value is, and, you know, so if you were to insure something, you'd want to look at, okay, what's the higher end of something that if I was to have to replace it, obviously there are things at the museum that are not replaceable, which is part of the reason why it's so important for them to be here. Yeah. Can you just set the scene for the overall uh, Strong Museum? Just what is it? When was it established? What's its goal? What's going on here? Sure. So the Strong Museum, uh, it's the National Museum of Play, and it's the only collections-based museum anywhere in the world that's dedicated solely to the study and the exploration of play. Now, what that means as a collections-based museum, it means that we care for a collection of objects and documentation as I um, noted about video games, but we do that more broadly for playthings. So we care for the world's largest and most comprehensive collection of playthings. Um, some om- nearly 500,000 objects. So everything from toys to dolls to board games to video games we have here at The Strong. Um, How do you define play? <laughs> It's going to be so hard. So it, it's funny that um, defining play is actually something that scholars have struggled with for you know more than a hundred years. Um, the uh, really the the most prominent play scholar of the late twentieth century, uh, scholar named Brian Sutton Smith, who our library and archives is actually named after. Uh, he would talk about defining play. That often when we try to define play, we fall into silliness. Right, that, um, and it gets at the struggle that we have, that we all have, and so in so in some fields, right. So if you're in neuroscience, you might define play in a different way than if you were in sociology or in okay. anthropology. So sometimes it's based on the field that you're in, um, but here at the museum, we take a broad uh, view of play. We think about play as being um, really in the the eye of the beholder. So to you, play might be working in your garden, right? To me, play might be <laughs> playing with, there, right? maybe playing with, uh, you know, my little ponies with my daughter. Uh-huh. Uh, so it's, it, 
I, I don't think it's impossible, but it certainly it creates uh, a large box for uh, for us to work with. But it does make it a challenge in terms of documenting and preserving oh, that yeah. history. Yeah. I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, you have a stick in your museum. <laughs> Not just in the museum, it's in the uh, National Toy Hall of Fame. Toy Hall of Fame is a stick. stick. Yes. We, that's we, amazing. And that's not the only stick that's on display. We have several sticks. Yeah, this, the stick is in the National Toy Hall of Fame, and our National Toy Hall of Fame, just to give a little bit of context, um, inducts uh, two or three toys uh, into the Hall of Fame each year. And in the past, it's inducted things that you know everyone um, you know knows, but doesn't necessarily think of as a plaything, like the stick or a cardboard box. I certainly have had the experience of buying gifts for my children when they were little, yeah. and then playing with the box for oh, hours. Wait, so the cardboard box is also in the Hall of Fame? The cardboard box is oh, also in the Hall of Fame. Oh, that's pretty, he's very yes. happy. So, so yeah, the, the stick, the cardboard box, the blanket, right? That These are these are that's objects so that, yeah. that propel the imagination, right? That a blanket can be, it can, you know, I can play t a tea set you know, and put a blanket down, you know, to play with my daughter or to do a picnic. Uh -huh. um, at the same time, I can tie a blanket, you know, around my neck and be a superhero. Yeah. With that toy That's Hall of Fame thing, what are those debates like? I mean, are you guys sitting around a boardroom and someone raises their hand and says, uh, what about just like a ball? Just a good vanilla ball, and then people have to argue why the ball. Why may ball not should or not, should yeah. not? It's so absurd. So, well, the ball is, of, of course, course in the national it's number one thing. Toy. And yeah. in fact, a couple of uh, summers ago, we actually uh, had a, a ball exhibit called "Have a Ball." It was, oh. and it, it was a temporary exhibit that, that focused specifically on the history and, and the sort of the, the kind of play, the development of, of ball play. That's so. Funny. so but um, but yeah, part of that process is, of course, that the you know the, the public, that uh, people who play with toys, um, you know, people who are kids at heart who remember the toys from their childhood, they nominate toys each year, uh, and internally we look at you know the, the criteria and bring you know it down to a group of finalists, and so as part of that, absolutely, there's a lot of discussion. We're certainly very playful here. But you might be surprised at how, um, you know, how dedicated and, and, and how uh, emotional that can be sometimes. I don't think uh, we'd be surprised. We're working Game Informer <laughs> yeah. and like, trying to argue about like the top games of the year everywhere. We're a bunch of idiots. It yeah. really gets absurd. Like we almost came to blows when arguing robots versus mechs and what oh, kind of oh. mech versus a robot. It, it was, was genuinely ten minutes. pissed, like leaving work oh. angry that day. You about cannot the call this a robot. We will. <laughs> Get raked over the coals. You need to be able to climb inside <laughs> that machinery. Well, and, even, and again, even just to find, as you said, you know, what's a toy and what would right. fit into our conception of a toy. We had similar conversations when we did an exhibit. Uh, right now, we have an exhibit on science fiction play. And boy, getting into conversations oh, about what counts yeah. as science fiction. Oh, my God. Because sure. there's those people out there that say Star Wars, not sci fi. Yep. Does it count? Yep. I'm not one of those people, but okay. I definitely had some heated arguments with some of our other curators, our video game curators. Oh, like really? Kind of Interesting. How do you guys go about selecting the box that's going in the, the Hall of Fame? Do you just order something off of Amazon and, like, here's a box? Or you mean for, like, like here's our display. copy of Fallout 4? Well, just, you're talking no, about no. cardboard box. I just meant the cardboard oh, box. Yeah. box. Yeah. Literally the okay. box. Like, it's such a, like, like, what's the box that represents all boxes on the <laughs> display? <laughs> well, so, so, um, the, the short answer, the short answer to that is that once something, often what happens is that, um, in some ways what you're doing when something gets inducted into the Hall of Fame is that you're creating a kind of canon. Um, so when something is inducted into our Hall of Fame, it's then that we need to collect very deliberately around it. And so our curators will identify, you know, it may be that, as you said, an Amazon box is a kind of iconic box, right? Yeah. We, we all shop at it. We all pretty much shop at Amazon, so we've all seen the boxes, and some of them we keep and play yeah. with, and other ones go right into the recycling. <laughs> um, You're not running to the recycling after that and be like, wait a minute, you guys are throwing away history. <laughs> oh, oh, no, what are you doing? doing? No, I, some of the, yeah. It, that may happen sometimes, certainly not from from me. But um, but on the other the other side of that is that when you think about objects, as each object having a story, right? And so we think of objects that have a provenance, right? So it may be that we have a box that um, 
you know, a, a kid in uh, the Rochester area turned into a spaceship. And having inducted the cardboard box, his parents were like, you know, I wonder if the museum would be interested in, you know, taking your cardboard box that you turned oh, into that's a spaceship. So strange. That is cool. You know, and then also the kind of documentation where, you know, people take photographs of their children playing with boxes. You know, videos on YouTube of kids turning boxes into, you know, to play house. Yeah, right. Those kinds of things. So there's all kinds of creative ways to document that kind of play. You guys have so many things. We just went for like a quick tour. So many arcade machines. You got everything you could ever want. Uh, old pinball stuff. Where does it all come from? How does this work? So it, our collections come from a variety of places. You know, one one thing um, we should do is a, a step back here and, and to say that, you know, so the Strong Museum is currently uh, about play, but it, it hasn't always been. Uh, and the, really the history of the museum is, is interesting in that it was founded by a woman named Margaret Woodbury Strong. She was from Rochester originally. Because often people will say, like, why, why a museum of play? Why video games right. in Rochester, New York? Um, and it really goes back to our founder. And, and Margaret came from a very wealthy background. Her, um, her maternal um, grandfather had made his money in the buggy whip industry. Buggy so, whip? Yes, the buggy whip industry. Big oh. industry. <laughs> um, so, so she grew up, her childhood, she spent a lot of time traveling the world and she collected things. And so collecting was play for her. Um, but in 1968, she, having built up this collection of toys and dolls from around the world and other items, uh, she went to the New York Board of Regents and asked for um, a charter for a, a museum of what she called at the time a museum of fascination. Sure. Now, unfortunately, Margaret passed away in 1969, and so she was never able to act really upon the museum in the way that maybe she imagined it. Um, and so if you fast forward to 1982, when we, f when we first opened at a museum, as a museum, we were a museum that was more of a traditional history museum. We focused on... Uh, a mission that was really to document uh, and explore the, the impact of industrialization on everyday life in America. Ah, the oh, least fun between traffic. 19 Between 1865 and 1945. Oh, oh specifically years. between those years? Yes. Interesting. Wow. So wow. That's, that's how the museum started. And so we had... And now you have a Mario Maker exhibit. <laughs> what the hell? So, so, you know, and, and all of that is to say that our collection started from Margaret's personal collection of things, which we had this world-class collections of toys and dolls. But when you start a museum, what they had done was brought in uh, consultants who were scholars and museum uh, curators who looked at the collection and pretty much across the board, they all noted the, the fact that we had this great collection of toys and dolls, but none of them could really see, they couldn't imagine a museum that was about play. They couldn't imagine a museum right. about toys. Who's going to want to go see this? Yeah, who's going to want to have toys? Fun. Come on. Yeah. Oh, how rare are play museums? Is that even a category? Yeah, again, we're very rare because, you know, we're, we're the only museum really like this in the world. Um, there sure. have been video game museums that have popped up and there are more and more that are, you know, now you're seeing them in Japan, mm -hmm. um, you know, Germany other parts of the United States. Um, but, you know, it's it's very unique, and it's part of the reason why when we looked, it wasn't simply um, our CEO at the time saying, let's do something unique. It was really going back. Um, our CEO at the time, uh, Raleigh Adams, uh, who's really, you know, the visionary for this, had really gone back sure. and looked at those initial studies and, and those consultation reports and really thinking about, you know, this museum should have been about play all along. Mm -hmm. um, you and idiots and, were you guys doing? Really, it was really him who brought, you know, people at the Strong mm -hmm. to, to really see that vision and bring the community to see that vision. I, I'm just curious, just like walking through, like parts of the museum feel a bit like a children's museum because you got like the miniature supermarket and things yeah. for for people to actually play on, which is cool. Do you guys feel like you, how do you, uh, how do you appeal to kids, but then also adults? Do you feel like adults are, like, having a good time here, too? Are they as interested in toy or play as, as I would think they might be? As, as, as we are? As, as, you, yes, as, as you are? Yeah, yeah. Big t children? Yeah, so we, you know, we come from the philosophy that, uh, you know, that we play throughout our lives. Right? That play 
that play plays a major part in human growth and development. Mm -hmm. right? You think of the time that you're a baby, the, the way that we first learn about the world, how we explore the world, is actually through play. Right? When we're playing peekaboo mm -hmm. with our children, when we play, we roll a ball back and forth, you're developing dexterity and, and you know, even trunk control, and there's, so there's physical, there's mm -hmm. emotional, language, all that stuff really starts with play. But we know that we play throughout our lives, now, sometimes, as we get older, we play less, and play tends to be associated with children because they have more time. Um, you know, so we joke here at the museum that, of course, you know, you tell people that you work at the museum and play, they're like, oh, so you get to play all day. I'm sure you guys get the, oh, you play video games all day long. So, um, of course, that's yeah. not the, the case. Um, but um, but we, we offer things in our exhibits that really blend um, our strengths in our collection. So these artifacts, yeah. our interpretation, right? So trying to take these play things, these games, and talking about sometimes that provenance, so that it, the importance of that individual item, because it might be that it was something that was used to create an iconic game, or it might be the prototype for Tickle Me Elmo that we oh, have sure. on display downstairs. Hmm. Um, but it also may be that we want to put it within the context of the history of play, um, and even a, a broader context, uh, you know, a broader cultural and social context. Um, so that appeals obviously more to adults, um, but it's a cross-generational experience. Yeah. We make all of our exhibits interactive, um, and, and we really believe that people come here and hey, if they want to come and they want to look at the artifacts and they don't play at all, that's okay. If they want to come and they don't read every label, they don't explore every single, um, you know, thing that's written down or every, you know, uh, in interpretive interactive, that's okay. Right. Uh, and if they play, that's great too because people learn through play. It's going to be so much fun just to, uh, not in a creepy way, but like watch everyone go to this museum and like, especially with multiple generations, I'm sure like grandparents are bringing their kids and just like, or grandkids and seeing how they split up, like seeing the grandparents go over to like the old Mickey Mouse toy I'm sure whereas the kids are running over to Bernstein Bears or whatever the hell is going on yeah. over there yes I mean and we see it every day I mean it, it really it's um, it's both inspiring and it's it's also it's really gratifying to see that um, because on you know on one level it's it's an educational experience on another level it's deeply personal because everyone, I've not met a person who's come here and I've spoken with who hasn't said, well, I've ha I had that, or, or, you know, oh, the kid down the street from me had that and I wanted that, totally. and he never let me play with it. Um, now you're going to let me play with it <laughs> and break the glass, finally. But, but yeah, we, we do, we often see, um, you, you know, uh, I actually, I remember a, um, stand, it, again, as you said, not in a creepy way, uh -huh. seeing, uh, seeing a grandparent with her, uh, with her granddaughter looking at some old dolls and her commenting on, you know, Grammy had this when, when she was a kid and, and her, her granddaughter actually said, they had toys when you were a kid? <laughs> That's so you know, cool. Which her, her wow. face was just like, great. <laughs> That's crazy. And, you know, but so, so people come here to have those kinds of experience, but people come here to play with their yeah. kids. Totally. Sometimes they just step back, as you, you were, um, you know, pointing out that we have a, an exhibit that um, on really shopping, grocery, you know, yeah, yeah. a Wegmans grocery store, yeah. where, you know, it's that sort of role playing, right? The kids who want to do things that are very adult. I take my kids to Wegmans, I put them in the cart, you know, or they walk through, and they want to grab everything, right? They want all the sugary cereals, they want all the, um, you know, so this actually allows them the ability to do that yeah. and and we have the actual cash registers from Wegmans in yeah. there so they get their receipt that's so, so cool yeah. that you so get, they get a receipt too I'm yeah. sure <laughs> you guys have a lot of ton of artifacts which is cool but it's like it's fascinating because you guys have stuff that's like do you wouldn't initially think it would be in a toy museum like like you have a computer from John Romero that he right. programmed on before he made Doom so or like you have like architectural plans or what looks like architectural plans for pinball machines mm -hmm. so how important it is is it to you guys to have that stuff that's like not just the artifact, but also the stuff behind the making of it and the creation? Yeah, can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 vitally important, and we we really um, we take a broad um, approach.
approach to collecting, you know, so if we talk about the history of, of video games in particular, um, and we take an approach that where we look at, okay, we, we want to have the games themselves, right? There's the physical media, and there's a lot that we can learn from those, right? We can, we can look at the packages, we can look at the media itself, but ultimately, you know, the, it's, it's the game on that media that is the experience. Um, and so we know that even just having that physical game, eventually that game's not going to work. And so it will be an, a non-usable artifact. So with all of that in mind, you have to collect other things that help provide you further contact. So we have a, a collection of tens of thousands of magazines like Game Informer um, and computer, um, toy industry, video game industry magazines uh, that, that uh, researchers come uh, and, and use quite frequently. Um, we also, again, will collect archival items, as, as uh, you noted, and so we have uh, collections that are uh, more industrial in the sense that they, they came from um, a company. You know, so in the case of the, the pinball playfield drawings, the, these were a group of drawings that were donated from WMS, who's now owned by Scientific Games, uh, but these were drawings that uh, go back to the, the founding of the company, right? So if there are, are, are anything close to founding documents for Williams, uh, which was a company that innovated in that space, these are those documents. Uh, and so it helps to show not only how these games were created, but also the kinds of conversations that happened. You know, sometimes it's, a, uh, as, you, as you see from these pinball documents where you're seeing people erasing and draw, you know, redrawing things, it's a conversation that's even happening internally with yourself. Um, so we, we, we have those kinds of materials. Uh, we also have personal papers from people like Ralph Baer, mm -hmm. uh, who created the Magnavox Odyssey. Um, you know, really the, the, the father of home video games, also Simon. Uh, so we have papers related to his, uh, to his work. Um, Will Wright, uh, Roberta and Ken Williams yeah. from Sierra. A number of, of personal papers and, um, and larger sure. company collections. And then also we look at, again, if you, you, you cover sort of the physical media, the archival materials, but then eventually you're not going to have the physical to play. And so what we've done is that then we look at digital preservation. And we've done that in a couple of different ways, one being a video capture project where we have uh, gone through and at this point have captured about 4,000 different games spanning consoles and PC from you know the 70s uh, through the mid-2000s. And this was a grant-funded, um, a, a government-sponsored project that we did. I love the idea of having that much pressure on the person capturing the gameplay. <laughs> like, all right, this is the historical documented version of Frogger. Yeah, we, all, we had a lot of, <laughs> and we had a lot of conversations. Don't look like an asshole. We had, of, <laughs> we had a lot of conversations about that. It's like, how do you, you know, how do you capture, um, you know, how do you, what does it mean to capture the essence of Pac-Man versus sure, right. the essence of, yeah. you know, civilization, which is this oh much longer game, you know, yeah. so, um, so, yeah, so it's, um, so that, that was certainly a challenge. We were really trying to develop a systematic approach to, you know, how do you do this? And if a, if a museum was to try to do this with their collection, how would you go about sure. doing that? Uh, and then lastly, we, we look at um, migration of digital media um, and the preservation of source code when we have it. And so right. sometime that's, sometimes that's migrating stuff from digital media, sometimes that's preserving uh, printouts of source code. I want to know how you get this stuff. Like you mentioned earlier that Romero was just wandering the museum late at night. No, <laughs> no he's, he's, he's hiding the museum. He's checking out the museum, then he's like, oh, you guys should have my Apple too. That'd be so cool. I mean, is it a lot of just those weird off-the-cuff things? Is it someone coming by and saying, like, I used to work for Activision. I think I have some source code lying around. I'll just give it to you. Like, how loose is that donation process? And what are you, what are you hunting down? Like, what's the ideal case sure. that you want to bring in? Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's really, um, it's a combination of things. You know, there is a, um, there, there is, you know, we approach it from really a systematic way. So our curators think about, you know, what are things that are gaps in our collections? What are, 
what are major things that have that have happened in the video game industry that we want to document. Uh -huh. um, and so we may look to reaching out to certain people. So both in you know internally, you have. Um, you know, you have people who are kind of systematically looking at that, but then externally, as we've grown, we've had tremendous support um, uh, from people who have, you know, really wanted to see their, um, you know, documentation or their games preserved. So sometimes it's um, sometimes it's a person who, like Doug Carlson, for instance, who founded one of the founders of Broderbund. Um, he donated a collection of pretty much one of every single thing that Broderbund ever published. Wow. Um, so several thousand games, but also his personal papers that really showed this kind of, you know, it was this time capsule of the industry at that moment. Yeah. Um, you know, but then you have collectors, right? Collectors play a really important role because if you look at the history of museums, you know, or, or across the, the world, oftentimes... Um, Collectors value things before museums. Usually, museums catch up. Interesting. Right? Okay. And so, before a museum comes along to collect playthings, of course, there have been people collecting toys oh, sure. and dolls, and even video games mm -hmm. before us. And so, collectors play a really important role in that. You know, we're we're always in conversation with collectors who, are, hey, I have these kinds of materials. I have. You know these games. I really would love to see those be preserved. I'd really love to see those uh, be part of the museum. So it, it's really, I think, um, the the work internally of the museum staff who does a, a tremendous job seeking out uh, and filling in gaps in our collection and looking at what things really we need to have, um, creating relationships with people in the industry, right, and finding those those opportunities where. Someone like John Romero um, says, "Hey, you know, I want the Apple II that uh -huh. you know I started programming on, you know, here in the Strong, um, you know." So, it, and then the collectors who have, you know, who have, who have found those things and found value in them before others. What's a uh, what's too small for the museum? Like, I'm imagining some game designer walking through and being like, "You know what you need? You need my notebooks." And it's like, "All right, dude." <laughs> No, you, you programmed on Madden 96 for <laughs> half a year. Like, I think we're good. Like, but will you just take everything like that? Well, I, I think there's... So the, the, the short answer is all of that stuff is a conversation. Okay. You know, when you first said what's too small for the museum, it was funny because I, the first thing I thought was like, we have thousands of pieces of miniature furniture that go into the oh. <laughs> um, So there's nothing really too small uh -huh. for the museum. But, um, but, but we, if, if, you, you know, if you've worked on a game and you've... Um, you've you've participated in creating a game. Um, you know there's a there's a story, and you're part of that history. You know, so so one thing that you know I, I hope you'll have the opportunity to talk with our video game curator, uh, my colleague who leads our Women in Games initiative. Uh, you know, one of the things that we really wanted to look at there is is that you know women have been a part of the game industry since the very beginning. Um, and, it, and it goes back to the 19th century where you've got, you know, women creating some of the most popular games like the Game of Authors. Um, and, you know, so women have been a part of that, but also you've had women who have worked on factory floors. You had women who, if you come to an exhibit that we have out right now on jigsaw puzzles, there are many women who hand cut jigsaw puzzles. Huh. You know, so women had important roles in marketing, um, you know, in sales. Uh, you know, so so across the board, there are people whose whose stories and whose materials um, help us get a, a richer, more full, sure. uh, and inclusive history of, of video games. I think that's what we're always striving for. So it's not just a game design centric and auteur mm -hmm. sort of view of of video games. It's thinking about it also as it's a production, and and even thinking too, what how do we document what players, um, how people are playing these sure. games, yeah. the cultures around that, which is a, a monumental challenge. If, if it's not challenging enough to try to document, you know, purely digital games right. and, and all these other things. So, um, so, so yeah, so to, I guess to, to answer your question, I, I don't know if there's anything too small, but it's yeah. always worth a conversation. Obviously, sure. um, if you come in with your you know, with, with a copy of Pac-Man, you know, your cartridge of Pac-Man from the 2600, 
we have many copies of that and and we would you know probably evaluate it and, and say okay this isn't in better condition than what we have and, yeah um I got my my personal notebook has some serious Sam notes on it from you three. Like, uh, do you want to display this maybe <laughs> next to the just right on the computer? It's covering yeah. Romero's computer. <laughs> I, I think it's ideal spot. Hey, I, I someday there may be a game informer exhibit, right? We we can Please. do an exhibit about uh, about game journalism, right? That, I'll let that, you stuff Ben Reed. Put him in that exhibit. If, if you think it. about the importance that game journalism plays in both, you know, communicating, you know, what's happening in the industry, but also actually in, in contributing to gaming culture. I mean, so much of what the magazines tell us when we go back is they, they do help us get at how are these games played. Yeah. I mean, Nintendo Power was created out of, oh, sure. you know, Nintendo itself and trying to reach the audience of their players mm -hmm. and, and, you know, so as a sort of tool of, of marketing, but also communication. Is the overall lesson, and this mainly for people in the video game industry for your case, I guess, but just overall, like, hey, everybody, just document everything. <laughs> Don't ever throw anything away. <laughs> Create, like, a very careful index of everything you have, no moments too small for your entire life. Is that the takeaway here? I don't think that okay. that I can ask those things. I think, I think realistically, we all have jobs. And my job, uh, at least part of my job, is to help uh, collect, preserve, and interpret the history of electronic games. But I realize that someone working at Activision or a game designer or someone working on the factory floor of Williams Pinball in 1946 you know, or 47 isn't necessarily their first, pr their first priority is not to document yeah, the right. things that they're doing for, you know, for generations to, to be able to study. Um, and so I understand that. We, we understand that. Uh, and so while at the same time that we would say, hey, you know, please don't throw that away, we also understand that, you know, you're not going to keep everything um, and that, you know, you, you can come to us with a box of materials. We can have a conversation about a truckload of materials, sure. which is actually we have a collection of Atari coin-op um, uh, materials, things that are basically the, the corporate records left over from Atari's coin op divisions, oh and that came on a tractor trailer, twenty three pallets oh, wow. of of materials, and so you know, so there's a wide range of uh, of things that uh, there's that that story out there though, like the people who found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they like took them and they burned some of them that night to like cook their food. Oh, like, really? So that there's stuff like similar. Like, of, of equal significance and historical value uh -huh. uh, for video games that are probably like, oh, what are, yeah. people don't recognize what they have and they're not obviously yeah. going to treat it with any kind of like reverence. Right? Absolutely. So there's, like, there's got to be that fear in your mind. Like right? even like Ralphair's kid like, didn't give a crap you know, about his job. Thankfully they did and then you have the they wonderful did, exhibit yes. because of that, you know? Yeah, and I mean, I think in any, you know, um, in any cultural heritage um, area, you have to imagine that there's going to be acceptable loss, right? Now, and it depends on the person, you know, Jason Scott at the Internet Archive um, is very much of like, save everything, yeah, you know, yeah. digitize everything. Isn't his motto, um, steal from work? Is steal from work, <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, You know, so, so people have different, you know, different approaches and different perspectives on this. Um, but, you know, so but I think as a historian, I take a really long view of things. And right, so if, as you're talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls, I mean, you think of, you know, uh, some of the stuff that we're dealing with when, when we start to think about ancient uh, civilizations, we're looking at archaeological evidence, right? We're, um, we're making guesses about the way that something operated and the way that people lived based on the evidence that we have. So now we have you know, if, if we take video games as an example, we have sort of this dual problem of in, you know, the, in the modern age, there's so much information uh -huh. that how do you, you know, back to your question of do you do anything so small, uh -huh. well, to, you know, you know to, to look at everything in our archive would take, you know, months and months sure. and years. Oh, gosh, we better get started. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so, you know, so um, you, you, have, you have the problem of there's sort of information overload because we're all dealing with, just the right. amount of every email, the every text message, every right. time you do something, um, but also at the same time that all of that is also very ephemeral, right? And that 
um, to you know to some people there's this sort of false sense that oh well it's on the internet so it's out there and it will be there and, and someone digitized it and put it out there you know so just because something's on YouTube doesn't mean that a hundred years from now we're gonna have that video right. it may not mean that three years from now mm-hmm. we'll have that video are you, are you guys working with other museums then to kind of like tag team for some of this stuff or do you ever feel I know the Smithsonian has their video game guys and there's the video game museum guys in Texas do you guys feel that or do you ever coordinate with those guys like hey we should pervert, preserve this you guys preserve that or does it ever feel like a competition like oh we got Will Wright's notebooks and so <laughs> uh-huh. got there. yeah yeah <laughs> well it doesn't get quite that we're burning them to cook our food Texas no I I think that um that we um, that we all work kind of separately, but we're all aware of what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think, um, you know, I can speak for um, myself and ourselves as an institution that we also, we identify what are the things that we do well, what are the things that we can do better at. Um, and, and so sometimes it's, you know, you, you, um, you specialize in certain areas. And it's also that we take different perspectives, right? The National Video Game um, museum, their focus is on video games and, and in a particular, they may have an interpretive focus that uh, is different than ours, right? We're broadly looking at the history of play, so the lens that we see through um, all the, the artifacts, all the objects uh, and the documentation in the museum is through this lens of play, whereas the, the Smithsonian is really looking um, from uh, technology um, you know, and, and other museums will, will you know, take various uh, perspectives. So, um, you know, so, so a lot of it is, is approaching sometimes the same subjects, but in, in different ways. Uh, but I, I don't, we, we certainly don't, we, we all talk to each other, but we certainly don't get on the phone and say, hey, we got Will Wright's <laughs> no right. But there's you, never you're like you're a bidding war or something for like a rare artifact that comes along. Not that I'm aware okay. of. Okay. Uh, right. <laughs> Yeah. So you guys are uh, you're expanding out the museum in a big way. Yeah. And you mentioned you're going to have the what exactly is going to be the huge new exhibit? <laughs> what is that thing? So we are currently working on a 100,000 square foot expansion, and it's part of a larger project that where we have this just incredible opportunity to transform a city neighborhood. Um, and within that 100,000 square feet. Uh, we will have a new kind of welcome center into the museum, but also we'll have two major exhibits, one that will be the home uh, of the World Video Game Hall of Fame, and so it'll be an interpretive gallery that looks at video games um, and their impact on culture uh, and, and society, and then also a, uh, a second exhibit that will be more of an immersive video game, right, so that you're you are going into and you're doing physical things that are so maybe you're solving puzzles you're um, you know playing a shooter game but you're doing it physically so that it's a sort of immersive physical and digital experience it's like you're in the movie series oh It'll perfect like <laughs> wait so are you moving all your video game stuff to this to this new wing or I'm confused about like what the you know hall of fame for video games how that would really differentiate itself from the wonderful video game exhibits you already have. Yeah, so so um, to, to help you contextualize this a little bit, um, when we when we um, when we moved to a play mission in 2003, yeah. when the museum became about play, we realized pretty quickly that we were we were not collecting video games um, in a serious, systematic way. We had a few dozen video games. All, you know, even though we knew and we could see that video games were changing the way that we play, hmm. changing the way that we learn, we connect with each other. And imagine a lot of people are coming in for the video games. Yeah. Right. And so at that time, that's where we founded um, uh, our International Center for the History of Electronic Games in 2009. And then later on in 2015, we would then sort of expand our footprint in that area with the World Video Game Hall of Fame. 
So our, our exhibits now, which we have a number of exhibits, our e-game revolution exhibit, which focuses on the history uh, of electronic games. We have pinball play fields, which gets at the history of uh, pinball. Um, and then also we have other uh, exhibits that feed into, that help us understand and contextualize video games. What this will do is provide um, a, a sort of expansive view of video games. So not everything will necessarily disappear from the rest of the right. museum because what, what we are at our core is about play. And so part of that is understanding that video games are both revolutionary, but they're also evolutionary. And that when we play Halo or play Doom, is it fundamentally a different play than when you know, your kids and you're playing cops and robbers in the backyard. Right. Mm. Is, you know, the text-based adventure and the adventure games that we play later, is that fundamentally different than the choose-your-own-adventure books that we read and the kinds of adventures that we played in our neighborhoods? Mm -hmm. You know, Pac-Man is a chase game. It's like playing mm. tag. And so all of our exhibits are going to help to, uh, to tell that story. Uh, we play in a variety of ways, but the, the, the new expansion will focus primarily on that. But I should mention, too, that we will uh, we'll be uh, creating, at the, at the moment, we have a, um, a garden outside of the museum where we talk about outdoor play. But we will, in order to build a massive parking garage, we will need to relocate the garden, and we're going to create an entirely new outdoor play space. Okay. Right? So for those who you know, really don't, you know, aren't very interested in video games, at least not in playing them, maybe, they can come here, they can play outside, um, learn about nature play, playing in the outdoors. Right. Or even the parking garage can be fun. Oh, yeah, a lot of kids love And we'll have a very playful parking garage, okay, I okay. promise. You should you. add that to the Hall of Fame, parking garage. <laughs> Well, one of my favorite. If you'd like to nominate that to the <laughs> National Toy Oh, oh yeah. every year you can talk about parking garage. It's not going to work. Come on. What's, uh, what's like the ideal takeaway for like, let's say a family leaving the museum? What do you want them to think other than, boy, some things sure are fun? <laughs> well, certainly we, we want them to, to walk away feeling they had a good time. A absolutely. If you come to a, a museum of play and you leave and you didn't have fun and you didn't have an opportunity to play, then we're uh -huh. doing something wrong. Yeah, yeah. Um, so everyone, we want to come away feeling that way. If they learn about the importance of play and the benefits of play throughout our lives, if they learn something about the history of play, then that then that's fantastic. Um, you know, as you know, as you, as you probably know, uh, you know. In, in schools today, we spend a lot of time on academics. We, we spend less and less time playing. Mm -hmm. You know, recesses have gotten shorter. There are some communities, uh, certainly in the United States, where kids don't go out and play recess. Sure. Um, and so in, in, in many communities, play is sort of under attack in some ways. Uh, and so that idea that play is really central uh, to, to who we are uh, as, you know, as human beings and that it plays such an important role in who we become, mm -hmm. uh, and that we continue to do it throughout our lives, whether it's you know, playing cards at the Senior Center, or as we all saw when Nintendo um, released the Wii, yeah. and the popularity of, of Wii bowling, and those, those sorts of bowling leagues that arose. And it, I think those are the things that we want to get across. We, we want people to play together. We want them to, to, love, uh, to love playing. Yeah. There we go. Great. Hey, Jeremy, thank you for your time. Thanks for your time, man. man. Appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Cool. This is a weird place to close the show, but thank you for <laughs> watching and listening to the Game Informer show. We'll have a new episode for you next Thursday. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.
should expect him to wander out the woods and die alone. Contribute nothing. That's harsh. Yeah. I saved he's, your life. He's you? just got plenty of time. He's just waiting for you. You're doing nothing. Maybe he's literally sitting in a room right now. Jim, you're such an ass! It's really depressing. Oh, that's a nice right there. Fine. I'll try. I guess. <laughs> well, what were you going to do instead? Sit in the house? Man, yes. you're welcome to complain about JV being a real turd. Yeah, I don't think I can do. get there in yeah, time. We do all the time. Like yeah, I, can. I don't think I can get there. Yeah, because you wasted 38 seconds. I did not waste 38 seconds. I wasted 15 at most. There is one. Oh, I got a better guy, I understand, you're pretty busy. <laughs> go, dude, get on that four wheeler and go! How have you not gotten him up yet? I don't. This happened. He's driving the opposite direction. Someone assaulted me. <laughs> what do you mean there's a graveyard there? This dude has been bleeding out for like 15 minutes. Hey, no, he hasn't. You're yeah. just saying that to make me feel bad. It's been a really long time. Oh! Wow. He's fine, I'll wow. get there. That's He's brutal! Dead. He's dead because. God, that sucked! dead because good men did not act. At least you should see a zombie. I haven't seen a zombie yet here. Oh, there were zombies in there. I didn't yeah, see I one. A few. Did you? Yeah, and a person. Hey, man, was there anything useful in your corpse? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, that's it. Just don't let this guy near this game again. I'm just saying I'm alive and you guys aren't. Yeah. Man, Someone that sucks. It's because you know, team play is part of that survival thing. You're playing a lot better than Matt would have, so I'm glad you didn't go revive him. I'm impressed by the amount of time that he just wait. He yeah, just I like, thought that was really cool. That was strategic. And he sort of like pretended to go try to get him. Right, home. right. Well, to be fair, he's pretty busy. Honest effort to go save that. No. If he had just no, held just, out two more seconds. You were sitting in a room. Check the tape. You were literally just sitting in a room. It was 30 seconds of you saying, this looks like working bad. Yeah. I don't hear him complaining yeah. about it. Yeah, because he's trying to be polite, because he doesn't know you. <laughs> he's a killer. It's a lovely home. Yeah. Yeah. Multi bathroom. Behind you, yeah, behind you, yeah. Behind you, yeah. Jamie, you're yeah. fucking dreaming if you think some idiot's gonna walk by that one window. Painful to watch, actually. It really is excruciating. Imagine if you made the game. No one's coming in this goddamn house. You know, Hanson, to be fair, this is one of your strategies. No, this is what I'd be doing 100%, but not if Treyarch was watching me. Right. Yeah. How am I being a poor teammate? I'm still alive. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Our exactly. And our best player is dead. What happened? <laughs> Why are you guys dicks? <laughs> you started. Of the Game Former Show. I'm Ben Hansen, joined by Kyle Hilliard. Hi. Ben Reeves. Hello. Kimberly Wallace. I'm back again. Yeah, not stop. Week in a row. Whoa. Perfect. Because uh, we have so many games to cover, and you've been playing at oh, least yes. one of them, uh, which is Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Yes. That's what we're kicking the show off oh, with. Oh, we're going right into. Well, not quite yet. We still okay. have more right. to plug <laughs> beyond that. Uh, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. After that, oh, confusingly, we also have a quick interview with some of the people who worked on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, coming right after that discussion. So enjoy that. Uh, and then after that. It's the old Game Informer Show classic. This is our this is our staple. This is our custom. This is our tradition. It's time to gather on the fire and let Papa Matt Miller come in here and talk about <laughs> Destiny <laughs> with Destiny 2 Forsaken, which we, we haven't had yet because he was out of the office during that cover that's story. True. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we uh, we let him do it every couple of months just to get it off his chest. And He's an eloquent man, and I can't <laughs> wait to hear his thoughts on Destiny 2 Forsaken with Serial Vasquez as well. Um, and then we have some great community emails. In the back half of the show, we're talking about Spider-Man. With some of the folks at this table, at least. Maybe. By the time. Yeah. Guess so who? It's going to be fun. So everything through Act 1 of the game, which is about four hours-ish after a big political speech 
slash rally, that is the cutoff point for this discussion. So if you don't want anything spoiled up to that point, maybe don't listen to the back half of the show, but that is the dividing line. And we got so many wonderful emails. Everyone was great sending emails to podcast.gameformer.com. If you're not familiar with Game Club, you write into podcast.gameformer.com covering this section of the game. We talk about it. Uh, we share thoughts from the community, and it, it always helps when people are super specific. And everyone did a great job of like, what about this one detail? And then they write just a couple lines about it. Compared to like the scatter shot of like ten different topics, it's like I don't know where to slip this email in and the conversational flow. It's very cool and somewhat disheartening to realize that our our listeners are sometimes smarter than we are. It's like, what are we even doing here? Can we just, like, I would say most of do? the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. say that's yeah, heartening. I agree, maybe. It's heartening, but also like, <laughs> Kyle, why do we have jobs then? Yeah, you lose sure. sleep in it, right? Yeah. <laughs> When are people going to start reading the comments section instead of our story? <laughs> uh, also, on this episode, real quick plugs. Uh, NBA 2K19 came out the same day as Spider-Man. Matt Burtz has been playing a lot of it. Um, the review, at this point, should be up on the site. There are a couple things he still had to test out, so at the time of this recording, he wasn't able to make it down. But check out GameFormer.com for Matt Burtz's reviews on NBA 2K19. Kim, are you going to play that one? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Perfect. I've been playing it, actually. Oh, maybe we can talk about it next week. Also, uh, Joe Juba's favorite, even though he isn't here, is Valkyria Chronicles 4. Yes. The return to form. The reviews on the site, Joe Juba gave it a 9.0. I not... love that what I'm hearing about that. I love Valkyria. Yeah. It it's like back a to where I previewed a lot of the games, so it's like back to where people have been wanting something more in line with the first game, and it's totally that. Yeah. So they learned their lesson with that bad one. With those with two with, bad like, ones. Well, let's not put it on handheld no, and change things. Like, no, oh, it, it just let's not make bad ones anymore. It's the a full event. Yeah. Like it's the full adventure that you want from it. Okay. I think putting it on the big screen definitely helps sell like the epic battles. Yeah, yeah, it's a good old tactics game. So check out Joe's review. I, I like imagine to use my brain. What's that? I like to use my brain. Hell yeah, I, I can like tell it. from the glasses. Are you smart today? Are you someone who writes into podcasts again for that guy? All the time. Uh, oh, the closing of Joe's review no, here. Here we go, here we go. I don't know if I need to impersonate Joe Jubal doing this. Please but do. I'm sure oh, yeah. This Please, you have to. Of all the people that can defend it, Joe Jubal would be number one. So I'll do it completely straight. He oh. says, though familiar... You can't! <laughs> That's, That's my impression of Ben Hansen impression of Joe. Right, which I find very offensive. <laughs> and I wish you would Dana Carvey-esque approach to uh, impersonation. So Joe says... You can't! No. <laughs> uh, though familiar mechanics and units remain, excellent new features and conveniences transform the way you see the battlefield. Fantastic. Nine out of ten. Yep. Um, and the game comes out September 25th, 2018. Nice. In the future. That's an early Very review. Soon. Yeah. Kim, when is TGS happening? Oh, well, that's actually... Um, so, not this week, but next. And you're flying out to Japan just you? Yes. Oh my gosh, what are you going to cover? You'll be the only person in Japan. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I've got a couple of things I'm doing... Um, You'll see when it goes up on the site. And there, there okay. were some pre-TGS things this morning, yeah. like Sekiro, a bad Kingdom Hearts trailer, uh, mm-hmm. and some other stuff, I think. Uh, they keep oh, forgetting really? to add sound effects, Kim. I don't understand what's happening. Look, that was a long time ago. We don't yeah. need to rekindle those old... Yeah, no, it's cool. I'm actually going to the Nier concert while I'm there, so I'm going to probably write that up while I'm doing it. Oh, that'll be fun. Yeah, yeah, that'll be cool. Is Taro going to be there? Yeah. Okay. You're going to transcribe then. the notes? Or <laughs> 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 yeah, exactly. I'm just going to... I'm going to say how that experience was, because I've never been to one of those shows, especially in, like, I've been to Kingdom Hearts concerts, don't get me wrong, but with the Japanese audience, it's going to be fun. Yeah, it'll be interesting. It'll be cool. For sure. Um, Uh, Going to the Pokemon Cafe. Sorry, now I'm remembering all the stuff that I'm doing while I'm there. (laughs) Oh, that sounds great. Um, So, yeah, there you go. The cafe. I have made that, and as for the games, like, I'm seeing a bunch of stuff by Bandai Namco, Capcom, you know, they're going to introduce more with Devil May Cry, oh, okay. another section of Resident Evil 2 which remake, which I'm super excited for. Yeah. So there's stuff going on. Okay, so report back to the Game Informer show in the future. Yes. Okay. Probably perfect. not next week, but the week after. That's all <laughs> um, And then real quick on Nintendo's front as well, uh, there's a new Labo set. Is it out now, Kyle, or coming Oh, out? I think it's, it, it might be out tomorrow. Okay. If, but uh, yeah, soon, if, if not right now. And this is the vehicles one. Yeah, I just want to talk about it real quick because it yeah. kind of surprised me. So what it is, it's, it's the vehicle kit. It's the third one. And basically you make three vehicles. You make like an airplane controls. You make a steering wheel and you make like submarine controls. Okay. And there's also stuff which is kind of cool. You make like a spray paint bottle so you can like paint all oh. the, uh, um, the, the, your, the parts of your vehicle. And they did the, it's, it's cute because like, um, you actually put a piece of cardboard inside the, 
spray paint box, so you have to shake it up, and it actually sounds like like spray paint. It's good. Like it's even cute. the other lab sets, like it has the little flippers to make it sound like you're using the reel yes. on the fishing yeah. rod. Like the sound is very important for labo, which is it's yeah. Like it but uh, the build, like building it, is still fun, and 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 the engineering is just always kind of blows my mind yeah. how well these things work. But then the reason I, I I think this is the best labo kit of all three because the game that's included with it actually just gives you a big open world like a big open area that you can explore and there are little uh like tasks for you to do within that world and you have a key that you basically like if you want to drive the car you put the key in the steering wheel and you drive and then if you want to start flying the plane you take the key out and you put it in the uh in the what is that called the 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 yoke for the airplane okay and you just your your ship transforms into an airplane and then same for the submarine so you can just kind of explore this large area and like just do little tasks switching between vehicles as, as you want so it's so crazy because i think i was on last week in the podcast somebody wrote in saying you know what i want from mario kart i want mario kart forza horizon this i thought like that i thought of that question actually. really yeah oh. and, and uh i mean i'm, I'm not going to go as far as say this is, this is the open world <laughs> mario kart that you want but it's like an open world that you can drive around and explore and you have to like go to the gas station and, and gas up your car and you have to like pull levers to like you know it, to to gas up and stuff like that it's it's cool it's, is it just like flying through rings and stuff uh, i haven't done all the ta- it, it's it's unique things like there was one out driving the car around i have to find these cows and i have to take them back to corral and then there's uh, there's a section of the there's like these balloons that you have to fly through to pop and i haven't actually built the submarine yet so i don't know what's going on underwater no one does on planet earth <laughs> you know we know less about underwater than the moon or whatever but um, that sounds right so it's the best labo thing i it's from what I've played, it is my favorite of the three. Yeah. Wow. Is building the cardboard still the best part? Um. Yeah. I mean, that's still super fun. Like that's that's still like sort of the sort of Lego style right. kind of creation. I want part them to come out with a fun. package of things where you're building stuff that I actually want to like have. Like that looks cool yeah. enough to keep, not yeah, a piano yeah. wheel and like a loving wife. <laughs> yeah, that piano's kind of cool looking, right? I guess. <laughs> but Nintendo <laughs> used to make things that weren't video games. So, like, is it? Beyond the pale to imagine they could release kits of like cardboard kits, just art coffee tables. Are you want yeah. something practical? No, no, no. no. You like, want to build like a cardboard Mario statue or something? Yeah, stuff that's okay. like not oh. uh, that you don't have a game to play. That's just like cool to look at. Yeah, yeah you're I'd be right. okay with that. I wouldn't be upset about that. Yeah, I would build that. <laughs> but yeah, it's tough. I think to make the cardboard really look great, yeah. it's like it's yeah. functional, and that's the thrill of it. So if you remove that functionality, you just are using these cardboard pieces to craft art. I don't know. I'm sure they could do something elaborate and sweet looking if they really wanted yeah. to. But yeah, your move, Lego. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> exactly. Here we go. Shadow the Tomb Raider uh, from yeah. Eidos Montreal. What a twist. Uh, Kimberly and Wallace. A little bit in there. Yeah. yeah, we'll find out about it in the interview coming up in a bit. Yeah. But what did you think of this game? Maybe review score out of the gate because I was, I was shocked when I saw it. <gasps> 7.5. 7. Oh. 7.5. Oh. That is the lowest for Tomb Raider game in a while. And here is my one word for it, because I was thinking about this. One word. I wanted to get a good one. Bananas. <laughs> Bana- well, that's, that's a good word of a positive bananas. word, though. It is crazy. Um, what? I didn't expect that. <laughs> yeah. I thought, I, by word, I was going to guess underwear. I ended, uh, I finished the game, and I just said, what did I just Play. So it's like this makes me I want went to play through, Yeah, I went through a lot of um, ups and downs with it. So I started the game off, and I was like, "Oh yeah, this is what I like about Tomb Raider." You know, exploration. They added more challenge tombs. Um, I love just collecting everything on that map because I'm, you know, I like I don't value my time, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, it was just like everything, and it was cool because the game has these awesome set pieces and. Those are the best, like the adrenaline pumping, like I'm in the moment, I, in the, you've seen some of the stuff in trailers with like the plane crash and all that. And sure. That's, um, but as I was going out, I was like, okay, so what are they going to do with her this time? Because my biggest um, thing is I've been so excited for this reboot since they've announced it. I've been playing all the games. I really thought Rise was a step up from the first game. Like Great. it made me feel like, oh, what could they really do? after rise right yeah and so this feels like a step back and not a step forward in many ways okay. and even with what they're doing with the character there's some interesting moments like there's so many little good moments littered in a lot of what the heck i guess is what fun I'm, what the heck or just just like you have pause. storytelling and full pause i think you have to suspend your disbelief it's like 
they took a lot from the Uncharted playbook, which is fine. Like, the climbing stuff, they've improved on, like, that level, but I wouldn't say it's as good as Uncharted by any means. Okay. Okay, but, um, they had, they tr- struggle with what to do with her and how to give an interesting story to her, and, uh... Through this game, like, they brought back Jonah, and Jonah helped her on their first exposition. It's probably, like, their relationship is the most interesting in the game. Now, granted, it's really the only one person that (laughs) she really has a connection with and talks to. And I like some some of that because you finally saw her um, put a friendship kind of ahead of other things. Yeah. But, like, here's the thing. The premise is crazy. I mean, she triggers, like, the Mayan apocalypse. First We're off. starting out sprinting here. Yeah. 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 By I mean, picking up an old artifact, right? Yeah. Like, it's just like, okay, this thing is, and is so, connected to yeah. the, and the so apocalypse. Oh, it gets, it gets <laughs> like, great. It gets even better. But she has, like, all this guilt, and there's a lot of moments for her having, like, rage because she's just so consumed with, like, I have to make this right. Um, Why did I trigger the apocalypse? Ah! Yeah, exactly. Wait, was it just sitting on a button for thousands of years? <laughs> and it's like, nobody touched this button. Well, of course. <laughs> like crazy mind. Yeah, and then, of course, you find, you know, find out Trinity's connection, and you're going through all that. Um. But this game, like last game, we were in the icy regions and mm-hmm. more like isolated. Yeah. This one, we're in like Me- we start in Mexico, go to Peru. Like cool. it is very vibrant compared to that, and the cities are crowded, and which I thought was really cool because I was like, oh my god, there's like side quests in these cities and and stuff for me to do, and I got really excited at first, and then I played some of the side quests, and I was like, woof. Um, also, it just doesn't feel like a very livable real world because you walk around the city and everybody is very rigid and yes like you talk to somebody and it's kind of like exactly a standard camera shot nobody's moving does it feel because it is the deus ex team does it feel a little bit like the hubs from that series does it remind you of that a little bit okay. but i feel like these so this game i was excited because they were like oh this we have the biggest you know map we've ever had for you know petiti village whatever uh-huh. i i w- there's like three main areas you go to and I remember, I was like, there's no way, I got to a point in the game, and I'm like, there's no way I'm done with this game yet, because, but then it's like, nope, this is the point of no return, like, you can't fast travel after this. And so I found that for everything that I could explore, because I took my sweet time, because I wanted to do all the challenge tombs, and I really love that stuff, um, and, and even doing a bunch of the side quests, and a lot of side quests are fetch quests. And um, they don't really have interesting stories behind them. There's, like, maybe one or two I could think of that I was like, oh, that was kind of cool. But other than that. Okay. So, like I said, this is a lot of mixed stuff. There's, like, good moments. Yeah, there's good moments. And that's why I was like, how am I going to talk about this? Because there's good moments shuffled in everything. So, at one point, I paused the button because I was like, how much of the map do I still have? So, you know, you see the unexplored areas faded out in fog. Right. And I was like, whoa, I have so much still to play. This is a huge map. And then I realized it was just an illusion because when I finally, like, didn't, I could keep going and going and going, but I was in the final area at that point, and I was not going anywhere else mm-hmm. except for this one side. So it was weird because I thought I had a lot more to go on it than that. Yeah. And it was just disappointing because they really, last game, like, made it all, oh, we're giving you these big hubs, like, we're making, you know, there's so many improvements, and this is just mess. Is Meh. it worth playing if you can, like, shut your brain off and, like, I don't care about the story. Here's I the thing. Some there is, that's why I said I, had, I still had fun with the game. I can't deny that I like those adrenaline-pumping moments. I like, you know, solving a uh, tough challenge, too. I think the loop is cool of, like, the progression of, well, let me get that. I'll get to that later. Um, uh-huh. of, of picking stuff up and crafting. Now she has costumes you can craft. Some are a little, eh. <laughs> Risque or what's mammy? Not risque, like we, you know, wearing animal stuff and tribal it things. It doesn't really look cool. It doesn't. It doesn't. Okay, you would a little Flintstone. Yeah, but okay. it, it goes. What I liked about the costumes is they can play into your strategy, so it maybe will lessen your detection for stealth or give you extra points if you play stealth. People um, will think you're a jaguar. Yeah, but <laughs> right. then what really upset me was yeah, the upgrade blah. system is so blah. Like I don't like they did what kind of what they did last game where they had the three areas, but like I was opening stuff and I'm like none of this makes a difference huh. at all. Like I want to feel like I'm progressing in a game and only like 
maybe one or two times can I think of that I opened a skill and I was like, wow, now that's really cool. And that one was like when I could shoot the confused arrows, which would then like have the other guys shoot oh, their that's, teammates. That's so I'll upgrade that first. Yeah, but here, here's in overall combat, I will say like the game does reward more of a stealth approach. Like okay. there is trees to climb, places to hide. And I, I say this because I had fun with some of the stealth things that you can do. But then the stealth is not very good either. Okay. You know? Yeah. Like, I had one case where I jumped out and an enemy totally saw me and I went and I <laughs> meleeed him and it was giving me points for a stealth kill. And I'm like, that is not a stealth kill. <laughs> right. And there's and you can cheese it because there's times when enemies definitely saw me and uh-huh. I was like, how am I not being detected right now? Um, so it's just all over the place. It is. That's the thing. The game is all over the place. And I want to preface this as like, If you play the past ones, you will have fun. It's just, there's just so much that you'll have a good moment, and then the next you'll be like, what the heck? Or you'll be like, that, you know, not so great. Well, well, Kyle, you've been playing it too. What do you guys think of it so far? How deep are you? Well, here's, I'm not too far into it. Do you know if you can skip cutscenes, Kim? What? Do you know? Certain ones, yes. Because, like, that is the point where I'm at in Tomb Raider. Like, Holy I cow! Love, I you're a story guy, too. I, I, lo- I really think the first one is super strong. Yeah. Good story, good game. The second one did not do it for me. By oh, the wow, end of the game, okay. I was like, I do not care what is happening. I just want to collect stuff and Immortality. explore. Immortality. And then the beginning of this third one, it's so scattershot. Oh the yeah, opening. and the uh, like they they do they try to do an in media yeah. res thing, and then it like then but then you, so then but then your normal timeline, but then they repeat the in media res opening that they did, but like fast forwarded, right. and it's and like it's only an hour into the game too. It's like oh, yeah. you guys that impatient and like oh. but. But I love the like the climbing, the shooting. Yeah, like the it's, climbing's really good. The shooting. Like I love. Improved. Like it's 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 like a weird reverse of Uncharted to me. You know, it's like I like interesting. Yeah. Because Uncharted is like I love the cutscenes in the story, and then I almost wish I could skip the climbing See, and the shooting. And then Tomb Raider's now become the opposite, where it's like I love exploring and shooting and climbing, and then the cutscenes are just like what little I've seen. I'm just like raising an eyebrow, and I'm like, yeah. this doesn't even feel like the same. What, aura. Just because. Um, uh, that's so confusing. Like, what about it? Like, what specifically is she doing those cutscenes? It doesn't feel right. Well, it, she's just... They she's all over to, the place. They want her to be this, like, cold-blooded, mm-hmm. confident killer, and then in, like, the first interaction she has with the, the what I'm assuming is the main antagonist, she seems very unsure of herself, and she doesn't know what she did. But, but then in the cutscene previously, like, she did seem like she knew what she was doing when she grabbed the blade. It just, nothing's lining up. That, nothing's clicking that's together. That's actually mm. something I mentioned in my review. It feels like you're playing two different Laras, and yeah. you're sitting there, like, one minute she's this, like, kind, you know, they want to make, sh- like, show that she's a, a good person, so she's, like, helping children, you know, you know, reuniting parents okay. with their kids, you know right. that. And then the next moment she's freaking going on these killing sprees and, like, hanging a guy from a tree, and it's just, like... <laughs> Where is, his head off. <laughs> and I get what the point is, is like how far will you go kind of for they're trying to well make this point of, you know, how far will she go to get what she needs to save the world and I heard also, it's the darkest Tomb Raider yet. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. It's dark in a lot in other ways. Like but um it, it's dark in that sense, but I didn't like buy it. Like the whole story too, all the way up until the end, and I'll be honest, as someone who's been following this and this is supposed to be the finale of her origin story. Right. Finally, so disappointing. I, I remember oh sitting there and be yeah. like, "This was the big thing I was waiting for. This is the moment that because they were kept saying she becomes the Tomb Raider. I'm like, this is She's what I've done been waiting that throughout for throughout all these There's, games. I know, I know, and like, it's just like that was the moment, her defining moment, because that's what they made a big deal of. And I'm like, that was does she, not. Does she finally braid her hair? Is that oh. the? Oh, finally, She's that already done sale. like almost everything yeah. that like the old Tomb Raider yeah. games have set forward. It's like at the it's end of that first game, it's like, well, she's officially the Tomb Raider. It's like, oh, not quite. Wait until she goes <laughs> now to the tombs and rises. Right. Like, All right, now she did it. No, not quite. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't know. Big thing. For for me, like as a fan of this series, like I, I'm only five hours in, so I haven't finished the game. Okay, but I've been enjoying the the gameplay and the action. It's definitely less less polished. Mm-hmm. Polished, yes. mm. like that word. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, and like, there's some rough spots, but like. If you like those last two games, I think there's something here. Like, if you just like the core so. gameplay, like yeah, that's what fun. I'm saying. I'm not saying don't play yeah. it. I don't play those last two for the story anyway. Like, I'm still excited to play it. Yeah, like, despite being turned off by the story, that's how much I love the action of that game. 
Like, I, wow. I, I will still see that game to the end I, for I sure. feel like last time we talked about this game on the show, you're like, I really want to see the conclusion of that story. I like her relationship with her father. I want to learn oh, more about that. All I, that stuff. I was being super sarcastic about oh, that game. Like, the stuff with what? her. Really, yeah, like, I, I oh, really... Oh, what the hell, guys? The one time I was supposed to be sarcastic, it didn't come yeah, through. It did not. Like, the, th- the, the stuff with her father is just, like, eye-rolling at the end of, well, of, of, of just, Rise of the Tomb Raider. they depend on it so much yeah. for everything. Um, and, yes, you get more of that in this game, so... Okay, all right, I was totally, I was totally kidding. I did not read that <laughs> at all. Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm just saying because of the yeah, fact... Yeah, most of the reviews you write are sarcastic. Yeah, they're right? all bad. <laughs> Those numbers, it's in italics. Aren't well, you going to stick a it up? That's a wild attack. I think so, really? As Reeves said, I want to probably, like, it is still fun. Yeah. There are great uh-huh. moments. There's just a lot of head scratchers throughout it as well. Bananas. Um, bananas. It is bananas. It's crazy. Now, this is the conversation I wish I had before what's about to come up in this podcast, <laughs> because now we have an interview with Jason Duzois, the narrative director for the game, oh! and I went and like, talked about these things. I just had no idea. Also, Rich Briggs is a senior brand director uh, from Crystal, so talking a little about the history of the game's development, stuff like that. So without further ado, here are Rich and Jason. Rich and Jason, welcome to the Game Informer Show, guys. Thank you. Yeah, it's an honor to have you. Thank so you. If you're watching the video version, we have Jason Skyping in from beautiful Montreal, and then we have Rich calling in from Crystal Dynamics itself, right? That is correct. Fantastic. And it's a bummer that we can't see you, Rich. Not only are you a, a pretty fellow, but also people might recognize you in the video version as also the man who dies in the beginning of Dead Space 2. Is that right? <laughs> that is correct. It's, I think, one of my uh, claims to fame. I, I've always been honored to be the first person killed in Dead Space 2. Because you were a producer and they just scanned you in? Or how did that work again? It was that I evidently had the perfectly shaped head to let it transform into a necromorph. So <laughs> I, by nature of my skull, uh, was the the, uh, the natural fit. That's perfect. Do you have uh, do you still have fond memories of working on like that first Dead Space in particular? I do actually. It was I got to see it from both sides. I was on the marketing, and then I was on the production side, and then a, a producer on both Dead Space One and Two. And it was it was a lot of fun. It was it was a game that I think uh, um, you know sort of was a long time coming, and a long time convincing people it was the right game to make at the right time. But we were really excited by the fan response, and it was just a ton of fun working on it. It was you know I was I was very excited and. and and very happy to, to be able to play a small part in that. Yeah, and now you're immortalized in a game. It's got to be nice. Uh, Jason, I'm curious about your history, and specifically your history with the Tomb Raider franchise. Well, I mean, I, my previous game at uh, um, Square Enix here at Eidos, Montreal, was uh, Mankind Divided. Yeah. So that, uh, that was my narrative uh, direction thing going in. When I finished that project, they were like, hey, it's in the same building, and I knew some of the people uh, from previous projects, and uh, I got onto this project. Cool, and I saw, uh, I might have Googled your name a little bit. Did you work on Indiana Jones and the Staff of Kings? <laughs> yes, yes I did. That's going to be so bizarre to work on an official Indiana Jones game and now work on uh, Tomb Raider. Do you have a lot of memories from that project? Have they been bubbling up throughout the course of working on Shadow of the Tomb Raider here? Of course, of course that came up, and uh, you know, it's, it's been so long now, it's, I think it's 11 years ago now. But uh, that was like, when the Wii was being launched, and you know the whip, and then psh, doing the whip moves and stuff like that. That was it was a lot of fun to work on that game. Yeah, I'd imagine. Okay, so Rich and Jason, you guys have to help me out. Can you take me back to like the handoff between the studios from Tomb Raider going from a Crystal Dynamics game to an Eidos Montreal game? Do you want to just walk me through that process from both your perspectives, how that handshake happened, and what the collaboration's been like? All right. So I mean, fr- from our side, the last three games have been uh, a collaboration between Crystal. And and and, uh, and uh, Idos Montreal, but even before that, on the first Deus Ex that we did in the studio, there was already a technical collaboration. So the relationship goes back, I mean, almost uh, over ten years now uh, between the two studios. So it was a lot of natural communication first with the technology, and then going in um, having um, Idos Montreal work on some of the content for TR9, and then uh, sorry, Tomb Raider 2013, and also. Uh, doing a lot of the maps on, on Rise of the Tomb Raider. So there was already this relationship established. When it comes to uh, the story aspect, I mean, still, uh, Noah Hughes and Rich, they're still at Crystal, and we worked uh, really closely with them on the story of the game, and they were really uh, instrumental in just orchestrating the whole uh, structure of the game for, for uh, Shadow. Yeah. What's it like for you, Rich? Well, from my perspective, absolutely agree with what Jason was, was saying, and, and for me, the 
there was just no better team and no better fit to move Lara's origin story conclusion across that finish line. As Jason said, you know, the, the IDOS Montreal team have had their heart and soul in the Tomb Raider franchise since the beginning of the reboot. And, you know, in addition to to creating content for Tomb Raider 2013 and Rise of the Tomb Raider and being responsible for you know, a lot of the great challenge tombs and puzzles and, and levels that, that, that fans you know, played across the game, we all have just a lot of that shared DNA. You know, people like, you know, Dan Bisson being the game director, you know, on, on both uh, Tomb Raider 2013 and, and Rise of Tomb Raider. In fact, he was working out of Crystal here, you know, for Tomb Raider 2013, and then he went and did that from, from Montreal for Rise of Tomb Raider. So having him as the senior game director and creative director on Shadow of the Tomb Raider just means that you've got someone who has been intrinsically involved with Lara Croft's reboot from the very beginning, and you had a bunch of the team that he brought with him who worked on both games, but you also had that injection of fresh new blood. So from my perspective, it kind of gave you the best of both worlds. You've got people who have had their DNA in the Tomb Raider reboot from the beginning, and then you have new people who are coming in saying, hey, what if we tried this? What if we you know, played with that? And, and that lets you push those boundaries a little bit and deliver those surprises that are going to delight our fans when they're playing Lara Croft's Finding Moment. Yeah. So, okay, you mentioned the conclusion of the origin story. That's such a mushy spot. And Jason, I wonder if you can speak to the challenges of that. Like, how do you have an impact in that kind of strange middle ground? Well, it's a massive responsibility because not only do we have to conclude the story of this game in a satisfying way, we have to conclude the story, the arc of the trilogy in a satisfying way. So, obviously, there's a lot of people involved in trying and seeing where do we want to leave her? Where, where does it end? What does it feel like for that ending? And, cr- and try and make sure that there's a big enough challenge that is going to reveal things about previous games about her personality and also have her overcome and really grow over the course of this game. So I think that... Uh, did you finish it? Did you play the game at all? Or No, actually, I haven't started it yet. People who just started uh, on the okay. podcast before us, they, they've been playing a hell of a lot of it. All right, so I don't want to spoil too Please much for you, but anyway, this defining moment is really just challenging her and having her really, really grow and, and finally become the Tomb Raider she was meant to be. Why frame it as the conclusion of the origin story? Why not just call this a trilogy? It's not ruling out future entries or anything, but you know, just the phrasing of that. And Rich, maybe you can speak to that better from a brand perspective. What's the what's appealing about saying this is the conclusion of the origin story specifically? Well, I think that it, it does a couple of things, and it's absolutely correct to call it you know an origin trilogy if you wanted to. But I do think that having a sense of finality is important. And what we wanted to make sure we were doing was presenting an experience that for the fans who have been with us since Tomb Raider 2013 and then played through Rise of Tomb Raider, they know that this is that defining moment, as we said. This is when Lara's becoming the Tomb Raider she's, she's destined to be. This is when it's all culminating. This is the, the biggest fight that we've ever had. This is you know, the Maya apocalypse. This is finding out really what happened with Trinity. And, you know, without being in the spoiler territory, it's just it's a very rewarding capstone. It's a, you know, it's, it's that great bookmark to this adventure that Lara's been on and this adventure that started so long ago when she just wanted to make her mark on the world. Now you're going to see how she actually does that. Right. At the same time, we want to make sure that we're delivering something that feels very accessible to fans. And that's also why we have that 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 phrase of it's Lara Croft's defining moment because for the for the fans who maybe didn't jump on board with Tomb Raider 2013 or Rise of the Tomb Raider, we're letting them know that hey, this is the moment that you can come on board. This is when you're going to see Lara at her most capable, her most calculating. If you, if you hadn't played the previous games, this is the one to come on board for. So we're trying to sort of thread that needle. Right, right. And we rarely have brand directors on the show. I think it's an interesting position, Rich. But I'm wondering if you can just speak to, like, how do you get gamers' attention? Especially with the third entry in the series, it has to be very tough. And, like, saying it's the build-up, that obviously works. I, I think this is maybe just a weird read amongst my friends and, and some coworkers, but I feel like we love the new Tomb Raider games. We always enjoy them when we play them, but we don't think about them much in the downtime. Like, so how do you get people excited for this from your very specific brand-directing position? It's a great question. I think it's a challenge across any video game of how are you competing for gamers' time. So I think that there's a couple of things we try and do. We want to make sure that we obviously are not 
alienating our fans. We're delivering an experience that they expect that, you know, that they deserve when, when you talk about Lara Croft's defining moment. But I think we also want to make sure that we are showing people something new. And whether you talk about the narrative in terms of how this is Lara actually being confident to a fault in some ways, that she's the one that triggers through a, a rash decision the Maya apocalypse or whether you look at the new combat tactics that we're introducing, you know, using mud as camouflage and striking, you know, from the jungle like a jaguar or making the tombs bigger and scarier than ever before. I think it's always about trying to show people something that fits as a natural progression and a natural evolution, but also shows them something surprising. And that's what hopefully gets people to sit up and take notice because they can say, wow, you know, I've, I've never had that, you know, jungle survival fantasy you know, that Rambo moment or the Predator moment where I'm covering myself up with mud, or I've never seen Lara portrayed in this light, and whereas a fan would look at it and say, yeah, this is her just coming into her own to a person who, you know, as you were saying, maybe isn't thinking about Tomb Raider in their downtime, this is a way to show them Tomb Raider in, in a way that they haven't seen before. Uh, Jason, what do you think has been the most fun uh, period of development for this game? When was the most exciting times? When were your brain cells lit on fire here? You know, it's um, when we came, like we had played with the structure of this game uh, several times. You know, so to me, the, the, when I look back over the several years, it, it's really just for me. Normally, at a whiteboard, <laughs> you know, with a bunch of people just you know brainstorming ideas and coming up with. And when you click on something, and everyone in the room is like, "Yeah, that's awesome." Those kind of moments, I think, are, are really are really memorable. And just like you know, the way the game is now, you know, it's not like we sat down and did a list and then. And three years, nothing changed. You know, we kind of tried things out to see what works, what doesn't work, and we some shifted some things around. And those, some of those changes we did uh, were are my favorite parts of the game. And sometimes just moving one piece from here to here makes a huge difference in how it feels and stuff like that. So we did a lot of those little small changes that made a huge impact emotionally. So that's the stuff that I look back and I think, wow, that was that was a lot of fun. What are they? Gameplay moments? Are they little story beats? Is like one of those ideas that everybody jumps up and hollers about is it stuff like the jaguar scene or is it big stuff like okay this set piece we need to move this from the third act to the second well um well both of those things i'll give you a specific example uh you've probably seen in some of the promos where lara kind of gets out of the out of the water and there's fire behind her and all yeah. that kind of stuff right well that moment that wasn't uh, clicking with when with play testers were playing it and people were like and, and we're thinking man this is this is a big moment for us and people weren't getting it and we said man the problem was probably earlier, you know, so we went, we kept it because we believed in that moment, and we went back and we saw, oh, some of the things in the sequence leading up to that were a little bit taking away from that momentum. So we had to, ended up kind of removing a scene completely, and then that whole sequence uh, paid off better. So sometimes the, if you really believe in a moment, you need to kind of stick with it and then remove anything that's, that's interfering with that moment. So that's a specific example. And that's just time for iteration, right? Just trying to work that into the development schedule, just saying, let's slow down a bit. We don't need to rush this game out the door necessarily. We need time to test this, evaluate how people are feeling at each moment. Well, yeah, because you need to, you know, it's not just the how does it feel at the ending. You want to make sure that at critical moments throughout the story that the feelings that you want, the feelings you're designing are coming across, you know? Like, that's where playtesting is very, uh, you know, uh, very powerful and can, can say, all right, are you guys getting this emotion when you're playing it? If not, it like, you need to analyze, and sometimes there's a fun gameplay moment, but maybe that gameplay moment is disrupting the emotional trajectory. Maybe it belongs somewhere else, you know, and sometimes we, we're not afraid to make those kinds of decisions. Yeah, for sure. Any super surprising reactions from playtests? Specific things that really stuck with you? Uh, well, you know, we have a multi-tiered difficulty setting. Right? Yeah. You know, because we wanted to make the puzzles a bit more difficult. We wanted to do things, and this was causing problems because some people want hints right away with the puzzle some people don't want any hints and there was no sweet spot and so through iteration we were like okay man we need to we need to make a different difficulty setting so this all grew kind of organically and then there was a this group called growl get rid of white ledges and so they didn't want exploration <laughs> help and all these things so you know you put all that together and then it's like we came up with this multi-tier difficulty system for combat for exploration and for puzzles to solve problems we are having through playtesting so you look back now, and people are like, oh, wow, this is great. It's like it was us solving problems. So without the playtesting, we never would have really exposed the problems to that extent. And what it gives us is be able to play your way. Some players are like, 
I want the puzzle super hard, but I don't want to mess with the combat, and I can tweak it that way to make sure I get the experience that I want. And now that we've, and it was a lot of work, and at some days I was like, oh, there's so many lines of dialogue for these hints. But now that we've done it and it's all done, I'm very happy we did that because you're able to, to, to do it and really play your way, and it's a lot of fun. It's great, but now Square's going to be stuck in that mold of that's such a cool <laughs> difficulty scale that every game you guys make moving forward is going to have to have those different options. So good luck with that. <laughs> great. Anything else that you guys would like to say? Uh, well, I, I think it's it's really exciting. I'm you know I'm 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 so happy because the, the team has been working on this for a really long time. You know, it's it's been amazing to watch the progress and all the heart and soul that's gone into the game. So. From my perspective, I'm, I'm just so excited for our fans to now finally get their chance to to experience this moment because I think it's uh, I think it's a lot of stuff that you want and and love out of the Tomb Raider game. I think a lot of things that you didn't know that you couldn't wait to play in the Tomb Raider game, and I, I think we found you know several places where we're going to surprise and delight our fans. So. I'm just excited for the for the Tomb Raider community to get their hands on Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Yeah, how you feel, Jason? I mean, it's been a, a, a this year has been exceedingly difficult. A lot of uh, a lot of crunch trying to, to get the, the polish on this game, and we're very very happy with it. And I can't wait to, to see what people think. I hope they love it. Yeah, for sure. All right, Rich, I just have one more question for you. Did you find so the raw Dana Gould Gex recordings yet in the basement of Crystal Dynamics? <laughs> Ben, I know I owe that to you. You really do. I, need to, I, I, I think I, I think I know where it is because we, we did a clean out, and I remember keeping all the CDs. So I think I know where it is. I don't have the exact disc. I've got, I've got, I've got to dig in after launch. I've got to dig in and find that for you. Absolutely, because I understand. I you need you asked about that. You need the vacation. Thank enjoy the launch. Show the Tomb Raider, and then at some point. If you could just get those tapes over to us, we could run them on the podcast. It'd be so much fun. <laughs> I'm writing a note to myself right now. <laughs> I, I will remember to do that. Awesome. Hey, shout out to the Tomb Raider, Rich and Jason. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks, man. Cool. Thank you, Ben. Do you remember what episode it was that I was like, oh, don't you want to find out what happened with the father? Do you remember that I think it was? Um, I think it was when we were bidding on the games we were going to play. Oh, I yeah, I want to go back and listen to that because I really was genuinely Maybe. being sarcastic. It was like, to wow. me, the biggest, like, well, who cares? At the end of that game, it was like, your father is alive. I was like, maybe you're trying okay. to Maybe I knew it at the moment, but yeah. in my mind, I have you down as like a, a care. But I, yeah, I do, man. I, I'm still totally excited to play the game. No, <laughs> it's like I said, I can't say that I didn't have, like I said, I could play it for hours yeah, on end, yeah. but like I would then sit there and be like, what the And, you, and your th- thoughts on whatever the finale, maybe I don't want it spoiled, yeah. makes me more excited. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> I, 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 want, no I, want, I had Reiner actually this weekend because he, I was like, did you finish yet? Because yeah. he read my review and I was like, no, no, not yet. And then I was like, finish and then come talk to me. So yeah. later that day, right. he's like, oh my God, you are not kidding. <laughs> okay. He's like, yes. <laughs> he's right. like, what the f- What's Here's that? my prediction. She cuts off, she takes her pants and she cuts them really low cut and pulls off her sleeves to be in the original Tomb Raider outfit. And wears her out. sleeves as <laughs> what? Anyways, we're still talking about Shadow of the Tomb Raider here. Uh, thanks to those guys for Skyping in for a little bit of context. I don't know if you guys remember. You do, because you were on the Rise of the Tomb Raider trip. Yeah. Do you remember that time that Rich said, like, oh, yeah, we have Dana Gould's raw recording yeah. from doing the Gex VO somewhere yeah. Crystal. I just saw him the other day. I'll go grab them for you. In theory, nobody's we're gonna get seen those. Rich since. That's right. And air them on this show. Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah. Maybe get Dana Gould's approval, which would probably be a cool thing to do. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Uh, so this like, is what? Three, four years in the making. This, uh, yes, this the big Ooh. Dana Gould Gex <laughs> explosion is going to be a special edition episode just devoted to Mr. Gould, the comedian. Okay, uh, that's it. A lot of Tomb Raider, folks. Uh, do you guys want to clap out and we can get rolling on Destiny? Let's do it. Oh my gosh, Sergio Vasquez, Matt Miller. We really had to coordinate that mm-hmm. whole clap in. Well, look, magic That was hard. like the fourth attempt, everybody. Don't reveal <laughs> what happens behind the scenes. You know, that's private information for the GI right. show. Uh, okay. We're here, Serial Miller, to talk about Destiny 2 Forsaken, just for a setup for you, Miller. Last week, yes, Serial did a very good job, he was very eloquent as ever, oh. of giving kind of like a high-level overview of the campaign, yeah. taking down a different baron, stuff like that. So that's where our audience is really at. But I'm excited to hear your thoughts, Miller, because you were not involved with the Forsaken uh, cover story content in terms of this podcast, yeah, because you were busy with other things, yes, and so that's why I'm so excited. I don't know your take on this game really hardly at all. So you sure. were playing. We had like the cover story that I did, right? The print story, and yes. then like yeah, and then for the online stuff, you're busy. But for this game overall, yeah, 
you've played a lot of it at this point, I assume. Yeah. How are you feeling about it? Uh, it's 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 great. Yep. I wow. think is the word I would use. It's excellent. Excellent. It might be their best expansion. Okay, because in everyone's mind, I feel like it was okay. They're kind of positioning this thing as the Taken King yep. equivalent for Destiny Two, but that is a that's a high bar. That's it, the last time I really loved Destiny. I feel like, mm-hmm. and and you're saying it hits that again. I would say that uh, the verdict is still out, and it's very hard with a game like like any game like this, World of Warcraft, Destiny, these these deep, involved, lengthy games, to really have a true determination this early to be able to say like this is better than Taking King. Some issues might arise. Two sure. months in, yeah. Not to mention the fact that some great things could arise two months in. Yeah. That, you know, new events and new uh, secrets that get found, all that stuff uh, is still in process. And so I think it's hard mm-hmm. to really confidently say that it's, it's quote-unquote, better than Taking King. But it's certainly in that running. Wow, okay. Um, it, it does a lot of the things uh, that I think Longtime Destiny players have wanted to see have happen. Um, it addresses many of the problems that have plagued the game since Destiny 2's launch last year around this time. And what are the big bullet points there? Well, people didn't like the new weapon slot system. In or many people didn't like it. Um, there was an overall sense that the uh, the structure of play was maybe oversimplified in in the name of bringing new players in. Which, by the way, Destiny 2 did bring new players in. For all the things that over the last year the, the, the uh, community around that game has harped about and complained about and all that kind of stuff, it's very easy to forget that in the very first couple of weeks of play, it, it drew in a whole new batch of players, and that even a lot of players, uh, myself included, really, really enjoyed Destiny 2 in its first few weeks. And then the problems started to the, get bigger and bigger. The problems that... Um, that were present were things that made the long time to- long-term game less enjoyable the longer you played yeah. the token economy the uh, the nature of, of team shooting in in the competitive play so that you could never feel like you were gaining quite as much mastery as you wanted to the um, I mean there were there was uh, there was just a host of things that yeah. people got frustrated about right I think a lot of it had to do with sort of the way that objectives are sort of like split up into like here is your weekly run of milestones and that will get you better gear and then and then you were done yeah and then there's if you want to sort of there's these everything else felt like extracurricular if you want to chase armor sets if you want to sort of engage with basically like a lot of the collection aspect that was sort of a thing you did on the side after you were done with the main milestone stuff so it felt like here are all these important aspects to like a loot based game that are being kind of thrown by the wayside in favor of like chasing a number and and destiny 2 at its core in addition to those system based things which i think you're summarizing really well there surreal there was also the fact that there was a there was a tonal inconsistency that increasingly became grading over time with destiny 2 where Losing the magic was another, there, it, i remember you had that complaint right it, it it felt um at times like while the, the the actual core campaign was a pretty well told story structurally um, and you went to interesting locales, and the destinations were beautiful to look at. There was something about the overall feel of the writing and of the storytelling that felt like it had missed something about what's what's magical about Destiny. This sort of um, mystical, fantastical element, this mystery, a certain level of kind of darkness. Uh, that literal darkness. <laughs> yeah. Not literal darkness, okay. figurative darkness, right? Like, that, that there was something that, that felt like, well, everybody's trying to crack a joke in the midst of these, like, uh, situations where it should really be really serious, like, humankind is about to go extinct, and... But now, thankfully, Kate 6 is dead, so there's no yeah. more jokes and, in and Forsaken. Or I not. haven't heard a peep out of Failsafe in a long time. <laughs> I'm very happy. I, I, think, I think that, by comparison, uh, Forsaken is a much... Um, uh, more nuanced storytelling experience. Um, it, it actually has some genuine pathos that it develops over the course of its story, and it's, it's, a, it's a darker story that, that is dealing a lot with issues of um, does it matter why we do things, the intent behind why we kill people or kill aliens or whatever, or not. Or chase levels. Uh, yeah. Right, or chase levels. Or grow more powerful, uh-huh. right? Um, and, and a lot of those, those systems... Uh, 
ideas that Sergei was talking about have also been uh, addressed in, in meaningful ways that make both the progression curve and the experience of gameplay a lot more fulfilling. Yeah, are you as charmed overall as uh, Miller is here? I, I think so. Like, I, I think my, fav- my favorite thing about it so far is that it feels like Miller said it sort of brings that stuff that I mentioned as being extracurricular more to the surface uh, because basically like anything you do will eventually gain you the progress that milestones used to give you but now it's all tied to challenges which feel like you're out there chasing things and also you know collecting armor sets which are now a lot easier to sort of uh, want because they have like a new collection screen where you can see here's all the stuff here's how to get them and if you do more of this activity you'll get uh, sort of you'll be rewarded with this armor. Yeah. But also it's tied to the bounty system, which has you basically going to the vendor, getting these bounties to do specific tasks, which are easy to, easy to accomplish, but then those are eventually tied to if you gain enough experience, you'll get powerful gear. Uh, and so you're basically chasing multiple objectives at once, which sort of makes that, like, it, it, it's better about instilling that sort of, like, uh, I, I'm just so, I'm so close to completing this thing that makes a loot grind game so much more enticing. Yeah. Uh, and I think Destiny has finally gotten to that place where I like I don't want to stop playing because like the next sort of big goal is right around the the corner and I just you you want to keep rounding those corners. Totally. I get I get the pitch. It's, just, it's always funny when you're when you've been out of the loop of Destiny's grind for a little bit to be like, dude, this treadmill goes so fast. You got to get on this treadmill cuz sprinting <laughs> so much fun. Right. Like, Why would I want to get on that treadmill? Right. It's just never ending. I I think the the curve at least as it has made itself apparent in this first first week is very appealing because um, you're chasing the thing, you're, you're doing the activities that you want to do and you can consistently go do those activities and expect that you're going to get a small but meaningful improvement. There's a big space between what uh, the people call the soft cap of power and the hard cap and that's going to be a really long grind but the things that you're doing along those that grind generally offer things offer new items that are going to move you up the scale a little bit okay and there's just there's just a lot of new things like uh, i think if you had just introduced forsaken as here's a whole restructuring of the game i think it would have been pretty solid but i think layering stuff like gambit like the tangled shore like the dreaming city and all these sort of disparate quests that they're now giving you like i, I have two exotic quests that i'm chasing independently uh and then a bunch of bounties and stuff that i'm, I'm chasing all of this stuff all at once but i'm also doing new like exciting things to get those things done, which like basically uh, rounds out the other stuff like Crucible by making it a smaller component of a larger whole, I think. And and while you're doing those things that Serial's talking about, they've done a, a great job of offering opportunities for layering, um, where you're, you're taking multiple tasks that you might want to complete and having that fun element of saying like, okay, well, I can can work on this exotic quest where I need to get this many kills with this type of weapon in the Crucible, but I can also get these bounties. I can pick up these bounties from Shax that are going to let me, okay, I'm going to get some more Crucible tokens that way, and simultaneously I'm going to be doing this other thing. Like, there, there, there's this sense that in any one activity that you're doing, you're feeling kind of smart mm-hmm. because you're, you're thinking about those ways that you're improving a, along multiple right. scales at the same time. Right. Even okay. something as simple as, like, all right, get, you'll have sort of two objectives that are, that are, like, get kills with a shotgun and get kills with arc damage. Well, I have this arc shotgun, so yes. I'm going to get both of those done at the same time. Right. And that, that makes you feel like, oh, I'm, 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 tr- I'm optimizing. I'm the game. I'm beating optimizing. The system. I'm beating yeah. the system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so there's that stuff going on. I would say... At this point, and again, it's very hard early on to to make concrete claims about a game like this, but at this point, the one negative that I would have to, to say about the game is that there are times that in its attempts to emulate what was successful about Destiny 1 mm-hmm. and integrate that into what is good about Destiny 2. Systems-wise. Yes. Okay. Some things are going to be uh, overly complicated to... Um, to people who aren't totally plugged into the game. What kind of stuff? Well, uh, for instance, the the upgrade system for your weapons, your infusion process, that kind of thing, is, is much more complicated now than it was before. For someone like Suriel or myself who are, who's playing this game multiple hours every day, I don't think that's going to be an issue. Um, because you're generally understanding... Um, 
okay, well, this is where I go to get this thing. It says that I need this particular planetary material. I just need to go here to get that. Or I can go to this other vendor and buy it. Mm -hmm. But if you're a player who's maybe a lapsed player or somebody who um, plays the game a little bit more casually, I think it's going to be harder to wrap your head around some of that stuff. Um, in many ways, Destiny 2's base game felt like it appealed too far towards that casual, accessible uh, market in the long term. Okay. And it's possible that Forsaken is going a, a pretty long distance the other direction. That it's very much catered towards players like myself, who are like, yeah. I want, this is my hobby, man. I'm going home and I'm playing Destiny 2 tonight and we're going to go do this and we're going to do this and I'm going to get with my clan and we're going to like do this activity. And, uh, I think that the store that that for more casual players, you're you're certainly going to be able to enjoy Forsaken. Um, the storyline is really great. I think it's it's their their best story. Um, really? Wow. Yeah, I really do. Um, because it's more personal. Because they like focus on characters and they focus on on like uh, how you as a guardian are doing what you're doing and why you're doing what you're doing and that kind of thing. Um, you're going to be able to enjoy that story, and the, the campaign is a lot of fun, and the destinations you go to are, are a lot of fun. But I, I think that if you're not going to be like going to the community pages every day, going to Destiny Reddit or going to the Bungie forums, if you're not going to be going online to look for guides of, like, what am I supposed to do once I get to the Dreaming City? Right. Without that component, there, uh, there may be things that people are like, well, why am I still... I don't even know what to do now in this game. Yeah, right. Even, even as like a as someone who's played a lot of Destiny, like that, the material system feels like needlessly complex because, yeah. and I'm, it also like it de incentivizes you constantly infusing things, which is sort of what I, how I, I play Destiny. Which I is, agree. I have a favorite gun, and I'm just going to keep powering that gun up because I like it so much. Yeah. Whereas now I feel like because it it is taking up this other resource that can you have to go out of your way to get in a lot of cases, it feels like I'm in I'm less incentivized to like constantly keep bringing up my gun. I think it, it, this is going to be an ongoing debate within the community for Destiny because a lot of people like that there is that deeper grind for materials and for legendary shards and for masterwork cores and you really got to work to get those infusions. And I get that argument and to some degree I'm on board with that. But it ignores the fact that for a lot of players the joy of the Destiny experience is experimentation. And if it costs a tremendous amount to be able to pull up interesting items to make them viable for use at high level play, people just aren't going to do it. Yeah. And so you're just going to get a drop and be like, well, this is the highest level thing I have. I better put on this shotgun. I don't really want to use this shotgun, but I, I better use it because if you're not a player who has a lot of those those materials um, and you're maybe a little bit more casual of a player, I think it's going to be hard to um, feel like it's, it's worth going back and, and grinding for that stuff. Right. So that is... That's a, a long explanation of, of the of the one thing that I, I have concerns about here, which is that uh, there are many things. It's very clear that uh, Bungie and High Moon Studios looked at the success of Destiny One, looked at the way that hobby players enjoyed playing that previous game, and said, "Like, what can we pull over? What can we make uh, Destiny Two better with by by you know looking to our previous work?" Um, and in so doing, I think in most cases they've made something better okay. um, that is an amalgamation of the two. Uh, but in a few situations, it maybe has gone a little bit too far towards um, needless fiddliness. Interesting. Yeah. It's funny to think of Bungie zigging and zagging with every release here. Like, what about this stance? What about this stance? What about yeah. this stance? It, with Forsaken now, does it look like Destiny 2 was a worthy experiment, just maybe a little bit too bold? It, like, how do you look back on Destiny 2 in general? I know you covered, like, a lot of the basics uh, in the beginning, but is it, you think, of, of something that the series should have done, that they should have been so bold and experimental with kind of shedding the past, or was it just all out a mistake at this point? I am very hesitant to label Destiny 2's core game as a mistake. I think there <laughs> were... <all>. Sorry. <laughs> I think that there were a lot of things that were really smart in Destiny 2. I, I, with the passing of months, I have taken increased issue with the decision to leave behind Destiny 1. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Okay. Like, like uh, with each passing month, I felt like, you know, I, I kind of think this game might be stronger if it was just a continuation 
of what the original game had been with, like some changes to systems. But there's lots of reasons why that didn't happen, not the least of which is that there were behind-the-scenes technical changes to the way they wanted to make the game Yeah, that made it impossible, I think, to, to be able to carry stuff over from D1. Um, but, uh, but, but there were things about Destiny 2 that drove away a, a lot of their audience, and ultimately, that's a big problem. Mm-hmm. In, in, in today's game uh, sphere of players, once you lose somebody, it is very hard to get them back. I think Forsaken, for players who are willing to give it a shot, the players who loved Destiny 1 and loved its expansions like Taken King and Rise of Iron, if you dropped into Forsaken now after being somewhat disillusioned with what was on offer in Destiny 2, you will be impressed. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's really strong um, and does a lot of things right. Um, but I, uh, unfortunately, uh, the nature of, of what that game, what the base game did drove a lot of people away and they're not some of them aren't going to come back right. a, l- question, a, lot of, yeah, a lot of the times it feels like when when you do something like that you've become like an, someone who used to smoke or someone who used to eat meat <laughs> you're, you're, you just become the most sort of like adamant person against that yes thing. yeah i totally know what you mean i and i agree now on the other hand destiny 2 brought in a bunch of new players and and if some of those players have stuck around and are now ready for that that deeper, more involved progression system and a, a more complex weapons a slot uh, system and crucible that's maybe a little bit more um, built around mastery and, and growth and that kind of thing. I uh, I don't know how it all balances out. Um, in the end, though, I would say that Forsaken is is something that that feels right now a week in like it is it, it's what the player base for that game wanted it to be. Oh, good. Right. Okay. Oh, um, I think there are some looming possible issues uh, right now. I think the biggest one is that I'm not light enough, like I, I'm not powerful enough to run it yet. But there's a new thing called the blind well, which is sort of this repetitive, like wave-based mode that uh, we played during our cover story, which I think is really cool. And we have a new gameplay today video, of right? It too, right. Okay. Uh, and, and but right now it still relies on sort of the, a lot of the same mechanisms as Escalation Protocol, uh, which. Rec- oftentimes requires you to sort of circumvent the game in order to have, like, the best experience. So it, For matchmaking, you mean. Right. Yeah. So you can only bring three people into your fire team, but, you know, a lot of people have said, like, the best way to run this is with six people. So you basically have to figure out a way to, like, let's both get in the same instance, and we're both going to try to get our fire... Like, once we're once these two random players are basically matched up in the same instance, they're both going to bring in their friends, and now we have six people. Instead of sort of dedicated matchmaking, which is, I think, what a lot of people want... Or the ability to bring in a six-person fire team into the blind well. I think those two things, I think, would improve that activity a lot. Uh, and I'm also conscious of, like, how is the power curve between the rest of this? Because it feels like I'm running up against the, the, the high end of the activities. So after between, let's say, 550 and maybe 600, what is what is the progression going to look like after that? Yeah. But right now, I feel like this is the most fun I've had with Destiny 2. That's so, awesome. By a long shot. That's and, great. And I think that's fantastic. I think a majority of the audience are going to be in the camp, which is a very particular camp, of Destiny 2 is the PlayStation Plus game of the month right now. Yeah. You yeah. can get that for free-ish type thing, PlayStation subscription. So what would they need to get? Because there's a certain thing you need to buy in order to even get to Forsaken, right? Cause you need to buy like the DLC in between you know, it, or how does that work? I, you know, I, you're, you're going to expose my ignorance here a little bit to the way that PSN offer was. I kind of think I heard that it offered up, that, that it, even though it didn't say so, that it also included some of these other expansions. So it got people fully primed. I don't mechanically. I don't yeah, know. Part, like they have like so many editions of that game. That's at this what's point. tough for an audience, right? Yeah. And so like the thing you want to get is you want to get the the one that gives you Forsaken and the expansion packs. I think that's either like a forty dollar just here's Forsaken, or yeah. there's a there might be a sixty dollar version. Uh, so that stuff can be kind of hard uh, to sort of uh, like sort of wade through. And oh, there's also like if you just want to start Forsaken, uh, there's. They offer you. They do offer you an item called a mode of. I think it's a, a mode of light or something, uh, that will boost your character basically past all of those previous campaigns and just start you at Forsaken. So hang on. Do they have that in the game? I haven't seen it. Uh, I, I I think I have one of those items, but I haven't used it. Okay. Yet. So hang on. This is very mechanical and very stupid, but I can just buy Forsaken if I've never played a Destiny game. Just buy that forty dollar thing and 
play. No, I think I think if you don't have the base game, you might have to pay sixty dollars. Okay. But at that point, you get an item that we like. If you just want to ignore Destiny 2's campaign, which I, I think it's worth playing. Yeah. Um, you can have, buy an item that boosts you basically. That starts you at Forsaken. Okay. Oh uh, boy, Destiny. <laughs> yeah. Help us love you. I I I think that one of the things, if somebody really was curious about Destiny and they. Um, either had played the core Destiny 2 experience, um, and and they liked it, and then they left just because they did, and they went to play other things, or they didn't like it. I think one of the things that you could do at this point, particularly because of the PSN offer, um, is you could play you could play through a lot of that core stuff with the new systems in place, and you could get a sense for how the the gameplay flow has changed. Okay. That stuff is apparent whether you have Forsaken or not. Whether you decide to spend the money to go in and, and, and play Forsaken, you would be able to see the way these new weapon slot things make uh, make play a lot more fun. That you have your snipers and your shotguns and your uh, fusion rifles up in your, your upper two slots, and you can do more with them. Uh, you'd get to see the way that the competitive game feels more competitive. Uh, a lot of that stuff is going to be available just by hopping in and playing like a free PSN version of, of Destiny 2. And then if you're like, yeah, you know, this is pretty sweet, then you could, like, check and see, like, okay, well, what do I need to do to get, um, you know, the things I need to, to play through the other expansions, or do I want to just right. jump up to Forsaken? I'm sorry, I don't know That's all fine. the details That's there, fine. like how you would do that, uh, because I've, of course, I've just kind of been playing along as it's happened. Yeah, there's so, so many different on totally ramps there. in there. Mess. Totally get it. Um, but uh, I think that the game is in as strong of a place as as it has been. Um, right. And and worth exploring. And so you're writing a review. Yeah. Do you have any time frame in mind for when that review is going to be up? You know, we're. This has been a tricky one to yeah. be honest because they've been very upfront. Bungie has uh, and their partners at High Moon about plans to unfold the content in that game gradually. Uh, they've talked about the Dreaming City having multiple um, iterations almost, it sounds like, where it's going to change over time. So we're waiting for some of those big climactic yeah, changes. Yeah, at, at the very least, we're thinking about uh, like holding until we get a chance to see the raid here. Cool. Um, so it's going to be a few days. We feel pretty strongly as a editorial outlet about trying to offer a... Um, meaningful evaluation in a review that takes into account the majority of what a game has to offer and Destiny 2 Forsaken by its nature is a game that's unfolding over time and so we're, we're trying to strike a balance between like paying attention to that but also making sure to do things like this right where we talk about it even as we're evaluating it's it. some sort of word out but for now seems excellent I, phrasing. I don't know it, it's hard for me to imagine anybody not really digging into this thing I mean it's like a western themed revenge story set with outer space ma outer space like magic and and crazy like a crazy elven mm -hmm. land that's been cursed yeah it just got all sorts of like it's fun really strong little little that dinner bell for sure. dorks here we yeah. go yeah. come on down yeah, everybody like, it's, if, if you were into like sci-fi and fantasy tropes there's a lot of that good stuff that's just like <laughs> baked in here uh, -huh. uh to to make for a, a great gaming experience and uh I certainly feel like, um, as a long-time player, it's it's worth it for anybody who has played it. And if you haven't played Destiny 2 yet, or if, even if you've never played any Destiny stuff, this would be an awesome time to just drop in and, like, just play through the whole darn thing. There's a lot to tackle. There's content lowers in the game. You can go read it in the game. That's, That's right. true. That's and they're right. selling a book on the side. They are. They are. Yeah. How do you feel about that, Miller? What are so I it's like it's, all the Grimoire cards? Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know the exact details of what's going to be in there. I know some of it's going to be the Grimoire cards, and maybe that's all of it. Okay. Or maybe they're going to have some other stuff in there, too. But uh, just as like a Lord dork for Destiny stuff, I think it's great to have more avenues for people to explore that stuff. Because so much of the Destiny story history mm -hmm. that's been in-game has been sort of, at, at times, almost adolescent in its approach to communicating itself and the grimoire and the lore entries are much more sophisticated poetic at times poetic at times really hard science fiction stuff that's, that's yeah like, like oh there's time travel and there's like weird simulations of reality going on and there's all these un unusual contemplations about the nature of of 
being deathless and immortal as a, as a guardian. Uh-huh. Like, stuff that's really Get it interesting. Out there. Get it, let yeah. people absorb it. And they put it. that stuff into the lore, and uh, a lot of it now is is now on offer in in game that you're finding things in the game and you're mm-hmm. picking up these little stories and while you're in loading screens or while you're waiting for your buddy to log in you can go you can read that thing yeah. and you'll be like oh that's that was a cool little story yeah for sure hey Jesse Do Forsaken thank you so much sure. uh, to you guys not necessarily you guys per se mm-hmm. but just the concept of the podcast want to move on to emails right now uh, I'm speaking for the podcast yes here we go <laughs> Welcome back to the Game Former Show. I'm still here. Now is the time for emails. We assemble the Dream Team, the best email crew ever assembled under the sun. We have Ben Reeves. Hello. Kyle Hilliard. I feel like you say that no matter who's on. That's not true. Imran Khan. I'm in the Dream Team because everyone else is asleep. That's true. <laughs> News editors Skyping in from San Francisco. What's going on out there these days, Imran? Absolutely nothing. Okay. Mm. Wait a go. minute. Who's watching the news? Oh! 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 <laughs> you guys gotta do that more, remember? Oh god. Yeah, I told Reese about it. It's really the dumbest, probably worst thing to do. But someone at the GameStop Andrews conference is like, that's my favorite thing in the podcast. It's funny. And I was trying to read his eyes like you, Kyle, to see if there's sarcasm in there. I don't think so. I, I think gotta find out what happens to Laura's dad. Years, you'll just see him again and be like, oh, that was sarcastic. Dude. <laughs> How would anybody enjoy when you guys <laughs> I scream? I never want mic? you to do that again. People write in to podcast at GameInformer.com with news stories, uh, questions, words of wisdom, feedback, dares, trivia, little fun games, anything that makes the show better, podcast at GameInformer.com. We get a lot of great emails this week. Um, we're going to read off some of our favorites, then choose our absolute number one favorite, and then honor where that person is from by putting a pin where they're from on our big map. It's filling up. It's filling up. Um, a lot of great stuff. By the way, another disclaimer out there. If there's like some crazy news this week and we're not covering it on this episode of the podcast, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we're recording it a little bit early, even though the podcast goes live on Thursday. So if that Nintendo Direct dropped, if anything big, I'm very sorry. But hopefully you guys are enjoying the Blackout beta and all that stuff. But and they'll never know because all they do is listen to the podcast. <laughs> I know, well, news. maybe some people, but yeah, write in with podcastgameformer.com if we miss something huge, and we'll talk about it on the next episode. We love you all, especially, what, Jack White from Utah. What? The, the white go. stripes? Absolutely. He says to Ben Hansen and company, question, what do you guys think of the recent trend in video games where developers give the players the ability to play as a low polygon version of the protagonist? I didn't realize it was such a trend, but he really maps it out here. Metal Gear Solid Five, Super Mario Odyssey, just a hat, but... Rise of the Tomb Raider, A Hat in Time, uh, have low polygon cosmetic options for the player to engage with. There are more titles that do this, but I think it's a very clever way to juxtapose modern visuals with a trip down memory lane. I love it. I oh, want some more cool. of yeah. it. It was my favorite unlockable thing in Mario Odyssey, was getting that stuff. I liked it in Mario really? Odyssey, because like, yeah. there was a decent amount of nostalgia there. Like, Shadow of the Tomb Raider has it, and I kind of hate it in that one. Oh, because, really? Like, you, can, you can go back as, like first reboot Laura. So the very original uh, Tomb Raider, not original Tomb Raider, but the one a couple of years ago, and it looks just slightly off enough that it makes everything look strange. Oh, oh, oh. wait, the 2013 Laura's in there? Yeah. yeah that is such a weird choice. That's a weird choice. Well, they also that, have the that's old ones, weird. too. They also have, like, the original PS1 era. Right, yeah. Models. That's, like, the fun novelty thing. Yeah, I wish you could, like, customize it to, like, just her legs or, like, the <laughs> polygons. Just make it, like, a full, like a mech from Armored Core just swapping <laughs> out different parts. I think uh, it's fun. I think more cool developers enough. should do it. What, I, what bugs me is you shouldn't wait until, like, the end of the game. Give it to us earlier than that. Maybe we want to play around. Yeah, let us just play the game. Any sense of serious gravitas you're trying to convey in your story because this is going to be some weirdo, gnarly Lara. How many stories do you really care about in games, though, really? This, One is, a, this is a very Jeff Cork topic. That's controversial. Um, out of all the games I play where I'm invested in the story... Yeah. Like four, I love a good story game, but realistically, it's fewer than twenty percent yeah. is pushing it. Is that, that insane? A little high, because I would say like three, maybe three games a year, something like that. That seems high. This is the Game Informer <laughs> show for Christ's sake. What? This is damning for the entire industry. Imran, what's your number? I, I mean, it depends. Like things I think are good, maybe like two games a year, but ones I actually get involved in, probably like ten. Ten. Yeah. Because so you well, think- yeah. Y- you know what, because, like, I will get engaged in something that I don't necessarily consider as a good story. Is that a, That's, like, a weird thing. But I, w- I will want to see it to its conclusion, but I, okay. it's not necessarily, like, a great story with good writing. Sure. But I'm engaged, and I want to see it that's through. That's a fair point. Yeah. Right. Jesus. 
just, I don't know, I think of like all the little games I play on Steam and stuff like that, where it's like, okay, I'm going to go through the dialogue and read it, but I'm not really going to care about where this is going ultimately. Right. Well, I'm just thinking about, I finished Guacamelee 2 recently, I'm just oh, thinking okay. about that, I'm like, that story was like fun and lighthearted, but I didn't really, I don't consider it like a great story. But right. Yeah, to yeah, Kyle's so. point, like I was invested enough to read the dialogue and I kind of wanted to know what the end was going to be. Wow. Well, maybe. We'll Where's the... Something. Pixel models for a guacamole. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> Maybe we'll learn something about Spider-Man in the game club coming up. Yeah. Maybe there's something to discuss on this topic. Okay, here we go. Here's a real question. Uh, okay, Devin from Rochester, Minnesota here, God's Country, says, Hey, GI crew, recently, a co-worker and myself will often discuss your publication and new video games. <laughs> Sorry, that's a funny way of phrasing it. Had a game <laughs> idea that we thought was a real banger, a real humpty banger. He says, so our green light team, oh, so be our green light team and listen All to right. the pitch. All right, here's the pitch. This is really, like, All right. patently stupid from Jack Okay, Fox. so this is a dangerous, like, <laughs> like, do we want to open the floodgates for everyone's game ideas? Yes. Uh, by the way, setting it up, this is a pitch I have also daydreamed about for a long time. All okay. Right. The game is called, stay with me, Oregon Trail. The developer is Bethesda Game Studios. Engine, Unreal. Wait, they write Unreal and then parentheses followed for. I don't think followed for is Unreal, but whatever. Something in that vein. Okay, Okay, so it's a first-person open-world RPG with a twist that the goal is to reach the West Coast with your map on the right side disappearing at your pace. But once that area is gone, you cannot return. This is specific. Okay. You must battle hunger, thirst, disease, bandits, wildlife, etc. The wagon or band of wagons is your mobile base, and the difficulty can be raised or lowered by the amount of children in your family. Like real life. <laughs> Uh, the map will be partially procedurally generated with set pieces like the old game, like the old games had, like Chimney Rock, Mississippi River, military forts. A final score can be attained with cutscenes when arriving at the West Coast, or you can just roam the Midwest. Other talking points include <laughs> talking points for this mixed game, building mechanics for when winter arrives or when you decide to stay, hunting and crafting for survival, hardcore mode with a single save, permanent family member deaths, woof, a zombie mode DLC with fully working Winnebago. Choose your morality by gaining all. By gaining all by proper means, or just murder and pillage your way to the West. Discuss amongst yourselves, and we will take cash or check. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Devin and Josh. What's the release date for this? Uh, he's actually working on it for later this year, so okay. I think it's the green light. <laughs> uh, Bethesda is going to rush over to it, make it happen. I do love that idea. I don't know if it's Bethesda in particular, but I would love to see an RPG-focused take on Oregon Trail. Just an RPG where the goal is get to the West, and I love the procedural generation aspect of it. So do you want the Oregon Trail, like theme like old west frontiersmen yeah or would it matter if it was like fantasy setting i don't want fantasy no one likes fantasy go no, to the old buddy, get out make of it here. licensed oregon trail okay it would sell one gazillion copies one gazillion one gazillion yes i feel like trying to sell bethesda on the idea of no one likes fantasy might not work out well <laughs> <laughs> well look, you don't have to mention that part as we as we court them to try and make them the developer for this so game. it's like it's like a long like it's a survival game where you're, instead of, like, trying to survive in one location, you're just always moving. You're always forced to kind of move yes. forward. Yep, That's yep. And the terrain yeah, would be tough. Uh, I don't think Oregon Trail gets enough credit in general, maybe because it's a Minnesota thing. Um, but, like, 1971 is the first version of Oregon Trail. Didn't it invent the rogue genre in some way? It's like a run-based game. Why is it not given its due? Well, oh, can you say any game that doesn't have saving is a rogue, basically? No, I would not say that. <laughs> So we should call them all Oregon Lakes? <laughs> is it too much to ask? Yeah, all right. please. Uh, the game Far Lone Sails yeah. is about, it's not like, it's not a survival game, it's like a puzzle game, but you are in a vehicle moving comp, like to the right, and you have to maintain your vehicle and move it and That's make it right. all the way to I the I played end. that, yeah. So, well, I was going to say Banner Saga had some elements of that too, oh. where you were moving across a landscape and you had to like collect supplies and manage your people. Yeah, it's inherently oh. difficult just to create new environments for that type of movement, yeah. but there's some way to do it. Get Hello Games on this thing. Come on, here we go. <laughs> uh, let's see. Exit Dusk says, Hello, crew. As a long-time gamer, I've played a lot of superhero games. Even Superman 64. It took three months of therapy to get over that one. <laughs> uh, and many have stated that this is one of the best superhero games out there next to the Arkham games. He's talking about Spider-Man here. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we'll talk about it next. My question is, what superhero deserves a video game? And what would you think... What do you think would make it work? My thoughts are with Ant-Man and the Wasp. I think it'd be an awesome game with the shrinking and expanding going on, especially when it comes to combat. What superhero needs their own game at this point? Who's dying out for it? I like his idea of Ant-Man of the Lost. I didn't even think about that. So does this have to be a character that hasn't had a 
game yet? Yeah, maybe not necessarily. Or not a great game. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, because I was the thing of Thor. Like, I like Thor a lot. And especially with God of War that just came out earlier this year. Like, yeah. it's kind of ripe for that that style of combat, that sort of setting and world. Am I just thinking of the Captain America game? There was a Thor game not too long ago, There was right? a Thor there game. Was. There was a yeah. Captain America game. But there was also... I, yeah. Yeah. I played that I, Thor game to completion. I was I reviewed it freelance pre Game Informer. It was not really? good. No, it was bad. Was, yeah. it, was it based on the movie? I think yeah. it was around the Dark World. Right? Oh, was it the oh, first good, one. I don't know, but it was. I mean, it followed like the plot of the first film with a lot of. Uh, it was around the first game. like exaggerated elements. Oh, that super fun plot where there, for a large section of it, he didn't have his powers and was desperate to get the yeah. hammer back. Well, okay. in the game, it's like a prequel. I he think. goes to a bunch of different worlds. Yeah. yeah so. Oh, that's kind of cool. It was also early. It was right when stereoscopic 3D was like the thing. So it was like that was one of its like major selling points in the front of the box. Yeah. It's like you can play this game in 3D. That's good. And you'll benefit in no way there <laughs> from is, doing so. There's a weird period of like early MCU video games. Remember, they're like. Two different Iron Man games. One of them was on yes. the Wii, I believe. By Sega. By Sega. What a weird time that was in the yeah. industry. Another so, superhero that I think would probably even sell better than Thor is Wonder Woman. And it just yeah. seems like that's mm. one that, like, her seems like a no brainer at this point. Like, well, in, yeah. in the recent film, like, her movement abilities of being able to, like, jump really far, but not fly. Because I don't, I don't really want to fly in a video game as a hero. I know you're, like, giving me a weird look. No, I get it. But, like, being able to jump around at, like, you know, leap over buildings. You wanted John Carter. Carter it. Yeah. Yeah. John Carter's not a comic book guy, but that would be a cool game. Sure. Learn how to use power, your powers. See you, Wonder Woman. We got John <laughs> Carter on our side. Forget now. that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everyone. What were you going to say? I was going to say, like, to Kyle's point of there are certain powers that make for good video games so that don't. The reason why, like, Spider-Man and Batman work is because they're kind of stronger humans. And they don't necessarily, like, run ripshot. Like, you can't have a game where Iron Man's blasting through buildings because that's too much work. So, like, for me, a good example would be the current Miss Marvel would be a really good game. Does she... Can she fly? She, can she fly. cannot yeah, fly. She, she can just fly. stretches and makes her fist bigger. Well, I mean... Oh, oh sorry. I missed that Miss Marvel. Yeah, I was thinking Captain Marvel. Yeah, not yeah. Captain Marvel because yeah, yeah, that yeah. runs into the same problem like a Superman game would have. Right. Yeah. Wait. No, I think you're right. That would be kind of cool. She has, like, these stretchy powers. And she can get big and small. What? Or, like, stretch kind of like Mr. Fantastic and, like, create shapes out of her body. Jeez. But she's more creative than uh, Mr. Fantastic is. So it's like a Green Lantern, Mr. Fantastic mix where it's just, like, different shapes and stuff? Or is that not as... Yeah, she's not creating new things out of nothing. Like Green okay. Lantern, but she's creating shapes out of her body. Like, her fists will get gigantic and smash people. Something Weird. like that. Okay. And, and she makes sense references while she does it. All right, that seems okay. Do you read a lot of comics, everyone? I read very few. I get most of my comic like knowledge by like osmosis so like when people are talking about it near me then i can i understand what they're talking about okay Wait, well, do you holding like... the newspaper over his face listening uh-huh. <laughs> do you do you like miss marvel because you share a last name yes <laughs> oh is that really a thing like, yeah she, she's a like pakistani like muslim superhero and i think that's super cool yeah she's cool what's her name kamala, kamala khan. khan wow there we go uh, Stuart Blessman writes in and says, Hello, GI crew. I enjoyed watching Andrew Reiner's Twitch stream of Spider-Man and PlayStation 4. It looked like a pretty fun game. But without KG Reiner and others have been about the story, I'm guessing it's going to suffer... Uh, suffer. I'm guessing it's going to suffer right now. Mm. I'm guessing it's going to suffer from what other comic book-based video games have suffered from, a non-original villain. Every developer seems to just use their favorite villain from that hero's stable of villains rather than create something new and unique. So my question is, when was the last time a video game developer created a brand new villain for a comic book superhero to face? Who was it, and what made them memorable? P.S. Arkham Knight does not count. Mm. When you had us prepped for the story, I didn't, or question, I didn't know we had to come up with someone who was memorable. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't have to be memorable. That's not part of it. There was, a, there, was a, there was another Batman game pre-Arkham called Sinzu that mm. had a... Sinzu was oh, a that's fully right. original villain created by Jim Lee for Batman. Uh, and I think, I think a novel came out with the game to be like, Get ready! This is the new big Batman villain, really? and it was just a total bomb. Like nobody. What cares. was Sinzu's deal? I don't even know. He was. I. I think he was just like a kind of like a yakuza style gang leader or something. Okay. And he just totally dropped off the map after the game came out because it wasn't yeah. the game wasn't a hit. So, right. So I, right. Yeah. I, to his point, though, is like he seems to think it's bad that they're using real villains from comics yeah. in the the games, which I don't know. Like, isn't that? You want to play the game starring the hero, but you don't want to see their villains? Like, that just seems a little weird to me. Like, usually I want to see what kind of... You'd be bummed out if they made a new character? Uh, not totally bummed out, but it just feels like... I don't know. These characters have been around for 50-plus years in 
in many cases. So yeah. it's like the chances of you creating a new character from scratch that can compete with these legacy characters is is pretty slim, I think. I know he says Arkham Knight doesn't count, and maybe it's just because of like the reveal then or something, but I feel like that's worthy of a discussion in some way here, right? I Well, the way they pitched it and the way... I don't know. It's spoilery. How do yeah, don't you know, don't reveal like anything specific, but just the way they use that character is is unique enough, right? Yeah. So I feel like it should count. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it was worth naming the game after, but yeah, yeah sure. I, I, I don't think I necessarily liked that character in that game, but <laughs> I'm just saying fight like, was not yeah. fun. Yeah. Uh, I had one other one, which maybe Imran, you might be able to help me out because you're you're you like Steven Universe, right? Mm-hmm. The recent attack. The Light, or maybe it was Save the Light, whatever the most recent Steven yeah. Universe RPG was, it had a completely original antagonist. Uh, and she was cool. I okay. liked her. There we go. I, I, don't, yeah, not, I don't remember the name. Not enough to remember her name. Out. Yeah. It's everything you but need to know. But I did like her. Perfect. All right, Leo, look alive, brother. Uh, Elias Roman writes in and says, Hello, GI crew. My jaw dropped <laughs> when you were referencing the soundtrack in Parappa the Rapper because a long time ago I was introduced to Bus Driver a very interesting artist who happens to rap over the same melody. <laughs> that song that Turtles Have Short Legs. Oh, really? Yeah, this is this is Bus Driver rapping over the piano from Turtles Have Short Legs, which is also then ripped off and used in Parappa. Take it away, Leo! Because as much as I think we all like Parappa the Rapper, I like Parappa the Rapper a lot. It's you can't like, really rap. It's not good <laughs> rapping. <laughs> right, so to yeah. hear like what are good beats from Parappa the Rapper with good rapping on top of it, like I want to yeah. hear the whole soundtrack like that yeah. now. You know? Oh, they need to do like the Hamilton mixtape, but just for Parappa yes. songs to get like a <laughs> yeah. bunch of different rappers doing it. Oh, I would love that. That'd be amazing. Come on, rappers, get out there. Get on it. Get on it, rappers. Yeah. Go do something for a change. <laughs> Chris Bynum writes in and says, "Guys, That's awesome. when your podcast loads to my phone." The picture is for something called Conversations with Rare Woman. Hilarious. <laughs> what? I don't know what that is or why the feeds would have crossed. But have you guys ever had those weird glitches where just like it'll load in a different image for your podcast or something? Like, uh, probably. Uh, not that I've noticed. I have a weird thing where... You? Yep. Where, like, this girl that I met once, like, eight years ago, for some reason when I added Tim Turry into my contacts and my phone... Her picture, like, auto-filled or, like, put itself into Tim's context. So it's still just, like, this random girl's face, like, on her graduation day with a big cap, like, graduation cap for Tim every time he yeah. calls. But Very you can't strange. really tell the difference, so that's yeah, what that's right. Yeah. I don't recognize Tim when I see him now. Anyways, I hope you like Conversations <laughs> with Rare Woman today. Um, Ch- Jordan writes in and says, hey, everyone. Jordan Bay is from Indiana here. Hope you're all here and having a great start to September. We're all here, Jordan. Well... One out of two. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what game series do you think will be the next to finally hit it big in the U.S. after so many attempts? It finally happened to Yakuza in 2017, and then Monster Hunter in 2018. What series will be next? Mm. <laughs> All right, this uh, is a good one. Imran, I feel like you can knock it out of the park with this question. This is your cup of tea. Oh, yeah. The thing is, there's kind of none left. Like, those are the last ah! two really big ones, and then everything else is now just coming over. Like, yeah. In previous years, the idea of something like, say, Zonky Zero coming over would be insane, but now, like, there's enough localizers and enough attention being brought to an international scene that, like, now that Yakuza's big, now that Monster Hunter's big, that there's kind of, like, no real big standout stuff that's Japan only anymore. Well, other than, like, Mother 3. Uh, well, okay, there's games sure. that have been, like, there's currently releasing games. Yeah. games or something yes, like. totally, yeah, for, like, sequelized stuff that's happening all the time over there. So I, I had one that's, I, I think it applies, and I hope Imran will back me up on this. Uh, one Piece is huge in Japan, right? It's like the yes. biggest manga, biggest anime over there, but really has never found its audience over here in a big, in a substantial way. Obviously, okay. there are fans of One Piece. Um, but I, I, I am hopeful, and I think, that the next game, uh, World Seeker, right, Imran? Yes. I, I am very optimistic about the game. I think it looks really, really cool to the point that, like, I think it, if it's good, it will, like, 
have make, uh, create a surge around One Piece. I think. What it kind of a, game is it? It is an open world game where you get to use Luffy's like stretch powers to travel and like. Um, it, it almost looks like Arkham because you're actually on like a prison island. <laughs> it's like so. It's like an Arkham style. You even have like a detective vision and stuff like that. Oh wow! But then like the, it kind of plays like MGS Five. Yeah, like Imran has actually what? played it, so he should he should you should tell us a little more about it because you've actually touched it. I'm only like looking at trailers and stuff. I mean, it, it's a straight up like a stealth action game where you're encouraged to stealth stuff. Otherwise, things get a little too chaotic, and it starts like it doesn't really kill you, but it kind of blasts you off past where you're making progress and. When you get you get into like very traditional kind of actually Metal Gear style boss fights, that I like I only got like a maybe twenty minutes with the game, but I really enjoyed what I played. Yeah. And I'm like if they can tighten up those controls and they can make the game just like sing with a little bit more polish, it's going to be actually really incredible. Yeah, and like what they've shown in trailers that really has me excited is like you know those when we first saw Spider Man like swinging through the city. Yeah, they're showing stuff like Luffy using his stretching abilities to like fling himself over the open world and stuff Ooh. like that. I, I'm really excited for it. I okay. think it could be really cool. Is, is it uh, is it Cyber Connect or who's making this thing? Mm, it's not, uh, it's not Cyber Gen Connect. Barion, yeah. who made like the Jump Superstars games on DS. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah, so not Strange. like not like a really exciting dev behind it, but everything yeah. they've shown of it looks cool. Mm. And Imran mm. liked what he played. Nice. So. This right. is a little bit different, but I was thinking about uh, Grand Blue Fantasy, which is a big yes. mobile RPG over in Japan, and uh, Platinum now is making like an action RPG called. Grand Blue Fantasy colon Project Relink, but yes. maybe it'll just be those Platinum fans that are into it. But if like Grand Blue is ever going to make a pretty big splash in the states, the idea of like this action RPG from Platinum releasing a game here that could do it, right? Maybe Japanese. Let's talk about that in ten days. In yeah. ten days, have ten you played days it? Is when the embargo on that expires. Yes. Have you played it? Uh, I've touched it. Yeah, touched it. All right, ten days from now, He's let's find out if it's one hundred percent correct prediction <laughs> is happening. <laughs> You should ask. They have him. already announced an American release for that, though, so it is coming. Oh, great! Okay, fantastic. You should ask him the same question too. In like two weeks, when she gets back from TGS, like, what? <laughs> what are the biggest games yeah, at like that the show? Yeah, yeah. What, what embargoes can you spoil for us? Uh, <laughs> no, what were the biggest games from that show that would never get any attention at PAX? Mm. Right. Yeah. Right. It's a good question. Yeah, that's always fun to see. Um, okay, this is Francis from San Diego. Wow. Uh, hello, GI Crew. The interview with Jeremy Saucier last week and exploring the Strong Museum of Play is one of the best features GI's ever had. Wow. That is very kind. People... <laughs> just the interview? I don't know. There were like there was a crowd that okay. was really into that interview in particular, which People is like great to hear. Two Bens instead of just one Ben performing an interview. So. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. Um, Jeremy hated us. <laughs> yeah. He could not stand as soon as we got off We mic. should just interview yeah. each other sometime. <laughs> we should really drive this thing home. It's like, you guys are full of yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah. Jeremy was great. Anyways, uh, Francis says there is also discussion about a possible Game Informer exhibit. This was a joke hypothetical. Uh, and how it helps the game culture in many ways. Uh, that said, if there were to be a Game Informer exhibit at the Strong Museum of Play in Rochester, New York, what feature, items, videos, articles, people, would you like for the public to see? What comes to mind are articles, cover stories, reviews, live streams, Brian Shea's lunch, outfit, replays, <laughs> Pokemon Go experience, anything GI-related. What would go in that exhibit? Other than, like, an animatronic Andy to come yeah. over and wag his <laughs> finger at you. Well, we have all of our... We have a big room of stuff that we, we're we still sorting through. Mm -hmm. um, there's probably something cool in there. The, <laughs> Do you want to explain what you're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> we have a big room full of stuff <laughs> that we're talking yeah, through. No, we had... Um, oh, my gosh. Help me out with his name. Frank Zafaldi? Frank Zafaldi, yeah. thank you. On the podcast, talking a little bit about it, but he's come by GameFormer's office twice now, and he's going to come back in the future to help us sort through all of the preview code and review code of early games, going back to the 90s and stuff. Yeah. So that is that is the obvious thing, right. uh, if we ever get that fully understanded. I think it's it'd be silly just to like have, here's a desk and with a bunch of toys on it. <laughs> here's Miller's desk. Yeah, I don't know. That feels weird to me if uh -huh. it's like... Uh, Unless it's like... A cube of like formaldehyde and like Miller's floating in it, then that would be cooler. One well, I'm working on that. Yeah. <laughs> well, one thing I like, I'm not sure if it's a faux pas to mention it, but it's like a fascinating thing from some, like it predates my appearance at Game Informer, but the Rainbow Six cover has always been like a very interesting thing to me. Uh, ah, the, the Patriots games. cover, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. That'd yeah. be actually cool, like have a just a, a scene or like here's a set of like how you put covers together, especially some of those older covers. How we put those together? That could like be writing or the design? Or uh, about? the design of the actual cover art itself, slash like right. how a story comes together, kind of an it, exhibit yeah. on that. Would it's be always so fun. Like I don't always have access to this, 
but when I do, um, every once in a while you'll get like the raw Photoshop file or whatever file it is from the developer or publisher for Game of Thrones covers and like the Call of Duty one recently I have like a 700 meg wow. version of the cover and you can like turn off all the individual layers. It's so much fun to see that stuff. I love it. And see what they drew underneath his pants. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you would not believe. <laughs> oh. Blackout oh. indeed. <laughs> uh, turn off that layer. I was thinking for in terms of like the archives and stuff like that. We have something, which I want to do something with someday, but we have old audio recordings from, like, early 2000s from Cover Story Trips on, like, this old tape format. And so we have interviews with, like, Mark Cerny talking about Ratchet and Clank and stuff. Oh, that's cool. Just super early. Jack and Daxter. Uh, we also have the Hauser brothers explaining San Andreas for the first time to somebody from the outside. And oh, you get to hear cool. Matt Helgeson, like, react to them saying, we decided to build a full state, not just one city. And Helgeson's like, what, what? Well, well, you can hear his jaw hit the ground. What? Uh, wait, how do you have that? I just digitized it real quick because I wanted to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, well, how did you ever get access to it? You, that was it's, in the, it's, in, it's in the room with all the other oh, all right. crap you're talking about. Yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> the room with the stuff. Yeah, the room, oh, with, the stuff, room with the stuff, man. Yeah, oh, why did stuff. you just say that? It's filled with treasures. <laughs> oh, we also have a bunch of weird like standees and stuff. There's like a Pikmin. I think it's Pikmin One standee that's signed by Shigeru Miyamoto. It's on the set, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm sure people have noticed that signature long ago, so I'm sorry I brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's signed by, yeah, the best of Nintendo. It's super cool, yeah. There would be some odd things here and there. we got to get Kyle's daughter in there. In yeah. formaldehyde, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I don't know. Prefer you didn't, but, what are you, gonna you know, do? For, anyway, his, for the sake of history. You got it. Um, oh, Cody Clements writes in and says, Hello, crew. Cody from Vancouver, Washington here. I was wondering, how often do people at GI read the website and magazine? Does everyone have a pretty good idea of what everyone else is working on? Hail people. I mean, we all I think so. We all pretty much read yeah. the magazine in full because yeah. we edit it. Yeah, it? we have to edit it at the yeah. end of the month. I mean, sometimes you'll be out on a cover story or something and miss the editing phase, So, but I try to like go back and read it after the fact. Yeah, Imran, I imagine you're in the same camp as me where we don't edit that thing. And so do you just yeah, also we... just get an issue and it's like, what is this? This is filled with a bunch of articles from people I know. <laughs> I actually do read read through it, but like, yeah, we don't do any magazine editing, so it's always fun to actually get it in the mail and be like, oh, I didn't actually know that we were previewing this. Yeah. I'm kind of curious how this matches up to my own perspective. Yeah, for sure. Even it's very fun for me because I have no idea what <laughs> doing for the, uh, or whatever, whoever puts the feedback section together. <laughs> you that out. So then, so then seeing like, oh, and then like, look at the GI spies that he used, all that stuff. That's fun. Is that an intentional slip-up? <laughs> no, but he said he didn't care. So uh, very smooth. Anyways, uh, John from Branson, Missouri says, Greetings, G informants. I've been listening to an old gaming podcast lately, 2006 with 2009, the golden age hmm. of video game podcasts, and oh, this, yeah. this right. humble podcast is mine. It got me wondering, what gaming event, from a journalism perspective, do you find the most fascinating in all of gaming history? This is a broad, interesting question. I think my pick has to be when Activision had bouncer types come and escort uh, Jason West and Vincent Pella from Infinity Board office. Uh, they're firing, the ensuing lawsuit, that whole saga with Call of Duty. Uh, Activision fired the heads of the most popular gaming franchise in the world in a very aggressive manner, and the news broke up as it was happening. Gersman Gate and the one apocalypse was also pretty ridiculous. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, those are two biggies. It's, uh, it's interesting that he focuses on the press for the last bit there, but what do you guys think? What's the most fascinating little tidbit uh, from gaming history here? A recent one for me is just the Half-Life 3 stuff. Uh, oh, yeah. Like, it, maybe it's not like the biggest of all time, but it's kind of similar to the Call of Duty where it's like the biggest... I mean, honestly, like maybe arguably the most a- anticipated piece of vaporware, frankly, of, of all time is like Half-Life 3. What is Half-Life 3? Does it exist? What will it be? Yeah. And we essentially got it in like a blog post like it was just the weirdest thing to me you remember know where some people in the office didn't think that was important or meaningful at all and yes, it was very frustrating I talking about that. that but yeah that that blows my mind still today that that ha- that half-life 3 essentially happened that You're way right. you know that was amazing that's a good yeah. call it's cool that it's out I, I, the <laughs> it's cool they released <laughs> half-life 3 yeah i'm glad i finally got to read it <laughs> uh i was gonna say like when um when bioware got bought by ea Felt kind of like a big deal at the mm, time. Huh. Okay. And, and it was interesting because we had just done an interview with the doctors, and we were like for the magazine, like and like the next day they announced they were by. I was like, well, that would have been nice to know. Oh like, come on, doctor. Yeah. So we had to go back and like try to reschedule an interview. But 
maybe it feels a little more important because of that, but like I think that was a big deal because yeah. Bioware was one of like the big, especially back then. I think right. Bioware had a little more cachet in terms of purchases. I mean, I don't think we really think about it this much because they still feel somewhat, somewhat distinct, even though it's it's merging. But obviously, like Activision buy, buying Blizzard, that was a that was well, a huge day as well. Yeah, that was a big deal. I think it was like over a weekend or something. Uh, uh, Facebook that, buying uh, Oculus was, was that was weird. Pretty weird. Yeah. Um, one that I don't feel like I've paid enough attention to, but really thinking about it, it's like, that is an interesting moment in gaming history. And as it was happening, it was like, oh, I'll skim a news story. But just the entire saga of Dota 2 and, like, Blizzard taking Valve to court, that you have, like, two of probably the greatest game developers of all time, like, in a legal confrontation about this bizarre fan-made mod and the fact that Blizzard just lost out and then Valve gets to make one of the biggest games in the world as a sequel to kind of sort of a Blizzard game. It's such a bizarre saga. Imran, were you following that closely? I was following it pretty closely, yeah, and it's still, like, it's not necessarily ongoing in a legal sense, but, like, there is still a lot of community talk about who really owns Dota, and the fact that there's not a very clear legal answer to that is amazing to me for something that that's it's that highly prized, and that brings up that much revenue. Yeah, I, that's probably a good special edition podcast someday to try and dive into that, exactly the full saga there, if we can talk to anybody. I mean, like, we still kind of have a modern version of that with, like, Fortnite and PUBG going on, and, like, I don't know what either of them are really doing at this point, because, like, there, there was that thing where PUBG did sue Epic right. to try, like, over certain things, and honestly, they, like, on the outset, it didn't look, it looked like sore loser, but they might have had a case, really, but they pulled away because of the actual PR implications of it, but the idea of, like, from the timeline of, Brendan Green goes to Epic to say, hey, I need this, or I need these changes to the engine so we can make this game work. And Epic then just making their own Battle Royale game from those changes. Like, that is honestly one of the biggest stories of the last couple of years. Yeah, yeah. And now with Blackout, I feel like they must just realize, like, all right, cat's out of the bag. What are you going to do? Yeah. You think yeah. there's going to be another round of lawsuits? I don't think there'll be another round of lawsuits. I think what their plan is, that they launched that fixed PUBG thing about a month ago. Yeah. That is how they plan to retain players and hope that they don't leap to Call of Duty or Battlefield. Yeah. Boy, that's going to be tough. What stands out to you, Imran? In terms of journalistic stuff? or Sure. Yeah, what do you see as the biggest story, other than the Fortnite PUBG thing? The death of Satoru Iwata was yeah. a huge one, because it was huh. very interesting seeing a, a journalistic community that's not used to writing obituaries, especially from a very, like, community-focused uh, public face. Yeah. Like, actually try and grip that. And, like, you could actually see in the community and even among the press the state of acceptance and denial and bargaining and all of that stuff. Yeah, that's a that's a really good one. Everyone just pulled back like that one quote where he said that first I'm a, I'm a yeah. gamer and all that stuff. Yeah. There were like the go-to references and everybody talked about his involvement in Pokemon Gold and Silver. Hmm. Even though then at Game Freak when we asked him about that, they're like, eh, not so much. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little confusing. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually, I was one of those people in Ron that wrote the obituary when it happened and it was. It was, it was like surprising and I I didn't really know how to react initially it was it was mm -hmm. it was strange yeah good question John uh, Caleb from Dayton Ohio says dear GI crew holy hell am I excited <laughs> I just learned that Crystal Chronicles is getting remastered on the Nintendo switch <laughs> Did final this just come in today because I haven't even written that story yet. uh I yeah it just came in today I'm sure it's okay. switch. Or, yeah I thought it was just on PS4 no PS4 and switch okay good but uh, what's he excited about <laughs> I'm not sure if you guys are excited or if I'm one of the few nerds out there that flipped their lid when the announcement got leaked. I do have an actual question here, though. How do you think the split screen will be implemented? Personally, I could see Nintendo using their iPhone app for that GBA screen. Thoughts? I, I, I don't, don't think know. that's going to happen, man. I don't think they're going to put that much effort. That, that, would, that would be crazy to have the full second uh, screen you experience. You really didn't need the GBA for that game. Like, you could uh, easily have put all that information on the screen. What was on the GBA? Do you remember? It's the, it, like the menus. So basically, your own internal menus are on the GBA screen. Yeah, you can just pause it and probably pull that up. Yeah. I'm excited. I've always wanted to play Crystal Chronicles, and I bet when it comes out on the Switch, everyone will be playing it for it the first time. It'll such a it's pain. really good. I Really? To an extent. What? Are you sure? <laughs> okay. I remember <laughs> liking it a lot, because <laughs> there was a... Like, it had a very nice, like, Celtic kind of feel that no other Final Fantasy game at that time hit. Okay. And... Like, as Final Fantasy was going more sci-fi with 7 and 8, like, this is a nice return to the old fantasy thing. And the actual final level was very cool. Mm. I have different memories of it. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was such a pain to, like, get 
first of all, four players together. I don't even think yeah. I ever got four. I think I got three yeah. people together. Sorry. And you have to, yeah, I know. And I only have two other friends. But <laughs> you have to, like, have your, like, GBA uh-huh. and all the chords and the game and the, and the GameCube, right? Yeah. I yeah. think it's GameCube. Yeah. So it was just a pain to put all that stuff together. And then I thought the game was just kind of like, okay. Yeah, but after all that effort, you have to convince yourself that it's great. I know, yeah. A lesser mind might convince himself. Right. <laughs> like everyone, everyone that climbs Mount Everest then has to say, oh, the view's good. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it was worth all that pain and suffering. They made another one. Yeah, a sequel for Wii. Was that what it was? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, was, it was not on Wii. It was on DS, right? I, I'm leaning DS, uh, too. Uh, all right. I want to say it was called Ring of Fates. There's no way of knowing. I'm going to come. We're going to figure this out. I'm pretty sure it's Wii. I would put down 50. There was a, no, the Wii game called Crystal Bears that is in the same universe. That wasn't a sequel? Exactly oh, that, that's the same universe. Right. Come on. Hang on. Same so universe? the actual sequel sequel of like the same kind of action RPG is DS, but the same universe as Crystal Bears on Wii. <laughs> All right. I guess I didn't even need to look it up. Uh, Aaron, you just got it, man. Uh, you want to repeat that for your edit? <laughs> but there was no edit, Kyle. Oh, 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 no. Hey, do you guys remember World of Final Fantasy from a couple years ago? <laughs> yeah. No one no. talked about that. It was a it was a fine RPG that they really well. It just completely flew under the radar. It was one where you, like you stacked the different characters yeah. together. Some Pokemon, There's, like multiple stuff different in there. chibi art styles. Wait, am I thinking of the same one? It's on the phone. No, no, it was a console that? game. I think okay. Joe Vita as well. Oh wait, I do remember that. Yeah, because I remember like, Dan Tack. Dan Tack lost his mind. Or yes, as much as Dan Tack does lose a mind. <laughs> right, lose one mind. Yeah, he he's like, oh, I'm really excited about that. And then he repeats it. And then you have to go, are you serious? serious. Uh, You're you're not kidding. No, I'm not joking around. He said he was more excited about that than 15, because they came out like pretty close to each other. Oh, that's funny. That was so weird. Also, the director of that game, uh, we interviewed him while out there on the cover story trip, and it was a a very fun example of him just having some crazy history where he's like, yeah, I worked on Final Fantasy VII. Yeah, I animated Yuffie and Vincent. It's like such a weird specific thing. I'm like, that's awesome. I love their animations, I think. Yeah, oh, <laughs> yep. when she did that thing? Well, Yuffie does have that very distinct animation. Remember, she was, yeah. like, punches rapidly a couple times. I, I takes the wind out of you. I wasn't quite sure what she was doing with that. No one knows. <laughs> thing. Well, yeah. if only there, you could have asked somebody. <laughs> By the way, great animations, but what were those? <laughs> what? Nice what? giraffe. Oh, it's an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a World of Final Fantasy <laughs> release date. <laughs> Uh, Mason Cowell from Chattanooga, Tennessee, woo woo, says, Hey, Ben and friends, my question today is, if you could take one game and completely change its graphics to something else, what would you choose? For example, what's that? <laughs> that's a oh, Jump Force, that's great. For example, I'm loving Into the Breach right now, and I love the pixel graphics, but I would also love to watch the mechs and bugs fight it out with incredible modern graphics and animations. <laughs> what about you? Hmm, so weird. I was going to say, I'll probably get... Crucified, but uh, Minecraft was a, what a game that I about? don't particularly like the art style for. I know everybody loves it, but that voxel look just looks kind of gross to me. Wow. That is, have we all answer, just convinced actually. ourselves that Minecraft is a good looking game because yes. it's so distinct and stylish? But like, Notch wasn't an artist, he was just winging it. Yeah, I think it was, it was, he designed it that way on purpose, obviously, because it was easier, and I'm not going to. You know, I'll give him some slack for that. Yeah. You well, do it's what also you do. Like, forget easy. It's just it's clarity. Well, it's like when you only deal functionally with cubes, right. of course you need to make everything cubes. Right. So leave them alone. But you would prefer yeah. even like the Dragon Quest Builders art style. Oh something yeah. Something cleaner that would also have that same effect. Yeah, one hundred percent. Minecraft too. Yeah, that's right. It's coming. Come on, bring it on. Did you guys see? I don't know where it was, but at some point Miyamoto was interviewed or gave a presentation in the last couple months, and he talked more about. Uh, Minecraft, which is always fascinating, but the story came out a little while ago that he was commenting on Minecraft, and he said, oh, we were experimenting with a block game on the N64. But in this interview now, he says, like, ah, oh, we didn't really know what it was going to be. It could have been a racing game. Like, we were just experimenting with building blocks oh. as a foundational aspect of games for the N64. But then he had a weird line where he said, he said, I really wish Minecraft would have been made in Japan. Oh, uh, weird. weird. That's an interesting take. Well, you know, I mean, the very first version of Zelda was people building like dungeons for each other. Oh, for them to that's explore, right. Okay, which always felt kind of like Minecrafty to me. Basically, Minecraft. He also said, I, probably in the same presentation or whatever, that one of the reasons they were like, like prepared to go forward with Breath of the Wild being dual analog mm-hmm. was because kids play Minecraft, and they're like, okay, oh, fine. Wow. Kids, kids clearly understand how to do oh, dual analog. We don't need to simplify the camera controls for them, which I thought yeah. was kind of cool. Super fun. Uh, do you guys have art styles in mind that you want changed? 
Now's your chance. No, they're all perfect. Did you guys like the art style? I like the graphics, but the art style in the Arkham games was sometimes yeah. a oh, little too bulky you know and a little bit too, like, sexy. Like, yeah, like, too edgy. Yeah, yeah. that's the problem. They're too, Batman was too sexy. <laughs> I was like, tone it down. <laughs> <laughs> Come Batman. on. That's actually, that's actually a good idea, because they are very bulky, muscular. Everyone is, like, super bulky and muscular. Yeah. It would be cool to have a little bit more streamlined and it, not quite as, you know, like more, more like animated series kind of look. Or something. Oh yeah. my gosh, yeah, yeah for sure. Good. Just redo everything with the animated series aesthetic. Cause they, you could, like Rise of Shinzu. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> do, do, do a classic. I think in Arkham City you could have the skin for Batman himself yeah. where you could have the animated look, but right. you could change the world. Yeah. yeah. Eric from Hudson, Michigan says, hello, Ben. Hello. Uh, I've been a huge fan of Pokemon since day one, spending hundreds of hours with each game, but I've always had trouble accepting the concept of Pokeballs. I know the developers have explained that Pokemon like being in the balls, but come on! The idea that this legendary, majestic Pokemon is now trapped inside a ball for all time seems insane, and when I farm eggs in the hopes of hatching a shiny Pokemon, I will have hundreds of Pokemon sitting in boxes that will never see the light of day. I cannot accept this, so I've replaced the game's explanation with my own. Uh, Pokeballs are actually teleportation devices that warp the Pokemon to you from wherever they are in the world. They enjoy the normal life uh, that had them doing whatever they like, and when called upon by the trainer, they get zapped there immediately. The act of catching is the Pokemon deciding that they respect you as a trainer and are agreeing to the teleportation terms. Mm. So ha- what happens when you first capture them? Because it's teleporting them somewhere, right? Where does it spit them out to? The first time you Oh, I see. Them. The uh, farm upstate. It's just like directly behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Never turn around. Yeah, just don't turn around and keep on walking. It's like Oregon Trail, man. You're, on a, you're straight ahead, <laughs> Route 22. Here we go. Uh... Yeah. I think that'll work because what have they said, Kyle? It's like, oh, it's like it's cozy. They like them. being in there. They said, yeah, but with being very vague, you know. It's probably like Doctor Who. It's like bigger in there, bigger on the inside, right? I think so yeah, too. And I think they go into a pleasant coma. Personally, you think it's like a drug thing? Where they're like getting zapped in the brain. It just pauses their life. It's just <laughs> you know what probably has polluted all of our minds with this concept is like the idea of the Pokeball. It's basically, it's a genie. It goes back what thousands of years. Of yeah. 101 Nights, or whatever the hell that story is. Um, and, but I think, like, Aladdin specifically, how much the genie complained about being in the lamp, I bet mm. if that wasn't part of pop culture, nobody would feel bad for these Pokemon. Him being like, oi, and all that stuff, it polluted all of our minds. Huh. Huh. I mean, it's like a cat case, but smaller. Right. Has there ever been a genie Pokemon? Genie-looking Pokemon? Uh, yeah, yes. I forgot the name. It's, I think, 5th Gen. Is it? Well, yeah, even like right. the pre-evolution for Jinx, I don't know. Mm, I don't know. We don't talk about Jinx. <laughs> well, they it's still canon. Uh, <laughs> Sam from Inver Grove Heights, Minnesota. Hello. Uh, hey, GI crew. Uh, do you guys have relatives who don't understand your love of video games? Have you ever been able to get them to understand why? I don't understand why a lot of non-gamers view playing games as a waste of time, but reading books, appreciating art at museums, or watching sports is an acceptable use of your time. I'm glad he said watching sports because those first two were kind of hard. Appreciating art at museums, <laughs> I don't know. Looking into the eyes of your loved ones, <laughs> having kids, uh, <laughs> going game. to the moon. I mean, games. <laughs> games just take longer, right? Generally, I don't know. There's a lot of people wasting a lot of time watching a lot of bad shows on Netflix. Oh, yeah. it's true. I mean, I put it up there with with yeah, watching TV or movies. Like it's a hobby, but it's also like a form of leisure entertainment. And like any leisure entertainment, you can do it too right. much, and maybe that's a bad thing. But right. And look, 95% of the stories are bad. But still, yeah, but still <laughs> come on. Guys. It's a worthy medium. Yeah. No, I think it's fun. Yeah, it's... And it's Hang on, stop. Wait, you on the record? what was the original question? <laughs> hey, go, no, 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 no. Hanson, this cannot go anywhere. <laughs> Games are fun. This cannot go anywhere. Uh, <laughs> the question is, why do people not put it in those terms? I had a, a case recently where I was talking with a dear, dear old friend of mine that I love very dearly. Uh, but uh, I was explaining why I needed to get back into the Twin Cities instead of staying at home over the weekend and stuff. And I said, well, I got to go back because we do this thing. It's kind of like a book club, but it's for games. I need to get to a certain point in Spider-Man so I can talk about it in the game club. And when I said it's a book club but for games, this young, hip lady just goes, oh, no. Like, <laughs> was just, like, disgusting. But it's like, well, wait a minute. What's, what's the point of a any sort of club, like yeah. it's a good community. I mean, it's also a person who doesn't really know anything about games. She's played right? plenty of games, which is very but, frustrating. But I mean, but do you think that they understand that there's like 
there is a story being told. Yeah. Because like, I think yes. most most people who aren't super familiar with games just see this like loop of like you know they look at Fortnite. It's like it looks like you're doing the same thing constantly. No, you're not no. progressing at all. I hear you, but no, this person's hip enough. They know there's a all story right. in games. They just don't have a respect for it. There's some there's some weird disconnect that happens every once in a while. Weird. No, yeah, I haven't counted that too for sure. What are we gonna do? How do we change the world? Just make them play Limbo. <laughs> you know what's funny? What? One of the games I played. Uh, with my friend, uh, was Inside. We yeah. beat Inside together, so... Oh, that, cool. to me, and that didn't convert her. To me, that's the game that, like, if you... It, it is... it is Anyone can play it, and it is not... There's nothing embarrassing about that game for a non-gamer to play. I feel like I'd give that game to my dad, and he'd be like, wow, that was really impressive. Yeah. You know? Have I told you about baseball, though, son? <laughs> yes, that I was on a date oh. recently, and I was telling the person, like, I was playing near automata to them. Oh, and no. Because the idea of, like, okay... How would robots create God if there was no God? Check, like, please. That's a, that's a compelling thing to like think about. Uh-huh. But when you start it with, okay, so there's robots and there's androids. And they're like, <laughs> oh, God, this sounds so stupid. What am I saying? What has happened? Let's just order. Let's just order. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am in a very similar camera. I was trying to explain Final Fantasy VII. It's like, oh, what's it about? It's like, oh, um, here's what it's like. It's about... Uh, I don't know. His, name is, his name is Cloud, but his name doesn't have to be Cloud. You can change it to something. Yeah, they're environmentalists. That's cool, right? We talked about it for six hours on a podcast. Just go listen to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As we try to retrace Cloud's past in a coherent way. Um, but yeah, we'll change the world, Sam. Send him this episode of the podcast. Um, Chandler from Detroit says, hello. I'm sorry. Hi, Ben. Hans's son. I have a relative, a great, great, great grandpa or something from Norway or Sweden or whatever whose name was Hans Hansen. Oh, very wow. stupid. Anyways, uh, rest in peace, buddy. Uh, I'm in a situation <laughs> that most of you probably will never experience. Uh, I really would like to play Spider-Man, but I don't own a PS4. Maybe one day I will, but for now I do not. This wouldn't be too terrible of a problem to have if it weren't for the fact that this game seems to be all you guys want to talk about on the podcast. My question is, what do you guys think I should do? Should I listen to your Game Club discussion coming up soon on the podcast? And the possible spoiled content you release, or should it remain spoiler-free, despite the fact that it might be years before I eventually play this game? Years? Uh, I don't know. I'm of the camp that I should interrupt Kyle. No, not you. <laughs> so I'm going to keep talking. I keep talking first. Too much, Frank. Yeah. Uh, I'm of the camp that, like, spoilers aren't as big a deal as we tend to make them out to be. So, like, I don't know. Well, and other people have a different opinion and mm-hmm. can be wrong, but, like... If you're interested in a game, like, there's nothing wrong with, like, kind of absorbing some of that content and seeing, like, what is this exciting? And then if you're like, huh, I know enough, and I want to go in with more, with a little bit clean, uh, you can stop listening to our podcast. Yeah. What I'm saying is, like, start listening to the game club. And see how, how it tickles you? Yeah. How it tickles if you. it's really going to be years, and it's not going to be a thing of, like, six months from now I'm going to get a PlayStation 4, if it's going to be years, I'd say go ahead and listen to it. Right. It'll be a fun conversation. You'll feel a little bit more hip, a little bit more in the loop about specifically what this game is doing. And by the time you eventually play it, it'll be like a distant memory. You won't even yeah. remember any specifics. Trust me, this conversation coming up with the podcast is going to be forgettable as all hell. We guarantee that. Oh, 100%. Yeah, it'll be a good way to fall asleep at night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one, though. Well, I, I, like, I like trying to hold out, if I can. Yeah? That's Would you hold out for years, though? Yeah. I, I, I mean, if you I hold like, up past, like, the first three months, the zeitgeist is pretty much over, and you can, yeah. you're can you not going to run into spoilers randomly. That's true. Like, the first time I completed Chrono Trigger was when it released on DS, and yeah. it, I was very happy to have a lot of its major beats not spoiled for me. Mm. So, Like, you still haven't read your wedding vows, because you don't want to get <laughs> spoiled on how the marriage ends? Yeah. I just, <laughs> I just, yeah, why did you write about that in the vows, by the way? It was very, <laughs> it was refreshing. A, it was very difficult to write that <laughs> and not to be spoiled by it. <laughs> what do you guys like for of the week? Oh, I like the journalistic one, like the biggest event. Uh, I, yeah, that was I think good. that's a very good yeah. one. I completely agree. I also like, you know, games that might be coming to the West. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm completely with you. That is John from Branson, Missouri. Congratulations, Congrats, Branson. John. Everyone's favorite up on the big board. First time? First time. Hell yeah. Uh, for now, by the way, podcastgameformer.com for all of us. <laughs> We'd love to hear your thoughts. For now, let's, let's get spoiling Spider-Man. Let's right. get to it. Uh, so this is going man. to be spoilers for everything until the end of Act 1, which is a big political speech slash rally that or happens about four hours into the game. Or talking so. through that whole mission, right? To the through end that mission. sequence, yes, until you are playing again um, in a big way. So, without further ado, here is the first episode of the Spider-Man Game Club.
All right, here we go. Hello and welcome to the first installment of the Spider-Man Game Club. GI Game Club, that is. We're covering everything within the first act of Spider-Man. No bones about it. Everything up until the big political speech slash rally. I'm here. Leo Vader is here. Hey! Out of the booth, onto the table. Kerplat! Uh, Hanging in! Yeah! Then we have Ben Reeves. Here I am. Okay, we have Cyril Vasquez. Less than two <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> Definitely. All right, now let's get serious. Here's our last cast member. <laughs> you might remember him from SB2 Forsaken. That's okay. Right. Uh, Kyle's in the booth. Uh, Kyle, is this my camera? All right. Dear camera, I want to make some... Well, <laughs> I want to do a great job. Camera comedy. <laughs> Doing a great job, Kyle. Here's the thing. YouTube, people listening, we like Spider-Man. I have a feeling we're all going to like this game. We're not experts on comic books. Ben Reeves has read a lot of them. We're going to get things wrong. We're going to ask questions that I bet some people out there on the internet will say, that's the dumbest Spider-Man question I've ever heard in my life. Please forgive us for our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us, as Amen. Aunt May said, as Green Goblin flew through her window that one time, <laughs> which is very funny. Those eyes! Those horrible eyes! Oh, Do you scene. think comic nerds are the most, like, um, religious of, like, uh... Truthsayers. I thing. would say they're the greatest folks under the sun. We're going to have a lot of fun talking hey, about Spider-Man. Here we go. Ben Reeves, just setting the table here. I assume everybody outside of Ben Reeves is in the same camp. We've probably seen every Spider-Man movie. Love the cartoon. I, uh, I read the comics for a little while oh, during okay. the Civil War era. But. Okay, and then Reeves, what is your history of Spider-Man? Uh, I used to be him. <laughs> <laughs> I crawled up inside of his skin. Uh -huh. oh, when I was a kid, I actually hated Spider-Man just because like, the spider thing. Because I don't like spiders, is what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, so it seems like, yeah, very defining. <laughs> so a little man in the mix, though, and yeah. he's into it now. Uh, but yeah, then I got into comics, and I was like, oh, I might check out the Spider-Man thing, and quickly became, like, my favorite character. I would say of all time. Really? So I would this say is a very holy thing for beyond, you. You are one of those religious nuts for I would say beyond comic books, even. He's, like, the coolest character, like, fictional character. Holy God. And you know a lot about the comics history, but again, I'm sure we're going to get some I'm things wrong. Sh Yes. Among my friends, I'm an expert, but also I'm sure there's people watching who are going to laugh at things I say. Okay. There's people who are going to go look at the Wikipedia article and fact check us and say, you're wrong because I know all this I stuff. I get it. We can't complain out of the gate. Again, podcastinginformer.com, all feedback, all thoughts. That's what the Game Club's all about. Big community playthrough. So I have, oh my gosh, so many pages of notes. My own notes, things people have written in. Everybody wrote in with amazing things. And the best, best part is... Spectacular things. It was true. Everyone was, like, specific. It's everything I could hope for. They say what's up with this detail? And I'm going to talk about this detail for a little bit. And that is the best case scenario for reading on the game club instead of a scattershot of everything. So be specific. Let's get nitty gritty. That's the point of a game club. Out of the gate. <clears throat> Let me open with a little, little email I got here. You guys are idiots. How did they know already? Oh, man. Man, Reeves did like Spider-Man as a child. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, Joshua Minette writes in and says, this game club is surreal. Spider-Man is the first game club game that I've worked on. I've been looking forward to hearing what everyone's thoughts are on the game. Oh. So he's uh, in the QA team at uh, Insomniac. Oh, the QA is probably the weakest part of the game so far. <laughs> <laughs> I was not happy with the QA. I was not assured by the quality yeah. of that game uh, at all. Anybody else that works at Insomniac, feel free to write it. This will be fun. Podcastinginformer.com yeah, cool. if you have thoughts or corrections. That's awesome. Uh, out of the gate, though, uh, Leo Vader, you were on the cover story. Um, you did the rapid-fire questions, which I have to say, after starting this game, I went back and watched again, and I was again amazed at how good you are in that video. Thank you. Just... Unbelievable, but what do you think about Insomniac Spider-Man? Great game. You're loving it. Yeah, it's good. I'm not... I'm less into the story than I am... It goes combat, swinging, story for how into it I am right now. Oh, that's a very good ranking. Oh, okay, kind of cool. Personally, I think it might be swinging, number one, story, and then combat, three. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I'm swinging combat, story. Okay. Okay. I think I'm with Leo. I think combat swinging story. I was really surprised how much I like the combat. Yeah. Wow. It, it feels very unique to me. Like, they did a really good job of making a fighting system that feels totally unique to Spider-Man. Like, it couldn't be in any other game, obviously. There's so much web shooting. Right, right, right. And it really is funny diving into this game of, like, oh, I guess the Spider-Sense is just the perfect counterattack notification. Right. Like, it fictionally, it works out so well. They yeah. kind of stole it for the Arkham games, and it works good there, but yeah. No, no Batman but also has Spider-Sense in the comics. <laughs> yeah. His enemies do, yeah. He built it, but it still technically <laughs> works. They, they all have, like, a collective, you know, sort of creature sense, you yes. know? Like. Reeves, how are you feeling about this game? Broad sense. Overall, yeah, I'm so far really liking it. I There are things that bother me. Wow. And it's easy to, like, get hung up on those, but when I look at the big picture, like, it's... 
and I'm not done with it yet, but, like, it's probably the best Spider-Man game so far that I've ever played. Right. And, like, there's heights that reach really close to the Arkham games. Yeah. But then it's, like, got a lot more, I want to say, maybe kind of junky stuff, like some mm-hmm. stuff that, like, just feels like busy work. Some junk in Spider-Man's trunk. And, <laughs> okay. Exactly. And we're going to talk, in his yeah. trunk specifically, yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk about all that stuff. That'll be fun. Uh, where are you at, Surreal? Uh, I am really enjoying it. Like, I, I think I agree with Reason that there are sort of a couple rough edges that I'm having issues with. I uh, struggled a little bit with the combat at first, just because yes. the button, yes. the button we're, we're going to get into it, buddy. But I think it's, I have a weird thing because I, I don't think it's as good as the Arkham games at their best, but I feel like it is a better embodiment of Spider-Man than the Arkham games were for Batman. Yeah, oh, I mean, that's that's Batman games okay. didn't feel like Spider-Man games at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, said so you get your head out of your I think this does a better job of channeling Spider-Man than I think the Arkham games do of channeling Batman. Okay, all right, that's a great take. Uh, overall, yeah, I think I was a little bit slower out of the gate, especially with combat. Like, it was pretty early on in those early fights. I was like, I don't know if, I'm, if I want a whole game of this. I don't know about the oh. combat. Um, I'm getting there now, and I'm enjoying it more and more, and we'll definitely dive into everything, but I'm enjoying it even more than I thought I would, especially because I was nervous about the writing in particular, and that, I think, has exceeded my expectations. We'll dive into all this stuff. Okay, Jordan Edmund, uh, big thumbs up here from Radford, Virginia, says, Hello, Ben and crew. So far, I'm absolutely loving Spider-Man. It lives up to the hype, and I feel like it can only get better from here. Well, we don't know, but we'll see. Uh, the greatest moment so far to me has been the opening of the game. Seeing Peter running around his apartment, suiting up is great. Feel so alive! <laughs> was that the song during the cover story trip? I believe it's the same song. Okay, I was very curious, because I don't know that song. Who is that? I don't know either. Okay. Uh, my non-gamer roommate was watching me play, and we both lost our S as Spider-Man jumped out this window <laughs> and right into web-slinging gameplay. <gasps> oh, what's happening? <laughs> I don't think I have played a game that has such an immediate, gratifying gameplay mechanic <laughs> that still feels as fun at hour eight as it did from the beginning. Well, That's I hope amazing. You find your S. I love that opening too. I didn't expect to get such a thrill out of it, but just like that slow shot of going through the apartment, which I think you guys even mentioned before on the podcast from the cover story trip. Yep, we saw that. But there are so many details in there where it is just like it's just a good uh, table setting. Here's exactly where he's at. You got the jars with no money in them, panning over to, hey, this villain's locked up here. It sets the scene exactly where you need it, and then bam, gameplay. And it totally works whether you know Spider-Man or not. Yeah. Like it gives you information either way that you appreciate. Yeah, for sure. The one weird thing is I think it works, and you have to do it. Like, I, I love the idea of setting this in Spider-Man's Prime and all that stuff, but it, it was a, an odd disconnect, obviously, out of the gate. But there's so much good stuff you can overrule it. But just that idea of Spider-Man, he's saying, like, I need to take care of Fisk right now, take care of it so I can get on with my real job. Let's just get over this whole thing, get it over with quick. And then he goes out the window, and I assume everybody in the world playing is like, how can I avoid this mission? How can I just swing <laughs> around and mess around with the mechanics for as long as possible, right? Did you try to get out of it? I didn't even try to. Oh, well, yeah, I was like trying to swing around the city and just like mess and get a feel for the swinging for as long as possible, but it's like, you're leaving mission area, leaving mission area. Uh, Missiles are coming your way, (laughs) (laughs) Spider-Man. It it gives you enough of a sandbox to play around with to get used to the controls, but what did you guys think, first feeling it, getting out into the city there? Uh, I feel like I I more or less be landed to the mission, actually. What the hell? Am I alone? You might be alone. That's really funny. I mean, you're probably not alone, but I didn't do that. I think it instructs you really early on of like, hey, the first prompt is literally like, press R2 to swing, basically. Uh, Yeah. But I feel like I got enough out of the... I, I, I did do a little dawdling when, when I was kind of experimenting with, like, how how quickly can you turn on a dime? And yeah. you, you, it's pretty fast. Like, you, if you rotate the camera and he just immediately swings in the opposite direction. Cool. Uh, but, yeah, I, I, I had a lot of fun with that initial opening. Um, but, yeah, I don't know that I explored as much as maybe Wow, you okay. I'm curious, when's the last time you played a Spider-Man game? Mmm, that's a good question. I don't know if I even have one answer for it. I don't know if I've ever played a Spider-Man Ever? Game. Wow. I did because it popped up in my YouTube feed. I watched, like, reviews. I think it was, like, IGN reviews for Amazing Spider-Man 1 and 2, which was fun to look back at now. Where it's like, hey, they also built up the whole city. Right. The swinging also looks fun in that. But, no, I don't think I have ever played a Spider-Man game now that I think about it. I don't remember when the last Spider-Man game was. Like, what, three years ago, maybe? Sounds right. Yeah, people. Amazing Spider-Man 2. Would that have been the last one? I think so. Yeah, so maybe more so, than that. But, yeah. but I've been reviewing them for, like, the last years a lot of them yeah. and so it, to me like the swinging around the city like I think this is the best yeah Spider-Man game so far but it's not novel like it was back in say Spider-Man 2 days right where it was like oh my gosh this is mind blowing I can swing around the city and it's awesome so for me kind of to Leo's point I kind of just beelined it to that first mission because like swinging around the city is fun and the best it's been but it's also like I've been doing it for 10 years 
Wow. Uh, to some level. Like, okay. To, to, to mediocre levels, but I've still been doing it. Yeah. I feel like the readers overall are still madly in love. Like, so many people had that sentiment of, like, never using fast travel. I'm never getting oh, yeah. sick of, of swinging around. I'm not complaining about it. Yeah. Any means. I'm just saying, like, it's not novel to me. And I think, I kind of wonder if, like, this is maybe the first Spider-Man game for a lot of That's people. That's probably what it is, the yeah. the first one in a long time. Right. Marvel vs. Capcom 2, I guess, would be the closest I could come up with. That, it didn't give really that swinging freedom no. sensation. That Lego Marvel superheroes you could swing around. Oh, oh that's actually, good yes, you're actually totally is. right. Yep. That counts. Okay. Um, Dylan Edmonds says, hey, I'll skip formal introductions and get right down to business. Thank you. Uh, I think that this Spider-Man is one of the best, most accurate portrayals ever outside of the spectacular Spider-Man TV Just like series. the real Spider-Man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the way Spider-Man uh, interacts with all civilians, like he's known them forever, is something we don't see too often, as well as Spider-Man beating himself up when others start to get in trouble. I haven't really seen that side of Spider-Man in any medium for quite some time. Peter Parker is someone who clearly cares for the people in the city and feels absolutely horrible at the thought of them getting into trouble. This game is some of the best writing I've ever had the pleasure of playing through, and all the little bits of dialogue add up to make this Spider-Man the best I've seen in a long time. Anyway, it's time to get back to kicking demon butt. Thanks for reading. Thanks for Insomniac for making such a wonderful story. Yeah, uh, Reeves, is it, does it feel 100% like Spider-Man for you, just personality-wise and knowing the character so well? Yeah, I would say tonally it feels pretty good, and I, I don't know, I guess I'm surprised to hear some people, like, gushing over the writing. I think the writing's good, it's not bad, but it does, it's not, I wouldn't put it up there with, like, say, Uncharted or something, as, like, no, I wouldn't either. storytelling. Well, no, I think, I don't know what I was expecting, maybe... I'm trying to think of even, like, the writing in Arkham. I guess I like it more. I, I think, like, the little emotional moments have hit me a little bit harder. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not weeping, necessarily. But also, I was just really concerned about quips. When you have a character that's quipping all the time, uh, as uh, Leo, you asked in the rapid fire question, which I think was originally a Jeff Cork question, it was, uh, does, does Spider-Man think he's just the funniest mf -er? <laughs> And Brian Intar, creative director, his answer was, Spider-Man does, Peter Parker does not. Yeah. Which is a fun... So I was so worried about, like, if it's just basically Deadpool here as he's going around <laughs> the city. I don't want it. Sure. But the jokes have mostly landed. Like, I have not winced really once, I don't think. Yeah, and as far as, as as I remember, he doesn't really quip all that much during the actual combat, which is, I think, sort of the biggest avenue where that can get really annoying is if he constantly makes the same remarks. If he repeats it. But yeah. there's still, during combat, you know, everyone says a line, like, I'm feeling a little punchy today, and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. I can there's hold on. That's fine. That's fine. A couple times where he repeats a line a couple times, and you're like, I feel like I just heard that like 10 minutes ago. Okay. I'm like, I kind of wish they had looped some of those out. But yeah, I don't, I don't think I'm cringing at any of the, the lines. Yeah. Like, uh, I am right now. Uh -huh. Like, to me, the weakest part of the writing so far has been uh, Fisk's writing. Like, his dialogue stuff seems so hokey, like, in comparison to how natural a lot of that stuff feels outside of him. He okay. feels like this, I mean, he feels like the most, like, the biggest sort of comic booky villain to, you know, to steal a line. But well, also just this heavy foreshadowing of, like, Spider-Man, if you get rid of me, all the other villains will run amok in the town. Yeah, you don't yeah. want to do this. It's like yeah. one step above, like, you'll rule this day, Spider-Man. <laughs> like, it, it's not his dialogue. I don't think it's very good, but I think most of I think you kind of want a little bit of that with Kingpin, sure. though, don't you? But it, like, it, it felt out of place because, uh, it, like, especially, uh, like, for the rest of that game, that game does a pretty good job of not being hokey, where sure. he feels totally, like, okay. just completely out of the field for me. Speaking of foreshadowing, there's a little line, I think at the end of the first mission, where you hear the first uh, J. Jonah Jameson radio. <laughs> yes, exactly. Show, where he's like, I'll get you to say something nice about me one of these days, yeah, J. J. I'm like, oh, in the third act. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's very true. Uh, on the writing here, oh my gosh. Okay, Ed, Ethan Evans from Missouri writes and says, I was just wondering how people were feeling about the dialogue and relationships in the game. Specifically, the interaction between Peter and, I guess, the side characters. Uh, the writing in this first act has seemed really strong to me, and I felt immediate investment in Peter's relationship with Octavius, May, Mary, Mary Jane. I think I particularly noticed in that quick mission you do with Jeff Davis towards the end of Act 1, there's nothing really special about it, but something about the warmth and camaraderie between Peter and Jeff made my stomach clench at the end of the mission when Jefferson takes down the last demon. I breathed a sigh of relief when I saw Peter help him up and realized that he hadn't been shot. Of course, it didn't take long for me to see the writing on the wall and where this character is eventually <laughs> going. But just, yeah, the interactions between characters. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think that mission, just jumping ahead a little bit, with Jefferson Davis, which, is that his name in the comics? Yeah. Okay. He's Miles. Davis. Odd choice, but sure. Um, but I think that mission, I was also struck by, like, oh, that's one of my favorite sections of the game, actually, is doing a little warehouse sequence with him. I think it was, yeah. it was really sweet. He was actually a cool character, like, because... I feel like I liked him in this game almost more than I liked him in the comics ever, too. They did okay. a good job of making him personable and, like, a, a cool character. But also just, like, the little human details of, obviously, you might see where this is going, that it's not going to end up well oh, for yeah. him, but at the same time, 
him just being so nervous about the speech and that being like a big recurring refrain. It's like, that's a nice humanizing little touch. Sure. Uh, and then also, <laughs> I was struck in that mission when, you know, you help him up the elevator and all that stuff. But then there's like a 15-foot gap. He's like, don't worry about this one. I've got it, Spider-Man. And then just like leaps across that huge yeah. chasm. I was like, good God, man. Especially you have Spider-Man you, yeah, there. Especially if you, help, you had to help him up with the elevator. Right. And then he's like, like, no, I, I got this jump. I'm you sure. should want to be swung across that gap by yeah. Spider-Man. Yeah. Like, don't risk it, dude. Are you crazy? Maybe he'll hang upside down and kiss you. Yes, that's a really a best-case scenario. They, they, they do have a riff on that, though. Like, yeah. At some point, he, he and a bad guy are hanging upside down. I want to say it's Electro, isn't it? I think it's Kingpin. Oh, at the end of the first one, when you fall through the ceiling. Oh, okay. okay. They're hanging he's together. like, oh, she should be kissed now. Oh, that's right. But it's stupid because yeah. they're both upside down. Yeah. One of them needs to be right side up. Spider Man, yeah. you're wrong about oh, this fact. Yeah, they blew it. They blew it. Learn how to kiss, dude. <laughs> Did you guys know uh, who hell yeah. Jefferson was? Uh, I assumed it. Because when he's like, boy, my son's a big fan of you. You mentioned his son twice in like the span of five minutes, and then I was like, okay. Like, I know that like Miles has a black dad and like an Asian mom. And so I was like, okay. Factoring in, I got it now. Oh, I, I yeah, I had no idea. Well, and I kind of wonder, even just this day and age, like how big a character is Miles Morales? Well, that's a point. great question. We actually have somebody who wrote in on that saying um, a very, very prescient thing. Oh, here it is. <laughs> he says. I wonder if some people are just like, why are they spending so much time on this character? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Juan Benitez writes in and says, "Hey, is Miles supposed to be Miles Morales? <laughs> <laughs> His last name wasn't Morales." Uh, but yes, can you explain how that works? Is Morales then his mom's name? Oh, good question. I don't mean... Yeah, I guess. Okay. Wait, so it's a Hispanic mother then? Yeah, but she totally looks Asian in the game. Okay. Well, that threw me, because I was like, oh, they changed her her model now. She's Asian, I guess? Okay. So in the game, is I don't even know. Did they refer to him as Miles Morales? That's a I don't think I, I don't, like, I don't think said he's Morales last yeah. name. I think at some point. In the game. Yeah. Yeah, I think, but they do say Miles. Yeah. They say Miles. Like, his friend calls him over as Miles. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's funny because that character. Like, you first see him when he's, like, Spider-Man's basically doing that one, like, the one mission from the E3 demo, and Miles sort of, like, has a scene where he texts someone, and, and at first I was like, there's spending a I thought he was just going to be, like, a cameo, because I hadn't figured out the dad thing yet. Yeah. So I thought, I was like, why are they spending so much time on this cameo? But then, you know, towards the end, it's, oh, this, char- this character's going to be a part of the story. Yeah. At least for now. Sure. Yeah. Um... His origin story reads in the comics. Is this pulling? Is it remixing? How is it referenced in here? I mean, at this point in the game, I don't know where they're going with it. Yeah. I mean, in the comics, it was part of a different universe to begin with, but there was like another spider that he got bit by from the same batch of spiders that that Peter got bit with. Right. So that's how he ended up with very similar powers. Okay. Got but you. yeah, I don't know where they're going because I kept wondering, I was like, oh, is he going to have powers or not? Yeah, it doesn't seem like you're going to use lifting stuff at the end of Act 1 there. Yeah. It's like, he's struggling a lot. You he think it would come weak. out now. Yeah, he's pretty feeble. Yeah. Come on. Not he's the third strongest all. character in the Marvel Universe. Don't do it. Yeah. Quinton from Moreno Valley, California says, Hello, straight to the point. This is looking far into the future, but given the amount of screen time he's receiving, do you think Miles Morales will be a fully playable character in Spider-Man 2? Surely he will be the final DLC in the city that never sleeps, where it seems like Insomniac is really setting him up for bigger and better things. Obviously, the sequel will still par- star Peter Parker, but I can see them switching between characters just like they're already doing, except this time with two Spideys for the price of one. It, that that would be weird if they have the character switching, because how different are their powers? Uh, they're very similar. Miles can turn invisible. Okay. And he has this, like, uh, what's he called? Spider shock, where he can, like, touch you, and then a couple seconds later, you get, like, shocked oh. and paralyzed. It would be, you know, meaningfully different. But more stealth missions in the next Yeah, game. yeah. Huh. It's... <laughs> It's interesting. How bold would it be, though, if at the end of the game they kill Peter and then you just play as Miles? Oh, my God. I don't think they would do that. I don't think either, but how bold would it be? Guys, would be cool. Are you ready for this? Yeah. Spider-Man 2? Co-op. Uh, uh, dual Spider-Man. I could see it. That's an angle. Spider-Man? Spider-Man? I mean, they already have the, the history with Fuse. They have that co-op pedigree in Sonic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, they did co-op in Sunset Overdrive, too. Oh, there we go. Point be more relevant. Um, I didn't know... And Leo, you were much more clued in being on the cover story and stuff. Had they revealed that you play as Miles at all before the game was out? I, I don't know if it was, like, spoiled for me by somebody who wasn't supposed to say it or if it okay. was part of their press. So you weren't surprised by it, though? Not really. Okay. Since I, I knew who was going to be a part of it, probably just from talking around the office really more than anything. Mary right. Jane, of course, definitely knew we were going to play as her. Right. And yeah, people were going to be very surprised by her. Right. Is what Brian said. Yes, which I'm still waiting for, but we'll still see. waiting to be surprised, right? Yeah, we'll see. Two more. Um, speaking of surprises, uh, Matthew Davies says I've actually found many surprises in Spider-Man PS4. So shut up, Leo. <laughs> um, from the pacing of the game and to how a lot of these characters are portrayed, a lot of this was unexpected. 
I thought the coverage for the game released gave away a bit too much, but I'm finding the story quite more quite surprising. I imagine the GI crew would probably have been had seen more of the game in general audience before his release, so I'm interested in how surprising you found the story overall. The black side quests, black cat side quests, are really cool as well. Another clever implementation of having her off screen ramping up the mystery and the world building even further. Um, did you have any surprises for you so far in Act One? Uh, no. Uh, really? I mean, maybe just the like the scene, the we have the end mission. Yeah. It was kind of like, oh, this is kind of like a bigger, more intense thing. Yes. Okay. So just the the darkness of the end of Act One in general. Yeah. I, maybe I'm just too desensitized or something. But I was like, is this? Uh, I didn't even realize until after the fact that that's what Reiner was referring to. Right. Huh. When he talked about the Call of Duty-esque moment. Sure, uh, sure, the no Russian. The no agreement. Russian, that's his Right, no that Russian. was his reference point, yeah. Um, and I, I don't know if I'd go quite that extreme, but like in retrospect, I'm like, oh, I guess that was pretty intense for a Spider-Man game. Yeah, uh, let's see, we have some thoughts on that. We have Nick, who says, overall, I think the game's absolutely brilliant, with the last half hour of Act 1 in particular blowing me away. I couldn't help but smile throughout the incredible helicopter set piece, especially the ending. The first person web slinging was so satisfying, and the image of Spider-Man person in the helicopter at the end was, for lack of a better term, epic. What really amazed me, though, was how the game went from such a joyous and victorious mood to a soberingly grim mood in an instant. Instant. Reiner was right. The bombing was eerily reminiscent of No Russian from Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, and I think the game handles this scenario amazingly well, even though we could tell Martin Lee's involvement from a mile away. I definitely didn't see the game getting this dark, and I can't wait to see the, how the whole experience progresses from here and how Miles and Peter's relationship evolves. Um, before I go, I leave you with some of the dumbest Spider-Man quips from Act 1. Great. Uh, looks like I get my own private ventron, which we... <laughs> it's really the, the you know, slogan of the GI show at this point. <laughs> and then as a rocket is flying towards him, he says, What is this, National Rocket Day? <laughs> <laughs> that is a good question. Um, yeah, I think I was also, as that sequence started, where I'm like, well, it's the demons using their abstract guns. I was expecting something a little bit more gory, but, like, the most jarring part of that scene for me, and maybe I'm cold and heartless, was when your Miles crawling through the car, and then, like, the body falls from, like, the passenger seat of the car. That's when I was like, oh, this is ratcheting it up to a slightly darker level than I was expecting, being a pessimist here. Well, it seems like Miles didn't react quite as, like, I thought he should. He didn't seem as horrified Okay. as I thought he should. It definitely got... A little bit more graphic later on, then, with the demons even wiping out more and more folks along the way. Right. Where it's like, yeah, I don't know if I go quite as far as Reiner did, but yeah, definitely. I yeah. totally could see why Reiner was like, oh, maybe don't play that one sequence around your kids. Yeah, it's definitely, it, it definitely, I, I think, does mark a tonal shift because up, up until this point, it's been pretty fun and going. But like, I don't think, yeah, I, I guess I never really got the no Russian vibes just because that that moment seems so much more intense in terms of. And you're controlling it, which yeah, is it's right, just a huge right, distinction right, here. Yeah, yeah. Huh. but it is bizarre then to go from that sequence of. Uh, you know, hey, here's a bunch of 9-11 imagery, and here's a sad funeral, and then, like, you're back to swinging around as Spider-Man, right where we cut out for the game club, and it's like, right. level up, level up, new skill yeah. points, just like, <laughs> this yeah, bomb bass on the screen, like, oh, it's hard. Hey, you really bumped, but hey, you got an experience <laughs> point. Come awesome. do a mission for your friend Harry. Yeah, yeah check this out. <laughs> Boy, these pollutions are all over the place. <laughs> yeah. I do like the way that they tie the time of day and the weather into kind of, like, helping build the atmosphere of where you're at in the story. Like, when you get out of that mission, it is, like, a really bleak day. Yeah. And it's raining. Right. That I really cool. like how they build the atmosphere throughout yeah. the story with that. Uh, John from Aliva, Wisconsin, Aliva, says, what are your thoughts on how the day-night cycle is handled in the game? Spider-Man is amazing, pun intended, but my only real gripe so far is the day-night cycle being too tied to story missions. <laughs> I found myself feeling the need to either fly through or put off doing main missions to either prolong or get through certain times of day. Would love the crew's feedback on this. Keep up the great work. I, I think it's interesting. I like, I think it's worth it so far. I like that it's not just, you know, yeah, it's it's not subtle. Like, if a mission set at night, it's referencing the fact that it's at night, which is my favorite mission so far, of Spider-Man being like, I need a place to sleep tonight. Yeah. You know, it seems relevant enough where I understand changing it for the time of day. Yeah, It is weird when you've been doing, like, a ton of side missions, and then Spider-Man's like, man, I haven't slept since I brought down the Kingpin. And you're like, holy crap, that <laughs> feels like it would have been, like, yes. a week ago in, yeah. in your game. But um, I like it, honestly, because we have so many games that do normal day-night cycles, and mm-hmm. I don't know that that's great for creating a world but like narratively it's kind of fun to have like the mood of your game set and be exactly what you want it to be right it helps with pacing yeah yeah and i don't know if it's a a spoiler necessarily but i know later on like after you beat the game you can choose whatever day night time you want you know if you want running around if you want to run around at sunset which is when new york is so beautiful go ahead and do it you know and so at that point it's fine pretty much every side mission has been loading me into nighttime though have you guys I've had a couple that? of huh. those where I'm like, 
this is weird. The first time it happens, you're like, this is weird. Why does it have to load this side mission? But right. it's just like setting it to a certain time. Yeah. Which I wonder, is it fictionally? Like, so this could have happened at any point in Spider-Man's timeline, right? But it did happen at night. Mm-hmm. Well, because there's some... I, I would say most missions actually feel like there's this sense of urgency. Like, I should really get over here and do this thing. Mm-hmm. And so it's sort of fiction-breaking to think that, like, Spider-Man would put off some of that stuff. Like, oh, I'm not going to go meet with Mary Jane right away because I'm going to go do, like, go catch ten of my backpacks and catch this pigeon. And Sure. You know, some of that? Right, yeah. right. Uh, speaking of loads, because it'll never be mentioned again, Dimitri Brown says, Hello, Game Informer. I've been playing and enjoying the game in the last 24 hours. However, there's one thing about it that can't elude me. The open world. Now, I think the game is brilliantly pulled off the state-of-the-art cinematics, uh, challenging yet fun, rewarding characters, lovely dialogue, paired with a strong script, all leads to success, right? Well, yeah, but not if you're creating a huge and layered open world. One of my major gripes is that there are loads everywhere, and deceptive museum-esque buildings that are all for show and you can't enter. I don't know about loads everywhere. That <laughs> seems like it's... You can go from one side of New York City to the other, just have, fine, right? Have we all been playing on PS4 Pro? No. I've, I've based PlayStation. I'm on a base okay. PlayStation as well. And the loads haven't been bad? No, loads no. have been fine. I mean, yeah, when you die, there's a little bit of a load, but it's okay. And then even, like, technically, I think during the big E3 original debut of, like, chasing the helicopter, it, it bogged a little bit frame rate-wise, but not bad at all, really. Um, anyways, so, let's see. The loads, blah, blah, blah. I can't recount how many times I did a crime mission alerted about a break-in or side mission, which gave the impression I can trail a baddie instead of a building, inside of a building, but nope, I can't do it. It makes me wonder if Insomniac was using the game with aging technology. I don't know. It's clear there were limitations and restrictions they weren't able to overcome. This got in the way of what could have been a seamless and immersive New York City. Imagine instead of hitting a load screen when entering Feast, Peter's lab, apartment, or any other countless places we entered, you could just walk in and walk back out. It would have made a big difference exploring the world and increased its credibility. He's got to change clothes, though. It would fade to black anyway, yeah. I feel like. Yeah, you're right, unless there's like another little quick time event as you're putting on your <laughs> <laughs> the, the segments he mentions, you know, going into Feast and stuff, I feel like those are not so frequent that... I have always ever like, okay, we got another loading screen, all right, let's yeah. keep going. I feel like they were in intermittent enough that it, I never, I guess I hardly even noticed them. Well, I wonder if you're just, I haven't really done too much of this yet, but if you're just focusing on doing the side content, maybe there's a lot of loads that go through that. Sure. But during, like, the main story progression, I'm not noticing it too much at all. When we were talking about yeah. the time changes, that is a weirdly long load, I feel like. Yeah. When the it changes to night for a yeah. specific side mission. Oh, okay. But beyond that, I haven't noticed it. Gotcha. Uh, other big thoughts, Matthias from Berlin, Germany... Not exactly God's country, but whatever. Okay. Uh, the game is a mystery to me. Well, I often have problems with skill trees in games that focus so much on movement, I couldn't get into Infamous Second Son because moving through the city is too slow and boring for a long period of time. Okay. It doesn't bother me in Insomniac like Spider-Man. Maybe it's because it's it feels fun from the get-go, or it's the fact that you soon get to upgrade wherever you want to upgrade first, but Spider-Man's skill tree feels encouraging and motivating. I also hate crafting. And uh, while I still do not know a single game that is improved by crafting mechanics, Spider-Man's crafting elements at least don't feel too intrusive. Finally, I thought it was so over overworld maps littered with meaningless things to do, and yet, in Spider-Man, I keep doing all those mundane tasks, and I even enjoy it with the beautiful world and amazing locomotion. All in all, I think Spider-Man does not break any new ground like a God of War or Breath of the Wild did, but it does rule the old grounds, and that's just fine. Uh, I've kind of had that sensation, too, of, like, I'm not the biggest open-world guy. Like, it feels... It feels like a gamey-ass game at times, but that's fine. It's definitely in the upper echelon of open-world games because both the way you traverse and the combat are so much fun. That any know. side mission in there is going to be fun to do. Right. I think the side missions are sort of very basic, but I think as a sort of a way to keep you exploring that city, I think they work well enough. I wish they were. I wish a lot of the side missions were better. I think a lot of those stories I don't think really go anywhere interesting. Do you like chasing the birds? I don't. But I, like, I, I think I haven't done it too much. Yeah. I've only done it once, and I kind of had a frustrating moment. But otherwise, I think like finding the backpacks, you know, doing a lot of those towers. I think they're, those are simple enough. Yeah. That it's just like the the main crux of those side missions is not what you do when you get there. It's getting to them and being able to say, all right, there there it is. I'm going to traverse over there, and that was the fun part. Yeah, yeah. I definitely had that weird vibe of okay, I'm trying to get through the main story because I'm right up to the wire for the game club here. <laughs> Uh, I definitely want to dive into more side stuff later on, but it's like, okay, the map's filled with, like, the locations I have to take pictures of. I haven't even gotten, you know, all the communications towers, all that stuff. And then it just keeps layering on more and more, and that map screen's filling up more and more, like the black cat. It's like, okay, here's some more stuff to do around the side, and now here's all the hairy stuff. Like, okay, this map is really getting crowded to the point yeah. that it's freaking me out a little bit. I kind of liked getting the backpacks and hearing his, like, 
oh, here's this bill I forgot to pay like yeah. ten years ago, or like here's this thing from my first date or whatever with Mary Jane. And I like taking the photos of the stuff, but I think they should have left it at that. Like anything beyond that just feels like it's like cluttering things up a little bit too but much. But at the same time, so many people would complain that there's nothing to do in the open world. I feel like you're damned if you do, damned if you don't well, in that situation. Well, maybe it's just the, the way it, like the black cat stuff. What do you guys think of that? Like I don't think very simple. I haven't done it. Particularly interesting. Yeah, what is I've, it? I haven't done any. Okay, it's you just have to scan the environment and try to find this little cat doll that okay. the black cat left. But the controller rumbles when you're like in the vicinity of it, and then you can see that something is glinting, and then you just zoom so, in. So yeah, so I guess I accidentally did that yeah. one to that one to like trigger it overall. It yeah, feels like they they're missing something to make it an interesting mini game. I do like the Harry's stations. A lot. Really? I, those are some of my favorite stuff. I did the one that I think you have to do where you have to like swing through the clouds, but what are the other ones like? There's one where you have like this weird technology where you turn invisible and you can only activate it. When you activate it, you can't web swing. Okay. Yeah. So basically there are these things like floating in the air. You have to activate it near, but you can't be swinging. So you have to like launch yourself up in the air and then time it so you go invisible and go through that area. Oh, that sounds cool. And then you have to re-engage, and then you can swing again. And it's just like weird ways of using the swinging like that. Yeah. That is really smart to do. Huh, in it's a weird open game. world swinging missions. And they vary. There's some that I really hated, and there's some that are like, that was kind of cool. Yeah. So this is a weird mix. Some yeah. are better than others, but it's cool that they're so like, varied. There's one where you have to like spray fish in the water, which is maybe the worst what? mission in the game. I haven't done that Spray fish. It yeah, is yeah. weird to see Spider-Man swim, by the way. But yeah. yeah. You basically have to swing over water, and there's nothing to swing on when you're over water. Yeah. But there's you have to find pools of fish, and then you have to, like, spray this, like, chemical foam over them. Huh. Okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Look forward to that one. <laughs> all right. Why not? Well, I feel like you also... You, you guys are all saints, by the way, for stopping at the game club thing. So you guys are in the dark with what happens in the future. But have you guys just been doing all the side missions then? Just waiting no. for the next act. To I start. I was also like you under the wire just because I I didn't get I didn't even start until uh, Sunday because uh, Kyle told me that the first act was only two to three hours. That's long. what everyone said. It's so much longer than that. Yeah, it's way longer than two to three hours. So yeah. I just said oh, I'll just do it on Sunday, knock it out real quick, and then go do side stuff. And then yeah. like it took me most of the day to do it. Oh well, yeah, you're up till four in the morning. That's right, grinding away. But you guys have done a lot of that <laughs> stuff, right? Yeah, I mean I'm basically done. I've done 100 percent up to act the end of act three. So really? everything you can do up to this point, I've done. Wait, Act 2. Sorry, Act 1. Okay. Well, the beginning of Act 2. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so there's like a lot of side stuff that you haven't even unlocked yet at this point, so I haven't done any of that. Yeah, okay. I can't, I've never gotten a challenge token. Right, I've I don't things I can buy with challenge yeah. tokens. Oh, funny, okay. Yeah, I agree where the, the backpacks, I think they're interesting. I love the little details in there. I didn't expect that. I didn't expect to get into the lore. But just the dumb little things like, hey, here's a spider plushie. And then one of my favorite little bits was uh, Spider-Man just saying, Oh yeah, they wanted to license out uh, my likeness for sp spider pl plushies, but I couldn't get any money off yeah, of that license because yeah. I'd have to reveal my identity. I, I, I've never <laughs> thought of that. I spent so an inordinate amount of time just swinging around the city thinking about like I bet they could, I bet if they like set up some sort of like anonymous way to pay right. me under the like I, I actually thought about that for way longer than I probably yeah. should Patreon. have. Yeah, That's right. Well, actually, Mike from Rochester, New York, says, "Hey, Ben and crew, fellow Spider Nuts." Uh, loving the new game. I'm going to waste my email by making a joke and saying that Spider-Man should just start a Patreon page. Spidey saved my cat. Here's a fiver. That's total, that, that is 100% yeah. what they should do in this sequel. Different and, tiers. I'll save your yeah. cat. I'll save your daughter. I'll save you. <laughs> I'll release you from my prison. <laughs> a te several tiers of spider insurance where it's like you can buy in and you pay a monthly fee and if something bad happens yeah. to you, Spider-Man will save you. You have to show your card when he swings by. Yeah. There's got to be some way for him to... Uh, being as moral as he wants to be, get some cash for these abilities. Yeah, that would solve all of his problems. Oh, they've got to be here full time. Is, is yep. he ever wealthy in the comics at any point? Does he ever make some sick cash off this thing? Yeah. I mean, oh, really? Great. Yeah, because he started his own like industry for a while. He had like Parker Industries, and so he became like a rich Tony Stark type person. Oh, okay. Yeah. He should just do that. Well, then he lost it all. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. What are you going to do with Spider Man? Who, who can say? Uh, Graham from London. That's in the United Kingdom. Ooh. For now. He says, hello, Game Informer. <laughs> hello, Xander. Weird. Uh, I've played about 15 hours, and while clearly a very high-quality production, perhaps I let hype get the best of me this time. I'm still enjoying it, but my main complaint is to do with story versus gameplay. While ambitious and interesting, uh, key dramatic ideas feel at odds with gameplay. For example, my girlfriend and I agree that opening with the fall of Kingpin is an exciting idea, but despite being seasoned video game players, we both died multiple times during this tutorial stage on the normal difficulty. Do you guys have a tough time with that fight, too? 
the Kingpin one specifically? Yes. Yeah, I, I did. did too. I'm, I'm dying a lot in this game. I think it was surprisingly hard. It was the first time you're really challenged with the combat mechanics, and yeah. you're still kind of learning the ropes, so... I would be interested in going back now and seeing if I was still as bad at it. I think I would do pretty good. Right, although Daniel Alejandro Hernandez Gomez writes in and says that the game is too easy overall. Oh, playing yeah. on the amazing there, difficulty, so there are different knows. difficulties. So That's some, true. Um, it, yeah, I think there's a lot... Of, I felt really clumsy, and I think that one of the reasons is because everything does more damage than I expected it to. So I think yes. I think one of the expectations is like, oh, you're you know you're here to be cool. You're you're here to have fun. I wasn't sort of expecting like you have to take this gameplay seriously. You can't like sort of yeah yeah my, like it's not as mashy as like. Well, I mean, it's like you know, press square and then press triangle and then like dodge out of the way. But I like, think even like it's not as mashy as the Arkham games, which is maybe what I was expecting. Where yeah. you kind of get into a flow and not really worry too much right. about it. I, I think. And at first I was like, oh, this is really. I don't know if I'm gonna. I, like I was like, you know, I, I don't know if I'm gonna like a whole game of this, but I think over time, as more options are introduced to, to combat, I think I ended up liking the combo system more and how sort of like, all right, I want this guy like, th here's a shield guy, I, I knocked him into the air, I need to take them down like immediately, and sort of like the urgency that places on combat, I think actually ends up being a, a plus in its favor so far. But yes, definitely early on, I I struggled a lot with like the different combo options and like. Okay, here's how you take out this, and here's yeah, sort of yeah. the counter. And I know that it's, it pushes you hard for, like, stay in the air. If you're on the ground, you're losing. Even yeah. they're like, I hope I don't get thrown up in the air. They have some, like, some sort of VO yeah. bar to let you know that, like, hey, that's really what you need to get <laughs> yeah. uh, them. I'm was, really weak in the air. Right. <laughs> Oxygen is bad for my skin. <laughs> it's so stupid and simplistic, but it was, like, learning not to just play it like an Arkham game. Otherwise, you just end up dodging and flipping all over the place, and you feel like, and it's less fun. Yeah, and you feel like Sonic and Smash Brothers were yeah. like, I'm hitting them a lot, but I'm not taking anybody out. Right. I don't know what I'm doing here. The other thing that I don't like about the game is, or the combat in general is that the dodge feels doesn't feel as useful until you figure out that you can dodge and then jump, and that's like an extra long dodge. Okay. Uh, but initially, I, I feel like that initial dodge doesn't... It, like I, I felt like it should have a longer distance on it than it did, so I would dodge and still get hit okay. a lot of the time. Oh, interesting. Uh, but then once I learned like you can dodge and then press uh, X to jump, I thought that was really cool. There's an that's upgrade too. I think it's an upgrade where you, uh, if you dodge at the right time, you like web the guy. Yeah. And attack you. That, which is, I think is a really valuable. Yeah, I learned that one. That was one of the first things I unlocked. The yeah. other thing that I find weird about the combat is just like how long you can keep those guys in the air. Like that yeah. is it is a Marvel versus Capcom s duration <laughs> of just like all right, three hits in the air. I I hold square and swing at them again, and so now I have another three hit combo I can land, and then I can throw them into the other guy. Right. Like, it is outlandish how how long you can keep those guys suspended in the air. Have you guys embraced the gadgets as well? Yeah, I don't yeah. think I've been using it as much as I should. It is a reminder too of like, oh yeah, I have that little spider drone. I haven't used that in combat yet. Little yeah. reminders. That, oh yeah, I have that. Webbing is really cool. That's, that's my favorite. Thing. Yeah, that's huge. Which one? Impact webbing. It's like oh. you hit a guy, and if it's a smaller dude, oh, uh, less powerful guy, he'll like get webbed to the wall immediately. So oh, it's a good way to take way out. back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so if you can upgrade it too, where I think you take out multiple guys. I only just started using the gadgets when they give you the one that is basically a grenade. And that was like immediately yeah. after I was like, man, I could use some AOE options. Yeah. And then oh, immediately oh, they give me a grenade. Uh, and uh, it, Aziz writes in on that front and says, it's such a small thing, but I love using that web bomb against a large group of thugs. Seeing half of them being helplessly stuck to walls makes me laugh every single yeah. time. And I, I like, so the other thing I had with combat was that I just had the, the button scheme very counterintuitive to me at first because it was like all right you're pressing square and like i feel like i should be zipping around where it's like oh triangle does this but it yeah like i felt like it should be r1 that was sort of my biggest thing is i kept mashing r1 instead of triangle to like all right, so I have to press it. this before the button changes <laughs> yeah and it didn't uh so that was part of my sort of early struggles to figure yeah. it out like the button scheme seems really strange but it, it once you get used to it, it it works yeah uh jerry from gilbert is kind of echoing some thoughts here just curious how long it took you all to get a feel or a flow for combat early on i found myself just using a dodge button being used to Arkham and ignoring the object throw, web pull, other mobility options from Spider-Man. Uh, once I got a feel for it, though, it became so much fun. Yeah. Especially, like, the, the dodge off the wall, and then you attack off the wall. I feel like I need to be doing that more in particular. I don't know if you guys are doing a lot of that stuff. I haven't done that one a lot just because, it, yeah, a lot. I haven't been near walls as much as I maybe should have. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. It's a wall crawler. Yeah. That's true. I feel like... Not a lot of wall crawling, though. Like, it feels like you're always running up. You don't get to be, like, the iconic, like, I'm going to crawl up the wall very slowly. Well, right, that's up to you, man. You can crawl up the yeah. wall. Yeah, I would love to <laughs> take this wall slowly, yeah. as opposed to running up it like an infant or a uh, prototype. I do get a real kick out of just, like, seeing if I have an objective marker far in the distance. So, like, I'm walking. And then just, like, slowly walking down the street. And it's so uncanny, like, watching that realism. Like, 
Wait, is Spider-Man kind of a dumb character? Does that suit look stupid? It looks awesome when you're swinging around, but just like slowly marching down the street. It's like, hey, this might be stupid You get self-conscious when yeah. everybody yeah. gets it really you. Is. But you can't point finger guns at anybody as you're walking down the street. What is about the... I haven't done that square. yet. It's just square. Like, just to interact with them? Yeah, not in combat, he'll just do that all. There's an achievement for like doing it to 10 just pedestrians. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's a pretty easy one to do. I, I had that same feeling, too, when I did the fast travel and you see him in the subway and you're yeah. like... This is weird. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny, I like it that they went that way, but it's also like, this, if you saw that in real life, you'd be like, this is kind of stupid, right? Yeah. Well, of course, it's a superhero. Yeah. And I love everybody shouting at him all the time. Like, they all want him to do different things. Everyone's very demanding. Where it's like, yeah, I can see that. It's the equivalent yeah. of, you know, celebrities and being harassed about selfies and stuff. People are like, hey, shoot a web, buddy. It's like, okay, it's, it's right, basically buddy. that scene from Homecoming where the guy, is. he's like, uh, hey, flip. fighter, yeah, yeah, and he's like, do a flip. Yeah. yeah. It's the best part of Homecoming. Yeah, when he's amazing. Uh, yeah. I like that there was one guy who was like, who didn't like me, and was like, we don't need your kind around here, and I just pass it aggressively. Like, hello, sir. <laughs> <laughs> That's so much fun. Uh, John says, hello, folks. Spider-Man, hey, guys. Well, see you later. That's not true. He says, seriously, though, it's hard to nail down just one thing to talk about in the game. What keeps coming back to my mind for though is the city and world and the interactions within it. I made it a point to get down to a street level early on to hang out with Spidey's adoring and even not so adoring public. Almost right away a guy approached me with a prompt over his head and after double high-fiving him he yelled, how can you not love this guy? A few blocks away I found some people who will happily pose for a group selfie. It feels great to stop a robbery and turn around to see a group of appreciative New Yorkers cheering over Spidey's most recent victory. So there's mine. I'm, I'm looking forward to part two. Keep on swinging. You bet, man. Uh, here's a thought, Reeves. This is a... Um, I'm not a features editor at Game Informer, but you need to write this feature. I want to know the history of civilians, pedestrians, and open world games using their cell phones. Like, what was the first game to incorporate that? Because I love seeing it, and it rings very true, but it's like a default in open world modern yeah. games. I just have like, uh, Miles is looking at your phone. Like, what year do you think that was? I think Grand Theft Auto 4. Was it one of the first ones? Did 4? Yeah, 4. Or, like, like, that was yeah. your whole menu. That was a big you thing. Well, you had it, but right. did pedestrians as I well they would walk down on the street on phone calls and stuff yeah okay but like just checking stuff not on the phone mm. that was probably the evolution though there's probably like a yeah. lot of pedestrians on cell phones right and then it morphed to uh, they're just looking at it right it's more time. all right well that feature is basically as good as done if everyone wants to transcribe yeah, yeah we're good yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, real quick, some more uh, comment stuff to mop up. Uh, ben B says, I'm not someone who considers myself very good at challenging games. I mostly play it on easy mode because I see gaming as an escape from stress. But imagine my surprise when I boot up Spider-Man and die at least three times during the opening fight against Fisk on friendly mode. Pretty demoralizing. That said, whereas I started out dreading every combat situation, I was amazed how fluid the combat becomes once you've been given the freedom to experiment and practice for a few hours. Absolutely. The game definitely rewards you for mastering the dodge button, but being that combat can get out of hand just after one or two hits, do you think the game should have eased players into combat a little bit more slowly? I started on normal, and I was dying a lot, and I said, I don't, I'm not interested in seeing Spider-Man die, that's not why I'm playing this game. <laughs> yeah, you want the power You started crying yeah. the first time you died. <laughs> yeah, I thought he was really dead. I said, never again. <laughs> <laughs> Spider-Man, talk to me! But I switched to easy. I couldn't tell a difference, honestly. Really? I feel like easy mode could be, and maybe should be, a lot easier. I completely agree. I'm, I'm playing on easy, and it's like, I'm still dying a shocking degree, and I'm not the worst at games. Like, there should be a super baby mode easy for people who want Kid the Spider-Man experience. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the one time, I think my biggest struggle so far has been the Shocker fight, uh, because they he has a prompt where it's like, I'm going to do this big sort of AoE attack, and you get the dodge prompt, but the dodge isn't the thing that's going to get you out of it. You sort of have to... What I ended up doing is jumping and then zipping immediately. But then that's like... The, the game trains you so hard to say, like, anytime you see that indicator, press yeah. circle, and that's like the one time that doesn't actually... That's not the way you get out of that attack. Okay. Other than that, I feel like uh, once I got through the Fisk fight, I've been doing okay. But yeah, even, even in random encounters sometimes, like, you get hit with, like, a gun, and you're like, oh man, this is way more damage. Oh, I was I chasing it. after a demon truck... Just swinging down the street, getting closer, and they shot me to death out of the sky. Oh no, Spider-Man! <laughs> yeah. Oh good, we shot him to death. <laughs> hey, with the, with the shocker fight, I love that he calls him Herman so much, and I love that he calls Fisk Willie. Is that just a very agreed upon staple of Spider-Man, as he always calls the villains by their first name or anything? I don't know if I'd say always, but okay. yeah, it's a, it happens. Hey, Green. <laughs> Mr. G. Hey, Gobby. Yeah, um, on the groups of enemies front, Adam Poole says, though I'm really enjoying the game so far, it does have some flaws. Uh, for one thing, I think it's too easy to get overwhelmed by groups of enemies, resulting in death, which I experienced more than I assumed I would. Another big issue I've had is that even if you successfully dodge an attack, you might still get hit by the enemies, especially the big guys that can hit multiple times really fast. 
Yeah, those big guys suck. Yeah. Where it's like they're basically harder than Fisk, and it's just like some big fat guy in New York or like in uh, Central Park that's just annihilating yeah. them. You just gotta whip them up. That yeah. is the reason I, I started using the sort of like dodge and then hop is because dodging out of the way of those guys is you're you're gonna get hit and they have like a three hit combo basically so if you're like do the thing that you're supposed you're, that you're told to do which is dodge you're just gonna get mauled basically right and right. you have you have to play against those guys very differently yeah and then like that's when I started using the impact web a little more. Okay. I think I've, yeah impact web will sometimes like web them up uh, to the point where you can punch them a bunch yeah yeah but the guys I've had more trouble with I think are the guys with the energy whips. Have you guys run into yeah. those guys much? Like the batons? So. Whips? Uh, they are demons who have, like, energy whips. Oh, I don't think so. No, I haven't. Yeah, oh, haven't really? Um, yeah. They're pretty rough. Okay. Huh. How'd you beat them? With my fist. Yes, yeah, Spidey! Yeah. You're doing it, buddy! <laughs> <laughs> the, o- uh, the only problem, Paul Arias, uh, he says here, is um, the only problem I have with is with the Fisk hideouts and the quick time event with the helicopter. I had to run that about four times before I was able to get all the timing correct. As for the hideouts, I try to do all the stealth takedowns, but the game doesn't even make that possible for as soon as you get all the enemies in Phase 1, Phase 2 starts with everyone knowing you're there. How? Why? There are no alarms. No one saw me. How did they, how did they know I was there? They're, they've all got psychic vision. Man. Like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that bothered me for a couple times. I did a couple of hideouts before I realized, like, you just can't do it stealth. Like, after the first oh, round, okay. yeah. you just fight. Stealth is your opener, not sort of how you do yeah, the It just feels like that first round is so easy, like, combat-wise. There's no, like, benefit to doing it stealthy. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of a bummer because I like stealth in games generally, and like the stealth as Spider Man could be kind of cool, but feels like they haven't flushed it out enough. There's yeah. that yeah. one segment, like uh, I think right after the Mary Jane segment or before, uh, where I think it worked there, but I think in terms of like in the general open city, I don't think it works. It works really right. Well. There's no incentive to do it. I yeah. love stealth is one of my favorite genres sure. in games, and there's just no. I just d- rarely do stealth in this game because there's no benefit. Yeah, which is kind of a bummer. What did you guys think about the Mary Jane stuff? It was okay. Like I, I, I feel like if you're gonna implement Mary Jane in a game, that's kind of how you have to do it because it's not like she's gonna like get a gun and it turns into a first-person shooter. <laughs> oh, that would be like blacklist. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, I, I could easily do without those segments and just have those be cutscenes. Like, I didn't really get much Well, that's actually them. interesting. James from Idaho Hall, uh, Idaho Falls, it's a Mormon community, so everything, everyone thinks it's God's country. That's nice. Said, could the extra playable characters' roles have been What's done? What's up? Good morning! Personally, if I'm playing a superhero game, I don't want to be pulled out of the role uh, of Spider-Man for some clunky stealth. Uh, Kyle has classically said he doesn't mind, doesn't like playing multiple characters, like in GTA V, but mentioned that these were quick and not too intrusive. Um... Yeah, you know, they seem to really want to have puzzles in this game. Yes, yeah. which the Mary Jane sequences promote. And I'm not sold on why like they're there. Like statue yeah. puzzles, like this is like a Resident <laughs> Evil style puzzle. Yeah. It feels so odd. <laughs> I, yeah. I didn't mind the part where she was walking around and looking at things and like taking photos. Uh huh. Yeah. But the stealth parts are so like rigid and like they're one path, you just wait till the guy turns around. Yeah. I would think they're bad stealth scenes. Yeah. I, I don't know, it, it is just, I think it, I don't know, it kind of conveys maybe a lack of confidence in, like, I'd be fine looking around at stuff as Mary Jane. I don't need yeah. some gameplay hook for yeah. those sequences. Totally. Just make them more of a little uh, walking simulator. Totally when you're looking around at that, that museum, that's totally more fun than it would be in a cutscene. Right. right. Oh, it definitely yeah. definitely is benefited. I think it's kind of cool that they're not just cutscenes, that there's something more going on, but the stealth implementation is not there. It's yeah. how they feel. And it, it speaks, I think, to a lot of things in this game, where even the radio towers, or a lot of the things when it has the mini-games, where it's like, how much more am I really getting out of it for having to line up these right. waves the rather exact than just thing you do down? Too, yeah. yeah, just hold down square. Like, I'm not feeling this right. puzzle more this way or right. anything like that. And before before listeners pointed out, you, there is an option to skip all the puzzles in the game. Yes. And where but is that option? That's when you start a file, I think it tells you, like, you uh, want to... You can do it later in accessibility. Oh, right. really? Yeah. You can skip that, and you can skip all the Q2Es, which what I did. Actually, yeah, so we have Brent from Capitola, California saying not super far into the game just yet, but I thought I'd write in with how deeply appreciative I am of the Insomniac's work with Spider-Man's impressive array of accessibility options. Being able to skip puzzles is a huge boon for me and I know multiple people who dislike quick time events due to slower reaction times love they can simply turn them off. Uh, this, in addition to smaller but possibly even more helpful, op- helpful options like being able to hold a button instead of rapidly mashing it are similar to God of War earlier this year and they make it great. And Joe Halaska says, also appreciating the uh, accessibility options and saying that he really appreciates the lack of difficulty-related trophies in the game. Hmm. Okay, so, so if they're... 
I don't know if there are trophies for having that stuff on, but I hope they don't because that would be a really kind of like weird incentive. I, I don't think they do. But ho yeah, because I'm kind of thinking about turning off the puzzle. I, I turned off the QTEs and I'm I'm a little torn on it because it just shows like they don't skip those scenes. It just sort of turns into slow mo for a second. Which is weird. So it'll just be like, yeah. oh, I'm oh, about weird. to jump, and then like slow motion for like a second, and then it continues. Okay. I feel like those could have been cut out a little more seamlessly. Sure. But I like I'm totally fine with not having those in the game. But yeah, I think I might skip puzzles if there's no incentive to have them on because I'm yeah. not. I'm not like great. I solved this you know conductor puzzle thing and. I feel super good about myself <laughs> now. Right. I wonder what happens if you go back to Otto's lab and go do the puzzles. Can you just press X and then it's complete? Oh, hey, Otto, look at this. <laughs> Give me a raise here, buddy. Yeah, uh, brilliant. Yeah. Tyler from Greenwood, Indiana says, This game is crazy good. I pretty much love everything about it, especially the odd little mini games that you do in Octavius' oh. lab. What do you guys think about the lab mini games? We love them. We love them. They're great. I love how optional they are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I love that they're optional too, but actually, like, uh, for all the like fluff that is in this game, I actually kind of like those games okay so like pipe they basically feel like bioshock pipe puzzles. right but, but then there's also a layer of math complex. beyond that of like the plus and minus yeah i don't know i was good at math uh <laughs> in fifth grade <laughs> your pluses and minus yeah. the ego plus five <laughs> oh. uh so i like these puzzles okay what about i guess for me the biggest surprise playing it so far was uh doc ock being in there so early and, and so present. I'd imagine they kept it under wraps. I didn't know about it. Yeah, I didn't know yep. about it. I mean, I mean when you're really like to him, just as, like, boss. Like, they're still trying to hide it until you see him. Yeah. Right. I, yeah, he references him, I think, as Doc at some point before you see him. And it's like, Doc! Oh, I only know one Doc in Spider-Man, and I like him. Yeah, Dr. Brown. Brown. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I thought it was going to be Dr. Kirk Connors, actually. He's the lizard. Oh, of oh, course. Oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a great call. Uh, sure. I think he's, like, I, they do a really good job of painting him as, like, a... Uh, you know, as a helpful friend to Peter, I'm just, I'm super concerned. I don't know if they're going to do it in this game or if it just ends up happening later, but I'm yeah. super concerned about his turn to villain. I don't think that, I don't think they're going to be able to pull it off because it feels like it would be such an enormous turn for that character. Well, it seems like, it seems like where they're building now is for him to use his abilities against uh, Green Goblin, right? Right. Or whatever that's going to be. It, and then it, it's like the yeah. twist of then he also has to go up against Peter because Peter will probably try and stop him. Leo, you're squinting at me. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds great. If he ends up being like no, a, yeah, but a it's hero. Like that, hey, F you, Osborne, I don't want to go work for you, shutting down my lab. Like, that's his motivation, I think. Right. That's but, like, last we left off, he was pretty happy with it, but I'm sure there's going to be some, like, oh, now they're Maybe. trying to steal my tech or whatever for making guns or whatever. But I, I'd actually think it'd be way cooler if they kind of turned that cannon on its head and, like, Octo Octavius is, like, the co-op buddy in Spider-Man 2 or something. <laughs> yeah. Like, if they oh, turned him into a hero, I think that'd be super cool. I would right, love that. Right, right, right. That'd be a good arc for eventually maybe turning into a villain. If they had him be a hero first, that would, that would be super Yeah. Awesome. I think one of the weakest moments so far, unless I'm not reading into it enough, is that moment where Spider-Man's working on the suit in his lab and then Doc Ock comes in and he's like, what you got there? Uh, nothing. Classic Spider-Man yeah. stuff. And he's like, oh, I see what's happening here. You make the suits for Spider-Man. It's like, yeah, okay. Like, yeah. Do you think uh, he knows what he's doing, though? Like, he knows that Peter Parker's Spider-Man, he's just trying to, like, cushion it? I, I feel thought like about that. Is actually. that what it is? Yeah. Okay. I kind of wonder if that's it. I yeah. think that would make more sense than him, like, than that goofy assumption. Yeah. Like, oh, you make the suits. Yeah. Right. I'm, uh, uh, yeah, I think that he has some of the best writing, and I think the other moment that kind of surprised me in terms of writing was the one of the last moments we see where uh, Peter and Miles meet. Yeah. And, like, you expected, like, to the, for them to have a normal conversation, but like they, kind of, you know, Miles has brought. Yeah, it's a little hostile just because, like, mm. yeah, Miles is kind of in a dark place at that point. And he's Peter's trying to be like, oh, I know how you. Like, no, you don't. Yeah, yeah and it's tough because like Peter can't say why he has this connection to his dad and all this stuff. So from Miles's point of view, it's like, who's this random asshole like yeah, trying yeah. to talk to me and console me? And it's, stuff a, like, it's a good interaction. Oh, that's yeah, interesting. I just assumed I went back to like the Uncle Ben stuff. I was assumed like, oh, I know how you feel because I lost a father. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. I think my little favorite bit of writing is like the MJ stuff I think is cuter than I was expecting and I also like how much of a mystery it is of like they're teasing of like why exactly they broke up you don't exactly know how the, how the, everything played yeah. out there but just like a little moment there where MJ is like hey uh, I don't know about this feeling there's a lot of baggage here and he's like that baggage can carry good things <laughs> like lip balm yeah. and he's like listing all yeah. things like, that's a cute yeah. little line yeah um on the auto front, Hazel Muhammad, friend of the show from Tampa, Florida, says, I enjoy that Insomniac decided to go with an ultimate Spider-Man, Peter Parker, and Mary Jane, since I appreciated their banter and the fact that there's history there already. Made the relationship more believable and maybe invested in seeing the plot unfurl. Hey, that was my argument, Hazel. <laughs> um, as 
did Martin Lee and Otto Octavius. I'm not too familiar with Lee, other than what I've read in Dan Slott's comic run, but he came off as a sympathetic character, even when the end of Act 1 comes rushing up at you. You can see he's conflicted when he calls off his man at the end, but his ties to Norman Osborn seem to be the key factor that ultimately pushes him over the edge upon edge from his feast persona. Uh, also, it can't be a coincidence that Otto also has ties to Osborn. I wouldn't be surprised if Lee's and Octavius' plots come together eventually later in the game. Now let's talk about the end of Act 1. Uh, given that was New York City, I did not expect to see what amounted to a terrorist attack given the anniversary of 9-11 is coming up soon. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Uh, regardless, I felt uncomfortable with the debris settled and the camera smashes to black on Miles' face. But Miles, Peter, and Mary Jane have a reason to be in each other's orbit, and I look forward to seeing how that plays out, especially if Insomniac decides to play Miles as his ultimate incarnation as well. And here are some random thoughts from, from his own. Ready. I'm glad my OCD has me collect everything in sight. Since one of the backpack collectibles actually explains why Peter has the funds to afford placing all his backpacks all over the city, it was an award from Wilson Fisk, apparently. Uh, I also appreciate that the collectibles filled in the blank that J. Jonah Am- Jameson is no longer working at the Daily Bugle. When his podcast popped up, I kept on wondering how he had time to do that while also running a newspaper. Makes you wonder what happened, that he had to leave the Bugle, maybe in the sequel? The Stan Lee cameo was the best cameo since it confirms MJ and Peter are the best couple in the Spider-Man mythos. What did you guys think of the Stan Lee cameo? I I was kind of wondering wondering when it would come. Actually. Yeah, I didn't even think of it until last week on the podcast in that rapid fire thing that somebody emailed in. Reiner was kind of cagey about it. And I was like, oh yeah, I guess they would do that at some yeah. point. He was in the Lego games, for Christ's sake. He oh was, yeah. He was in, um, gosh, he was digitized into something else too wasn't it the destiny 2 yeah he was in destiny 2 i think he was <laughs> he and paul mccartney That's did right. a did uh, whole thing uh, uh, i actually was kind of wondering like because he's he's the owner of the italian restaurant i thought wait is, is stanley italian i don't I know i thought his face looked really good but that was the drawing part too is like it was just a close-up so i was like is he a janitor like what is his role here just get a wide shot so i can see a uniform of some sort because of the modoc style i think, he was yeah, so I think that shot shows him behind the register so oh does it i just missed it work or own that place yeah. okay he does I, something there. i was playing that game my wife was in the room when i was playing it and she was like what he can't be in this like oh, gave that game a, the finger he's and a real person she like, attacked yeah. the screen yeah so he, actually, he, he actually does kind of stand out oh of uh, course he always does because yeah. like I, I don't know that i like the way peter looks I, like, uh, I, think I am with like, you. Yeah, Absolutely. Weird. Like, the first instance in that opening cutscene was like, wait, is Peter kind of funky looking? I think it's his hair. It is something with his hair and his eyes. Whereas somebody wrote in saying that MJ looked gross. Like, MJ looks fine, but MJ great. looks way better than Peter does. Yeah, like, she looks her a hair like looks like the Mass Effect Andromeda woman. Oh, oh Mrs. Mass, Mass Effect Andromeda. Yeah. yeah, right. Oh, the writer, lady writer. Uh, <laughs> I think Martin Lee looks like good i think yeah he's probably my favorite like in terms of like oh wow you oh, really yeah. did a good job of capturing this guy's face something with peter's face though and yeah. the hair in particular maybe <laughs> push kind of weird yeah i should be just tom oh that could That's be bad. uh on that mr lee front oh, i thought of uh i think it was big hero six that stanley was also oh yes you're yeah. right he's the voice at the end on that stuff um hey ben says taylor from houston texas and the crew um i love spider-man so far but my largest issue with the game is that it's spoiled uh, Mr. Lee as Mr. Negative in their ad campaign for the game. I think it would have been a, it would have been a much better surprise if they had not ruined that fact. That is true, even though they changed the scene, because normally he was in the helicopter, yeah. right? And, like, he flew through, but Mr. Lee wasn't in the helicopter this time. Yeah, right. Oh. He was just actually at, like, the bombing scene. I thought about that the first time. during that scene. I was like, man, the scene is really cool, and there's a lot of cool stuff going on, and it's like, I've seen this a couple times, and so it feels a little diminished because of that. Yeah. To the point where I'm like, man, it'd be really nice to go in not knowing that. Like, yeah. not having seen some of the big moments. In this well, game. what yeah. is the deal with Mr. Negative? Like, how popular is he? Uh, he's a more recent character. He's pretty popular considering the fact that he's created pretty recently. I okay. Think, man, so somebody probably read in, but I think Dan Slott actually created him, so, like, he's, he's that recent. I, I love that. I think it's a smart addition. I, yeah. I don't know anything about his powers or what he's capable of or what his past is. There was, like, past is, like, that slight hint about talking about how he had a tough childhood. And so I don't know if he's, like, a duality figure and he is yeah. actually good or if he, that was all BS at the feast I don't know what that is do well, you I think th- he remains the main protagonist I mean antagonist that's a good question or both um, I I would hope so um I'd imagine I, I would I would think so I'll say yes I will imagine him and then also yeah. Doc Ock rising up and that'll kind of be the big finale the w- yeah the weird thing is I, I can't imagine they're going to go for Green Goblin in this universe 
universe because Norman just looks way like his that particular version of the character looks like I don't think he'd be good in a suit. Like I don't know that he could actually. If fight. he's more mechanical, maybe yeah. though. Yeah. I think knowing nothing, and again, we're only a couple hours in this game. Really, like, the fact that yeah. they tease Harry in such a big way, like he'll be coming home next year. It's like I'm sure they're saving all the Goblin stuff for right. the sequel. Yeah. yeah. Well, what's crazy is like we're this far into the game and we haven't seen that many like big superhero fights. We've seen the, what the Shocker. Yeah. yeah. That's about it. I guess you're negative. I guess Kingpin, yeah, too. But, like, uh, I, so every time a person p p pops up, I'm like, oh, I want to see him. I want to see Osborne fight as Green Goblin. I want to see, like, uh, Dr. Ock. I'd love to see that fight. Yeah. So, uh, here's, here's my, here's my first thing that came up with. Why? Maybe Norman Osborne fights using Dr. Octopus's tech, and Dr. Octopus remains a scientist. Mm. And so that's how, like, you know, like, I, I'm going to become the super. <laughs> I'm going to make the Green okay. Goblin. And it's gonna be like sort of different mechanically, not just a guy on a glider. Yeah. Fun. Uh, Prove me wrong, Internet. At some point, Doc Ock becomes Spider Man as well in the comics, right? Isn't there some yeah. weird stuff like that? <laughs> Called Superior. He actually like takes over Peter Parker's body. Uh, don't come. Sorry. He, like, takes over his Unless body. Unless you watch you the video, cool. then they're great. Yeah. Oh, I mean, they're amazing. Uh, uh, they're really spectacular. Yeah. And so he calls himself the Superior Spider Man. And so he like. That's super good. He's willing to do. He has all of Spider Man's powers, obviously, in his body, but so more of whatever a spider can. Yeah, he's basically like, I'm going to be you, but I'm going to be you better than you ever were. Right. That's, that's a fun idea. Do that in the game. Uh, Wyatt writes in says, I'm surprised. There's only been uh, two boss fights in the first act so far, but he says that the pacing's really great, so he doesn't really mind. And he says, which villain are you most excited to fight with? Personally, I want to see how they handle a fight with Scorpion. Do you have any villains that you hope to see that haven't been revealed yet? I'd love to see Mysterio in the game. Uh, I would too. I'd, I'd be surprised if they squeeze that in. I'd love to see Venom and Carnage. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see, it'd be fun if they just throw in a couple, like, D-string, like, uh, super villains, like Stilt Man or, like, Captain Boomerang or something. They'd be Scorpion a little bit. Uh, yeah, I think he'd be cool. Like, right. in one of the side missions. I oh, think. really? I didn't yeah. that. He, he, uh, no, I think one of the J, JJ conversations mentions oh, Scorpion. Okay, yeah. Well, but, I mean, we know that he's in the game, don't we? He's, he's not, he, isn't he in the present? Isn't yeah, he in the wrap the when they show all the pictures? Yeah, oh. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, they do tease Venom. A little bit, which Dusty W wrote in saying, "My so far my favorite little moment is the offhand mention of the black and white suit." The cop asked Spider if he has one for the police ball, and his reaction kind of hinted that he already has it, and he's already fought with Venom. I guess I didn't get that vibe. I thought it was just like a cheeky little joke, but I didn't get the vibe that Peter Parker was hinting that he already fought with Venom. Yeah, that's a little weird. Is it, it, starting that character off so far into his career, it feels like. Uh, okay, so has, I'm guessing he hasn't fought the Green Goblin, which seems weird to not have done it for eight years against yeah. Norman Osborn. Like, right. the fact that Norman Osborn is the mayor, obviously, I think that's that cool, though, it's yeah. not him. Or so I'm, yeah. 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 I'm curious as to, like, which of the bad guys he's fought up up until this point. Which yeah. I mean, one of them might have been the Vulture, because I think there's a mural yep. at some point in the beginning. I assume the people who are in the raft got put there by him. And there's, like, the, the rhino's horn and stuff. Yeah, that's so true. he made some reference, like, oh, this guy, my back still hurts thinking about fighting him. He charged into the wall like this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's that's this a good idea. This fight was fine. It was not as maybe right. amazing as. I hope they don't repeat it like Arkham did. Yeah. Well, that's the yeah. thing is like the Shocker boss fight. The Shocker isn't like considered like one of his best villains or anything, but like yeah. that fight was really cool. Oh, so you like that one? I thought it was cool. Okay, someone hated that. chasing him down. I love chasing him down. Oh, really? That was one of my favorite missions. I thought the way it like. You were using the swinging to get after him, and then you got close enough, and it went seamlessly to cutscene, and then you popped right back out. Yeah. No matter where you tagged him in, you know. Yeah, I, I, I thought think that was really well done. He was a really well done chase mission. I think the rest of those chase missions aren't as good. I like kind of like it. Missions are not as cool as shot. I haven't done the no. pigeon stuff yet, but I do like the idea of just I am just swinging around that city so much. I love focusing on speed every once in a while. I'm like, okay, I'm normally not just trying to go as fast as possible, but I like the idea of like really trying to push myself and get caught up with them. Yeah, um, what? This might have been a random joke. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, please. But at some point on the podcast, J. Jonah Jameson mentioned. Like, he's listing off all the villains that came about because of Spider-Man. He's like, there's a Nazi made of bees? Is that a real villain, or is that just a random joke? He was thinking of Metal Gear Solid 3. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's right. I just played this game, and <laughs> who's the boss? And I blame Spider-Man yeah. for Metal Gear Solid 3. <laughs> uh, is that a thing? Uh, that's not a thing that I'm aware of, but yeah. Okay. Maybe somebody and should you're saying that under that. oath. I'm saying Spider-Man is, uh... <laughs> 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 Well, you, uh, clearly you haven't heard of the Nazi. Yeah, the Nazi. <laughs> That's very good. You should write comics, sir. Yeah. Uh, let's see. This is a twist for y'all. 
Josh from Mesa, Arizona writes in, says Spider-Man has been spectacular so far. In fact, even amazing up to this point. <gasps> Everyone's making those jokes. But not so spectacular. Um, I would definitely say it is the ultimate Spider-Man video game to date. There we go. There was ultimate Spider-Man. Of course, the web slinging in this game is excellent. My personal favorite uh, part of the game, uh, and I'm sure this will get covered extensively, so there's nothing really original to add. Okay. One moment I would really like to highlight, I really loved, is after Peter gets evicted from his apartment and asks Aunt May, Aunt May for help, I was completely expecting her to invite him back to his old room in her house, but instead, she sends him to her office to sleep on the couch. Yeah. That moment really lit up my imagination. Why was her first thought to send Peter to her office instead of her house? Here are some theories. Mm. I also thought that was weird, by the way. Yep. She got sick and tired of her house, just <laughs> randomly getting attacked by super villains for no discernible reason, and after Peter left there, there was a sharp decline in such attacks, she's not risking taking him back. Or... Aunt May knows how to party, and Peter would cramp her style. <laughs> I really hope this one's true, and Peter accidentally represents and crash. Oh, accidentally crashes an eyes wide shut party at Aunt May's house, even mm. if the Sinister Six are present. Or she is in fact a super villain herself and has converted Peter's old room into her sinister lair. Or they didn't want to model Aunt May's house. Yes, I think it's much more that. Yeah. Like, well, they got the feast ready to go there. Yeah, so the feast is ringer. Like, That's yeah. a really interesting thing, though. I really hope something happens with that. That'd be awesome. We, yeah. we don't know for, like, I don't think Aunt May knows that Peter is spider no. no. I don't think so. Um, but she is Spider-Woman. It's very <laughs> clear. Also, another example of very good hair. Like, one of the <laughs> rare examples of, like, oh, her sure. hair is actually pretty nice. Rare hair. The, um... That is actually my favorite part of the game so far, is just Peter hair, hair. hair. Yeah. yeah. Is Peter going home and, like, in the eviction notice, and he, like, uses his super strength to, like, blast open the door. And I know it's a cutscene, so that's the most interesting thing, but I loved the fusion of him having his real-world problems, but then just a little bit using his spider powers. Like, he's just stuck in the bureaucracy of trying to get the number off of this garbage can while he's talking yeah. to Eddie at the warehouse. He's like, uh, let me see where it is. And he's like flipping around, like kicking the trash can around just to see what the number is on the back and like trying to track that stuff down. I thought that was such a nice little quiet mission. Yeah. I thought that was really cool too. Uh, there was part of me that was like, this garbage guy's being way too nice. Now. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he does like, offer to buy him a pizza. So. It's true. Yeah, from Leo's. That's right. Mm. Ooh, we'll see if something happens with Leo's that. cannon like that. now. Uh, okay. Wait, was Leo Stanley? I think so. I did the mocap. Oh. What's, uh, what's your guys' favorite part so far? I like using the web shooters. The more I've used them in combat, the less I've been dying. And the way, now that I've gotten some upgrades and I have so much, so many web shooter shots yeah. before they run out, and then it recharges so fast, I love just spraying everybody, swinging them around, doing the square triangle combo to throw them, just okay. kick them right into a band. Oh, yeah. And then by the time I'm done doing that, the web shooters are back. I think the way the webs work in the combat is... Perfectly done. Yeah. I yeah. think once once I got it used to it, I think the combat ended up being like both sort of true to the character and kind of like compelling in its own way. Uh, like once I started using more guys. Uh, I like that you can do tricks while you're swinging, and that it basically yeah. turns that game into this weirdo Tony Hawk kind of game where it's like, okay, I can probably do three tricks off this swing right. before yeah. I have to swing again. Even like NBA the, Street, I'm just like, I, there's no reason, yeah. but just, just yeah. keep doing it. There was also one time possible. where I fell low enough to the ground, I did, I did a trick, and I ended up like landing on the ground, but not changing my animation. So there, here's this animation of him sort of like falling all across the street for like three <laughs> seconds before I actually landed. Uh, Paul Swears writes in on that topic a little bit. He says, when you're web swimming, I really love it uh, when Spidey will sometimes catch himself off balance and mid-swing if he doesn't have a good hold on what you're stuck to. Web. Oh, it's cool. a little like stumbling animation as he's trying to get it down, which I don't think I've noticed, but that's a cool idea if it's in there. I don't think I'll ever get sick of just like using that impact webbing to like web and do it against the wall, like instantly. That's yeah. so satisfying. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Um, let's see. Uh, Kevin Jennison of Lindstrom, Minnesota, and also Joe Williams both wrote in appreciating the feast sequence. Um, and just anytime you're in there and talking about how it does a good job of representing homeless people without being cliched and over the top in any way. Which is like, yeah. Leo, you're wincing. <laughs> yeah, that was good. The the dump stuff, the catching the pigeons, has felt a little cliche presentation of a homeless person. Oh, I've I've been kindly yet, so. old homeless man on the rooftop. Oh, I lost my pigeons. Home uh, alone too. Remind me of my wife. Yeah. It starts okay. out as a side mission, so you gotta go do a side mission and then okay. it unlocks all the pigeons. Gotcha. Um, Jared says, hello, club. As a huge fan of Sunset Overdrive, I've spent many hours in the game just swinging from landmark to landmark and taking pictures because of how much fun I'm having with the movement system. One landmark in particular piqued my interest, however, the Avengers Tower. After taking a picture of the tower, Peter says something along the lines of, it's too bad the Avengers are never around. I think they're on the West Coast or something. 
I'm not very knowledgeable on Marvel comics, so hopefully someone's a little bit more comic book savvy can help me out. Is this line of dialogue a reference to a specific event in the Marvel Universe? Is it possible that it alludes to Square Enix Avengers game from Crystal Dynamics, which is on the West Coast? Ooh, oh, I think I think that's what it is. I think uh, that's what they're going for. It's, well, <laughs> so actually, there's a comic called West Coast Avengers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but still, I really am sick with my Crystal D theory. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. It was, uh, man, some of you read in, I'm sure, but I think it started in the 80s. Hawkeye founded a West Coast team because they wanted to, like, have, like, multiple <laughs> issues. They're like, we should make more Avengers comics, so they created a West Coast team. And who while. better than Hawkeye to lead it all? Uh, they recently brought it back. Oh, okay. Oh, so maybe that is a reference to that then. Yeah, I'm sure that's what it is. Because it's a little bit weird of like, boy, there's crime all over this city, and Spider-Man's really the only superhero running around. Like, what is Doctor Strange doing in yeah. there? Well, yeah, because there's Sanctum's there, and you can take a picture of it. Yeah, and he says, like, something's a little bit strange about this building. And it's also like, oh, where's uh, Daredevil, or where's any of the other New York-based superheroes? Right, I understand. But is a part of you guys hoping that eventually they'll get to tease more Marvel stuff, or do you want it to be completely Spider-Man? I think it'd be fun to, like, see another character, rather than just the towers. Yeah. Like, where's 4 for you? Plaza, too. Like, I kept expecting that. But apparently, it's, like, the Fantastic Four building? Like, where's that one? Oh, the Baxter building? The Baxter building. Like, that used to be, like, the big... Is it? I don't know. I haven't seen it yet, but I assume it would be. Okay. I I can totally see, like, a crossover being sort of, like, the ending stinger of, like, right at the end, post-credits, like, oh, like... Spider-Man's doing something, and here's Iron Man. He's like, hey, Peter. But that's such a buy slippery... Buy the DLC! <laughs> yeah. It's such a slippery slope, and especially with Square having that deal for the Avengers games and stuff. Yeah. Like, if they did it, maybe it would be more of the New York-based stuff and less like Avengers Knight. stuff. Yeah. It will be like, hey, let's get the Defenders in there or something like that. Because question. they do have the Rand Tower uh, from Iron yeah. Fist in there. Apparently, it's where the Trump Tower is. They, like, replace oh, the really? Tower with Tower. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Really makes you think of a politics. I wish I could <laughs> replace
says, I really like the amount of work they put into this Spidey forum slash Twitter. That's in the menus. They did a great job of making it look like something you would see today. There's even an idiot defending Fisk after he gets arrested. Uh, the best account is JJ in space, fake JJJ news, and Wallcrawler's response to Screwball. Yeah, do you guys like those little tweet pop-ups? All that stuff? I haven't seen that many of them. Okay. Yeah, I don't know some of them. Yeah, I haven't really read them, but I appreciate they're there. There's yep. a lot of extra writing there, too. It is one of those things where I noticed, like, oh, Spider-Man's on Twitter as, like, Spider-Man or whatever. And I'm like, some crazy hacker would be able to track that back to Peter Parker, all right? Some, some guy would yeah. track that back to, like, you created this account on Peter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, wait a minute. There's wait a minute. made-up nonsense. They figured out who Drill was, so. Yeah. They can uh, figure out who Spider-Man Drill yeah. is our modern Spider-Man. Sure, yeah, exactly. Uh, Nathan says the best landmarks in the game are obviously Avenger Tower and Wakanda Embassy. Uh, he says they laughed out loud at the Stan Lee cameo. Glitches. He said he found a glitch where getting interrupted by police radio when near a police tower made it not possible to sync with it. That's interesting. Oh, weird. I fixed it by doing another activity and reloading the last checkpoint after that. Another glitch when trying to do Harry's lightning mission. Dying breaks the mission and forces me to end and restart the mission. And he is very, very disappointed that Doc Ock finds Peter with a Superman suit. I'm sorry, the Spider-Man suit. Uh, and jumps to, oh, you're a guy that works for the guy. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and Nathan was the one that did think Mary Jane. I think you're wrong here, Nate. Yeah, come it's on. It's all good. Uh, I got her. You guys want the most specific mm-hmm. feedback here? Yes. This is from Matthew Thies from Blacksburg, Virginia. It says, Dear Game Informer Show, I just finished playing Spider-Man for eight hours straight, only stopping when I reached the end of Act 1. Suffice to say, I'm enjoying my time with it. The web, sling, web swinging feels great. The attention to detail in the city is astonishing. J. Jordan James' podcast always merits a laugh. I found myself, like, stopping whatever I'm doing just to make sure I don't accidentally skip any of the podcast. I think it's really fun, too. Yep. However, the game has one glaring flaw. The prompt that appears whenever you're supposed to interact with an item, when it loads, it looks like a spinning circle. So my idiot brain always thinks, well, better press the circle button. <laughs> but no, when it finally does load, it is revealed you're supposed to press triangle. You think, I would, you think I would learn after the first few times, but I'm always tricked by seeing a circle on screen. The game explains the rest of its complicated UI so well, but just fumbles with this one little thing. Absolute madness. He is 100% correct. I had that same experience. Oh, really? Oh, wow, that's crazy. That's also, surprising. somebody else wrote in, uh, talking about just like the opening of the game and how much they throw at you. And I thought it was a lot. It, it was a lot of tutorials. I mean, they're not too in your face, but it's like there was a surprising amount of different movesets between the swinging and then the opening fight. It was like, oh, there's a lot to digest here out of the gate. If I wasn't paying attention to the game so much ahead of its launch, I feel like I would just not know about certain things you can do. Yeah. It's like running on the wall holding circles so you go around the corner. It only tells you that in like a tool tip on the loading screen. Right. It's super easy to miss that. I don't feature. think I've been doing that at all. That's really helpful. Okay. Um, okay, Leo. Whatever. Uh, Nate McClellan <laughs> says, Did any of you guys read the novel that takes place before the events of the game? It's really great, but I'm a bit bummed the game hasn't made mention of stuff that happens in the novel. I won't spoil anything from the book, but there's some stuff that happens with the shocker in the novel, but it is even like that in the game. Granted, the novel takes place months before the game opens up, but still. There's also a side mission that involves stopping some people from robbing a casino. And when you find the apartment they're in, the heist leader is named Nico, and he talks of hiring his brother's son, Roman, to help him. I thought that was a oh, pretty cool funny. Easter egg. Yeah. Yeah. Is he talking about the graphic novel, Amazing Spider-Man? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I skipped that word. Yeah, he's talking oh, about the graphic okay. novel, Amazing Spider-Man. Um, also, Austin from Howard, Indiana says, Hey, GI, uh, GI guys, lit. only an hour or so in. I just had to write it. Long live Spider-Cop. I don't know why it's such a funny segment of dialogue to me. I hope he comes back. I like the implication that he's been doing that for years. Yes. Yeah. And then he's finally retiring. Yeah, I thought that was fine. I thought that was, that was funny enough. I was waiting for it to get grading, but it's like, okay, it's okay. It's pretty quick. I thought it was funny at first, and I thought it overstayed as well. But when the joke is that it is super not funny, and you're being yeah. annoyed by it, yeah, like, you, you kind of leave going, it. Yeah. yeah. By the way, this Yuri character. Uh, yeah, I was I shocked right out of the that. gate. I'm like, Yuri, why do I remember that? It's like, oh, that's right, the voice actor behind Spider-Man, his name is Yuri. And then the oh, main, sure. or the first character you meet in the game is also Yuri. Does Yuri have a big presence in the comics? Uh, somewhat. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I He's always know. just the Commissioner Gordon? I wouldn't say it. It's not as big a... I wouldn't say it's as big a presence as, like, Commissioner Gordon. Has, yeah. And she hasn't been around nearly as long. But it is just that role in the comics it's, as well? It's kind of the same role. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Also, like, with Batman, like, his relationship to the police is so, like, interesting mm-hmm. and, like, sometimes tight. With Spider-Man, I don't feel like he needs to have a relationship with the police and, like, they have never played that up quite to the same extent. He just needs the scanner, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Well, I like that... I always on. feel it's super weird when he's standing there talking to the police in uniform. Because 
because that's not a thing Spider-Man does a lot. It just feels weird to me, even when huh. it does happen. It happens in the comics, sure. But. Okay. The uh, I liked is early on when you're going up against some enemies and the, and the police are there. The, the police go, "Spider-Man's here. He's gonna mess everything up." And then Spider-Man's like, "Hey, thanks for the confidence, guys." Like I, I like that dynamic instead of just being like, "Huzzah, Spider-Man!" It's like, "Oh God, this asshole's back." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, what are you gonna do? Yeah, because I remember there was a line where he said, "Oh, I I haven't been on I I've been on." Worse, re- I've been in a worse relationship with the police before, which implies that it's better than it has been. Uh, okay. So maybe like that was sort of like, ah, he's pretty tight with the police. And then there's a side mission where you can do where you're sort of trying to sort of uh, free this guy from be- getting blackmailed for a crime he didn't commit. Okay. And at some point, I, towards the end of the quest, he says like, oh, I know someone on the force that can help you out. And I'm guessing it's Yuri, but like, yeah, yeah. it definitely feels like they, they're kind of shifting between like, police. They're like police like Peter and. They don't, which is like a weird. Yuri thing. does, but maybe the rest are kind of annoyed yeah, by maybe. the dynamic. Yeah. With Osborne as the mayor, it'd be interesting if they play that up here in the next part of the game. Like he starts putting pressure on them or something to like catch Spider-Man or do something about that. I don't Spider-Man think guy. they would let you kill police or at least like attack police in a Spider-Man game. No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying like the police are coming after you and you're trying to run or, sure. or do something. One funny thing is when you're like fighting and the police are on your side. Yeah. I noticed they were using like taser bolts. Like, they were doing non-lethal attacks on the enemies to support you. And it's oh, like, yeah, this funny. game feels very positive on police. Yeah. <laughs> it thinks they're doing a good job. Right. Are you okay with us? No problem here. Good Moving cop. on. Yeah. Spider uh, Any other big thoughts? Uh, I I am not as sort of blown away by it as I think a, a lot of other people are, but I feel like this is a, like, I really like the way this game channels Spider-Man, but, like, I'm kind of, I'm not into the game like a hundred percent, but it just I'm, feels I'm, too standard open world for you. A or? little bit, yeah. Okay. I, I wish it were a better game, but I feel like it's hard to like those chase missions that I don't like. Those feel like super a part of what Spider-Man is and does. Okay. But like I, I'm still kind of struggling with the idea. Like this is a really good Spider-Man game, but I wish it were a, like a better designed yeah. game overall. I hear you. I like just the cultural moment. I think this game is going to sell one gajillion units, and it seems like everybody one in the world gajillion. is playing it. But I love when culture is the gaming culture rallies around one thing that we all kind of know and kind of already love like you're just referencing Reese. there have been so many spider games some not even that long ago but this one is just like no now i love spider-man yeah. again now yeah. i'm excited to talk about spider-man it feels like everybody on twitter everybody in the gaming universe was all of a sudden like you know what's awesome chili I don't need it that often, but let's all celebrate chili. This is the year of chili. It just feels like a celebration of something we've all lived with forever. You know, oh, yeah. it's back. <laughs> I feel like the, the other time this has happened chili. this year, I think, is with Dragon Ball. Like, it yes. was to a slightly smaller extent, but I definitely feel like a lot of people, it's like, you know what? I This game reminded me that Dragon Ball's pretty cool. Yes. And forever. everyone just kind of, say, like, suddenly Dragon Ball is cool again because of this game. And like Spider-Man, everybody loves again. Yeah. No questions asked because of this one game. Coolest fictional character. Which is also very funny, real quick. It's funny that, like, legally, what they call it, Marvel Spider-Man is the official name of the game. But I love that everyone just calls it Insomniac Spider-Man. It's like this weird <laughs> play of, like, just leave the Marvel out completely. We'll add a word, though, and it'll be the word you won't want, Marvel. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so this game will do really, really well, and it will spawn more superhero games, right? Like a new wave? I hope so. Well, I mean, did the Arkham games spawn a new wave of zero? I don't know about that. I feel like the, the Arkham games are harder to... I think it, it inspired a lot of other games to be sort of influenced by them, but I feel like those games specifically in terms of... I don't think it works for other superheroes, whereas this feels a little bit more flexible. Although, like, <laughs> Spider-Man sort of web-swinging is not something that a lot of other characters do, obviously. Right. But I feel like this, this sort of format feels a little bit easier to ape with other heroes. Well, I think the only thing is with that is, like, there's only so many characters that have cracked uh-huh. to the Spider-Man <laughs> tier. Superman, Superman, maybe Wonder Woman. I think but, like, Iron Man can totally work that way. Like, yeah, maybe Iron Man now at this point. But, yeah. that, like, you can't do this with Daredevil, because, I mean, uh-huh. I think the game would still be fun because it's done well, but, like, it's Daredevil, quiet man, but, yeah. people <laughs> don't love Daredevil like they love Spider-Man, uh-huh. right? Yeah. To the same universal uh-huh. appeal. Yeah, I so I think there's there's a there's only a select number of characters you can do that for yeah. sure. So I don't think yeah, we'll have for a huge big budget explosion. Production, yeah, I think yeah you're right, yeah. creatively I think you're totally right that it'd be hard to adapt that with many other superheroes, but I mean money talks. You know what I'm talking about? Speaking hey, of which, like it's gonna be so up. bizarre. Think about Insomniac still an independent studio. Imagine how much they increased their worth to Sony buying them. Like yeah. clearly Sony could have bought them years and years ago. So clearly Ted Price and everybody else from Insomniac is not interested in being bought, but like 
with the success of this game, I'm sure Sony's a little bit nervous, but like, yeah. we didn't make it technically as a developer we don't own. Right. But like, what? The asking price must have gone up by four times as much. I'll just throw it out there. It's oh, such yeah. a fun idea to think about. So think back yeah. when they made Fuse, like what's the difference right. between yeah. Fuse How much and would this? Sony have paid then versus yeah. now? Yeah, but, oh God. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, six months of Sony got them. Yeah. Okay, well, just to try and lock that down. Their exclusive was like Sunset Overdrive, which right. is fine, but like, Nowhere near this level that they're yeah. making exclusive for Sony. It's like, the most, probably like well, I remember there's popular. a big cultural zeitgeist where everyone was talking about how much they loved Sunsets when that game yeah. came out. Everyone was really <laughs> rallying around this thing we all knew for yeah. so long. Cheering everyone installed the overdrive into their cars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd be remiss too if I didn't mention real quick uh, the music. I think the main theme is so good. I think it's so important for a game like this to have an amazing main theme. And just, it reminds me of like Lego Batman 2, where every time you play a Superman, and you fly off the ground even an inch, it'll start playing the John Williams theme, which <laughs> right. never really got old. And then a little bit this game, like, the second you start swinging, it'll just, it'll just start the strings rolling again. Yeah. It's so satisfying and so sweet. Really great music. Yeah. Especially just that opening area, like that mission, where I just avoided things as much as possible, just having that music just hit all out, out of the gate, just with that main theme driving it home. So sweet. Hey, everybody, that's a game club. Part one. That's right. <laughs> Nobody wrote in saying they didn't like the game. Um, somebody wrote in, I think it was Nick from Atlanta, I remember this, friend of the show, saying that he expected to like it more. Yeah. Um, no I, one, no one I, hates it. Yeah, I, I, I really do like, I, I really do like the game, I just don't, like, it'll probably oh, be, back pedal, <laughs> well, I can, I can see it sort of, like, cracking my top, I, it'll probably be on my top ten. Oh, it'll yeah, be, like, I'd be surprised if it isn't. Yeah, okay. That's, that's sort of real. I yeah. will say I let myself get too hyped, probably. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's a very good game, but it's not, like, life-changing. Yeah. The it's, way I... Kind well, you've only played be. a third of it. You're right. right. You're right. Two thirds of your life left as well. <laughs> um, okay, so the next episode. Do you guys want to do it? Next episode on the twentieth. Can we get through Act Two by then? Heck yes. yes. How long is that? We're gonna go right up yeah. till he meets Superman. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, that's two weeks. Um, or is it? I don't no, think so. Week. I don't yeah, know. That's man. a week. Yeah. Look, so it's September twentieth, I believe, will be the next episode yeah. of right. GI Game Club. And so, where you'll stop then? It's very easy. End of Act 2. There should be a trophy to remind you of that. Or it is the last E3 demo involving the prison. So when you're done with the prison, oh. that is the end of Act 2. So okay. stop there. Thank God that is E3 demos as the end of the acts. Yeah, and uh, the Act 3 finale as well. We all saw it at E3. <laughs> Everybody remembers yeah. E3 2012. Where we hinted at it very subtly. Uh, yeah, so that's the end of Act 2. So please write in with specific thoughts, the tiny details. That's what we want. Everything good like that. But I love the big overview stuff as well. But podcast at GameInformer.com. Please write in. Let's have some fun. And that's it for this overall episode of the Game Informer Show. Thank you so much for watching or listening. Be sure to tune in next Thursday. We'll have a new episode waiting for you. Bye, everybody. Bye.